the Queen's guard. You were the Queen's man, said Resnak Mo Resnak. The King desires his own men about him when he holds court. I am the Queen's man still, today, tomorrow, always, until my last breath or hers. Barristan Selmy refused to believe that Daenerys Targaryen was dead. Perhaps that was why he was being put aside. One by one, his dar removes us all. Strong Belwas lingered at the door of death in the temple, under the care of the Blue Graces, though Selmy half suspected they were finishing the job those honeyed locusts had begun. Skaha's shave pate had been stripped of his command. The Unsullied had withdrawn to their barracks. Jehogo, Dario Naharis, Admiral Grolio, and Hero of the Unsullied remained hostages of the young Kai. Ago and Rakaro and the rest of the Queen's Kalasar had been dispatched across the river to search for their lost queen. Even Missandei had been replaced. The king did not think it fit to use a child as his herald, and a one-time Nothi slave at that. And now me. There was a time when he might have taken this dismissal as a blot upon his honor. But that was in Westeros. In the viper's pit that was Meereen, honor seemed as silly as a fool's motley. And this mistrust was mutual. His Darzo Lorak might be his queen's consort, but he would never be his king. If his grace wishes for me to remove myself from court, his radiance, the seneschal corrected. No, 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 you misunderstand me. His worship is to receive a delegation from the Yunkai to discuss the withdrawal of their armies. They may ask for, uh, recompense for those who lost their lives to the dragon's wrath. A delicate situation. The king feels it will be better if they see a Mirinese king upon the throne, protected by Mirinese warriors. Surely you can understand that, sir. I understand more than you know. Might I know which men his grace has chosen to protect him? Resnak Mo Resnak smiled his slimy smile. Fearsome fighters, who love his worship well, Gogor the Giant, Kraz, the Spotted Cat, Beliquo Bonebreaker, heroes all. Pit fighters all. Ser Baristan was unsurprised. His Darzo Lorak sat uneasily on his new throne. It had been a thousand years since Mirin last had a king, and there were some even amongst the old blood who thought they might have made a better choice than him. Outside the city sat the young Kai with their cell swords and their allies. Inside were the sons of the harpy. And the king's protectors grew fewer every day. His dar's blunder with Grey Worm had cost him the unsullied. When his grace had tried to put them under the command of a cousin, as he had the brazen beasts, Grey Worm had informed the king that they were free men who took commands only from their mother. As for the brazen beasts, half were freedmen and the rest shave-pates, whose true loyalty might still be to Skahasmo Kandak. The pit fighters were King Hisdar's only reliable support against a sea of enemies. May they defend his grace against all threats. Sir Barristan's tone gave no hint of his true feelings. He had learned to hide such back in King's Landing years ago. His magnificence, Resnak Mo Resnak stressed. Your other duties shall remain unchanged, sir. Should this peace fail, his radiance would still wish for you to command his forces against the enemies of our city. He has that much sense, at least. Beliquo Bonebreaker and Gogor the Giant might serve as Hisdar's shields, but the notion of either leading an army into battle was so ludicrous that the old knight almost smiled. I am his graces to command. Not grace, the seneschal complained. That style is Westerosi. His magnificence, his radiance, his worship. His vanity would fit better. As you say. Resnak licked his lips. Then we are done. This time his oily smile betokened dismissal. Ser Barristan took his leave, grateful to leave the stench of the seneschal's perfume behind him. A man should smell of sweat, not flowers. The Great Pyramid of Mirin was eight hundred feet high from base to point. The seneschal's chambers were on the second level. The queen's apartments, and his own, occupied the highest step. 
A long climb for a man my age, Sir Barristan thought as he started up. He had been known to make that climb five or six times a day on the Queen's business, as the aches in his knees and the small of his back could attest. There will come a day when I can no longer face these steps, he thought, and that day will be here sooner than I would like. Before it came, he must make certain that at least a few of his lads were ready to take his place at the Queen's side. I will knight them myself when they are worthy, and give them each a horse and golden spurs. The royal apartments were still and silent. Hisdar had not taken up residence there, preferring to establish his own suite of rooms deep in the heart of the Great Pyramid, where massive brick walls surrounded him on all sides. Mazara, Miklas, Keza, and the rest of the Queen's young cup-bearers, hostages in truth, but both Selmy and the Queen had become so fond of them that it was hard for him to think of them that way, had gone with the King, whilst Eri and Jiki departed with the other Dothraki. Only Missende remained, a forlorn little ghost haunting the Queen's chambers at the apex of the pyramid. Sir Barristan walked out onto the terrace. The sky above Meereen was the color of corpse flesh, dull and white and heavy, a mass of unbroken cloud from horizon to horizon. The sun was hidden behind a wall of cloud. It would set unseen, as it had risen unseen that morning. The night would be hot, a sweaty, suffocating, sticky sort of night without a breath of air. For three days rain had threatened, but not a drop had fallen. Rain would come as a relief. It might help wash the city clean. From here he could see four lesser pyramids, the city's western walls, and the camps of the Yunkish men by the shores of Slaver's Bay, where a thick column of greasy smoke twisted upward like some monstrous serpent. The Yunkish men burning their dead, he realized. The pale mare is galloping through their siege camps. Despite all the queen had done, the sickness had spread, both within the city walls and without. Mirin's markets were closed, its streets empty. King Hisdar had allowed the fighting pits to remain open, but the crowds were sparse. The Mirinese had even begun to shun the Temple of the Graces, reportedly. The slavers will find some way to blame Daenerys for that as well, Sir Barristan thought bitterly. He could almost hear them whispering, great masters, sons of the Harpy, young Kai, all telling one another that his queen was dead. Half of the city believed it, though as yet they did not have the courage to say such words aloud. But soon, I think. Sir Barristan felt very tired, very old. Where have all the years gone? Of late, whenever he knelt to drink from a still pool, he saw a stranger's face gazing up from the water's depths. When had those crow's feet first appeared around his pale blue eyes? How long ago had his hair turned from sunlight into snow? Years ago, old man. Decades. Yet it seemed like only yesterday that he had been raised to knighthood, after the tourney at King's Landing. He could still recall the touch of King Aegon's sword upon his shoulder, light as a maiden's kiss. His words had caught in his throat when he spoke his vows. At the feast that night he had eaten ribs of wild boar, prepared the Dornish way with dragon peppers, so hot they burned his mouth. Forty-seven years, and the taste still lingered in his memory, yet he could not have said what he had supped on ten days ago if all seven kingdoms had depended on it. Boiled dog, most like, or some other foul dish that tasted no better. Not for the first time, Selmy wondered at the strange fates that had brought him here. He was a knight of Westeros, a man of the Stormlands and the Dornish Marches. His place was in the Seven Kingdoms, not here upon the sweltering shores of Slaver's Bay. I came to bring Daenerys home. Yet he had lost her, just as he had lost her father and her brother. Even Robert, I failed him too. Perhaps his dar was wiser than he knew. Ten years ago I would have sensed what Daenerys meant to do. Ten years ago I would have been quick enough to stop her. Instead he had stood befuddled as she leapt into the pit, shouting her name, then running uselessly after her across the scarlet sands. I am become old and slow. 
Small wonder Naharis mocked him as Ser Grandfather. Would Dario have moved more quickly if he had been beside the queen that day? Selmy thought he knew the answer to that, though it was not one he liked. He had dreamed of it again last night, Belwas on his knees retching up bile and blood, Isdar urging on the dragon slayers, men and women fleeing in terror, fighting on the steps, climbing over one another, screaming and shouting. And Daenerys. Her hair was aflame. She had the whip in her hand and she was shouting. Then she was on the dragon's back, flying. The sand that Drogon stirred as he took wing had stung Ser Barristan's eyes, but through a veil of tears he had watched the beast fly from the pit, his great black wings slapping at the shoulders of the bronze warriors at the gates. The rest he learned later. Beyond the gates had been a solid press of people, maddened by the smell of dragon, horses below reared in terror, lashing out with iron-shod hooves. Food stalls and palanquins alike were overturned, men knocked down and trampled. Spears were thrown, crossbows were fired. Some struck home. The dragon twisted violently in the air, wounds smoking, the girl clinging to his back. Then he loosed the fire. It had taken the rest of the day and most of the night for the brazen beasts to gather up the corpses. The final count was 214 slain, three times as many burned or wounded. Drogon was gone from the city by then, last seen high over the Skahazadan, flying north. Of Daenerys Targaryen, no trace had been found. Some swore they saw her fall. Others insisted that the dragon had carried her off to devour her. They are wrong. Ser Barristan knew no more of dragons than the tales every child hears, but he knew Targaryens. Daenerys had been riding that dragon, as Aegon had once ridden Balerion of old. She might be flying home, he told himself, aloud. No, murmured a soft voice behind him. She would not do that, sir. She would not go home without us. Ser Barristan turned. Missinde, child, how long have you been standing there? Not long. This one is sorry if she has disturbed you. She hesitated. Skahasmo Kandak wishes words with you. The shave, Pate? You spoke with him? That was rash, rash. The enmity ran deep between Skahaz and the king, and the girl was clever enough to know that. Skahaz had been outspoken in his opposition to the queen's marriage, a fact Hisdar had not forgotten. Is he here, in the pyramid? When he wishes. He comes and goes, sir. Yes, he would. Who told you he wants words with me? A brazen beast. He wore an owl mask. He wore an owl mask when he spoke to you. By now he could be a jackal, a tiger, a sloth. Ser Barristan had hated the masks from the start, and never more than now. Honest men should never need to hide their faces. And the shave pate. What could he be thinking? After Hisdar had given command of the brazen beasts to his cousin Margaz Zolorak, Skahaz had been named Warden of the River, with charge of all the ferries, dredges, and irrigation ditches along the Skahazadan for fifty leagues, but the shave pate had refused that ancient and honorable office, as Hisdar called it, preferring to retire to the modest pyramid of Kandak. Without the queen to protect him, he takes a great risk coming here. And if Ser Barristan were seen speaking with him, suspicion might fall on the night as well. He did not like the taste of this. It smelled of deceit, of whispers and lies and plots hatched in the dark, all the things he'd hoped to leave behind with the spider and Lord Littlefinger in their ilk. Barristan Selmy was not a bookish man, but he had often glanced through the pages of the White Book, where the deeds of his predecessors had been recorded. Some had been heroes, some weaklings, knaves, or cravens. Most were only men, quicker and stronger than most, more skilled with sword and shield, but still prey to pride, ambition, lust, love, anger, jealousy, greed for gold, hunger for power, and all the other failings that afflicted lesser mortals. The best of them overcame their flaws, did their duty, 
and died with their swords in their hands. The worst. The worst were those who played the game of thrones. Can you find this owl again? he asked Miss Ende. This one can try, sir. Tell him I will speak with... with our friend, after dark, by the stables. The pyramid's main doors were closed and barred at sunset. The stables would be quiet at that hour. Make certain it is the same owl. It would not serve to have the wrong brazen beast hear of this. This one understands. Miss Ende turned as if to go, then paused a moment and said, It is said that the young Kai have ringed the city all about with scorpions, to loose iron bolts into the sky should Drogon return. Sir Barristan had heard that too. It is no simple thing to slay a dragon in the sky. In Westeros many tried to bring down Aegon and his sisters. None succeeded. Miss Ende nodded. It was hard to tell if she was reassured. Do you think that they will find her, sir? The grasslands are so vast, and dragons leave no tracks across the sky. Ago and Rakaro are blood of her blood, and who knows the Dothraki sea better than Dothraki? He squeezed her shoulder. They will find her if she can be found. If she still lives. There were other cows who prowled the grass, horse lords with calisars whose riders numbered in the tens of thousands, but the girl did not need to hear that. You love her well, I know. I swear I shall keep her safe. The words seemed to give the girl some comfort. Words are wind, though, Sir Barristan thought. How can I protect the queen when I am not with her? Barristan Selmy had known many kings. He had been born during the troubled reign of Aegon the Unlikely, beloved by the common folk, had received his knighthood at his hands. Aegon's son Jaehaerys had bestowed the white cloak on him when he was three and twenty, after he slew Malus the Monstrous during the War of the Ninepenny Kings. In that same cloak he had stood beside the Iron Throne as madness consumed Jaehaerys' son Aerys, stood and saw and heard, and yet did nothing. But no, that was not fair. He did his duty. Some nights Sir Barristan wondered if he had not done that duty too well. He had sworn his vows before the eyes of gods and men, he could not in honor go against them. But the keeping of those vows had grown hard in the last years of King Eris's reign. He had seen things that it pained him to recall, and more than once he wondered how much of the blood was on his own hands. If he had not gone into Duskendale to rescue Eris from Lord Darklin's dungeons, the king might well have died there as Tywin Lannister sacked the town. Then Prince Rhaegar would have ascended the Iron Throne, mayhaps to heal the realm. Duskendale had been his finest hour, yet the memory tasted bitter on his tongue. It was his failures that haunted him at night, though. Jaehaerys, Aerys, Robert, three dead kings. Rhaegar, who would have been a finer king than any of them. Princess Elia and the children. Aegon just a babe. Rhaenys with her kitten. Dead, every one, yet he still lived, who had sworn to protect them. And now Daenerys, his bright shining child queen. She is not dead. I will not believe it. Afternoon brought Ser Barristan a brief respite from his doubts. He spent it in the training hall on the pyramid's third level, working with his boys, teaching them the art of sword and shield, horse and lance, and chivalry, the code that made a knight more than any pit fighter. Daenerys would need protectors her own age about her after he was gone, and Ser Barristan was determined to give her such. The lads he was instructing ranged in age from eight to twenty. He had started with more than sixty of them, but the training had proved too rigorous for many. Less than half that number now remained, but some showed great promise. With no king to guard, I will have more time to train them now, he realized as he walked from pair to pair, watching them go at one another with blunted swords and spears with rounded heads. Brave boys, base-born I, but some will make good knights, and they love the queen. If not for her, all of them would have ended in the pits. 
King Hisdar has his pit fighters, but Daenerys will have knights. Keep your shield up, he called. Show me your strokes. Together now. Low. High. Low. Low. High. Low. Selmy took his simple supper out onto the Queen's terrace that night and ate it as the sun went down. Through the purple twilight he watched fires waken one by one in the great stepped pyramids, as the many-colored bricks of Meereen faded to gray and then to black. Shadows gathered in the streets and alleys below, making pools and rivers. In the dusk, the city seemed a tranquil place, even beautiful. That is pestilence, not peace, the old knight told himself with his last sip of wine. He did not wish to be conspicuous, so when he was finished with his supper he changed out of his court clothes, trading the white cloak of the Queen's Guard for a hooded brown traveler's cloak such as any common man might wear. He kept his sword and dagger. This could still be some trap. He had little trust in his dar and less in Resnak Mo Resnak. The perfumed seneschal could well be part of this, trying to lure him into a secret meeting so he could sweep up him and Skahaz both and charge them with conspiring against the king. If the shave pate speaks treason, he will leave me no choice but to arrest him. His dar is my queen's consort, however little I may like it. My duty is to him, not Skahaz. Or was it? The first duty of the king's guard was to defend the king from harm or threat. The white knights were sworn to obey the king's commands as well, to keep his secrets, counsel him when counsel was requested, and keep silent when it was not, serve his pleasure and defend his name and honor. Strictly speaking, it was purely the king's choice whether or not to extend king's guard protection to others, even those of royal blood. Some kings thought it right and proper to dispatch king's guard to serve and defend their wives and children, siblings, aunts, uncles, and cousins of greater and lesser degree, and occasionally even their lovers, mistresses, and bastards. But others preferred to use household knights and men-at-arms for those purposes, whilst keeping their seven as their own personal guard, never far from their sides. If the queen had commanded me to protect his dar, I would have had no choice but to obey. But Daenerys Targaryen had never established a proper queen's guard even for herself, nor issued any commands in respect to her consort. The world was simpler when I had a lord commander to decide such matters, Selmy reflected. Now I am the lord commander, and it is hard to know which path is right. When at last he came to the bottom of the last flight of steps, he found himself all but alone amongst the torchlit corridors inside the pyramid's massive brick walls. The great gates were closed and barred, as he had anticipated. Four brazen beasts stood guard outside those doors, four more within. It was those that the old knight encountered, big men, masked as boar, bear, vole, and manticore. All quiet, sir the bear told him. Keep it so. It was not unknown for Sir Barristan to walk around at night to make certain the pyramid was secure. Deeper inside the pyramid, another four brazen beasts had been set to guard the iron doors outside the pit where Viserion and Rhaegal were chained. The light of the torches shimmered off their masks, ape, ram, wolf, crocodile. Have they been fed? Sir Barristan asked. Aye, sir, replied the ape. A sheep apiece. And how long will that suffice, I wonder? As the dragons grew, so did their appetites. It was time to find the shave pate. Sir Barristan made his way past the elephants and the queen's silver mare to the back of the stables. An ass nickered as he went by, and a few of the horses stirred at the light of his lantern. Elsewise all was dark and silent. Then a shadow detached itself from inside an empty stall and became another brazen beast, clad in pleated black skirt, greaves, and muscled breastplate. A cat? said Barristan Selmy when he saw the brass beneath the hood. When the shave pate had commanded the brazen beasts, he had favored a serpent's head mask, imperious and frightening. Cats go everywhere, replied the familiar voice of Skahazmo Kandak. No one ever looks at them. 
If Hisdar should learn that you are here, who will tell him? Margaz? Margaz knows what I want him to know. The beasts are mine. Do not forget it. The shavepate's voice was muffled by his mask, but Selmy could hear the anger in it. I have the poisoner. Who? Hisdar's confectioner. His name would mean nothing to you. The man was just a cat's paw. The sons of the harpy took his daughter and swore she would be returned unharmed once the queen was dead. Belwas and the dragon saved Daenerys. No one saved the girl. She was returned to her father in the black of night in nine pieces, one for every year she lived. Why? Doubts gnawed at him. The sons had stopped their killing. His daughter's peace is a sham. Not at first, no. The young Kai were afraid of our queen, of her unsullied, of her dragons. This land has known dragons before. Yerkaz Zoyunzak had read his histories, he knew. Hisdar as well. Why not a peace? Daenerys wanted it, they could see that. Wanted it too much. She should have marched to Astapor. Skahaz moved closer. That was before. The pit changed all. Daenerys gone, Yerkaz dead. In place of one old lion, a pack of jackals. Bloodbeard. That one has no taste for peace. And there is more. Worse. Volantis has launched its fleet against us. Volantis? Selmy's sword hand tingled. We made a peace with Yunkai, not with Volantis. You are certain? Certain. The wise masters know. So do their friends. The Harpy, Reznak, Hisdar. This king will open the city gates to the Volantines when they arrive. All those Daenerys freed will be enslaved again. Even some who were never slaves will be fitted for chains. You may end your days in a fighting pit, old man. Kraz will eat your heart. His head was pounding. Daenerys must be told. Find her first. Skahaz grasped his forearm. His fingers felt like iron. We cannot wait for her. I have spoken with the Free Brothers, the Mother's Men, the Stalwart Shields. They have no trust in Lorak. We must break the young Kai. But we need the Unsullied. Grey Worm will listen to you. Speak to him. To what end? He is speaking treason, conspiracy. Life. The shavepate's eyes were black pools behind the brazen cat mask. We must strike before the Volantines arrive. Break the siege. Kill the slaver lords. Turn their cell swords. The young Kai do not expect an attack. I have spies in their camps. There's sickness, they say, worse every day. Discipline has gone to rot. The lords are drunk more oft than not, gorging themselves at feasts, telling each other of the riches they'll divide when Myrene falls, squabbling over primacy. Bloodbeard and the tattered prince despise each other. No one expects a fight, not now. Hisdar's peace has lulled us to sleep, they believe. Daenerys signed that peace, Ser Barristan said. It is not for us to break it without her leave. And if she is dead? demanded Skahaz. What then, sir? I say she would want us to protect her city, her children. Her children were the freedmen. Mysa, they called her, all those whose chains she broke. Mother. The shavepate was not wrong. Daenerys would want her children protected. What of Hisdar? He is still her consort, her king, her husband. Her poisoner. Is he? Where is your proof? The crown he wears is proof enough. The throne he sits. Open your eyes, old man. That is all he needed from Daenerys, all he ever wanted. Once he had it, why share the rule? Why, indeed. It had been so hot down in the pit. He could still see the air shimmering above the scarlet sands, smell the blood spilling from the men who died for their amusement. And he could still hear his dar urging his queen to try the honeyed locusts. Those are very tasty, sweet and hot, yet he never touched so much as one himself. Selmy rubbed his temple. I swore no vows to Hisdar Zolorak. 
and if I had, he has cast me aside just as Joffrey did. This... this confectioner? I want to question him myself. Alone. Is it that way? The shave pate crossed his arms against his chest. Done, then. Question him as you like. If... if what he has to say convinces me, if I join with you in this... this... I would require your word that no harm would come to his Darzo Lorak until... unless it can be proved that he had some part in this. Why do you care so much for his dar, old man? If he is not the harpy, he is the harpy's firstborn son. All I know for certain is that he is the queen's consort. I want your word on this, or I swear I shall oppose you. Skahaz's smile was savage. My word, then. No harm to his dar till his guilt is proved. But when we have the proof, I mean to kill him with my own hands. I want to pull his entrails out and show them to him before I let him die. No, the old knight thought. If Hisdar conspired at my queen's death, I will see to him myself, but his death will be swift and clean. The gods of Westeros were far away, yet Ser Barrist and Selmy paused for a moment to say a silent prayer, asking the crone to light his way to wisdom. For the children, he told himself, for the city, for my queen. I will talk to Grey Worm, he said. The Iron Suitor Grief appeared alone at daybreak, her black sails stark against the pale pink skies of morning. Fifty-four, Victarion thought sourly when they woke him, and she sails alone. Silently, he cursed the storm god for his malice, his rage a black stone in his belly. Where are my ships? He had set sail from the shields with ninety-three of the hundred that had once made up the iron fleet, a fleet belonging not to a single lord but to the sea-stone chair itself, captained and crewed by men from all the islands. Ships smaller than the great war dromans of the Greenlands, aye, but thrice the size of any common longship, with deep hulls and savage rams fit to meet the king's own fleets in battle. In the stepstones they had taken on grain and game and fresh water, after the long voyage along the bleak and barren coast of Dorne with its shoals and whirlpools. There the Iron Victory had captured a fat merchant ship, the great cog Noble Lady, on her way to Old Town by way of Gulltown, Duskendale, and King's Landing, with a cargo of salt cod, whale oil, and pickled herring. The food was a welcome addition to their stores. Five other prizes taken in the Red Wine Straits and along the Dornish coast, three cogs, a galleus, and a galley, had brought their numbers to ninety-nine. Nine and ninety ships had left the stepstones in three proud fleets, with orders to join up again off the southern tip of the Isle of Cedars. Forty-five had now arrived on the far side of the world, Twenty-two of Victarion's own had straggled in, by threes and fours, sometimes alone. Fourteen of Ralph the Limpers, only nine of those that had sailed with Red Ralph Stonehouse. Red Ralph himself was amongst the missing. To their number the fleet had added nine new prizes taken on the seas, so the sum was fifty-four. But the captured ships were cogs and fishing boats, merchantmen and slavers, not warships. In battle they would be poor substitutes for the lost ships of the Iron Fleet. The last ship to appear had been the Maiden's Bane, three days previous. The day before that, three ships had come out of the south together, his captive noble lady, lumbering along between Raven Feeder and Iron Kiss. But the day before and the day before there had been nothing, and only Headless Jane and Fear before that, then two more days of empty seas and cloudless skies after Ralph the Limper appeared with the remnants of his squadron. Lord Quellen, White Widow, Lamentation, Woe, Leviathan, Iron Lady, Reaper's Wind, and Warhammer, with six more ships behind, two of them storm-racked and under tow. Storms, Ralph the Limper had muttered when he came crawling to Victarion. Three big storms and foul winds between. 
Red winds out of Valeria that smelled of ash and brimstone, and black winds that drove us toward that blighted shore. This voyage was cursed from the first. The crow's eye fears you, my lord. Why else send you so far away? He does not mean for us to return. Victarion had thought the same when he met the first storm a day out of old Volantis. The gods hate kinslayers, he brooded. Elsewise Euron Crow's eye would have died a dozen deaths by my hand. As the sea crashed around him and the deck rose and fell beneath his feet, he had seen Dagon's feast and red tide slammed together so violently that both exploded into splinters. My brother's work, he'd thought. Those were the first two ships he'd lost from his own third of the fleet, but not the last. So he had slapped the limper twice across the face and said, The first is for the ships you lost, the second for your talk of curses. Speak of that again and I will nail your tongue to the mast. If the crow's eye can make mutes, so can I. The throb of pain in his left hand made the words harsher than they might have been elsewise, but he meant what he said. More ships will come. The storms are done for now. I will have my fleet. A monkey on the mast above howled derision, almost as if it could taste his frustration. Filthy, noisy beast. He could send a man up after it, but the monkeys seemed to like that game, and had proved themselves more agile than his crew. The howls rang in his ears, though, and made the throbbing in his hand seem worse. Fifty-four, he grumbled. It would have been too much to hope for the full strength of the Iron Fleet after a voyage of such length, but seventy ships, even eighty, the drowned god might have granted him that much. Would that we had the damn fare with us, or some other priest. Victarion had made sacrifice before setting sail, and again in the stepstones when he split the fleet in three, but perhaps he had said the wrong prayers. That or the drowned god has no power here. More and more he had come to fear that they had sailed too far, into strange seas where even the gods were queer, but such doubts he confided only to his dusky woman, who had no tongue to repeat them. When grief appeared, Victarion summoned Wolf One Ear. I will want words with the Vole. Send word to Ralph the Limper, Bloodless Tom, and the Black Shepherd. All hunting parties are to be recalled, the shore camps broken up by first light. Load as much fruit as can be gathered and drive the pigs aboard the ships. We can slaughter them at need. Shark is to remain here to tell any stragglers where we've gone. She would need that long to make repairs. The storms had left her little more than a hulk. That would bring them down to fifty-three, but there was no help for it. The fleet departs upon the morrow, on the evening tide. As you command, said Wolf. But another day might mean another ship, Lord Captain. Aye, and ten days might mean ten ships, or none at all. We have squandered too many days waiting on the sight of sails. Our victory will be that much the sweeter if we win it with a smaller fleet. And I must needs reach the Dragon Queen before the Volantines. In Volantis he had seen the galleys taking on provisions. The whole city had seemed drunk. Sailors and soldiers and tinkers had been observed dancing in the streets with nobles and fat merchants, and in every inn and wine sink cups were being raised to the new triarchs. All the talk had been of the gold and gems and slaves that would flood into Volantis once the Dragon Queen was dead. One day of such reports was all that Victarion Greyjoy could stomach. He paid the gold price for food and water, though it shamed him, and took his ships back out to sea. The storms would have scattered and delayed the Volantines, even as they had his own ships. If fortune smiled, many of their warships might have sunk or run aground. But not all. No god was that good, and those green galleys that survived by now could well have sailed around Valyria. They will be sweeping north toward Myrene and Yunkai, great dromans of war teeming with slave soldiers. If the storm god spared them, by now they could be in the Gulf of Grief. Three hundred ships, perhaps as many as five hundred. Their allies were already off Myrene, Yunkish men and Astapors, men from Nugis and Karth and Tolos and the storm god knew where else, even Myrene's own warships, the ones that fled the city before its fall. Against all that, 
Victarion had four and fifty. Three and fifty, less the shark. The crow's eye had sailed halfway across the world, reaving and plundering from Carth to Tall Trees Town, calling at unholy ports beyond where only madmen went. Euron had even braved the smoking sea and lived to tell of it. And that with only one ship. If he can mock the gods, so can I. Aye, Captain, said Wolf One Ear. He was not half the man that Newt the Barber was, but the crow's eye had stolen Newt. By raising him to Lord of Oakenshield, his brother made Victarion's best man his own. Is it still to be Mirin? Where else? The Dragon Queen awaits me in Mirin. The fairest woman in the world, if my brother could be believed. Her hair is silver gold, her eyes are amethysts. Was it too much to hope that for once Euron had told it true? Perhaps. Like as not, the girl would prove to be some pock-faced slattern with teats slapping against her knees, her dragons no more than tattooed lizards from the swamps of Sothorios. If she is all that Euron claims, though. They had heard talk of the beauty of Daenerys Targaryen from the lips of pirates in the Stepstones and fat merchants in old Volantis. It might be true. And Euron had not made Victarion a gift of her. The crow's eye meant to take her for himself. He sends me like a serving man to fetch her. How he will howl when I claim her for myself. Let the men mutter. They had sailed too far and lost too much for Victarion to turn west without his prize. The iron captain closed his good hand into a fist. Go see that my commands are carried out, and find the maester wherever he is hiding and send him to my cabin. I, Wolf hobbled off. Victarion Greyjoy turned back toward the prow, his gaze sweeping across his fleet. Long ships filled the sea, sails furled and oars shipped, floating at anchor or run up on the pale sand shore. The Isle of Cedars. Where were these cedars? Drowned four hundred years ago, it seemed. Victarion had gone ashore a dozen times, hunting fresh meat, and had yet to see a cedar. The girlish maester Euron had inflicted upon him back in Westeros claimed this place had once been called the Isle of a Hundred Battles, but the men who had fought those battles had all gone to dust centuries ago. The Isle of Monkeys, that's what they should call it. There were pigs as well, the biggest, blackest boars that any of the ironborn had ever seen, and plenty of squealing piglets in the brush, bold creatures that had no fear of man. They were learning, though. The larders of the Iron Fleet were filling up with smoked hams, salted pork, and bacon. The monkeys, though, the monkeys were a plague. Victarion had forbidden his men to bring any of the demonic creatures aboard ship, yet somehow half his fleet was now infested with them, even his own Iron Victory. He could see some now, swinging from spar to spar and ship to ship. Would that I had a crossbow! Victarion did not like this sea, nor these endless cloudless skies, nor the blazing sun that beat down on their heads and baked the decks until the boards were hot enough to scorch bare feet. He did not like these storms, which seemed to come up out of nowhere. The seas around Pike were often stormy, but there at least a man could smell them coming. These southrun storms were as treacherous as women. Even the water was the wrong color, a shimmering turquoise close to shore, and farther out a blue so deep that it was almost black. Victarion missed the gray-green waters of home with their white caps and surges. He did not like this Isle of Cedars, either. The hunting might be good, but the forests were too green and still, full of twisted trees and queer bright flowers like none his men had ever seen before and there were horrors lurking amongst the broken palaces and shattered statues of drowned Velos, half a league north of the point where the fleet lay at anchor. The last time Victarion had spent a night ashore, his dreams had been dark and disturbing, and when he woke his mouth was full of blood. The maester said he had bitten his own tongue in his sleep, but he took it for a sign from the drowned god, a warning that if he lingered here too long he would choke on his own blood. On the day the doom came to Valyria, it was said, a wall of water three hundred feet high had descended on the island, 
drowning hundreds of thousands of men, women, and children, leaving none to tell the tale but some fisher folk who had been at sea, and a handful of Velosi spearmen posted in a stout stone tower on the island's highest hill, who had seen the hills and valleys beneath them turn into a raging sea. Fair Vilos, with its palaces of cedar and pink marble, had vanished in a heartbeat. On the north end of the island, the ancient brick walls and stepped pyramids of the slaver port Gozai had suffered the same fate. So many drowned men, the drowned god will be strong there, Victarion had thought when he chose the island for the three parts of his fleet to join up again. He was no priest, though. What if he had gotten it backward? Perhaps the drowned god had destroyed the island in his wrath. His brother Aaron might have known, but the damfair was back on the Iron Islands, preaching against the crow's eye and his rule. No godless man may sit in the sea-stone chair. Yet the captains and kings had cried for Euron at the king's moot, choosing him above Victarion and other godly men. The morning sun was shining off the water in ripples of light too bright to look upon, Victarion's head had begun to pound, though whether from the sun, his hand, or the doubts that troubled him, he could not say. He made his way below to his cabin, where the air was cool and dim. The dusky woman knew what he wanted without his even asking. As he eased himself into his chair, she took a soft, damp cloth from the basin and laid it across his brow. Good, he said. Good. And now the hand. The dusky woman made no reply. Euron had sliced her tongue out before giving her to him. Victarion did not doubt that the crow's eye had bedded her as well. That was his brother's way. Euron's gifts are poisoned, the captain had reminded himself the day the dusky woman came aboard. I want none of his leavings. He had decided then that he would slit her throat and toss her in the sea, a blood sacrifice to the drowned god. Somehow, though, he had never quite gotten around to it. They had come a long way since. Victarion could talk to the dusky woman. She never attempted to talk back. Grief is the last, he told her, as she eased his glove off. The rest are lost or laid or sunk. He grimaced as the woman slid the point of her knife beneath the soiled linen wound about his shield hand. Some will say I should not have split the fleet fools. Nine and ninety ships we had, a cumbersome beast to shepherd across the seas to the far end of the world. If I'd kept them together, the faster ships would have been held hostage to the slowest. And where to find provisions for so many mouths? No port wants so many warships in their waters. The storms would have scattered us in any case, like leaves strewn across the summer sea. Instead, he had broken the great fleet into squadrons, and sent each by a different route to Slaver's Bay. The swiftest ships he gave to Red Ralph Stonehouse to sail the Corsair's Road along the northern coast of Sothorius. The dead cities rotting on that fervid, sweltering shore were best avoided, every seaman knew. But in the mud and blood towns of the Basilisk's Isles, teeming with escaped slaves, slavers, skinners, whores, hunters, brindled men, and worse, there were always provisions to be had for men who were not afraid to pay the iron price. The larger, heavier, slower ships made for Lys, to sell the captives taken on the shields, the women and children of Lord Hewitt's town and other islands, along with such men who decided they would sooner yield than die. Victarion had only contempt for such weaklings. Even so, the selling left a foul taste in his mouth, Taking a man as thrall or a woman as a salt wife, that was right and proper. But men were not goats or fowl to be bought and sold for gold. He was glad to leave the selling to Ralph the Limper, who would use the coin to load his big ships with provisions for the long, slow middle passage east. His own ships crept along the shores of the disputed lands to take on food and wine and fresh water at Volantis before swinging south around Valyria. That was the most common way east, and the one most heavily trafficked, with prizes for the taking and small islands where they could shelter during storms, make repairs, and renew their stores if need be. Four and fifty ships is too few, he told the dusky woman. But I can wait no longer. The only way... 
he grunted as she peeled the bandage off, tearing a crust of scab as well. The flesh beneath was green and black where the sword had sliced him. The only way to do this is to take the slavers unawares, as once I did at Lannisport. Sweep in from the sea and smash them, then take the girl and race for home before the Volantines descend upon us. Victarion was no craven, but no more was he a fool. He could not defeat three hundred ships with fifty-four. She'll be my wife, and you will be her maid. A maid without a tongue could never let slip any secrets. He might have said more, but that was when the maester came, rapping at the cabin door as timid as a mouse. Enter, Victarion called out, and bar the door. You know why you are here. Lord Captain? The maester looked like a mouse as well, with his gray robes and little brown mustachio. Does he think that makes him look more manly? Kerwin was his name. He was very young, two and twenty maybe. May I see your hand? he asked. A fool's question. Maesters had their uses, but Victarion had nothing but contempt for this Kerwin. With his smooth pink cheeks, soft hands, and brown curls, he looked more girlish than most girls. When first he came aboard the Iron Victory, he had a smirky little smile, too, but one night off the stepstones he had smiled at the wrong man, and Burton Humble had knocked out four of his teeth. Not long after that, Kerwin had come creeping to the captain to complain that four of the crew had dragged him below decks and used him as a woman. Here is how you put an end to that, Victarion had told him, slamming a dagger down on the table between them. Kerwin took the blade, too afraid to refuse it, the captain judged, but he had never used it. My hand is here, Victarion said. Look all you like. Maester Kerwin went down to one knee, the better to inspect the wound. He even sniffed at it like a dog. I will need to let the pus again. The color. Lord Captain, the cut is not healing. It may be that I will need to take your hand. They had talked of this before. If you take my hand, I will kill you. But first I will tie you over the rail and make the crew a gift of your arse. Get on with it. There will be pain. Always. Life is pain, you fool. There is no joy but in the drowned god's watery halls. Do it. The boy, it was hard to think of one so soft and pink as a man, laid the edge of the dagger across the captain's palm and slashed. The pus that burst forth was thick and yellow as sour milk. The dusky woman wrinkled her nose at the smell, the maester gagged, and even Victarion himself felt his stomach churn. Cut deeper. Get it all. Show me the blood. Maester Kerwin pressed the dagger deep. This time it hurt, but blood welled up as well as pus, blood so dark that it looked black in the lantern light. Blood was good. Victarion grunted in approval. He sat there unflinching as the maester dabbed and squeezed and cleaned the pus away with squares of soft cloth boiled in vinegar. By the time he finished, the clean water in his basin had become a scummy soup. The sight alone would sicken any man. Take that filth and go. Victarion nodded at the dusky woman. She can bind me up. Even after the boy had fled, the stink remained. Of late, there was no escaping it. The maester had suggested that the wound might best be drained up on deck amidst fresh air and sunlight, but Victarion forbade it. This was not something that his crew could see. They were half a world away from home, too far to let them see that their iron captain had begun to rust. His left hand still throbbed, a dull pain but persistent. When he closed his hand into a fist, it sharpened, as if a knife were stabbing up his arm. Not a knife, a longsword, a longsword in the hand of a ghost. Sari, that had been his name, a knight and heir to South Shield. I killed him, but he stabs at me from beyond the grave. From the hot heart of whatever hell I sent him to, he thrusts his steel into my hand and twists. Victarion remembered the fight as if it had been yesterday. His shield had been in shards, 
hanging useless from his arm, so when Ceres' long sword came flashing down, he had reached up and caught it. The stripling had been stronger than he looked. His blade bit through the lobstered steel of the captain's gauntlet and the padded glove beneath into the meat of his palm. A scratch from a little kitten, Victarion told himself afterward. He had washed the cut, poured some boiled vinegar over it, bound it up, and thought little more of it, trusting that the pain would fade and the hand heal itself in time. Instead, the wound had festered, until Victarion began to wonder whether Ceres' blade had been poisoned. Why else would the cut refuse to heal? The thought made him rage. No true man killed with poison. At Moat Kalin, the bog devils had loosed poisoned arrows at his men, but that was to be expected from such degraded creatures. Sari had been a knight, highborn. Poison was for cravens, women, and Dornishmen. If not Sari, who? he asked the dusky woman. Could that mouse of a maester be doing this? Maesters know spells and other tricks. He might be using one to poison me, hoping I will let him cut my hand off. The more he thought on it, the more likely it seemed. The crow's eye gave him to me, wretched creature that he is. Euron had taken Kerwin off Greenshield, where he had been in service to Lord Chester, tending his ravens and teaching his children, or perhaps the other way around, and how the mouse had squealed when one of Euron's mutes delivered him aboard the Iron Victory, dragging him along by the convenient chain about his neck. If this is his revenge, he wrongs me. It was Euron who insisted he be taken, to keep him from making mischief with his birds. His brother had given him three cages of ravens, too, so Kerwin could send back word of their voyaging, but Victarion had forbidden him to loose them. Let the crow's eye stew and wonder. The dusky woman was binding his hand with fresh linen, wrapping it six times around his palm, when Longwater Pike came pounding at the cabin door to tell him that the captain of grief had come aboard with a prisoner. "'Says he's brought us a wizard, captain,' says he fished him from the sea. A wizard? Could the drowned god have sent a gift to him, here on the far side of the world? His brother Aaron could have known, but Aaron had seen the majesty of the drowned god's watery halls below the sea before being returned to life. Victarion had a healthy fear of his god, as all men should, but put his faith in steel. He flexed his wounded hand, grimacing, then pulled his glove on and rose. Show me this wizard. Grief's master awaited them on deck. A small man, as hairy as he was homely, he was a spar by birth. His men called him the Vole. Lord Captain, he said when Victarion appeared, this is Makoro, a gift to us from the drowned god. The wizard was a monster of a man, as tall as Victarion himself and twice as wide, with a belly like a boulder and a tangle of bone-white hair that grew about his face like a lion's mane. His skin was black, not the nut-brown of the summer islanders on their swan ships, nor the red-brown of the Dothraki horse lords, nor the charcoal and earth color of the dusky woman's skin, but black, blacker than coal, blacker than jet, blacker than a raven's wing. Burned, Victarion thought like a man who has been roasted in the flames until his flesh chars and crisps and falls smoking from his bones. The fires that had charred him still danced across his cheeks and forehead, where his eyes peered out from amongst a mask of frozen flames. Slave tattoos, the captain knew. Marks of evil. We found him clinging to a broken spar, said the vole. He was ten days in the water after his ship went down. If he were ten days in the water, he'd be dead, or mad from drinking seawater. Salt water was holy. Aaron Damphair and other priests might bless men with it and swallow a mouthful or two from time to time to strengthen their faith, but no mortal man could drink of the deep sea for days at a time and hope to live. You claim to be a sorcerer? Victarion asked the prisoner. No, Captain, the black man answered in the common tongue. His voice was so deep it seemed to come from the bottom of the sea. I am but a humble slave of Rohalor, the Lord of Light. Rohalor, a red priest, then. 
Victarion had seen such men in foreign cities, tending their sacred fires. Those had worn rich red robes of silk and velvet and lamb's wool. This one was dressed in faded, salt-stained rags that clung to his thick legs and hung about his torso in tatters, but when the captain peered at the rags more closely, it did appear as if they might once have been red. A pink priest, Victarion announced. A demon priest, said Wolf One Ear. He spat. Might be his robes caught fire, so he jumped overboard to put them out, suggested Longwater Pike to general laughter. Even the monkeys were amused. They chattered overhead, and one flung down a handful of his own shit to spatter on the boards. Victarion Greyjoy mistrusted laughter. The sound of it always left him with the uneasy feeling that he was the butt of some jape he did not understand. Euron Crow's eye had oft made mock of him when they were boys. So had Aaron, before he had become the damn fair. Their mockery oft came disguised as praise, and sometimes Victarion had not even realized he was being mocked. Not until he heard the laughter. Then came the anger, boiling up in the back of his throat until he was like to choke upon the taste. That was how he felt about the monkeys. Their antics never brought so much as a smile to the captain's face, though his crew would roar and hoot and whistle. Send him down to the drowned god before he brings a curse upon us, urged Burton Humble. A ship gone down and only him clinging to the wreckage, said Wolf One Ear. Where's the crew? Did he call down demons to devour them? What happened to this ship? A storm. Makoro crossed his arms against his chest. He did not appear frightened, though all around him men were calling for his death. Even the monkeys did not seem to like this wizard. They leapt from line to line overhead, screaming. Victarion was uncertain. He came out of the sea. Why would the drowned god cast him up unless he meant for us to find him? His brother Euron had his pet wizards. Perhaps the drowned god meant for Victarion to have one too. Why do you say this man is a wizard? He asked the vole. I see only a ragged red priest. I thought the same, Lord Captain. But he knows things. He knew that we made for Slaver's Bay before any man could tell him, and he knew you would be here off this island. The small man hesitated. Lord Captain, he told me... He told me you would surely die unless we brought him to you. That I would die? Victarion snorted. Cut his throat and throw him in the sea, he was about to say until a throb of pain in his bad hand went stabbing up his arm almost to the elbow, the agony so intense that his words turned to bile in his throat. He stumbled and seized the rail to keep from falling. "'The sorcerers cursed the captain,' a voice said. Other men took up the cry. "'Cut his throat! Kill him before he calls his demons down on us!' Longwater Pike was the first to draw his dirk. "'No!' Victarion bellowed. Stand back, all of you. Pike, put up your steel. Vol, back to your ship. Humble, take the wizard to my cabin. The rest of you about your duties. For half a heartbeat, he was not certain they would obey. They stood about muttering, half with blades to hand, each looking to the others for resolve. Monkey shit rained down around them all. Splat, splat, splat. No one moved until Victarion seized the sorcerer by the arm and pulled him to the hatchway. As he opened the door to the captain's cabin, the dusky woman turned toward him, silent and smiling, but when she saw the red priest at his side, her lips drew back from her teeth, and she hissed in sudden fury, like a snake. Victarion gave her the back of his good hand and knocked her to the deck. Be quiet, woman. Wine for both of us. He turned to the black man. Did the vole speak true? You saw my death? That and more. Where? When? Will I die in battle? His good hand opened and closed. If you lie to me, I will split your head open like a melon and let the monkeys eat your brains. Your death is with us now, my lord. Give me your hand. My hand. What do you know of my hand? 
I have seen you in the night fires, Victorian Greyjoy. You come striding through the flames, stern and fierce, your great axe dripping blood, blind to the tentacles that grasp you at wrist and neck and ankle, the black strings that make you dance. Dance? Victarion bristled. Your night fires lie. I was not made for dancing, and I am no man's puppet. He yanked off his glove and shoved his bad hand at the priest's face. Here, is this what you wanted? The new linen was already discolored by blood and pus. He had a rose on his shield, the man who gave this to me. I scratched my hand on a thorn. Even the smallest scratch can prove mortal, Lord Captain. But if you will allow me, I will heal this. I will need a blade. Silver would be best, but iron will serve. A brazier as well. I must needs light a fire. There will be pain. Terrible pain, such as you have never known. But when we are done, your hand will be returned to you. They are all the same, these magic men. The mouse warned me of pain as well. I am iron-born priest. I laugh at pain. You will have what you require. But if you fail, and my hand is not healed, I will cut your throat myself and give you to the sea. Makoro bowed, his dark eyes shining. So be it. The Iron Captain was not seen again that day, but as the hours passed, the crew of his Iron Victory reported hearing the sound of wild laughter coming from the Captain's cabin, laughter deep and dark and mad, and when Longwater Pike and Wolf One-Eye tried the cabin door, they found it barred. Later singing was heard, a strange high wailing song in a tongue the maester said was High Valyrian. That was when the monkeys left the ship, screeching as they leapt into the water. Come sunset, as the sea turned black as ink and the swollen sun tinted the sky a deep and bloody red, Victarion came back on deck. He was naked from the waist up, his left arm blood to the elbow. As his crew gathered, whispering and trading glances, he raised a charred and blackened hand. Wisps of dark smoke rose from his fingers as he pointed at the maester. That one. Cut his throat and throw him in the sea, and the winds will favor us all the way to Mirin. Makoro had seen that in his fires. He had seen the wench wed too, but what of it? She would not be the first woman Victorian Greyjoy had made a widow. Tyrion the healer entered the tent murmuring pleasantries, but one sniff of the foul air and a glance at Yezanzo Kagaz put an end to that. The pale mare, the man told Sweets. What a surprise, Tyrion thought. Who could have guessed? Aside from any man with a nose and me with half of one. Yezan was burning with fever, squirming fitfully in a pool of his own excrement. His shit had turned to brown slime streaked with blood, and it fell to Yolo and Penny to wipe his yellow bottom clean. Even with assistance, their master could not lift his own weight. It took all his failing strength to roll onto one side. My arts will not avail here, the healer announced. The noble Yazan's life is in the hands of the gods. Keep him cool if you can. Some say that helps. Bring him water. Those afflicted by the pale mare were always thirsty, drinking gallons between their shits. Clean fresh water, as much as he will drink. Not river water, said Sweets. By no means. And with that, the healer fled. We need to flee as well, thought Tyrion. He was a slave in a golden collar, with little bells that tinkled cheerfully with every step he took. One of Yezan's special treasures, an honor indistinguishable from a death warrant. Yezanzo Kagaz liked to keep his darlings close, so it had fallen to Yolo and Penny and Sweets and his other treasures to attend him when he grew sick. Poor old Yezan. The Lord of Suet was not so bad as masters went. Sweets had been right about that. Serving at his nightly banquets, Tyrion had soon learned that Yezan stood foremost amongst those Yunkish lords who favored honoring the peace with Mirin. Most of the others were only biding their time, waiting for the armies of Volantis to arrive. 
A few wanted to assault the city immediately, lest the Volantines rob them of their glory and the best part of the plunder. Yazan would have no part of that, nor would he consent to returning Mirin's hostages by way of trebuchet, as the sellsword Bloodbeard had proposed. But much and more can change in two days. Two days ago Nurse had been hale and healthy. Two days ago Yezan had not heard the pale mare's ghostly hoofbeats. Two days ago the fleets of old Volantis had been two days farther off. And now... Is Yezan going to die? Penny asked, in that please-say-it-is-not-so voice of hers. We are all going to die. Of the flux, I meant. Sweets gave them both a desperate look. Yezan must not die. The hermaphrodite stroked the brow of their gargantuan master, pushing back his sweat-damp hair. The yunkish man moaned, and another flood of brown water gushed down his legs. His bedding was stained and stinking, but they had no way to move him. Some masters free their slaves when they die, said Penny. Sweets tittered. It was a ghastly sound. Only favorites. They free them from the woes of the world to accompany their beloved master to the grave and serve him in the afterlife. Sweets should know. His will be the first throat slit. The goat boy spoke up. The Silver Queen is dead, insisted Sweets. Forget her. The dragon took her across the river. She's drowned in that Dothraki sea. You can't drown in grass, the goat boy said. If we were free said Penny. We could find the queen, or go search for her at least. You on your dog and me on my sow, chasing a dragon across the Dothraki Sea. Tyrion scratched his scar to keep from laughing. This particular dragon has already evinced a fondness for roast pork, and roast dwarf is twice as tasty. It was just a wish, said Penny wistfully. We could sail away. There are ships again now that the war is over. Is it? Tyrion was inclined to doubt that. Parchments had been signed, but wars were not fought on parchments. We could sail to Carth, Penny went on. The streets are paved with jade there, my brother always said. The city walls are one of the wonders of the world. When we perform in Carth, gold and silver will rain down on us, you'll see. Some of those ships out on the bay are Carthine, Tyrion reminded her. Lomas Longstrider saw the walls of Carth. His books suffice for me. I have gone as far east as I intend to go. Sweet stabbed at Yezan's fevered face with a damp cloth. Yezan must live, or we all die with him. The pale mare does not carry off every rider. The master will recover. That was a bald-faced lie. It would be a wonder if Yezan lived another day. The Lord of Suet was already dying from whatever hideous disease he had brought back from Sothorios, it seemed to Tyrion. This would just hasten his end. A mercy, really. But not the sort the dwarf craved for himself. The healer said he needs fresh water. We will see to that. That is good of you. Sweets sounded numb. It was more than just fear of having her throat cut. Alone amongst Yezan's treasures, she actually seemed fond of their immense master. Penny, come with me. Tyrion opened the tent flap and ushered her out into the heat of a Myrinese morning. The air was muggy and oppressive, yet still a welcome relief from the miasma of sweat, shit, and sickness that filled the inside of Yezan's palatial pavilion. Water will help the master, Penny said. That's what the healer said. It must be so. Sweet fresh water. Sweet fresh water didn't help nurse. Poor old nurse. Yazan's soldiers had tossed him onto the corpse wagon last night at dusk, another victim of the pale mare. When men are dying every hour, no one looks too hard at one more dead man, especially one as well despised as nurse. Yazan's other slaves had refused to go near the overseer once the cramps began, so it was left to Tyrion to keep him warm and bring him drinks. Watered wine and lemon sweet and some nice hot dogtail soup with slivers of mushroom in the broth. 
Drink it down, nursey. That shit water squirting from your arse needs to be replaced. The last word nurse ever said was, No. The last words he ever heard were, A Lannister always pays his debts. Tyrion had kept the truth of that from Penny, but she needed to understand how things stood with their master. If Yezan lives to see the sunrise, I'll be stunned. She clutched his arm. What will happen to us? He has heirs, nephews. Four such had come with Yezan from Young Kai to command his slave soldiers. One was dead, slain by Targaryen cell swords during a sortie. The other three would divide the yellow enormities slaves amongst them, like as not. Whether any of the nephews shared Yezan's fondness for cripples, freaks, and grotesques was far less certain. One of them may inherit us, or we can end up back on the auction block. No. Her eyes got big. Not that, please. It is not a prospect I relish either. A few yards away, six of Yezan's slave soldiers were squatting in the dust, throwing the bones and passing a wineskin from hand to hand. One was the sergeant called Scar, a black-tempered brute with a head as smooth as stone and the shoulders of an ox. Clever as an ox, too, Tyrion recalled. He waddled toward them. Scar, he barked out. The noble Yezan has need of fresh, clean water. Take two men and bring back as many pails as you can carry, and be quick about it. The soldiers broke off their game. Scar rose to his feet, brow beetling. What did you say, dwarf? Who do you think you are? You know who I am. Yalo, one of our lord's treasures. Now do as I told you. The soldiers laughed. Go on, Scar, one mocked, and be quick about it. Yezan's monkey gave you a command. You do not tell soldiers what to do, Scar said. Soldiers? Tyrion affected puzzlement. Slaves is what I see. You wear a collar round your neck the same as me. The savage backhand blow Scar dealt him knocked him to the ground and broke his lip. Yezan's collar, not yours. Tyrion wiped the blood from his split lip with the back of his hand. When he tried to rise, one leg went out from under him, and he stumbled back onto his knees. He needed Penny's help to regain his feet. Sweet said the master must have water, he said in his best wine. Sweets can go fuck himself. He's made for it. We don't take commands from that freak neither. No, thought Tyrion. Even amongst slaves there were lords and peasants, as he had been quick to learn. The hermaphrodite had long been their master's special pet, indulged and favored, and the noble Yezhan's other slaves hated him for it. The soldiers were accustomed to taking their commands from their masters and their overseer, but Nurse was dead and Yezhan too sick to name a successor. As for the three nephews, those brave free men had remembered urgent business elsewhere at the first sound of the pale mare's hooves. The water, said Tyrion, cringing. Not river water, the healer said. Clean, fresh well water. Scar grunted. You go for it, and be quick about it. Us? Tyrion exchanged a hopeless glance with Penny. Water's heavy. We're not so strong as you. Can we... can we take the mule cart? Take your legs. We'll need to make a dozen trips. Make a hundred trips. It's no shit to me. Just the two of us. We won't be able to carry all the water that the master needs. Take your bear, suggested Scar. Fetching water is about all that one is good for. Tyrion backed away. As you say, master... Scar grinned. Master. Oh, he liked that. Morgo, bring the keys. You fill the pails and come right back, dwarf. You know what happens to slaves who try to escape. Bring the pails, Tyrion told Penny. He went off with the man Morgo to fetch Ser Jora Mormont from his cage. The knight had not adapted well to bondage. 
when called upon to play the bear and carry off the maiden fair, he had been sullen and uncooperative, shuffling lifelessly through his paces when he deigned to take part in their mummery at all. Though he had not attempted escape, nor offered violence to his captors, he would ignore their commands oft as not, or reply with muttered curses. None of this had amused Nurse, who made his displeasure clear by confining Mormont in an iron cage and having him beaten every evening as the sun sank into Slaver's Bay. The night absorbed the beatings silently. The only sounds were the muttered curses of the slaves who beat him and the dull thuds of their clubs pounding against Ser Jorah's bruised and battered flesh. The man is a shell, Tyrion thought, the first time he saw the big knight beaten. I should have held my tongue and let Tsarina have him. It might have been a kinder fate than this. Mormont emerged from the cramped confines of the cage, bent and squinting, with both eyes blackened and his back crusty with dried blood. His face was so bruised and swollen that he hardly looked human. He was naked except for a breech clout, a filthy bit of yellow rag. You ought to help them carry water, Morgo told him. Ser Jorah's only reply was a sullen stare. Some men would sooner die free than live a slave, I suppose. Tyrion was not stricken with that affliction himself, thankfully, but if Mormont murdered Morgo, the other slaves might not draw that distinction. Come, he said, before the knight did something brave and stupid. He waddled off and hoped Mormont would follow. The gods were good for once. Mormont followed. Two pails for Penny, two for Tyrion, and four for Ser Jorah, two in either hand. The nearest well was south and west of the Harridan, so they set off in that direction, the bells on their collars ringing merrily with every step. No one paid them any mind. They were just slaves fetching water for their master. Wearing a collar conferred certain advantages, particularly a gilded collar inscribed with the name of Yezenzo Kagaz. The chime of those little bells proclaimed their value to anyone with ears. A slave was only as important as his master. Yezen was the richest man in the Yellow City, and had brought six hundred slave soldiers to the war, even if he did look like a monstrous yellow slug and smell of piss. Their collars gave them leave to go anywhere they might wish within the camp. Until Yezan dies. The clanker lords had their slave soldiers drilling in the nearest field. The clatter of the chains that bound them made a harsh metallic music as they marched across the sand in lockstep and formed up with their long spears. Elsewhere, teams of slaves were raising ramps of stone and sand beneath their mangonels and scorpions, angling them upward at the sky, the better to defend the camp should the black dragon return. It made the dwarf smile to see them sweating and cursing as they wrestled the heavy machines onto the inclines. Crossbows were much in evidence as well. Every other man seemed to be clutching one, with a quiver full of bolts hanging from his hip. If anyone had thought to ask him, Tyrion could have told them not to bother. Unless one of those long iron scorpion bolts chanced to find an eye, the queen's pet monster was not like to be brought down by such toys. Dragons are not so easy to kill as that. Tickle him with these and you'll only make him angry. The eyes were where a dragon was most vulnerable, the eyes and the brain behind them, not the underbelly, as certain old tales would have it. The scales there were just as tough as those along a dragon's back and flanks, and not down the gullet either, that was madness. These would-be dragon slayers might as well try to quench a fire with a spear thrust. Death comes out of the dragon's mouth, Septon Barth had written in his Unnatural History, but death does not go in that way. Farther on, two legions from New Gis were facing off shield wall to shield wall, whilst sergeants in iron half-helms with horsehair crests screamed commands in their own incomprehensible dialect. To the naked eye, the Giscari looked more formidable than the Yunkish slave soldiers, but Tyrion nursed doubts. The legionaries might be armed and organized in the same manner as Unsullied, but the eunuchs knew no other life, whereas the Giscari were free citizens who served for three-year terms. The line at the well stretched back a quarter mile. 
There were only a handful of wells within a day's march of Mirene, so the wait was always long. Most of the Yunkish host drew their drinking water from the Skahazadan, which Tyrian had known was a very bad idea even before the healer's warning. The clever ones took care to stay upstream of the latrines, but they were still downstream of the city. The fact that there were any good wells at all within a day's march of the city only went to prove that Daenerys Targaryen was still an innocent where siegecraft was concerned. She should have poisoned every well. Then all the Yunkish men would be drinking from the river. See how long their siege lasts then. That was what his lord father would have done, Tyrion did not doubt. Every time they shuffled forward another place, the bells on their collars tinkled brightly. Such a happy sound, it makes me want to scoop out someone's eyeballs with a spoon. By now Griff and Duck and Halden Halfmaester should be in Westeros with their young prince. I should be with them. But no, I had to have a whore. Kin-slaying was not enough. I needed cunt and wine to seal my ruin. And here I am on the wrong side of the world, wearing a slave collar with little golden bells to announce my coming. If I dance just right, maybe I can ring the reins of Castamir. There was no better place to hear the latest news and rumors than around the well. I know what I saw an old slave in a rusted iron collar was saying, as Tyrion and Penny shuffled along in the queue. And I saw that dragon ripping off arms and legs, tearing men in half, burning them down to ash and bones. People started running, trying to get out of that pit, but I come to see a show, and by all the gods of Gis I saw one. I was up in the purple, so I didn't think the dragon was like to trouble me. The queen climbed onto the dragon's back and flew away, insisted a tall brown woman. She tried, said the old man, but she couldn't hold on. The crossbows wounded the dragon, and the queen was struck right between her sweet pink teats, I hear. That was when she fell. She died in the gutter, crushed beneath the wagon's wheels. I know a girl who knows a man who saw her die. In this company, silence was the better part of wisdom, but Tyrion could not help himself. No corpse was found, he said. The old man frowned. What would you know about it? They were there, said the brown woman. It's them, the jousting dwarfs, the ones who tilted for the queen. The old man squinted down as if seeing him and Penny for the first time. You're the ones who rode the pigs. Our notoriety precedes us. Tyrion sketched a courtly bow and refrained from pointing out that one of the pigs was really a dog. The sow I ride is actually my sister. We have the same wet nose, could you tell? A wizard cast a spell on her, but if you give her a big wet kiss, she will turn into a beautiful woman. The pity is, once you get to know her, you'll want to kiss her again to turn her back. Laughter erupted all around them. Even the old man joined in. You saw her then, said the red-headed boy behind them. You saw the queen. Is she as beautiful as they say? I saw a slender girl with silvery hair wrapped in a tokar, he might have told them. Her face was veiled, and I never got close enough for a good look. I was riding on a pig. Daenerys Targaryen had been seated in the owner's box beside her Giscari king, but Tyrion's eyes had been drawn to the knight in the white and gold armor behind her. Though his features were concealed, the dwarf would have known Barrist and Selmy anywhere. Illyrio was right about that much, at least he remembered thinking. Will Selmy know me, though? And what will he do if he does? He had almost revealed himself then and there, but something stopped him. Caution, cowardice, instinct, call it what you will. He could not imagine Barristan the Bold greeting him with anything but hostility. Selmy had never approved of James' presence in his precious Kingsguard. Before the rebellion, the old knight thought him too young and untried, Afterward, he had been known to say that the Kingslayer should exchange that white cloak for a black one. And his own crimes were worse. Jame had killed a madman. Tyrion had put a quarrel through the groin of his own sire, a man Ser Barristan had known and served for years. He might have chanced it all the same, but then Penny had landed a blow on his shield and the moment was gone, never to return. The Queen watched his tilt, 
Penny was telling the other slaves in line. But that was the only time we saw her. You must have seen the dragon, said the old man. Would that we had. The gods had not even vouchsafed him that much. As Daenerys Targaryen was taking wing, Nurse had been clapping irons round their ankles to make certain they would not attempt escape on their way back to their master. If the overseer had only taken his leave after delivering them to the abattoir, or fled with the rest of the slavers when the dragon descended from the sky, the two dwarfs might have strolled away free. Or run away, more like, our little bells a-jingle. Was there a dragon? Tyrion said with a shrug. All I know is that no dead queens were found. The old man was not convinced. Ah, they found corpses by the hundred. They dragged them inside the pit and burned them, though half was crisp already. Might be they didn't know her, burned and bloody and crushed. Might be they did, but decided to say elsewise to keep you slaves quiet. Us slaves, said the brown woman. You wear a collar, too. Gazdor's collar, the old man boasted. Known him since we was born. I'm almost like a brother to him. Slaves like you, sweepings out of Astapor and Yunkai, you whine about being free, but I wouldn't give the Dragon Queen my collar if she offered to suck my cock for it. Man has the right master, that's better. Tyrion did not dispute him. The most insidious thing about bondage was how easy it was to grow accustomed to it. The life of most slaves was not all that different from the life of a serving man at Casterly Rock, it seemed to him. True, some slave owners and their overseers were brutal and cruel, but the same was true of some Westerosi lords and their stewards and bailiffs. Most of the young Kai treated their chattels decently enough, so long as they did their jobs and caused no trouble. And this old man in his rusted collar, with his fierce loyalty to Lord Wobblecheeks, his owner, was not at all atypical. Gazdor the Great-Hearted? Tyrion said sweetly. Our master Yezan has often spoken of his wits. What Yezan had actually said was on the order of, I have more wits in the left cheek of my arse than Gazdor and his brothers have between them. He thought it prudent to omit the actual words. Midday had come and gone before he and Penny reached the well, where a scrawny one-legged slave was drawing water. He squinted at them suspiciously. Nurse always comes for Yezan's water with four men in a mule cart. He dropped the bucket down the well once more. There was a soft splash. The one-legged man let the bucket fill, then began to draw it upward. His arms were sunburnt and peeling, scrawny to look at, but all muscle. The mule died, said Tyrion. So did Nurse, poor man. And now Yezan himself has mounted the pale mare, and six of his soldiers have the shits. May I have two pails full? As you like. That was the end of idle talk. Is that hoofbeats you hear? The lie about the soldiers got old one leg moving much more quickly. They started back, each of the dwarfs carrying two brimful pails of sweet water, and Ser Jorah with two pails in each hand. The day was growing hotter, the air as thick and wet as damp wool, and the pails seemed to grow heavier with every step. A long walk on short legs. Water sloshed from his pails with every stride, splashing round his legs, whilst his bells played a marching song. Had I known it would come to this, father, I might have let you live. Half a mile east, a dark plume of smoke was rising where a tent had been set afire, burning last night's dead. This way, Tyrion said, jerking his head to the right. Penny gave him a puzzled look. That's not how we came. We don't want to breathe that smoke. It's full of malign humors. It was not a lie. Not entirely. Penny was soon puffing, struggling with the weight of her pails. I need to rest. As you wish. Tyrion set the pails of water on the ground, grateful for the halt. His legs were cramping badly, so he found himself a likely rock and sat on it to rub his thighs. I could do that for you offered Penny. I know where the knots are. As fond as he had grown of the girl, it still made him uncomfortable when she touched him. He turned to Ser Jorah. 
A few more beatings and you'll be uglier than I am, Mormont. Tell me, is there any fight left in you? The big knight raised two blackened eyes and looked at him as he might look at a bug. Enough to crack your neck, imp. Good. Tyrion picked up his pails. This way, then. Penny wrinkled her brow. No, it's to the left. She pointed. That's the harridan there. And that's the wicked sister. Tyrion nodded in the other direction. Trust me, he said. My way is quicker. He set off, his bells jingling. Penny would follow, he knew. Sometimes he envied the girl all her pretty little dreams. She reminded him of Sansa Stark, the child bride he had wed and lost. Despite the horrors Penny had suffered, she remained somehow trusting. She should know better. She is older than Sansa. And she's a dwarf. She acts as if she has forgotten that, as if she were high-born and fair to look upon, instead of a slave in a grotesquerie. At night Tyrion would oft hear her praying. A waste of words. If there are gods to listen, they are monstrous gods who torment us for their sport. Who else would make a world like this, so full of bondage, blood, and pain? Who else would shape us as they have? Sometimes he wanted to slap her, shake her, scream at her, anything to wake her from her dreams. No one is going to save us, he wanted to scream at her. The worst is yet to come. Yet somehow he could never say the words. Instead of giving her a good hard crack across that ugly face of hers to knock the blinders from her eyes, he would find himself squeezing her shoulder or giving her a hug. Every touch a lie. I have paid her so much false coin that she half thinks she's rich. He had even kept the truth of Daznak's pit from her. Lions. They were going to set lions on us. It would have been exquisitely ironic, that. Perhaps he would have had time for a short, bitter chortle before being torn apart. No one ever told him the end that had been planned for them, not in so many words, but it had not been hard to puzzle out, down beneath the bricks of Daznak's pit, in the hidden world below the seats, the dark domain of the pit fighters and the serving men who tended to them, quick and dead, the cooks who fed them, the ironmongers who armed them, the barber surgeons who bled them and shaved them and bound up their wounds, the whores who serviced them before and after fights, the corpse handlers who dragged the losers off the sands with chains and iron hooks. Nurse's face had given Tyrion his first inkling. After their show, he and Penny had returned to the torchlit vault where the fighters gathered before and after their matches. Some sat sharpening their weapons, others sacrificed to queer gods, or dulled their nerves with milk of the poppy before going out to die. Those who'd fought and won were dicing in a corner, laughing as only men who have just faced death and lived can laugh. Nurse was paying out some silver to a pitman on a lost wager, when he spied Penny leading Crunch. The confusion in his eyes was gone in half a heartbeat, but not before Tyrion grasped what it meant. Nurse did not expect us back. He had looked around at other faces. None of them expected us back. We were meant to die out there. The final piece fell into place when he overheard an animal trainer complaining loudly to the pitmaster. The lions are hungry. Two days since they ate. I was told not to feed them, and I haven't. The queen should pay for meat. You take that up with her the next time she holds court, the pitmaster threw back at him. Even now, Penny did not suspect. When she spoke about the pit, her chief worry was that more people had not laughed. They would have pissed themselves laughing if the lions had been loosed, Tyrion almost told her. Instead, he'd squeezed her shoulder. Penny came to a sudden halt. We're going the wrong way. We're not. Tyrion lowered his pails to the ground. The handles had gouged deep grooves in his fingers. Those are the tents we want there. The second sons? A queer smile split Ser Jorah's face. If you think to find help there, you don't know Brown Ben Plum. Oh, I do. Plum and I have played five games of Sivas. Brown Ben is shrewd, tenacious, not unintelligent, but wary. 
He likes to let his opponent take the risks whilst he sits back and keeps his options open, reacting to the battle as it takes shape. Battle? What battle? Penny backed away from him. We have to get back. The master needs clean water. If we take too long, we'll be whipped. And Pretty Pig and Crunch are there. Sweets will see that they are taken care of, Tyrion lied. More like Scar and his friends would soon be feasting on ham and bacon and a savory dog stew, but Penny did not need to hear that. Nurse is dead and Yezen's dying. It could be dark before anyone thinks to miss us. We will never have a better chance than now. No! You know what they do when they catch slaves trying to escape. You know! Please, they'll never let us leave the camp. We haven't left the camp. Tyrion picked up his pails. He set off at a brisk waddle, never looking back. Mormont fell in beside him. After a moment, he heard the sounds of Penny hurrying after him, down a sandy slope to a circle of ragged tents. The first guard appeared as they neared the horse lines, a lean spearman whose maroon beard marked him as Tyrashi. What do we have here? And what have you got in those pails? Water, said Tyrion, if it please you. Beer would please me better. A spear point pricked him in the back. A second guard come up behind them. Tyrion could hear King's Landing in his voice. Scum from Flea Bottom. You lost, dwarf? the guard demanded. We're here to join your company. A pail slipped from Penny's grasp and overturned. Half the water had spilled before she could right it once again. We got fools enough in this company. Why would we want three more? The Tyrashi flicked at Tyrion's collar with his spear point, ringing the little golden bell. A runaway slave is what I see. Three runaway slaves. Whose collar? The yellow whales. That from a third man, drawn by their voices, a skinny, stubble-jawed piece of work with teeth stained red from sour leaf. A sergeant, Tyrion knew, from the way the other two deferred to him. He had a hook where his right hand should have been. Bronze meaner bastard shadow, or I'm Baylor the Beloved. These are the dwarfs Ben tried to buy, the sergeant told the spearmen, squinting. But the big one... Best bring him too, all three. The Tyrashi gestured with his spear. Tyrion moved along. The other sellsword, a stripling, hardly more than a boy, with fuzz on his cheeks and hair the color of dirty straw, scooped up Penny under one arm. Ooh, mine has teats, he said, laughing. He slipped a hand under Penny's tunic just to be sure. Just bring her, snapped the sergeant. The stripling slung Penny over one shoulder. Tyrion went ahead as quick as his stunted legs would allow. He knew where they were going. The big tent on the far side of the fire pit, its painted canvas walls cracked and faded by years of sun and rain. A few sellswords turned to watch them pass, and a camp follower sniggered, but no one moved to interfere. Within the tent, they found camp stools and a trestle table, a rack of spears and halberds, a floor covered with threadbare carpets in half a dozen clashing colors, and three officers. One was slim and elegant, with a pointed beard, a bravo's blade, and a slashed pink doublet. One was plump and balding, with ink stains on his fingers and a quill clutched in one hand. The third was the man he sought. Tyrion bowed. Captain? We caught them creeping into camp. The stripling dumped Penny onto the carpet. Runaways, the Tyrashi declared, with pails. Pails, said Brown Ben Plum. When no one ventured to explain, he said, Back to your posts, boys, and not a word of this to anyone. When they were gone, he smiled at Tyrion. Come for another game of Sivas, Yolo? If you wish, I do enjoy defeating you. I hear you're twice a turn cloak, Plum. A man after mine own heart. Brown Ben's smile never reached his eyes. He studied Tyrion as a man might study a talking snake. Why are you here? To make your dreams come true. You tried to buy us at auction. Then you tried to win us at Sivas. 
Even when I had my nose, I was not so handsome as to provoke such passion, save in one who happened to know my true worth. Well, here I am, free for the taking. Now be a friend, send for your smith, and get these collars off us. I'm sick of tinkling when I tinkle. I want no trouble with your noble master. Yazan has more urgent matters to concern him than three missing slaves. He's riding the pale mare. And why should they think to look for us here? You have swords enough to discourage anyone who comes nosing round. A small risk for a great gain. The jackanapes in the slashed pink doublet hissed. They brought the sickness amongst us, into our very tents. He turned to Ben Plum. Shall I cut his head off, Captain? We can toss the rest in a latrine pit. He drew a sword, a slender bravo's blade with a jeweled hilt. Do be careful with my head, said Tyrion. You don't want to get any of my blood on you. Blood carries the disease, and you'll want to boil our clothes, or burn them. I've a mind to burn them with you still in them, Yalo. That is not my name, but you know that. You have known that since you first set eyes on me. Might be. I know you as well, my lord, said Tyrion. You're less purple and more brown than the plums at home, but unless your name's a lie, you're a westerman, by blood if not by birth. House Plum is sworn to Casterly Rock, and as it happens, I know a bit of its history. Your branch sprouted from a stone spit across the narrow sea, no doubt. A younger son of Viscerous Plum, I'd wager. The Queen's dragons were fond of you, were they not? That seemed to amuse the sellsword. Who told you that? No one. Most of the stories you hear about dragons are fodder for fools. Talking dragons, dragons hoarding gold and gems, dragons with four legs and bellies big as elephants, dragons riddling with sphinxes, nonsense all of it. But there are truths in the old books as well. Not only do I know that the queen's dragons took to you, but I know why. My mother said my father had a drop of dragon blood. Two drops. That or a cock six feet long. You know that tale? I do. Now, you're a clever plum, so you know this head of mine is worth a lordship, back in Westeros, half a world away. By the time you get it there, only bone and maggots will remain. My sweet sister will deny the head is mine and cheat you of the promised reward. You know how it is with queens. Fickle cunts the lot of them, and Cersei is the worst. Brown Ben scratched at his beard, could deliver you alive and wriggling, then, or pop your head into a jar and pickle it. Or throw in with me. That's the wisest move. He grinned. I was born a second son. This company is my destiny. The second sons have no place for mummers, the bravo in pink said scornfully. It's fighters we need. I brought you one. Tyrion jerked a thumb at Mormont. That creature? The bravo laughed. An ugly brute, but scars alone don't make a second son. Tyrion rolled his mismatched eyes. Lord Plum, who are these two friends of yours? The pink one is annoying. The bravo curled a lip, whilst the fellow with the quill chuckled at his insolence. But it was Jorah Mormont who supplied their names. Inkpots is the company paymaster. The peacock calls himself Casporio the Cunning, though Casporio the cunt would be more apt. A nasty piece of work. Mormont's face might have been unrecognizable in its battered state, but his voice was unchanged. Casporio gave him a startled look, whilst the wrinkles around Plum's eyes crinkled in amusement. Jorah Mormont? Is that you? Less proud than when you scampered off, though. Must we still call you Sir? Ser Jorah's swollen lips twisted into a grotesque grin. Give me a sword and you can call me what you like, Ben. Casporio edged backward. You... She sent you away. I came back. Call me a fool. A fool in love. Tyrion cleared his throat. You can talk of old times later, after I am done explaining why my head would be of more use to you upon my shoulders. You will find, Lord Plum, that I can be very generous to my friends. If you doubt me, ask Bronn. Ask Shaga, son of Dolph. Ask Timot, 
son of Timot. And who would they be? asked the man called Inkpots. Good men who pledged me their swords and prospered greatly by that service. He shrugged. Oh, very well. I lied about the good part. They're bloodthirsty bastards like you lot. Might be, said Brown Ben. Or might be you just made up some names. Shaga, did you say? Is that a woman's name? His teats are big enough. Next time we meet, I'll peek beneath his britches to be sure. Is that a Sivas set over there? Bring it out and we'll have that game. But first, I think a cup of wine. My throat is dry as an old bone, and I can see that I have a deal of talking to do. John That night he dreamt of wildlings howling from the woods, advancing to the moan of war horns and the roll of drums. Boom, doom, boom, doom, boom, doom came the sound, a thousand hearts with a single beat. Some had spears, and some had bows, and some had axes. Others rode on chariots made of bones, drawn by teams of dogs as big as ponies. Giants lumbered amongst them, forty feet tall, with mauls the size of oak trees. Stand fast, John Snow called. Throw them back. He stood atop the wall, alone. Flame, he cried. Feed them flame. But there was no one to pay heed. They are all gone. They have abandoned me. Burning shafts hissed upward, trailing tongues of fire. Scarecrow brothers tumbled down, black cloaks ablaze. Snow, an eagle cried, as foemen scuttled up the ice like spiders. John was armored in black ice, but his blade burned red in his fist. As the dead men reached the top of the wall, he sent them down to die again. He slew a gray beard and a beardless boy, a giant, a gaunt man with filed teeth, a girl with thick red hair. Too late he recognized Agrit. She was gone as quick as she'd appeared. The world dissolved into a red mist. John stabbed and slashed and cut. He hacked down Donald Noy and gutted Deaf Dick Follard. Corin Halfhand stumbled to his knees, trying in vain to staunch the flow of blood from his neck. I am the Lord of Winterfell, John screamed. It was Rob before him now, his hair wet with melting snow. Longclaw took his head off. Then a gnarled hand seized John roughly by the shoulder. He whirled and woke with a raven pecking at his chest. Snow, the bird cried. John swatted at it. The raven shrieked its displeasure and flapped up to a bedpost to glare down balefully at him through the pre-dawn gloom. The day had come. It was the hour of the wolf. Soon enough the sun would rise, and four thousand wildlings would come pouring through the wall. Madness. John Snow ran his burned hand through his hair and wondered once again what he was doing. Once the gate was opened, there would be no turning back. It should have been the old bear to treat with torment. It should have been Jeremy Riker or Corin Halfhand or Dennis Malister or some other seasoned man. It should have been my uncle. It was too late for such misgivings, though. Every choice had its risks, every choice its consequences. He would play the game to its conclusion. He rose and dressed in darkness, as Mormont's raven muttered across the room. Corn, the bird said, and King, and Snow, John Snow, John Snow. That was queer. The bird had never said his full name before, as best John could recall. He broke his fast in the cellar with his officers. Fried bread, fried eggs, blood sausages, and barley porridge made up the meal, washed down with thin yellow beer. As they ate, they went over the preparations yet again. All is in readiness, Bowen Marsh assured him. If the wildlings uphold the terms of the bargain, all will go as you've commanded. And if not, it may turn to blood and carnage. Remember, John said, Torment's people are hungry, cold, and fearful. Some of them hate us as much as some of you hate them. We are dancing on rotten ice here, them and us. One crack and we all drown. If blood should be shed today, it had best not be one of us who strikes the first blow, or I swear by the old gods and the new that I will have the head of the man who strikes it. 
They answered him with eyes and nods and muttered words, with, As you command, and it will be done, and yes, my lord. And one by one they rose and buckled on their swords and donned their warm black cloaks and strode out into the cold. Last to leave the table was Dolores Ed Tollett, who had come in during the night with six wagons from the Long Barrow. Whore's Barrow, the Black Brothers called the fortress now. Ed had been sent to gather up as many spear wives as his wagons would hold and bring them back to join their sisters. John watched him mop up a runny yoke with a chunk of bread. It was strangely comforting to see Ed's dour face again. How goes the restoration work? he asked his old steward. Ten more years should do it, Tollett replied in his usual gloomy tone. Place was overrun with rats when we moved in. The spearwives killed the nasty buggers. Now the place is overrun with spearwives. There's days I want the rats back. How do you find serving under Iron Emmet? John asked. Mostly it's Black Maris serving under him, my lord. Me, I have the mules. Nettle's claims were kin. It's true we have the same long face, but I'm not near as stubborn. Anyway, I never knew their mothers on my honor. He finished the last of his eggs and sighed. I do like me a nice runny egg. If it please, my lord, don't let the wildlings eat all our chickens. Out in the yard, the eastern sky had just begun to lighten. There was not a wisp of cloud in sight. We have a good day for this, it would seem, John said. A bright day, warm and sunny. The wall will weep, and winter almost on us. It's unnatural, my lord, a bad sign, you ask me. John smiled. And if it were to snow? A worse sign. What sort of weather would you prefer? The sort they keep indoors, said Dolores Ed. If it please, my lord, I should get back to my mules. They miss me when I'm gone. More than I can say for them spearwives. They parted there, Tollett for the east road, where his wagons waited, John Snow for the stables. Satin had his horse saddled and bridled and waiting for him, a fiery gray courser with a mane as black and shiny as Maester's ink. He was not the sort of mount that John would have chosen for arranging, but on this morning all that mattered was that he look impressive, and for that the stallion was a perfect choice. His tail was waiting, too. John had never liked surrounding himself with guards, but today it seemed prudent to keep a few good men beside him. They made a grim display in their ringmail, iron half-helms and black cloaks, with tall spears in their hands and swords and daggers on their belts. For this, John had passed over all the green boys and graybeards in his command, choosing eight men in their prime, Ty and Mully, Left Hand Lou, Big Little, Rory, Falk the Flea, Garrett Greenspear, and Leathers, Castle Black's new master-at-arms, to show the free folk that even a man who had fought for Mance in the battle beneath the wall could find a place of honor in the night's watch. A deep red blush had appeared in the east by the time they all assembled at the gate. The stars are going out, John thought. When next they reappeared, they would be shining down upon a world forever changed. A few queen's men stood watching from beside the embers of Lady Melisandre's night fire. When John glanced at the king's tower, he glimpsed a flash of red behind a window. Of Queen Selyse he saw no sign. It was time. Open the gate, John Snow said softly. Open the gate, Big Little roared. His voice was thunder. Seven hundred feet above, the sentries heard and raised their war horns to their lips. The sound rang out, echoing off the wall and out across the world. Ahoo! One long blast. For a thousand years or more, that sound had meant rangers coming home. Today it meant something else. Today it called the free folk to their new homes. On either end of the long tunnel, gates swung open and iron bars unlocked. Dawn light shimmered on the ice above, pink and gold and purple. Dolorous Ed had not been wrong. The wall would soon be weeping. God's grant it weeps alone. Satin led them underneath the ice, lighting the way through the gloom of the tunnel with an iron lantern. John followed, leading his horse, then his guardsmen. After them came Bowen Marsh and his stewards, 
a score of them, every man assigned a task. Above, Ulmer of the Kingswood had the wall. Two score of Castle Black's best bowmen stood with him, ready to respond to any trouble down below with a rain of arrows. North of the wall, Tormund Giant's Bane was waiting, mounted on a runty little garron that looked far too weedy to support his weight. His two remaining sons were with him, tall Toreg and young Drin, along with three score warriors. Ha! Tormund called. Guards, is it? Now where's the trust in that, crow? You brought more men than I did. So I did. Come here by me, lad. I want my folk to see you. I got thousands ne'er saw a lord commander, grown men who were told as boys that your rangers would eat them if they didn't behave. They need to see you plain, a long-faced lad in an old black cloak. They need to learn that the Night's Watch is not to be feared. That is a lesson I would sooner they never learned. John peeled the glove off his burned hand, put two fingers in his mouth, and whistled. Ghost came racing from the gate. Tormund's horse shied so hard that the wildling almost lost his saddle. Not to be feared, John said. Ghost, stay. You are a black-hearted bastard, Lord Crow. Tormund Hornblower lifted his own war horn to his lips. The sound of it echoed off the ice like rolling thunder, and the first of the free folk began to stream toward the gate. From dawn till dusk, John watched the wildlings pass. The hostages went first, one hundred boys between the ages of eight and sixteen. Your blood price, Lord Crow, Tormund declared. I hope the wailing of their poor mothers don't haunt your dreams at night. Some of the boys were led to the gate by a mother or a father, others by older siblings. More came alone. Fourteen- and fifteen-year-old boys were almost men, and did not want to be seen clinging to a woman's skirts. Two stewards counted the boys as they went by, noting each name on long sheepskin scrolls. A third collected their valuables for the toll and wrote that down as well. The boys were going to a place that none had ever been before, to serve an order that had been the enemy of their kith and kin for thousands of years. Yet John saw no tears, heard no wailing mothers. These are winters, people, he reminded himself. Tears freeze upon your cheeks where they come from. Not a single hostage balked or tried to slink away when his turn came to enter that gloomy tunnel. Almost all the boys were thin, some past the point of gauntness, with spindly shanks and arms like twigs. That was no more than John expected. Elsewise they came in every shape and size and color. He saw tall boys and short boys, brown-haired boys and black-haired boys, honey blondes and strawberry blondes and redheads kissed by fire, like a greet. He saw boys with scars, boys with limps, boys with pockmarked faces. Many of the older boys had downy cheeks or wispy little mustachios, but there was one fellow with a beard as thick as Tormund's. Some dressed in fine soft furs, some in boiled leather and oddments of armor, more in wool and sealskins, a few in rags. One was naked. Many had weapons, sharpened spears, stone-headed mauls, Knives made of bone or stone or dragon glass, spiked clubs, tangle nets, even here and there a rust-eaten old sword. The Hornfoot boys walked blithe and barefoot through the snowdrifts. Other lads had bare paws on their boots and walked on top of the same drifts, never sinking through the crust. Six boys arrived on horses, two on mules. A pair of brothers turned up with a goat. The biggest hostage was six and a half feet tall but had a baby's face. The smallest was a runty boy who claimed nine years but looked no more than six. Of special note were the sons of men of renown. Tormund took care to point them out as they went by. The boy there is the son of Soren Shieldbreaker, he said of one tall lad. Him with the red hair, he's Garrick Kingsblood's get. Comes of the line of Raymond Redbeard to hear him tell it. The line of Redbeard's little brother, you want it true. Two boys looked enough alike to be twins, but Tormund insisted they were cousins, born a year apart. One was sired by Harl the Huntsman, to other by Harl the Handsome, both on the same woman. Fathers hate each other. I was you, I'd send one to Eastwatch and to other to your shadow tower. 
Other hostages were named as sons of Howd Wanderer, of Brog, of Devon Sealskinner, Kyleg of the Wooden Ear, Morna White Mask, the Great Walrus. The Great Walrus? Truly? They have queer names along the frozen shore. Three hostages were sons of Alfin Crowkiller, an infamous raider slain by Corrin Halfhand, or so Tormund insisted. They do not look like brothers, John observed. Half-brothers, born of different mothers. Alfin's member was a wee thing, even smaller than yours, but he was never shy with where he stuck it. Had a son in every village, that one. Of a certain runty, rat-faced boy, Tormund said, That one's a whelp of Varamir Sixskins. You remember Varamir, Lord Crow? He did. The skin-changer. Aye, he was that. A vicious little runt besides. Dead now, like as not. No one's seen him since the battle. Two of the boys were girls in disguise. When John saw them, he dispatched Rory and Big Little to bring them to him. One came meekly enough, the other kicking and biting. This could end badly. Do these two have famous fathers? Ha! Them skinny things? Not likely. Picked by lot. They're girls. Are they? Tormund squinted at the pair of them from his saddle. Me and Lord Crow made a wager on which of you has the biggest member. Pull them britches down, give us a look. One of the girls turned red, the other glared defiantly. You leave us alone, Tormund giant stink. You let us go. Ha! You win, Crow, not a cock between them. The little one's got her a set of balls, though. A spear wife in the making, her. Huh? He called to his own men. Go find them something girly to put on before Lord Snow wets his small clothes. I'll need two boys to take their places. How's that? Tormund scratched his beard. A hostage is a hostage, seems to me. That big sharp sword of yours can snick a girl's head off as easy as a boy's. A father loves his daughters, too. Well, most fathers. It is not their fathers who concern me. Did Mance ever sing of brave Danny Flint? Not as I recall. Who was he? A girl who dressed up like a boy to take the black. Her song is sad and pretty. What happened to her wasn't. In some versions of the song, her ghost still walked the night fort. I'll send the girls to Longbarrow. The only men there were Iron Emmett and Dolorous Ed, both of whom he trusted. That was not something he could say of all his brothers. The wildling understood. Nasty birds, you crows. He spat. Two more boys, then. You'll have them. When nine and ninety hostages had shuffled by them to pass beneath the wall, Tormund Giantsbane produced the last one. My son, Dryn. You'll see he's well taken care of, crow, or I'll cook your black liver up and eat it. John gave the boy a close inspection. Bran's age, or the age he would have been if Theon had not killed him. Dryn had none of Bran's sweetness, though. He was a chunky boy, with short legs, thick arms, and a wide red face, a miniature version of his father, with a shock of dark brown hair. He'll serve as my own page, John promised Tormund. Hear that, Dryn? See that you don't get above yourself. To John, he said, he'll need a good beating from time to time. Be careful of his teeth, though. He bites. He reached down for his horn again, raised it, and blew another blast. This time it was warriors who came forward, and not just one hundred of them. Five hundred, John Snow judged, as they moved out from beneath the trees. Perhaps as many as a thousand. One in every ten of them came mounted, but all of them came armed. Across their backs they bore round wicker shields covered with hides and boiled leather, displaying painted images of snakes and spiders, severed heads, bloody hammers, broken skulls, and demons. A few were clad in stolen steel, dinted oddments of armor looted from the corpses of fallen rangers. Others had armored themselves in bones like rattle shirt. All wore fur and leather. There were spearwives with them, long hair streaming. John could not look at them without remembering a great, the gleam of fire in her hair, 
the look on her face when she disrobed for him in the grotto, the sound of her voice. You know nothing, Jon Snow, she'd told him a hundred times. It is as true now as it was then. You might have sent the women first, he said to Tormund. The mothers and the maids. The wildling gave him a shrewd look. Aye, I might have. And you crows might decide to close that gate. A few fighters on the other side, well, that way the gate stays open, don't it? He grinned. I bought your bloody horse, Jon Snow. Don't mean that we can't count his teeth. Now don't you go thinking me and mine don't trust you. We trust you just as much as you trust us. He snorted. You wanted warriors, didn't you? Well, there they are. Everyone worth six of your black crows. John had to smile. So long as they save those weapons for our common foe, I am content. Gave you my word on it, didn't I? The word of Tormund Giant's Bane. Strong as iron, tis. He turned and spat. Amongst the stream of warriors were the fathers of many of John's hostages. Some stared with cold, dead eyes as they went by, fingering their sword hilts. Others smiled at him like long-lost kin, though a few of those smiles discomfited Jon Snow more than any glare. None knelt, but many gave him their oaths. What torment swore, I swear, declared black-haired Brog, a man of few words. Soren Shieldbreaker bowed his head an inch and growled, Soren's axe is yours, Jon Snow, if ever you have need of such. Red-bearded Garrick Kingsblood brought three daughters. They will make fine wives and give their husbands strong sons of royal blood, he boasted. Like their father, they are descended from Raymond Redbeard, who was king beyond the wall. Blood meant little and less amongst the free folk, John knew. Agreed had taught him that. Garrick's daughters shared her same flame-red hair, though hers had been a tangle of curls and theirs hung long and straight. Kissed by fire. Three princesses, each lovelier than the last, he told their father. I will see that they are presented to the queen. Selys Baratheon would take to these three better than she had to Val, he suspected. They were younger and considerably more cowed. Sweet enough to look at them, though their father seems a fool. Howd Wanderer swore his oath upon his sword, as nicked and pitted a piece of iron as John had ever seen. Devin Sealskinner presented him with a sealskin hat, Harl the Huntsman with a bear claw necklace. The warrior witch Morna removed her weirwood mask just long enough to kiss his gloved hand and swear to be his man or his woman, whichever he preferred. And on and on and on. As they passed, each warrior stripped off his treasures and tossed them into one of the carts that the stewards had placed before the gate. Amber pendants, golden torques, jeweled daggers, Silver brooches set with gemstones, bracelets, rings, niello cups and golden goblets, war horns and drinking horns, a green jade comb, a necklace of freshwater pearls, all yielded up and noted down by Bowen Marsh. One man surrendered a shirt of silver scales that had surely been made for some great lord. Another produced a broken sword with three sapphires in the hilt. And there were queerer things a toy mammoth made of actual mammoth hair, an ivory phallus, a helm made from a unicorn's head, complete with horn. How much food such things would buy in the free cities, Jon Snow could not begin to say. After the riders came the men of the frozen shore. Jon watched a dozen of their big bone chariots roll past him one by one, clattering like rattle shirt. Half still rolled as before, others had replaced their wheels with runners. They slid across the snowdrifts smoothly, where the wheeled chariots were foundering and sinking. The dogs that drew the chariots were fearsome beasts, as big as dire wolves. Their women were clad in sealskins, some with infants at their breasts. Older children shuffled along behind their mothers and looked up at John with eyes as dark and hard as the stones they clutched. Some of the men wore antlers on their hats, and some wore walrus tusks. The two swords did not love each other, he soon gathered. A few thin reindeer brought up the rear, with the great dogs snapping at the heels of stragglers. Be wary of that lot, Jon Snow, Tormund warned him. A savage folk. 
The men are bad, the women worse. He took a skin off his saddle and offered it up to John. Here, this will make them seem less fearsome, might be. And warm you for the night. No, go on, it's yours to keep. Drink deep. Within was a mead so potent it made John's eyes water and sent tendrils of fire snaking through his chest. He drank deep. You're a good man, Tormund Giants, babe, for a wildling. Better than most, might be. Not so good as some. On and on the wildlings came, as the sun crept across the bright blue sky. Just before midday, the movement stopped when an ox cart became jammed at a turn inside the tunnel. Jon Snow went to have a look for himself. The cart was now wedged solid. The men behind were threatening to hack it apart and butcher the ox where he stood, whilst the driver and his kin swore to kill them if they tried. With the help of Tormund and his son Toreg, John managed to keep the wildlings from coming to blood, but it took the best part of an hour before the way was opened again. You need a bigger gate, Tormund complained to John with a sour look up at the sky, where a few clouds had blown in. Too bloody slow this way, like sucking the milk water through a reed. Ha! Would that I had the horn of Joraman. I'd give it a nice toot and we'd climb through the rubble. Melisandre burned the horn of Joraman. Did she? Tormund slapped his thigh and hooted. She burned that fine big horn, I. A bloody sin, I call it. A thousand years old, that was. We found it in a giant's grave, and no man of us had ever seen a horn so big. That must have been why Mance got the notion to tell you it were Joraman's. He wanted you crows to think he had it in his power to blow your bloody wall down about your knees but we never found the true horn, not for all our digging. If we had, every kneeler in your seven kingdoms would have chunks of ice to cool his wine all summer. John turned in his saddle, frowning. And Joraman blew the horn of winter and woke giants from the earth. That huge horn with its bands of old gold, incised with ancient runes. Had Mance Raider lied to him, or was Tormund lying now? If Mance's horn was just a feint, where is the true horn? By afternoon the sun had gone, and the day turned gray and gusty. A snow sky, Tormund announced grimly. Others had seen the same omen in those flat white clouds. It seemed to spur them on to haste. Tempers began to fray. One man was stabbed when he tried to slip in ahead of others who had been hours in the column. Toreg wrenched the knife away from his attacker, dragged both men from the press, and sent them back to the wildling camp to start again. Tormund, John said, as they watched four old women pull a cart full of children toward the gate. Tell me of our foe. I would know all there is to know of the others. The wildling rubbed his mouth. Not here, he mumbled. Not this side of your wall. The old man glanced uneasily toward the trees in their white mantles. They're never far, you know. They won't come out by day, not when that old sun's shining. But don't think that means they went away. Shadows never go away. Might be you don't see them, but they're always clinging to your heels. Did they trouble you on your way south? They never came in force, if that's your meaning. But they were with us all the same, nibbling at our edges. We lost more outriders than I care to think about, and it was worth your life to fall behind or wander off. Every nightfall we'd ring our camps with fire. They don't like fire much, and no mistake. When the snows came, though, snow and sleet and freezing rain, it's bloody hard to find dry wood or get your kindling lit. And the cold. Some nights our fires just seemed to shrivel up and die. Nights like that, you always find some dead come the morning. Lest they find you first. The night that Torwind... My boy, he... Tormund turned his face away. I know, said Jon Snow. Tormund turned back. You know nothing. You killed a dead man, I, I heard. Mance killed a hundred. A man can fight the dead, but when their masters come, when the white mists rise up. How do you fight a mist, crow? Shadows with teeth? They are so cold it hurts to breathe like a knife inside your chest. You do not know. You cannot know. Can your sword cut cold? 
We will see, John thought, remembering the things that Sam had told him, the things he'd found in his old books. Long Claw had been forged in the fires of old Valyria, forged in dragon flame and set with spells. Dragon steel, Sam called it. Stronger than any common steel. Lighter, harder, sharper. But words in a book were one thing. The true test came in battle. You are not wrong, John said. I do not know. And if the gods are good, I never will. The gods are seldom good, John Snow. Tormund nodded toward the sky. The clouds roll in. Already it grows darker, colder. Your wall no longer weeps. Look. He turned and called out to his son Toreg. Ride back to the camp and get them moving. The sick ones and the weak ones, the slugabeds and cravens, get them on their bloody feet. Set their bloody tents afire if you must. The gate must close at nightfall. Any man not through the wall by then had best pray the others get to him afore I do. You hear? I hear. Toreg put his heels into his horse and galloped back down the column. On and on the wildlings came. The day grew darker, just as Tormund said. Clouds covered the sky from horizon to horizon, and warmth fled. There was more shoving at the gate, as men and goats and bullocks jostled each other out of the way. It is more than impatience, John realized. They are afraid. Warriors, spearwives, raiders. They are frightened of those woods, of shadows moving through the trees. They want to put the wall between them before the night descends. A snowflake danced upon the air, then another. Dance with me, John Snow, he thought. You'll dance with me anon. On and on and on the wildlings came. Some were moving faster now, hastening across the battleground. Others, the old, the young, the feeble, could scarce move at all. This morning the field had been covered with a thick blanket of old snow, its white crust shining in the sun. Now the field was brown and black and slimy. The passage of the free folk had turned the ground to mud and muck. Wooden wheels and horses' hooves, runners of bone and horn and iron, pig trotters, heavy boots, the cloven feet of cows and bullocks, the bare black feet of the hornfoot folk, all had left their marks. The soft footing slowed the column even more. You need a bigger gate, Tormund complained again. By late afternoon the snow was falling steadily, but the river of wildlings had dwindled to a stream. Columns of smoke rose from the trees where their camp had been. Toreg, Tormund explained, burning the dead. Always some who go to sleep and don't wake up. You find them in their tents, them as have tents, curled up and froze. Toreg knows what to do. The stream was no more than a trickle by the time Toreg emerged from the wood. With him rode a dozen mounted warriors armed with spears and swords. My rear guard, Tormund said with a gap-toothed smile. You crows have rangers, so do we. Am I left in camp in case we were attacked before we all got out? Your best men. Or my worst. Every man of them has killed a crow. Amongst the riders came one man afoot, with some big beast trotting at his heels. A boar, John saw. A monstrous boar. Twice the size of ghost, the creature was covered with coarse black hair, with tusks as long as a man's arm. John had never seen a boar so huge or ugly. The man beside him was no beauty either. Hulking, black-browed, he had a flat nose, heavy jowls dark with stubble, small black close-set eyes. Borak! Tormund turned his head and spat. A skin-changer. It was not a question. Somehow he knew. Ghost turned his head. The falling snow had masked the boar's scent, but now the white wolf had the smell. He padded out in front of John, his teeth bared in a silent snarl. No, John snapped. Ghost, down. Stay. Stay. Boars and wolves, said Tormund. Best keep that beast of yours locked up tonight. I'll see that Borak does the same with his pig. He glanced up at the darkening sky. Them's the last, and none too soon. It's going to snow all night. I feel it. 
Time I had a look at what's on the other side of all that ice. You go ahead, John told him. I mean to be the last one through the ice. I will join you at the feast. Feast? Ha! Now that's a word I like to hear. The wildling turned his garin toward the wall and slapped her on the rump. Toreg and the riders followed, dismounting by the gate to lead their horses through. Bowen Marsh stayed long enough to supervise as his stewards pulled the last carts into the tunnel. Only Jon Snow and his guards were left. The skin changer stopped ten yards away. His monster pawed at the mud, snuffling. A light powdering of snow covered the boar's humped black back. He gave a snort and lowered his head, and for half a heartbeat John thought he was about to charge. To either side of him, his men lowered their spears. Brother, Borak said. You'd best go on. We are about to close the gate. You do that, Borak said. You close it good and tight. They're coming, Crow. He smiled as ugly a smile as John had ever seen and made his way to the gate. The boar stalked after him. The falling snow covered up their tracks behind them. That's done, then, Rory said when they were gone. No, thought John Snow. It has only just begun. Bowen Marsh was waiting for him south of the wall, with a tablet full of numbers. Three thousand one hundred and nineteen wildlings passed through the gate today, the Lord Steward told him. Sixty of your hostages were sent off to Eastwatch and the Shadow Tower after they'd been fed. Ed Tollett took six wagons of women back to Longbarrow. The rest remain with us. Not for long, John promised him. Tormund means to lead his own folk to Oakenshield within a day or two. The rest will follow as soon as we sort where to put them. As you say, Lord Snow. The words were stiff. The tone suggested that Bowen Marsh knew where he would put them. The castle John returned to was far different from the one he'd left that morning. For as long as he had known it, Castle Black had been a place of silence and shadows, where a meager company of men in black moved like ghosts among the ruins of a fortress that had once housed ten times their numbers. All that had changed. Lights now shone through windows where Jon Snow had never seen lights shine before. Strange voices echoed down the yards, and free folk were coming and going along icy paths that had only known the black boots of crows for years. Outside the old flint barracks, he came across a dozen men pelting one another with snow. Playing, John thought in astonishment. Grown men playing like children, throwing snowballs the way Bran and Arya once did, and Rob and me before them. Donal Noy's old armory was still dark and silent, however, and John's rooms back of the cold forge were darker still. But he had no sooner taken off his cloak than Danil poked his head through the door to announce that Clytus had brought a message. Send him in. John lit a taper from an ember in his brazier and three candles from the taper. Clytus entered, pink and blinking, the parchment clutched in one soft hand. Beg pardon, Lord Commander. I know you must be weary, but I thought you would want to see this at once. You did well, John read. At hard home, with six ships, wild seas, Blackbird lost with all hands, two Liseni ships driven aground on Skane, Talon taking water, very bad here, wildlings eating their own dead, dead things in the woods. Bravo sea captains will only take women, children on their ships, which women call us slavers. Attempt to take Stormcrow defeated, six crew dead, many wildlings, eight ravens left, dead things in the water, send help by land, seas racked by storms, from Talon by hand of Maester Harmune. Cotter Pike had made his angry mark below. Is it grievous, my lord? asked Clytus. Grievous enough. Dead things in the wood, dead things in the water. Six ships left of the eleven that set sail. John Snow rolled up the parchment, frowning. Night falls, he thought, and now my war begins. The Discarded Knight All kneel for his magnificence, Hisdar Zolorak, fourteenth of that noble name, King of Myrene, 
Scion of Gis, Arctarch of the Old Empire, Master of the Skahazadan, Consort to Dragons and Blood of the Harpy, roared the Herald. His voice echoed off the marble floor and rang amongst the pillars. Sir Barristan Selmy slipped a hand beneath the fold of his cloak and loosened his sword in its scabbard. No blades were allowed in the presence of the king save those of his protectors. It seemed as though he still counted amongst that number despite his dismissal. No one had tried to take his sword, at least. Daenerys Targaryen had preferred to hold court from a bench of polished ebony, smooth and simple, covered with the cushions that Sir Barristan had found to make her more comfortable. King Hisdar had replaced the bench with two imposing thrones of gilded wood, their tall backs carved into the shape of dragons. The king seated himself in the right-hand throne with a golden crown upon his head and a jeweled scepter in one pale hand. The second throne remained vacant. The important throne, thought Sir Barristan. No dragon chair can replace a dragon no matter how elaborately it's carved. To the right of the twin thrones stood Gogor the Giant, a huge hulk of a man with a brutal, scarred face. To the left was the spotted cat, a leopard skin flung over one shoulder. Back of them were Bellaquo Bonebreaker and the cold-eyed Kraz. Seasoned killers all, thought Selmy. But it is one thing to face a foe in the pit when his coming is heralded by horns and drums, and another to find a hidden killer before he can strike. The day was young and fresh, and yet he felt bone-tired, as if he'd fought all night. The older he got, the less sleep Sir Barristan seemed to need. As a squire, he could sleep ten hours a night and still be yawning when he stumbled out onto the practice yard. At three and sixty, he found that five hours a night was more than enough. Last night, he had scarce slept at all. His bedchamber was a small cell off the Queen's apartments, originally slave quarters. His furnishings consisted of a bed, a chamber pot, a wardrobe for his clothing, even a chair should he want to sit. On a bedside table he kept a beeswax candle and a small carving of the warrior. Though he was not a pious man, the carving made him feel less alone here in this queer alien city, and it was to that he had turned in the black watches of night. Shield me from these doubts that gnaw at me, he had prayed, and give me the strength to do what is right. But neither prayer nor dawn had brought him certainty. The hall was as crowded as the old knight had ever seen it, but it was the missing faces that Barrist and Selmy noted most. Missende, Belwas, Grey Worm, Ago and Jogo and Rakaro, Iri and Jiki, Dario Naharis. In the shavepate's place stood a fat man in a muscled breastplate and lion's mask, his heavy legs poking out beneath a skirt of leather straps. Margaz Zolorak, the king's cousin, new commander of the Brazen Beasts. Selmy had already formed a healthy contempt for the man. He had known his sort in King's Landing, fawning to his superiors, harsh to his inferiors, as blind as he was boastful and too proud by half. Skahaz could be in the hall as well, Selmy realized. That ugly face of his concealed behind a mask. Two score brazen beasts stood between the pillars, torchlight shining off the polished brass of their masks. The shavepate could be any one of them. The hall thrummed to the sound of a hundred low voices, echoing off the pillars and the marble floor. It made an ominous sound, angry. It reminded Selmy of the sound a hornet's nest might make an instant before hornets all came boiling out, and on the faces in the crowd he saw anger, grief, suspicion, fear. Hardly had the king's new herald called the court to order than the ugliness began. One woman began to wail about a brother who had died at Dasnak's pit, another of the damage to her palanquin. A fat man tore off his bandages to show the court his burned arm, where the flesh was still raw and oozing. And when a man in a blue and gold tokar began to speak of Hargaz the hero, a freedman behind him shoved him to the floor. It took six brazen beasts to pull them apart and drag them from the hall. Fox, hawk, seal, locust, lion, toad. Selmy wondered if the masks had meaning to the men who wore them. Did the same men wear the same masks every day, or did they choose new faces every morning? Quiet! Resnak Mo Resnak was pleading. Please, I will answer if you will only— Is it true? 
a freed woman shouted. Is our mother dead? No, 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 Reznak screeched. Queen Daenerys will return to Meereen in her own time in all her might and majesty. Until such time, his worship King Hisdar shall— He is no king of mine, a freedman yelled. Men began to shove at one another. The queen is not dead, the seneschal proclaimed. Her blood riders have been dispatched across the Skahazadan to find her grace and return her to her loving lord and loyal subjects. Each has ten picked riders, and each man has three swift horses, so they may travel fast and far. Queen Daenerys shall be found. A tall Giscari in a brocade robe spoke next, in a voice as sonorous as it was cold. King Hisdar shifted on his dragon throne, his face stony as he did his best to appear concerned but unperturbed. Once again his seneschal gave answer. Ser Barristan let Reznak's oily words wash over him. His years in the King's Guard had taught him the trick of listening without hearing, especially useful when the speaker was intent on proving that words were truly wind. Back at the rear of the hall, he spied the Dornish princeling and his two companions. They should not have come. Martel does not realize his danger. Daenerys was his only friend at this court, and she is gone. He wondered how much they understood of what was being said. Even he could not always make sense of the mongrel Giscari tongue the slavers spoke, especially when they were speaking fast. Prince Quentin was listening intently, at least. That one is his father's son. Short and stocky, plain-faced, he seemed a decent lad, sober, sensible, dutiful, but not the sort to make a young girl's heart beat faster. And Daenerys Targaryen, whatever else she might be, was still a young girl, as she herself would claim when it pleased her to play the innocent. Like all good queens, she put her people first, else she would never have wed his Darzo Lorak but the girl in her still yearned for poetry, passion, and laughter. She wants fire, and Dorn sent her mud. You could make a poultice out of mud to cool a fever. You could plant seeds in mud and grow a crop to feed your children. Mud would nourish you, where fire would only consume you. But fools and children and young girls would choose fire every time. Behind the prince, Sargeras Drinkwater was whispering something to Ironwood. Sargeras was all his prince was not, tall and lean and comely, with a swordsman's grace and a courtier's wit. Selmy did not doubt that many a Dornish maiden had run her fingers through that sun-streaked hair and kissed that teasing smile off his lips. If this one had been the prince, things might have gone elsewise, he could not help but think. But there was something a bit too pleasant about Drinkwater for his taste. False coin, the old knight thought. He had known such men before. Whatever he was whispering must have been amusing, for his big bald friend gave a sudden snort of laughter, loud enough so that the king himself turned his head toward the Dornishmen. When he saw the prince, Isdar Zolorak frowned. Sir Barristan did not like that frown. And when the king beckoned his cousin Margaz closer, leaned down and whispered in his ear, he liked that even less. I swore no oath to Dorn, Sir Barristan told himself. But Lewin Martell had been his sworn brother, back in the days when the bonds between the King's Guard still went deep. I could not help Prince Lewin on the trident, but I can help his nephew now. Martell was dancing in a viper's nest, and he did not even see the snakes. His continued presence, even after Daenerys had given herself to another before the eyes of gods and men, would provoke any husband and Quentin no longer had the queen to shield him from Hisdar's wrath. Although... The thought hit him like a slap across the face. Quentin had grown up amongst the courts of Dorne. Plots and poisons were no strangers to him. Nor was Prince Lewin his only uncle. He is kin to the Red Viper. Daenerys had taken another for her consort, but if Hisdar died, she would be free to wed again. Could the shave pate have been wrong? Who can say that the locusts were meant for Daenerys? It was the king's own box. What if he was meant to be the victim all along? Hisdar's death would have smashed the fragile peace. The sons of the harpy would have resumed their murders, the Yunkish men their war. Daenerys might have had no better choice than Quentin and his marriage pact. Sabariston was still wrestling with that suspicion, 
when he heard the sound of heavy boots ascending the steep stone steps at the back of the hall. The Yunkish men had come. Three wise masters led the procession from the Yellow City, each with his own armed retinue. One slaver wore a tokar of maroon silk fringed with gold, one a striped tokar of teal and orange, the third an ornate breastplate inlaid with erotic scenes done in jet and jade and mother of pearl. The sellsword Captain Bloodbeard accompanied them with a leathern sack slung across one massive shoulder and a look of mirth and murder on his face. No tattered prince, Selmy noted. No brown Ben Plum. Sir Barristan eyed Bloodbeard coolly. Give me half a reason to dance with you and we will see who is laughing at the end. Resnak Moresnak wormed his way forward. Wise masters, you honor us. His radiance King Hizdar bids welcome to his friends from Yunkai. We understand, understand this. Bloodbeard pulled a severed head from his sack and flung it at the seneschal. Resnak gave a squeak of fright and leapt aside. The head bounced past him, leaving spots of blood on the purple marble floor as it rolled until it fetched up against the foot of King Hizdar's dragon throne. Up and down the length of the hall, brazen beasts lowered their spears. Gogor the giant lumbered forward to place himself before the king's throne, and the spotted cat and Kraz moved to either side of him to form a wall. Bloodbeard laughed. He's dead. He won't bite. Gingerly, so gingerly, the seneschal approached the head, lifted it delicately by the hair. Admiral Grolio. Sir Barristan glanced toward the throne. He had served so many kings, he could not help but imagine how they might have reacted to this provocation. Eris would have flinched away in horror, likely cutting himself on the barbs of the Iron Throne, then shrieked at his swordsmen to cut the Yunkish men to pieces. Robert would have shouted for his hammer to repay Bloodbeard in kind. Even Jaehaerys, reckoned weak by many, would have ordered the arrest of Bloodbeard and the Yunkish slavers. Hisdar sat frozen, a man transfixed. Resnak set the head on a satin pillow at the king's feet, then scampered away, his mouth twisted up in a moo of distaste. Sir Barristan could smell the seneschal's heavy floral perfume from several yards away. The dead man stared up reproachfully. His beard was brown with caked blood, but a trickle of red still leaked from his neck. From the look of him, it had taken more than one blow to part his head from his body. In the back of the hall, petitioners began to slip away. One of the brazen beasts ripped off his brass hawk's mask and began to spew up his breakfast. Barristan Selmy was no stranger to severed heads. This one, though, he had crossed half the world with the old seafarer, from Pentos to Karth and back again to Astapor. Grolio was a good man. He did not deserve this end. All he ever wanted was to go home. The knight tensed, waiting. This, King Hisdar said at last, this is not, we are not pleased, this, what is the meaning of this, this, the slaver in the maroon tokar produced a parchment. I have the honor to bear this message from the Council of Masters. He unrolled the scroll. It is here written. Seven entered Mirin to sign the peace accords and witness the celebratory games at the pit of Daznak. As surety for their safety, seven hostages were tendered us. The Yellow City mourns its noble son Yorkaz Zoyunzak, who perished cruelly whilst a guest of Mirin. Blood must pay for blood. Grolio had a wife back in Pentos. Children, grandchildren. Why him of all the hostages? Jogo, Hiro, and Dario Naharis all commanded fighting men, but Grolio had been an admiral without a fleet. Did they draw straws? Or did they think Grolio the least valuable to us, the least likely to provoke reprisal? The knight asked himself. But it was easier to pose that question than to answer it. I have no skill at unraveling such knots. Your grace, Sir Barristan called out. If it please you to recall, the noble Yurkaz died by happenstance. He stumbled on the steps as he tried to flee the dragon and was crushed beneath the feet of his own slaves and companions. That or his heart burst in terror. He was old. Who is this who speaks without the king's leave? asked the Yunkish lord in the striped tokar, 
a small man with a receding chin and teeth too big for his mouth. He reminded Selmy of a rabbit. Must the lords of Yunkai attend to the natterings of guards? He shook the pearls that fringed his tokar. His darzo Lorak could not seem to look away from the head. Only when Reznak whispered something in his ear did he finally bestir himself. Yorkaz So Yunzak was your supreme commander, he said. Which of you speaks for Yun Kai now? All of us, said the rabbit. The Council of Masters. King Hisdar found some steel. Then all of you bear the responsibility for this breach of our peace. The Yunkish man in the breastplate gave answer. Our peace has not been breached. Blood pays for blood, a life for a life. To show our good faith, we return three of your hostages. The iron ranks behind him parted. Three Mirinis were ushered forward, clutching at their tokars, two women and a man. Sister, said Hisdar Zolorak, stiffly. Cousins, he gestured at the bleeding head. Remove that from our sight. The Admiral was a man of the sea, Ser Barristan reminded him. Mayhaps your magnificence might ask the young Kai to return his body to us, so we may bury him beneath the waves? The rabbit-toothed lord waved a hand. If it please your radiance, this shall be done, a sign of our respect. Reznak Mo Reznak cleared his throat noisily. Meaning no offense, yet it seems to me that her worship Queen Daenerys gave you, ah, uh, seven hostages. The other three, the others, shall remain our guests, announced the Yunkish lord in the breastplate, until the dragons have been destroyed. A hush fell across the hall. Then came the murmurs and the mutters, whispered curses, whispered prayers, the hornets stirring in their hive. The dragons, said King Hisdar, are monsters, as all men saw in Daznak's pit. No true peace is possible whilst they live. Reznak replied, Her magnificence, Queen Daenerys, is mother of dragons. Only she can— Bloodbeard's scorn cut him off. She is gone, burned and devoured. Weeds grow through her broken skull. A roar greeted those words. Some began to shout and curse. Others stamped their feet and whistled their approval. It took the brazen beasts pounding the butts of their spears against the floor before the hall quieted again. Sir Barristan never once took his eyes off Bloodbeard. He came to sack a city, and Hisdar's peace has cheated him of his plunder. He will do whatever he must to start the bloodshed. Hisdar Zolorak rose slowly from his dragon throne. I must consult my council. This court is done. All kneel for his magnificence, Hisdar Zolorak, fourteenth of that ancient name, king of Mirin, scion of Gis, Octark of the old empire, master of the Skahazadan, consort to dragons and blood of the harpy, the herald shouted. Brazen beasts swung out amongst the pillars to form a line, then began a slow advance in lockstep, ushering the petitioners from the hall. The Dornish men did not have as far to go as most. As befit his rank and station, Quentin Martell had been given quarters within the Great Pyramid, two levels down, a handsome suite of rooms with its own privy and walled terrace. Perhaps that was why he and his companions lingered, waiting until the press had lessened before beginning to make their way toward the steps. Sir Barristan watched them, thoughtful. What would Daenerys want? he asked himself. He thought he knew. The old knight strode across the hall, his long white cloak rippling behind him. He caught the Dornish men at the top of the steps. Your father's court was never half so lively, he heard Drinkwater japing. Prince Quentin, Selmy called. Might I beg a word? Quentin Martell turned. Sir Barristan, of course. My chambers are one level down. No. It is not my place to counsel you, Prince Quentin. But if I were you, I would not return to my chambers. You and your friends should go down the steps and leave. Prince Quentin stared. Leave the pyramid? Leave the city. Return to Dorne. The Dornish men exchanged a look. Our arms and armor are back in our apartments, said Garrus Drinkwater. Not to mention most of the coin that we have left. Swords can be replaced, said Sir Barristan. 
I can provide you with coin enough for passage back to Dorne. Prince Quentin, the king made note of you today. He frowned. Garrus Drinkwater laughed. Should we be frightened of Hisdar's Lorak? You saw him just now. He quailed before the Yunkishmen. They sent him a head, and he did nothing. Quentin Martell nodded in agreement. A prince does well to think before he acts. This king... I do not know what to think of him. The queen warned me against him as well, true, but she warned you. Selmy frowned. Why are you still here? Prince Quentin flushed. The marriage pact was made by two dead men and contained not a word about the queen or you. It promised your sister's hand to the queen's brother, another dead man. It has no force. Until you turned up here, her grace was ignorant of its existence. Your father keeps his secrets well, Prince Quentin. Too well, I fear. If the queen had known of this pact in Carth, she might never have turned aside for Slaver's Bay. But you came too late. I have no wish to salt your wounds, but her grace has a new husband and an old paramour, and seems to prefer the both of them to you. Anger flashed in the prince's dark eyes. This Giscari lordling is no fit consort for the Queen of the Seven Kingdoms. That is not for you to judge. Sir Barristan paused, wondering if he had said too much already. No, tell him the rest of it. That day at Dasnak's pit, some of the food in the royal box was poisoned. It was only chance that strong Belwas ate it all. The Blue Graces say that only his size and freakish strength have saved him, but it was a near thing. He may yet die. The shock was plain on Prince Quentin's face. Poison? Meant for Daenerys? Her or his dar, perhaps both. The box was his, though. His grace made all the arrangements. If the poison was his doing, well, he will need a scapegoat. Who better than a rival from a distant land who has no friends at this court? Who better than a suitor the queen spurned? Quentin Martell went pale. Me? I would never... You cannot think I had any part in any... That was the truth, or he is a master mummer. Others might, said Sir Barristan. The Red Viper was your uncle, and you have good reason to want King Hisdar dead. So do others, suggested Garrus Drinkwater. Naharis, for one. The Queen's... Paramour, Sir Barristan finished, before the Dornish Knight could say anything that might besmirch the Queen's honor. That is what you call them down in Dorn, is it not? He did not wait for a reply. Prince Lewin was my sworn brother. In those days there were few secrets amongst the King's Guard. I know he kept a paramour. He did not feel there was any shame in that. No, said Quentin, red-faced. But Dario would kill his dar in a heartbeat if he dared, Sir Barristan went on. But not with poison, never. And Dario was not there in any case. His dar would be pleased to blame him for the locusts all the same. But the king may yet have need of the storm crows, and he will lose them if he appears complicit in the death of their captain. No, my prince, if his grace needs a poisoner, he will look to you. He had said all that he could safely say. In a few more days, if the gods smiled on them, his Darzo Lorak would no longer rule Mirene, but no good would be served by having Prince Quentin caught up in the bloodbath that was coming. If you must remain in Mirene, you would do well to stay away from court and hope Hisdar forgets you, Sir Barristan finished. But a ship for Volantis would be wiser, my prince. Whatever course you choose, I wish you well. Before he had gone three steps, Quentin Martell called out to him, Barristan the Bold, they call you. Some do. Selmy had won that name when he was ten years old, a new-made squire, yet so vain and proud and foolish that he got it in his head that he could joust with tried and proven knights. So he'd borrowed a warhorse and some plate from Lord Dondarrion's armory and entered the lists at Blackhaven as a mystery knight. Even the herald laughed. My arms were so thin that when I lowered my lance it was all I could do to keep the point from furrowing the ground. Lord Dondarrion would have been within his rights to pull him off the horse and spank him, but the Prince of Dragonflies had taken pity on the addle-pated boy in the ill-fitting armor, and accorded him the respect of taking up his challenge. One course was all that it required. 
Afterward, Prince Duncan helped him to his feet and removed his helm. A boy, he had proclaimed to the crowd. A bold boy. Fifty-three years ago, how many men are still alive who were there at Blackhaven? What name do you think they will give me should I return to Dorn without Daenerys? Prince Quentin asked. Quentin the Cautious? Quentin the Craven? Quentin the Quail? The prince who came too late, the old knight thought. But if a knight of the king's guard learns nothing else, he learns to guard his tongue. Quentin the Wise, he suggested, and hoped that it was true. The Spurned Suitor The hour of ghosts was almost upon them when Sir Garrus Drinkwater returned to the pyramid to report that he had found beans, books, and old Bill Bone in one of Meereen's less savory cellars, drinking yellow wine and watching naked slaves kill one another with bare hands and filed teeth. Beans pulled a blade and proposed a wager to determine if deserters had bellies full of yellow slime, Sir Garris reported. So I tossed him a dragon and asked if yellow gold would do. He bit the coin and asked what I meant to buy. When I told him, he slipped the knife away and asked if I was drunk or mad. Let him think what he wants, so long as he delivers the message, said Quentin. He'll do that much. I'll wager you get your meeting, too, if only so rags can have pretty Maris cut your liver out and fry it up with onions. We should be heeding Somi. When Barristan the Bold tells you to run, a wise man laces up his boots. We should find a ship for Volantis whilst the port is still open. Just the mention turned Sir Archibald's cheeks green. No more ships. I'd sooner hop back to Volantis on one foot. Volantis, Quentin thought. Then Lys, then home. Back the way I came, empty-handed. Three brave men dead. For what? It would be sweet to see the green blood again to visit Sunspear and the water gardens and breathe the clean, sweet mountain air of Ironwood in place of the hot, wet, filthy humors of Slaver's Bay. His father would speak no word of rebuke, Quentin knew, but the disappointment would be there in his eyes. His sister would be scornful, the sand snakes would mock him with smiles sharp as swords, and Lord Ironwood, his second father, who had sent his own son along to keep him safe. I will not keep you here, Quentin told his friends. My father laid this task on me, not you. Go home if that is what you want. By whatever means you like. I am staying. The big man shrugged. Then drink and me are staying too. The next night, Denzo Dehan turned up at Prince Quentin's door to talk terms. He will meet with you on the morrow by the spice market. Look for a door marked with a purple lotus. Knock twice and call for freedom. Agreed, said Quentin. Arch and Garrus will be with me. He can bring two men as well, no more. If it please my prince. The words were polite enough, but Denzo's tone was edged with malice, and the eyes of the warrior poet gleamed bright with mockery. Come at sunset, and see that you are not followed. The Dornishmen left the Great Pyramid an hour shy of sunset in case they took a wrong turn or had difficulty finding the Purple Lotus. Quentin and Garrus wore their sword belts. The big man had his warhammer slung across his broad back. It is still not too late to abandon this folly, Garrus said, as they made their way down a fetid alley toward the old spice market. The smell of piss was in the air and they could hear the rumble of a corpse cart's iron-rimmed wheels off ahead. Old Bill Bone used to say that Pretty Maris could stretch out a man's dying for a moon's turn. We lied to them, Quent, used them to get us here, then went over to the Storm Crows. As we were commanded. Tatters never meant for us to do it for real, though, put in the big man. His other boys, Sarah Orson and Dick Straw, Hungerford, Will of the Woods, that lot, they're still down in some dungeon thanks to us. Old Rags can't have liked that much. No, 
Prince Quentin said. But he likes gold. Garrus laughed. A pity we have none. Do you trust this piece, Quent? I don't. Half the city is calling the Dragon Slayer a hero, and the other half spits blood at the mention of his name. Arzu, the big man said. Quentin frowned. His name was Hargaz. Hisdar, Humzum, Hagnag, what does it matter? I call them all Harzu. He was no dragon slayer. All he did was get his arse roasted black and crispy. He was brave. Would I have the courage to face that monster with nothing but a spear? He died bravely is what you mean. He died screaming, said Arch. Garrus put a hand on Quentin's shoulder. Even if the queen returns, she'll still be married. Not if I give King Harzu a little smack with my hammer, suggested the big man. Hisdar, said Quentin. His name is Hisdar. One kiss from my hammer and no one will care what his name was, said Arch. They do not see. His friends had lost sight of his true purpose here. The road leads through her, not to her. Daenerys is the means to the prize, not the prize itself. The dragon has three heads, she said to me. My marriage need not be the end of all your hopes, she said. I know why you are here, for fire and blood. I have Targaryen blood in me, you know that. I can trace my lineage back. Fuck your lineage, said Garrus. The dragons won't care about your blood, except maybe how it tastes. You cannot tame a dragon with a history lesson. They're monsters, not maesters. Quent, is this truly what you want to do? This is what I have to do. For Dorn, for my father, for Cletus and Will and Maester Kedry. They're dead, said Garrus. They won't care. All dead, Quentin agreed. For what? To bring me here so I might wed the Dragon Queen. A grand adventure, Cletus called it. Demon roads and stormy seas, and at the end of it the most beautiful woman in the world, a tale to tell our grandchildren. But Cletus will never father a child, unless he left a bastard in the belly of that tavern wench he liked. Will will never have his wedding. Their deaths should have some meaning. Garrus pointed to where a corpse slumped against a brick wall, attended by a cloud of glistening green flies. Did his death have meaning? Quentin looked at the body with distaste. He died of the flux. Stay well away from him. The pale mare was inside the city walls. Small wonder that the streets seemed so empty. The Unsullied will send a corpse cart for him. No doubt, but that was not my question. Men's lives have meaning, not their deaths. I loved Will and Cletus too, but this will not bring them back to us. This is a mistake, Quint. You cannot trust in sellswords. They are men like any other men. They want gold, glory, power. That's all I am trusting in. That and my own destiny. I am a prince of Dorn, and the blood of dragons is in my veins. The sun had sunk below the city wall by the time they found the purple lotus, painted on the weathered wooden door of a low brick hovel squatting amidst a row of similar hovels in the shadow of the great yellow and green pyramid of Razdar. Quentin knocked twice, as instructed. A gruff voice answered through the door, growling something unintelligible in the mongrel tongue of Slaver's Bay, an ugly blend of old Giscari and High Valyrian. The prince answered in the same tongue. Freedom. The door opened. Garrus entered first, for caution's sake, with Quentin close behind him and the big man bringing up the rear. Within, the air was hazy with bluish smoke, whose sweet smell could not quite cover up the deeper stinks of piss and sour wine and rotting meat. The space was much larger than it had seemed from without, stretching off to right and left into the adjoining hovels. What had appeared to be a dozen structures from the street turned into one long hall inside. At this hour, the house was less than half full. A few of the patrons favored the Dornishmen with looks bored or hostile or curious. The rest were crowded around the pit at the far end of the room, 
where a pair of naked men were slashing at each other with knives whilst the watchers cheered them on. Quentin saw no sign of the men they had come to meet. Then a door he had not seen before swung open, and an old woman entered, a shriveled thing in a dark red tokar fringed with tiny golden skulls. Her skin was white as mare's milk, her hair so thin that he could see the scalp beneath. Dawn, she said. I be Zarina. Purple Lotus. Go down here, you find them. She held the door and gestured them through. Beyond was a flight of wooden steps, steep and twisting. This time the big man led the way, and Garrus was the rear guard, with the prince between them. An underseller. It was a long way down, and so dark that Quentin had to feel his way to keep from slipping. Near the bottom, Sir Archibald pulled his dagger. They emerged in a brick vault thrice the size of the wine sink above. Huge wooden vats lined the walls as far as the prince could see. A red lantern hung on a hook just inside the door, and a greasy black candle flickered on an overturned barrel serving as a table. That was the only light. Cago Corpse Killer was pacing by the wine vats, his black arak hanging at his hip. Pretty Maris stood cradling a crossbow, her eyes as cold and dead as two gray stones. Denzo Dahan barred the door once the Dornish men were inside, then took up a position in front of it, arms crossed against his chest. One too many, Quentin thought. The tattered prince himself was seated at the table, nursing a cup of wine. In the yellow candlelight his silver-gray hair seemed almost golden, though the pouches underneath his eyes were etched as large as saddlebags. He wore a brown wool traveler's cloak, with silvery chain mail glimmering underneath. Did that betoken treachery or simple prudence? An old sellsword is a cautious sellsword. Quentin approached his table. My lord, you look different without your cloak. My ragged raiment? The Pentashi gave a shrug. A poor thing. Yet those tatters fill my foes with fear, and on the battlefield the sight of my rags blowing in the wind emboldens my men more than any banner. And if I want to move unseen, I need only slip it off to become plain and unremarkable. He gestured at the bench across from him. Sit. I understand you are a prince. Would that I had known. Will you drink? Zarina offers food as well. Her bread is stale and her stew is unspeakable. Grease and salt with a morsel or two of meat. Dogs, she says, but I think rat is more likely. It will not kill you, though. I have found that it is only when the food is tempting that one must beware. Poisoners invariably choose the choicest dishes. You brought three men, Sir Garris pointed out, with an edge in his voice. We agreed on two apiece. Maris is no man. Maris, sweet, undo your shirt, show him. That will not be necessary, said Quentin. If the talk he had heard was true, beneath that shirt pretty Maris had only the scars left by the men who'd cut her breasts off. Maris is a woman, I agree. You've still twisted the terms. Tattered and twisty, what a rogue I am. Three to two is not much of an advantage, it must be admitted, but it counts for something. In this world a man must learn to seize whatever gifts the gods chose to send him. That was a lesson I learned at some cost. I offer it to you as a sign of my good faith. He gestured at the chair again. Sit, and say what you came to say. I promise not to have you killed until I have heard you out. That is the least I can do for a fellow prince. Quentin, is it? Quentin of House Martell. Frog suits you better. It is not my custom to drink with liars and deserters, but you've made me curious. Quentin sat. One wrong word, and this could turn to blood in half a heartbeat. I ask your pardon for our deception. The only ships sailing for Slaver's Bay were those that had been hired to bring you to the wars. The tattered prince gave a shrug. Every turncloak has his tail. 
You are not the first to swear me your swords, take my coin, and run. All of them have reasons. My little son is sick, or my wife is putting horns on me, or the other men all make me suck their cocks. Such a charming boy, the last, but I did not excuse his desertion. Another fellow told me our food was so wretched that he had to flee before it made him sick. So I had his foot cut off, roasted up, and fed it to him. Then I made him our camp cook. Our meals improved markedly, and when his contract was fulfilled, he signed another. You, though. Several of my best are locked up in the Queen's dungeons thanks to that lying tongue of yours, and I doubt that you can even cook. I am a Prince of Dorne, said Quentin. I had a duty to my father and my people. There was a secret marriage pact. So I heard. And when the Silver Queen saw your scrap of parchment, she fell into your arms, yes? No, said pretty Maris. No? Oh, I recall. Your bride flew off on a dragon. Well, when she returns, do be sure to invite us to your nuptials. The men of the company would love to drink to your happiness, and I do love a Westerosi wedding. The betting part especially, only— Oh, wait. He turned to Denzo de Han. Denzo, I thought you told me that the Dragon Queen had married some Giscari. A Mirinese nobleman, rich. The tattered prince turned back to Quentin. Could that be true? Surely not. What of your marriage pact? She laughed at him, said pretty Maris. Daenerys never laughed. The rest of Meereen might see him as an amusing curiosity, like the exiled Summer Islander King Robert used to keep at King's Landing, but the Queen had always spoken to him gently. We came too late, said Quentin. A pity you did not desert me sooner. The tattered prince sipped at his wine. So, no wedding for Prince Frog. Is that why you've come hopping back to me? Have my three brave Dornish lads decided to honor their contracts? No. How vexing. Yorkazzo Yunzak is dead. Ancient tidings. I saw him die. The poor man saw a dragon and stumbled as he tried to flee. Then a thousand of his closest friends stepped on him. No doubt the yellow city is awash in tears. Did you ask me here to toast his memory? No. Have the Yankish men chosen a new commander? The Council of Masters has been unable to agree. Yazanzo Kagaz had the most support, but now he's died as well. The wise masters are rotating the supreme command amongst themselves. Today our leader is the one your friends in the ranks dubbed the Drunken Conqueror. On the morrow it will be Lord Wobblecheeks. The rabbit, said Maris. Wobblecheeks was yesterday. I stand corrected, my sweetling. Our Yunkish friends were kind enough to provide us with a chart. I must strive to be more assiduous about consulting it. Yorkazzo Yunzak was the man who hired you. He signed our contract on behalf of his city, just so. Mirin and Yunkai have made peace. The siege is to be lifted, the armies disbanded. There will be no battle, no slaughter, no city to sack and plunder. Life is full of disappointments. How long do you think the Yunkish men will want to continue paying wages to four free companies? The tattered prince took a sip of wine and said, A vexing question. But this is the way of life for we men of the free companies. One war ends, another begins. Fortunately, there is always someone fighting someone somewhere. Perhaps here. Even as we sit here drinking, Bloodbeard is urging our Yunkish friends to present King Hisdar with another head. Freedmen and slavers eye each other's necks and sharpen their knives. The sons of the harpy plot in their pyramids. The pale mare rides down slave and lord alike. Our friends from the yellow city gaze out to sea. And somewhere in the grasslands a dragon nibbles the tender flesh of Daenerys Targaryen. Who rules Meereen tonight? Who will rule it on the morrow? The Pentashi gave a shrug. One thing I am certain of. 
someone will have need of our swords. I have need of those swords. Dorne will hire you. The tattered prince glanced at pretty Maris. He does not like for gall this frog. Must I remind him? My dear prince, the last contract we signed you used to wipe your pretty pink bottom. I will double whatever the Yankish men are paying you. And pay in gold upon the signing of our contract, yes? I will pay you part when we reach Volantis, the rest when I am back in Sunspear. We brought gold with us when we set sail, but it would have been hard to conceal once we joined the company, so we gave it over to the banks. I can show you papers. Ah, papers. But we will be paid double. Twice as many papers, said Pretty Maris. The rest you'll have in Dorne, Quentin insisted. My father is a man of honor. If I put my seal to an agreement, he will fulfill its terms. You have my word on that. The tattered prince finished his wine, turned the cup over, and set it down between them. So, let me see if I understand. A proven liar and oathbreaker wishes to contract with us and pay in promises. And for what services? I wonder. Are my wind blown to smash the young Kai and sack the Yellow City? Defeat a Dothraki Kalasar in the field? Escort you home to your father? Or will you be content if we deliver Queen Daenerys to your bed, wet and willing? Tell me true, Prince Frog. What would you have of me and mine? I need you to help me steal a dragon. Kago Corpse Killer chuckled. Pretty Maris curled her lip in a half smile. Denzo Dehan whistled. The tattered prince only leaned back on his stool and said, Double does not pay for dragons, princeling. Even a frog should know that much. Dragons come dear. And men who pay in promises should have at least the sense to promise more. If you want me to triple what I want, said the tattered prince, is Pentos. The Griffin Reborn he sent the archers in first. Black Balak commanded one thousand bows. In his youth, John Connington had shared the disdain most knights had for bowmen, but he had grown wiser in battle. In its own way, the arrow was as deadly as the sword, so for the long voyage he had insisted that homeless Harry Strickland break Balak's command into ten companies of one hundred men and place each company upon a different ship. Six of those ships had stayed together well enough to deliver their passengers to the shores of Cape Wrath. The other four were lagging, but would turn up eventually, the Volantines assured them, but Griff thought it just as likely they were lost or had landed elsewhere, which left the company with six hundred bows. For this, two hundred proved sufficient. They will try to send out ravens, he told Black Palak. Watch the Maester's Tower. Here. He pointed to the map he had drawn in the mud of their campsite. Bring down every bird that leaves the castle. This we do, replied the summer islander. A third of Balak's men used crossbows, another third the double-curved horn and sinew bows of the east. Better than these were the big yew longbows borne by the archers of Westerosi blood, and best of all were the great bows of Goldenheart treasured by Black Balak himself and his fifty summer islanders. Only a dragon-bone bow could outrange one made of golden heart. Whatever bow they carried, all of Balak's men were sharp-eyed, seasoned veterans who had proved their worth in a hundred battles, raids, and skirmishes. They proved it again at Griffin's Roost. The castle rose from the shores of Cape Wrath on a lofty crag of dark red stone surrounded on three sides by the surging waters of Shipbreaker Bay. Its only approach was defended by a gatehouse, behind which lay the long bare ridge the Conningtons called the Griffin's Throat. To force the throat could be a bloody business, since the ridge exposed the attackers to the spears, stones, and arrows of defenders in the two round towers that flanked the castle's main gates. And once they reached those gates, the men inside could pour down boiling oil on their heads. Griff expected to lose a hundred men, perhaps more. They lost four. 
The woods had been allowed to encroach on the field beyond the gatehouse, so Franklin Flowers was able to use the brush for concealment and lead his men within twenty yards of the gates before emerging from the trees with the ram they'd fashioned back at camp. The crash of wood on wood brought two men to the battlements. Black Balak's archers took down both of them before they could rub the sleep out of their eyes. The gate turned out to be closed but not barred. It gave way at the second blow, and Sir Franklin's men were halfway up the throat before a war horn sounded the alarum from the castle proper. The first raven took flight as their grapnels were arcing above the curtain wall, the second a few moments later. Neither bird had flown a hundred yards before an arrow took it down. A guard inside dumped down a bucket of oil on the first men to reach the gates, but as he'd had no time to heat it, the bucket caused more damage than its contents. Swords were soon ringing in half a dozen places along the battlements. The men of the Golden Company clambered through the merlins and raced along the wall walks, shouting, A griffin! A griffin! The ancient battle cry of House Connington, which must have left the defenders even more confused. It was over within minutes. Griff rode up the throat on a white courser beside homeless Harry Strickland. As they neared the castle, he saw a third raven flap from the maester's tower, only to be feathered by Black Balak himself. No more messages, he told Sir Franklin Flowers in the yard. The next thing to come flying from the maester's tower was the maester. The way his arms were flapping, he might have been mistaken for another bird. That was the end of all resistance. What guards remained had thrown down their weapons, and quick as that, Griffin's roost was his again and John Connington was once more a lord. Sir Franklin, he said, go through the keep and kitchens and roust out everyone you find. Mallow, do the same with the maester's tower and the armory. Sir Brendel, the stables, sept, and barracks. Bring them out into the yard, and try not to kill anyone who does not insist on dying. We want to win the stormlands, and we won't do that with slaughter. Be sure you look under the altar of the mother, there's a hidden stair there that leads down to a secret bolt hole, and another under the northwest tower that goes straight down to the sea. No one is to escape. They won't, my lord, promised Franklin Flowers. Connington watched them dash off, then beckoned to the half-maester. Halden, take charge of the rookery. I'll have messages to send out tonight. Let us hope they left some ravens for us. Even homeless Harry was impressed by the swiftness of their victory. I never thought that it would be so easy, the Captain General said, as they walked into the Great Hall to have a look at the carved and gilded griffin seat where fifty generations of Conningtons had sat and ruled. It will get harder. So far we have taken them unawares. That cannot last forever, even if Black Balak brings down every raven in the realm. Strickland studied the faded tapestries on the walls, the arched windows with their myriad diamond-shaped panes of red and white glass, the racks of spears and swords and warhammers. Let them come. This place can stand against twenty times our number, so long as we are well provisioned. And you say there is a way in and out by sea? Below. A hidden cove beneath the crag, which appears only when the tide is out but Connington had no intention of letting them come. Griffin's roost was strong but small, and so long as they sat here they would seem small as well. But there was another castle nearby, vastly larger and impregnable. Take that and the realm will shake. You must excuse me, Captain General. My Lord Father is buried beneath the sept, and it has been too many years since last I prayed for him. Of course, my Lord. Yet when they parted, John Connington did not go to the sept. Instead, his steps led him up to the roof of the east tower, the tallest at Griffin's Roost. As he climbed, he remembered past ascents, a hundred with his lord father, who liked to stand and look out over woods and crags and sea, and know that all he saw belonged to House Connington, and one, only one, with Rhaegar Targaryen. Prince Rhaegar was returning from Dorne, and he and his escort had lingered here a fortnight. He was so young then, and I was younger. Boys, the both of us. At the welcoming feast, the prince had taken up his silver-stringed harp and played for them. A song of love and doom, John Connington recalled. 
and every woman in the hall was weeping when he put down the harp. Not the men, of course. Particularly not his own father, whose only love was land. Lord Armand Connington spent the entire evening trying to win the prince to his side in his dispute with Lord Morrigan. The door to the roof of the tower was stuck so fast that it was plain no one had opened it in years. He had to put his shoulder to it to force it open. But when John Connington stepped out onto the high battlements, the view was just as intoxicating as he remembered. The crag with its wind-carved rocks and jagged spires, the sea below growling and worrying at the foot of the castle like some restless beast, endless leagues of sky and cloud, the wood with its autumnal colors. Your father's lands are beautiful, Prince Rhaegar had said, standing right where John was standing now. And the boy he'd been had replied, One day they will all be mine. As if that could impress a prince who was heir to the entire realm, from the arbor to the wall. Griffin's roost had been his eventually, if only for a few short years. From here, John Connington had ruled broad lands extending many leagues to the west, north, and south, just as his father and his father's father had before him. But his father and his father's father had never lost their lands. He had. I rose too high, loved too hard, dared too much. I tried to grasp a star, overreached, and fell. After the Battle of the Bells, when Aerys Targaryen had stripped him of his titles and sent him into exile in a mad fit of ingratitude and suspicion, the lands and lordship had remained within House Connington, passing to his cousin Sir Ronald, the man whom John had made his castle end when he went to King's Landing to attend Prince Rhaegar. Robert Baratheon had completed the destruction of the Griffins after the war. Cousin Ronald was permitted to retain his castle and his head, but he lost his lordship, thereafter being merely the knight of Griffin's Roost, and nine-tenths of his lands were taken from him and parceled out to neighbor lords who had supported Robert's claim. Ronald Connington had died years before. The present knight of Griffin's Roost, his son Ronnet, was said to be off at war in the Riverlands. That was for the best. In John Connington's experience, men would fight for things they felt were theirs, even things they'd gained by theft. He did not relish the notion of celebrating his return by killing one of his own kin. Red Ronnet's sire had been quick to take advantage of his lord cousin's downfall, true, but his son had been a child at the time. John Connington did not even hate the late Sir Ronald as much as he might have. The fault was his. He had lost it all at Stony Sept in his arrogance. Robert Baratheon had been hiding somewhere in the town, wounded and alone. John Connington had known that, and he had also known that Robert's head upon a spear would have put an end to the rebellion then and there. He was young and full of pride. How not? King Eris had named him Hand and given him an army, and he meant to prove himself worthy of that trust, of Rhaegar's love. He would slay the rebel lord himself and carve a place out for himself in all the histories of the Seven Kingdoms. And so he swept down on Stony Sept, closed off the town, and began a search. His knights went house to house, smashed in every door, peered into every cellar. He had even sent men crawling through the sewers, yet somehow Robert still eluded him. The townsfolk were hiding him. They moved him from one secret bolt hole to the next, always one step ahead of the king's men. The whole town was a nest of traitors. At the end they had the usurper hidden in a brothel. What sort of king was that who would hide behind the skirts of women? Yet whilst the search dragged on, Eddard Stark and Hoster Tully came down upon the town with a rebel army. Bells and battle followed, and Robert emerged from his brothel with a blade in hand, and almost slew John on the steps of the old sept that gave the town its name. For years afterward, John Connington told himself that he was not to blame, that he had done all that any man could do. His soldiers searched every hole and hovel, he offered pardons and rewards, he took hostages and hung them in crow cages and swore that they would have neither food nor drink until Robert was delivered to him. All to no avail. Tywin Lannister himself could have done no more, he had insisted one night to Blackheart during his first year of exile. There is where you're wrong, 
Miles Toyne had replied. Lord Tywin would not have bothered with a search. He would have burned that town and every living creature in it. Men and boys, babes at the breast, noble knights and holy septons, pigs and whores, rats and rebels, he would have burned them all. When the fires guttered out and only ash and cinders remained, he would have sent his men in to find the bones of Robert Baratheon. Later, when Stark and Tully turned up with their host, he would have offered pardons to the both of them, and they would have accepted and turned for home with their tails between their legs. He was not wrong, John Connington reflected, leaning on the battlements of his forebears. I wanted the glory of slaying Robert in single combat, and I did not want the name of Butcher. So Robert escaped me and cut down Rhaegar on the trident. I failed the father, he said, but I will not fail the son. By the time Connington made his descent, his men had gathered the castle garrison and surviving small folk together in the yard. Though Sir Ronnet was indeed off north somewhere with Jane Lannister, Griffin's roost was not quite bereft of Griffin's. Amongst the prisoners were Ronnet's younger brother Raymond, his sister Alin, and his natural son, a fierce red-haired boy they called Ronald Storm. All would make for useful hostages if and when Red Ronnet should return to try and take back the castle that his father had stolen. Connington ordered them confined to the West Tower under guard. The girl began to cry at that, and the bastard boy tried to bite the spearmen closest to him. Stop it, the both of you, he snapped at them. No harm will come to any of you unless Red Ronnet proves an utter fool. Only a few of the captives had been in service here when John Connington had last been lord, a grizzled sergeant, blind in one eye, a couple of the washerwomen, a groom who had been a stable boy during Robert's rebellion, the cook, who had grown enormously fat, the castle armorer. Griff had let his beard grow out during the voyage, for the first time in many years, and to his surprise it had come in mostly red, though here and there ash showed amidst the fire. Clad in a long red and white tunic embroidered with the twin griffins of his house, counterchanged and combatant, he looked an older, sterner version of the young lord who had been Prince Rhaegar's friend and companion, but the men and women of Griffin's Roost still looked at him with strangers' eyes. Some of you will know me, he told them. The rest will learn. I am your rightful lord, returned from exile. My enemies have told you I am dead. Those tales are false, as you can see. Serve me as faithfully as you have served my cousin, and no harm need come to any of you. He brought them forward one by one, asked each man his name, then bid them kneel and swear him their allegiance. It all went swiftly. The soldiers of the garrison, only four had survived the attack, the old sergeant and three boys, laid their swords at his feet. No one balked, no one died. That night in the great hall the victors feasted on roast meats and fresh-caught fish, washed down with rich red wines from the castle cellars. John Connington presided from the griffin's seat, sharing the high table with homeless Harry Strickland, Black Balak, Franklin Flowers, and the three young griffins they had taken captive. The children were of his blood, and he felt that he should know them, but when the bastard boy announced, My father's going to kill you, he decided that his knowledge was sufficient, ordered them back to their cells, and excused himself. Halden Halfmaster had been absent from the feast. Lord John found him in the maester's tower, bent over a pile of parchments, with maps spread out all around him. Hoping to determine where the rest of the company might be? Connington asked him. Would that I could, my lord. Ten thousand men had sailed from Volantheris, with all their weapons, horses, elephants. Not quite half that number had turned up thus far on Westeros, at or near their intended landing site, a deserted stretch of coast on the edge of the Rainwood, lands that John Connington knew well, as they had once been his. Only a few years ago, he would never have dared attempt a landing on Cape Wrath. The Storm Lords were too fiercely loyal to House Baratheon and to King Robert. But with both Robert and his brother Renly slain, everything was changed. Stannis was too harsh and cold a man to inspire much in the way of loyalty, even if he had not been half a world away, and the Stormlands had little reason to love House Lannister. 
and John Connington was not without his own friends here. Some of the older lords will still remember me, and their sons will have heard the stories, and every man of them will know of Rhaegar and his young son whose head was smashed against a cold stone wall. Fortunately, his own ship had been one of the first to reach their destination. Then it had only been a matter of establishing a campsite, assembling his men as they came ashore and moving quickly, before the local lordlings had any inkling of their peril. And there the Golden Company had proved its mettle. The chaos that would inevitably have delayed such a march with a hastily assembled host of household knights and local levies had been nowhere in evidence. These were the heirs of bitter steel, and discipline was mother's milk to them. By this time on the morrow we ought to hold three castles, he said. The force that had taken Griffin's roost represented a quarter of their available strength. Sir Tristan Rivers had set off simultaneously for the seat of House Morrigan at Crow's Nest, and Laswell Peak for Rain House, the stronghold of the Wilds, each with a force of comparable size. The rest of their men had remained in camp to guard their landing site and prince, under the command of the company's volunteer paymaster, Goris Edorian. Their numbers would continue to swell, one hoped. More ships were straggling in every day. We still have too few horses. And no elephants, the half-maester reminded him. Not one of the great cogs carrying the elephants had turned up yet. They had last seen them at Lys, before the storm that had scattered half the fleet. Horses can be found in Westeros. Elephants do not matter. The great beasts would be useful in a pitched battle, no doubt, but it would be some time before they had the strength to face their foes in the field. Have those parchments told you anything of use? Oh, much and more, my lord. Halden gave him a thin smile. The Lannisters make enemies easily, but seem to have a harder time keeping friends. Their alliance with the Tyrells is fraying, to judge from what I read here. Queen Cersei and Queen Margery are fighting over the little king like two bitches with a chicken bone, and both have been accused of treason and debauchery. Mace Tyrell has abandoned his siege of Storm's End to march back to King's Landing and save his daughter, leaving only a token force behind to keep Stannis's men penned up inside the castle. Connington sat. Tell me more. In the north, the Lannisters are relying on the Boltons and in the Riverlands upon the Freys, both houses long renowned for treachery and cruelty. Lord Stannis Baratheon remains in open rebellion, and the Ironborn of the Islands have raised up a king as well. No one ever seems to mention the Vale, which suggests to me that the Arryns have taken no part in any of this. And Dorn? The Vale was far away. Dorn was close. Prince Doran's younger son has been betrothed to Marcella Baratheon, which would suggest that the Dornishmen have thrown in with House Lannister, but they have an army in the Boneway and another in the Prince's Pass, just waiting. Waiting. He frowned. For what? Without Daenerys and her dragons, Dorne was central to their hopes. Right, Sunspear. Doran Martell must know that his sister's son is still alive and has come home to claim his father's throne. As you say, my lord. The half-maester glanced at another parchment. We could scarcely have timed our landing better. We have potential friends and allies at every hand. But no dragons, said John Connington. So to win these allies to our cause, we must needs have something to offer them. Gold and land are the traditional incentives. Would that we had either. Promises of land and promises of gold may suffice for some, but Strickland and his men will expect first claim on the choicest fields and castles, those that were taken from their forebears when they fled into exile. No. My lord does have one prize to offer, Halden Halfmaster pointed out. Prince Aegon's hand, a marriage alliance to bring some great house to our banners. A bride for our bright prince. John Connington remembered Prince Rhaegar's wedding all too well. Ilya was never worthy of him. She was frail and sickly from the first, and childbirth only left her weaker. After the birth of Prince Rhaenys, her mother had been bedridden for half a year, and Prince Aegon's birth had almost been the death of her. 
She would bear no more children, the maesters told Prince Rhaegar afterward. Daenerys Targaryen may yet come home one day, Connington told the half-maester. Aegon must be free to marry her. My lord knows best, said Haldan. In that case, we might consider offering potential friends a lesser prize. What would you suggest? You. You are unwed? A great lord, still virile, with no heirs except these cousins we have just now dispossessed, the scion of an ancient house with a fine stout castle and wide rich lands that will no doubt be restored, and perhaps expanded by a grateful king once we have triumphed. You have a name as a warrior, and as King Aegon's hand you will speak with his voice and rule this realm in all but name. I would think that many an ambitious lord might be eager to wed his daughter to such a man, even perhaps the Prince of Dorne. John Connington's answer was a long, cold stare. There were times when the half-maester vexed him almost as much as that dwarf had. I think not. Death is creeping up my arm. No man must ever know, nor any wife. He got back to his feet. Prepare the letter to Prince Doran. As my lord commands. John Connington slept that night in the lord's chambers, in the bed that had once been his father's, beneath a dusty canopy of red and white velvet. He woke at dawn to the sound of falling rain and the timid knock of a serving man anxious to learn how his new lord would break his fast. Boiled eggs, fried bread and beans, and a jug of wine, the worst wine in the cellar. The... the worst, my lord? You heard me. When the food and wine had been brought up, he barred the door, emptied the jug into a bowl, and soaked his hand in it. Vinegar soaks and vinegar baths were the treatment Lady Lamore had prescribed for the dwarf when she feared he might have grayscale, but asking for a jug of vinegar each morning would give the game away. Wine would need to serve, though he saw no sense in wasting a good vintage. The nails on all four fingers were black now, though not yet on his thumb. On the middle finger, the gray had crept up past the second knuckle. I should hack them off, he thought. But how would I explain two missing fingers? He dare not let the grayscale become known. Queer as it seemed, men who would cheerfully face battle and risk death to rescue a companion would abandon that same companion in a heartbeat if he were known to have grayscale. I should have let the damned dwarf drown. Later that day, garbed and gloved once more, Connington made an inspection of the castle and sent word to homeless Harry Strickland and his captains to join him for a war council. Nine of them assembled in the solar, Connington and Strickland, Halden Halfmaester, Black Balak, Sir Franklin Flowers, Mallow Jane, Sir Brendel Byrne, Dick Cole, and Lyman Pease. The Halfmaester had good tidings. Words reached the camp from Mark Mandrake. The Volantines put him ashore on what turned out to be Estermont, with close to five hundred men. He's taken Greenstone. Estermont was an island off Cape Wrath, never one of their objectives. The damned Volantines are so eager to be rid of us, they are dumping us ashore on any bit of land they see, said Franklin Flowers. I'll wager you that we've got lads scattered all over half the bloody stepstones, too. With my elephants, Harry Strickland said in a mournful tone. He missed his elephants, did homeless Harry? Mandrake had no archers with him, said Lyman Pease. Do we know if Greenstone got off any ravens before it fell? I expect they did, said John Connington. But what messages would they have carried? At best, some garbled account of raiders from the sea. Even before they had sailed from Volantheris, he had instructed his captains to show no banners during these first attacks, not Prince Aegon's three-headed dragon, nor his own griffins, nor the skulls and golden battle standards of the company. Let the Lannisters suspect Stannis Baratheon, pirates from the Stepstones, outlaws out of the woods, or whoever else they cared to blame. If the reports that reached King's Landing were confused and contradictory, so much the better. The slower the Iron Throne was to react, the longer they would have to gather their strength and bring allies to the cause. There should be ships on Estermont. It is an island. Halden, 
Send word to Mandrake to leave a garrison behind and bring the rest of his men over to Cape Wrath, along with any noble captives. As you command, my lord. House Estermont has blood ties to both kings, as it happens. Good hostages. Good ransoms, said Homeless Harry, happily. It is time we sent for Prince Aegon as well, Lord John announced. He will be safer here behind the walls of Griffin's Roost than back at camp. I'll send a rider, said Franklin Flowers. But the lad won't like much the idea of staying safe, I'll tell you that. He wants to be in the thick of things. So did we all at his age, Lord John thought, remembering. Has the time come to raise his banner? asked Pease. Not yet. Let King's Landing think this is no more than an exile lord coming home with some hired swords to reclaim his birthright. An old familiar story, that. I will even write King Tommen, stating as much and asking for a pardon and the restoration of my lands and titles. That will give them something to chew over for a while. And whilst they dither, we will send out word secretly to likely friends in the Stormlands and the Reach. And Dorn. That was the crucial step. Lesser lords might join their cause for fear of harm or hope of gain, but only the Prince of Dorne had the power to defy House Lannister and its allies. Above all else, we must have Doran Martell. Small chance of that, said Strickland. The Dornishman is scared of his own shadow, not what you call daring. No more than you. Prince Doran is a cautious man, that's true. He will never join us unless he is convinced that we will win. So to persuade him, we must show our strength. If Peak and Rivers are successful, we will control the better part of Cape Wrath, argued Strickland. Four castles in as many days, that's a splendid start. But we are still only at half strength. We need to wait for the rest of my men. We are missing horses as well, and the elephants. Wait, I say. Gather our power. Win some small lords to our cause. Let Lysono Mar dispatch his spies to learn what we can learn of our foes. Connington gave the plump Captain General a cool look. This man is no black heart, no bitter steel, no malus. He would wait until all seven hells were frozen if he could, rather than risk another bout of blisters. We did not cross half the world to wait. Our best chance is to strike hard and fast before King's Landing knows who we are. I mean to take Storm's End, a nigh-impregnable stronghold, and Stannis Baratheon's last foothold in the south. Once taken, it will give us a secure fastness to which we may retreat at need, and winning it will prove our strength. The captains of the Golden Company exchanged glances. If Storm's End is still held by men loyal to Stannis, we will be taking it from him, not the Lannisters, objected Brendel Byrne. Why not make common cause with him against the Lannisters? Stannis is Robert's brother, of that same ilk that brought down House Targaryen, John Connington reminded him. Moreover, he is a thousand leagues away, with whatever meager strength he still commands. The whole realm lies between us. It would take half a year just to reach him, and he has little and less to offer us. If Storm's End is so impregnable, how do you mean to take it? asked Mallow. By guile. Homeless Harry Strickland disagreed. We should wait. We shall. John Connington stood. Ten days, no longer. It will take that long to prepare. On the morning of the eleventh day, we ride for Storm's End. The prince arrived to join them four days later, riding at the head of a column of a hundred horse, with three elephants lumbering in his rear. Lady Lamore was with him garbed once more in the white robes of a septa. Before them went Sir Raleigh Duckfield, a snow-white cloak streaming from his shoulders. A solid man, and true, Connington thought as he watched Duck dismount, but not worthy of the king's guard. He had tried his best to dissuade the prince from giving Duckfield that cloak, pointing out that the honor might best be held in reserve for warriors of greater renown whose fealty would add luster to their cause, and the younger sons of great lords whose support they would need in the coming struggle, but the boy would not be moved. Duck will die for me if need be, he had said, and that's all I require in my king's guard. The king's slayer was a warrior of great renown, and the son of a great lord as well. 
At least I convinced him to leave the other six slots open, else Duck might have six ducklings trailing after him, each more blindingly adequate than the last. Escort his grace to my solar, he commanded. At once. Prince Aegon Targaryen was not near as biddable as the boy young Griff had been, however. The better part of an hour had passed before he finally turned up in the solar, with Duck at his side. Lord Connington, he said, I like your castle. Your father's lands are beautiful, he said. His silvery hair was blowing in the wind, and his eyes were a deep purple, darker than this boy's. As do I, your grace. Please be seated. Sir Raleigh will have no further need of you for now. No, I want Duck to stay. The prince sat. We've been talking with Strickland and Flowers. They told us about this attack on Storm's End that you're planning. John Connington did not let his fury show. And did Homeless Harry try to persuade you to delay it? He did, actually, the prince said. But I won't. Harry's an old maid, isn't he? You have the right of it, my lord. I want the attack to go ahead, with one change. I mean to lead it. The Sacrifice On the village green, the queen's men built their pyre. Or should it be the village white? The snow was knee-deep everywhere, but where the men had shoveled it away, to hack holes into the frozen ground with axe and spade and pick. The wind was swirling from the west, driving still more snow across the frozen surface of the lakes. You do not want to watch this, Ali Mormont said. No, but I will. Asha Greyjoy was the Kraken's daughter, not some pampered maiden who could not bear to look at ugliness. It had been a dark, cold, hungry day, like the day before and the day before that. They had spent most of it out on the ice, shivering beside a pair of holes they'd cut in the smaller of the frozen lakes, with fishing lines clutched in mitten-clumsy hands. Not long ago they could count on hooking one or two fish apiece, and wolf's wood men more practiced at ice fishing were pulling up four or five. Today all that Asha had come back with was a chill that went bone deep. Allie had fared no better. It had been three days since either of them had caught a fish. The she-bear tried again. I do not need to watch this. It is not you the queen's men want to burn. Then go. You have my word. I will not run. Where would I go? To Winterfell? Asha laughed. Only three days' ride, they tell me. Six queen's men were wrestling two enormous pinewood poles into holes six other queen's men had dug out. Asha did not have to ask their purpose. She knew. Stakes. Nightfall would be on them soon, and the red god must be fed. An offering of blood and fire, the queen's men called it, that the Lord of Light may turn his fiery eye upon us and melt these thrice-cursed snows. Even in this place of fear and darkness, the Lord of Light protects us, Sir Godfrey Faring told the men who gathered to watch as the stakes were hammered down into the holes. What has your Southron god to do with snow? demanded Artos Flint. His black beard was crusted with ice. This is the wrath of the old gods come upon us. It is them we should appease. Aye, said Big Bucket Wall. Red Ralu means nothing here. You will only make the old gods angry. They are watching from their island. The crofter's village stood between two lakes, the larger dotted with small wooded islands that punched up through the ice like the frozen fists of some drowned giant. From one such island rose a weirwood gnarled and ancient, its bowl and branches white as the surrounding snows. Eight days ago, Asha had walked out with Ali Mormont to have a closer look at its slitted red eyes and bloody mouth. It is only sap, she'd told herself, the red sap that flows inside these weirwoods. But her eyes were unconvinced. Seeing was believing, and what they saw was frozen blood. You Northmen brought these snows upon us, insisted Corliss Penny. 
You and your demon trees. Rahalor will save us. Rahalor will doom us, said Artos Flint. A pox on both your gods, thought Asher Greyjoy. Sir Godry the Giant Slayer surveyed the stakes, shoving one to make certain it was firmly placed. Good, good, they will serve. Sir Clayton, bring forth the sacrifice. Sir Clayton Suggs was Godry's strong right hand. Or should it be his withered arm? Asha did not like Sir Clayton. Where Faring seemed fierce in his devotion to his red god, Suggs was simply cruel. She had seen him at the night fires, watching, his lips parted and his eyes avid. It is not the god he loves, it is the flames, she concluded. When she asked Sir Justin if Suggs had always been that way, he grimaced. On Dragonstone he would gamble with the torturers and lend them a hand in the questioning of prisoners, especially if the prisoner were a young woman. Asha was not surprised. Suggs would take a special delight in burning her, she did not doubt. Unless the storms let up. They had been three days from Winterfell for nineteen days. One hundred leagues from Deepwood Mott to Winterfell, three hundred miles as the raven flies. But none of them were ravens, and the storm was unrelenting. Each morning Asha awoke hoping she might see the sun, only to face another day of snow. The storm had buried every hut and hovel beneath a mound of dirty snow, and the drifts would soon be deep enough to engulf the long haul too. And there was no food beyond their failing horses, fish taken from the lakes, fewer every day and whatever meager sustenance their foragers could find in these cold, dead woods. With the king's knights and lords claiming the lion's share of the horse meat, little and less remained for the common men. Small wonder, then, that they had started eating their own dead. Asha had been as horrified as the rest when the she-bear told her that four Peasbury men had been found butchering one of the late Lord Fells, carving chunks of flesh from his thighs and buttocks as one of his forearms turned upon a spit, but she could not pretend to be surprised. The four were not the first to taste human flesh during this grim march, she would wager, only the first to be discovered. Peasbury's four would pay for their feast with their lives, by the king's decree, and by burning end the storm the queen's men claimed. Asha Greyjoy put no faith in their red god, Yet she prayed they had the right of that. If not, there would be other pyres, and Sir Clayton Suggs might get his heart's desire. The four flesh-eaters were naked when Sir Clayton drove them out, their wrists lashed behind their backs with leathern cords. The youngest of them wept as he stumbled through the snow. Two others walked like men already dead, eyes fixed upon the ground. Asha was surprised to see how ordinary they appeared. Not monsters, she realized, only men. The oldest of the four had been their sergeant. He alone remained defiant, spitting venom at the queen's men as they prodded him along with their spears. Fuck you all and fuck your red god too, he said. You hear me, Faring? Giant Slayer? I laughed when your fucking cousin died, Godry. We should have eaten him too, he smelled so good when they roasted him. I bet the boy was nice and tender, juicy. A blow from a spear butt drove the man to his knees, but did not silence him. When he rose, he spat out a mouthful of blood and broken teeth and went right on. The cock's the choicest part, all crisped up on the spit. A fat little sausage. Even as they wrapped the chains around him, he raved on. Corliss Penny, come over here. What sort of name is Penny? Is that how much your mother charged? And you, Suggs, you bleeding bastard, you— Sir Clayton never said a word. One quick slash opened the sergeant's throat, sending a wash of blood down his chest. The weeping man wept harder, his body shaking with each sob. He was so thin that Asha could count every rib. No, he begged. Please. He was dead. He was dead, and we was hungry. Please. The sergeant was the clever one, Asha said to Ali Mormont. He goaded Suggs into killing him. She wondered if the same trick might work twice, should her own turn come. 
The four victims were chained up back to back, two to a stake. There they hung, three live men and one dead one, as the Lord of Light's devout stacked split logs and broken branches under their feet, then doused the piles with lamp oil. They had to be swift about it. The snow was falling heavily as ever, and the wood would soon be soaked through. Where is the king? asked Sir Corliss Penny. Four days ago, one of the king's own squires had succumbed to cold and hunger, a boy named Brian Farring, who'd been kin to Sir Godry. Stannis Baratheon stood grim-faced by the funeral pyre as the lad's body was consigned to the flames. Afterward, the king had retreated to his watchtower. He had not emerged since, though from time to time his grace was glimpsed upon the tower roof, outlined against the beacon fire that burned there night and day. Talking to the Red God, some said. Calling out for Lady Melisandre, insisted others. Either way, it seemed to Asha Greyjoy, the king was lost and crying out for help. Canty, go find the king and tell him all is ready, Sir Godry said to the nearest man-at-arms. The king is here, the voice was Richard Horps. Over his armor of plate and mail, Sir Richard wore his quilted doublet, blazoned with three death's head moths on a field of ash and bone. King Stannis walked beside him. Behind them, struggling to keep pace, Arnulf Karstark came hobbling, leaning on his blackthorn cane. Lord Arnulf had found them eight days past. The Northmen had brought a son, three grandsons, four hundred spears, two score archers, a dozen mounted lances, a maester, and a cage of ravens, but only enough provisions to sustain his own. Karstark was no lord in truth, Asha had been given to understand, only Castellan of Carhold for as long as the true lord remained a captive of the Lannisters. Gaunt and bent and crooked, with a left shoulder half a foot higher than his right, he had a scrawny neck, squinty gray eyes, and yellow teeth. A few white hairs were all that separated him from baldness. His forked beard was equal parts white and gray, but always ragged. Asha thought there was something sour about his smiles. Yet if the talk was true, it was Karstark who would hold Winterfell should they take it. Somewhere in the distant past, House Karstark had sprouted from House Stark, and Lord Arnolf had been the first of Eddard Stark's bannermen to declare for Stannis. So far as Asha knew, the gods of the Karstarks were the old gods of the North, gods they shared with the Wolves, the Norries, the Flints, and the other hill clans. She wondered if Lord Arnolf had come to view the burning at the king's behest, that he might witness the power of the Red God for himself. At the sight of Stannis, two of the men bound to the stakes began to plead for mercy. The king listened in silence, his jaw clenched. Then he said to Godry Faring, You may begin. The giant slayer raised his arms. Lord of Light, hear us! Lord of Light, defend us, the queen's men chanted for the night is dark and full of terrors. Sir Godry raised his head toward the darkening sky. We thank you for the sun that warms us, and pray that you will return it to us, O Lord, that it might light our path to your enemies. Snowflakes melted on his face. We thank you for the stars that watch over us by night, and pray that you will rip away this veil that hides them, so we might glory in their sight once more. Lord of Light, protect us, the Queen's men prayed, and keep this savage dark at bay. Sir Corliss Penny stepped forward, clutching the torch with both hands. He swung it about his head in a circle, fanning the flames. One of the captives set to whimper. Rahalor, Sir Godry sang, we give you now four evil men. With glad hearts and true, we give them to your cleansing fires, that the darkness in their souls might be burned away. Let their vile flesh be seared and blackened, that their spirits might rise free and pure to ascend into the light. Accept their blood, O Lord, and melt the icy chains that bind your servants. Hear their pain, and grant strength to our swords that we might shed the blood of your enemies. Accept this sacrifice, and show us the way to Winterfell, that we might vanquish the unbelievers. Lord of Light, accept this sacrifice, 
a hundred voices echoed. Sir Corliss lit the first pyre with the torch, then thrust it into the wood at the base of the second. A few wisps of smoke began to rise. The captives began to cough. The first flames appeared, shy as maidens, darting and dancing from log to leg. In moments, both the stakes were engulfed in fire. He was dead, the weeping boy screamed as the flames licked up his legs. We found him dead. Please, we was hungry. The fires reached his balls. As the hair around his cock began to burn, his pleading dissolved into one long wordless shriek. Asha Greyjoy could taste the bile in the back of her throat. On the Iron Islands, she had seen priests of her own people slit the throats of thralls and give their bodies to the sea to honor the drowned god. Brutal as that was, this was worse. Close your eyes, she told herself. Close your ears. Turn away. You do not need to see this. The queen's men were singing some paean of praise for Red Rohalor, but she could not hear the words above the shrieks. The heat of the flames beat against her face, but even so she shivered. The air grew thick with smoke and the stink of burnt flesh, and one of the bodies still twitched against the red-hot chains that bound him to the stake. After a time, the screaming stopped. Wordless, King Stannis walked away, back to the solitude of his watchtower. Back to his beacon fire, Asha knew, to search the flames for answers. Arnulf Karstark made to hobble after him, but Sir Richard Horp took him by the arm and turned him toward the long hall. The watchers began to drift away, each to his own fire and whatever meager supper he might find. Clayton Suggs sidled up beside her. Did the iron cunt enjoy the show? His breath stank of ale and onions. He has pig eyes, Asha thought. That was fitting. His shield and surcoat showed a pig with wings. Suggs pressed his face so close to hers that she could count the blackheads on his nose and said, The crowd will be even bigger when it's you squirming on a stake. He was not wrong. The wolves did not love her. She was ironborn and must answer for the crimes of her people, for Moat Kaelin and Deepwood Mott and Torhen Square, for centuries of reaving along the stony shore, for all Theon did at Winterfell. Unhand me, sir. Every time Suggs spoke to her, it left her yearning for her axes. Asha was as good a finger dancer as any man on the Isles and had ten fingers to prove it. If only I could dance with this one. Some men had faces that cried out for a beard. Sir Clayton's face cried out for an axe between the eyes. But she was axeless here, so the best that she could do was try to wrench away. That just made Sir Clayton grasp her all the tighter, gloved fingers digging into her arm like iron claws. My lady asked you to let her go, said Ali Mormont. You would do well to listen, sir. Lady Asha is not for burning. She will be, Suggs insisted. We have harbored this demon worshipper amongst us too long. He released his grip on Asha's arm all the same. One did not provoke the she-bear needlessly. That was the moment Justin Massey chose to appear. The king has other plans for his prize captive, he said with his easy smile. His cheeks were red from the cold. The king or you? Suggs snorted his contempt. Scheme all you like, Massey. She'll still be for the fire, her and her king's blood. There's power in king's blood, the red woman used to say. Power to please our lord. Let Rahalor be content with the four we just sent him. Four base-born churls, a beggar's offering. Scum like that will never stop the snow. She might. The she-bear spoke. And if you burn her and the snows still fall, what then? Who will you burn next? Me? Asha could hold her tongue no longer. Why not Sir Clayton? Perhaps Rahalor would like one of his own, a faithful man who will sing praises as the flames lick at his cock. Sir Justin laughed. Suggs was less amused. Enjoy your giggle, Massey. If the snow keeps falling, we will see who is laughing then. 
He glanced at the dead men on their stakes, smiled, and went off to join Sir Godry and the other queen's men. My champion, Asha said to Justin Massey. He deserved that much, whatever his motives. Thank you for the rescue, sir. It will not win you friends among the queen's men, said the she-bear. Have you lost your faith in Red Rahalor? I have lost faith in more than that, Massey said, his breath a pale mist in the air. But I still believe in supper. Will you join me, my ladies? Ali Mormont shook her head. I have no appetite. Nor I. But you had best choke down some horse meat all the same, or you may soon wish you had. We had eight hundred horses when we marched from Deepwood Mott. Last night the count was sixty-four. That did not shock her. Almost all of their big destriers had failed, including Massey's own. Most of their palfreys were gone as well. Even the garrons of the Northmen were faltering for want of fodder. But what did they need horses for? Stannis was no longer marching anywhere. The sun and moon and stars had been gone so long that Asha was starting to wonder whether she had dreamed them. I will eat. Allie shook her head. Not me. Let me look after Lady Asha, then, Sir Justin told her. You have my word, I shall not permit her to escape. The she-bear gave her grudging assent, deaf to the japery in his tone. They parted there, Allie to her tent, she and Justin Massey to the long hall. It was not far, but the drifts were deep, the wind was gusty, and Asha's feet were blocks of ice. Her ankle stabbed at her with every step. Small and mean as it was, the long hall was the largest building in the village, so the lords and captains had taken it for themselves, whilst Stannis settled into the stone watchtower by the lake shore. A pair of guardsmen flanked its door, leaning on tall spears. One lifted the greased door flap for Massey, and Sir Justin escorted Asha through to the blessed warmth within. Benches and trestle tables ran along either side of the hall, with room for fifty men, though twice that number had squeezed themselves inside. A fire trench had been dug down the middle of the earthen floor, with a row of smoke holes in the roof above. The wolves had taken to sitting on one side of the trench, the knights and southron lords upon the other. The southerners looked a sorry lot, Asha thought, gaunt and hollow-cheeked, some pale and sick, others with red and wind-scoured faces. By contrast, the northmen seemed hale and healthy, big ruddy men with beards as thick as bushes, clad in fur and iron. They might be cold and hungry, too, but the marching had gone easier for them, with their garrons and their bare paws. Asha peeled off her fur mittens, wincing as she flexed her fingers. Pain shot up her legs as her half-frozen feet began to thaw in the warmth. The crofters had left behind a good supply of peat when they fled, so the air was hazy with smoke and the rich earthy smell of burning turf. She hung her cloak on a peg inside the door after shaking off the snow that clung to it. Sir Justin found them places on the bench and fetched supper for the both of them, ale and chunks of horse meat, charred black outside and red within. Asha took a sip of ale and fell upon the horse flesh. The portion was smaller than the last she'd tasted, but her belly still rumbled at the smell of it. My thanks, sir, she said as blood and grease ran down her chin. Justin, I insist. Massey cut his own meat into chunks and stabbed one with his dagger. Down the table, Will Foxglove was telling the men around him that Stannis would resume his march on Winterfell three days hence. He'd had it from the lips of one of the grooms who tended the king's horses. His grace has seen victory in his fires, Foxglove said a victory that will be sung of for a thousand years in Lord's Castle and Peasant's Hut alike. Justin Massey looked up from his horse meat. The cold count last night reached eighty. He pulled a piece of gristle from his teeth and flicked it to the nearest dog. If we march, we will die by the hundreds. We will die by the thousands if we stay here, said Sir Humphrey Clifton. Press on or die, I say. Press on and die, I answer. And if we reach Winterfell, what then? How do we take it? 
Half our men are so weak they can scarce put one foot before another. Will you set them to scaling walls, building siege towers? We should remain here until the weather breaks, said Sir Ormond Wilde, a cadaverous old knight whose nature gave the lie to his name. Asha had heard rumors that some of the men-at-arms were wagering on which of the great knights and lords would be the next to die. Sir Ormond had emerged as a clear favorite. And how much coin was placed on me, I wonder, Asha thought. Perhaps there is still time to put down a wager. Here at least we have some shelter, Wilde was insisting, and there are fish in the lakes. Too few fish and too many fishermen, Lord Peasbury said gloomily. He had good reason for gloom. It was his men Sir Godrey had just burned, and there were some in this very hall who had been heard to say that Peasbury himself surely knew what they were doing and might even have shared in their feasts. He's not wrong, grumbled Ned Woods, one of the scouts from Deepwood. Noseless Ned, he was called. Frostbite had claimed the tip of his nose two winters past. Woods knew the wolf would as well as any man alive. Even the king's proudest lords had learned to listen when he spoke. I know them lakes. You've been on them like maggots on a corpse, hundreds of you. Cut so many holes in the ice it's a bloody wonder more haven't fallen through. Out by the island there's places look like a cheese the rat's been at. He shook his head. Lakes are done. You fished them out. All the more reason to march, insisted Humphrey Clifton. If death is our fate, let us die with swords in hand. It was the same argument as last night and the night before. Press on and die, stay here and die, fall back and die. Feel free to perish as you wish, Humphrey, said Justin Massey. Myself, I would sooner live to see another spring. Some might call that craven, Lord Peasbury replied. Better a craven than a cannibal. Peasbury's face twisted in sudden fury. You. Death is part of war, Justin. Sir Richard Horp stood inside the door, his dark hair damp with melting snow. Those who march with us will have a share in all the plunder we take from Bolton and his bastard, and a greater share of glory undying. Those too weak to march must fend for themselves. But you have my word. We shall send food once we have taken Winterfell. You will not take Winterfell. Aye, we will came a cackle from the high table, where Arnulf Karstark sat with his son Arthur and three grandsons. Lord Arnulf shoved himself up, a vulture rising from its prey. One spotted hand clutched at his son's shoulder for support. We'll take it for the Ned and for his daughter. Aye, and for the young wolf too, him who was so cruelly slaughtered. Me and mine will show the way if need be. I've said as much to his good grace the king. March, I said, and before the moon can turn, we'll all be bathing in the blood of Freys and Boltons. Men began to stamp their feet, to pound their fists against the tabletop. Almost all were Northmen, Asha noted. Across the fire trench, the Southron lords sat silent on the benches. Justin Massey waited until the uproar had died away. Then he said, Your courage is admirable, Lord Karstark but courage will not breach the walls of Winterfell. How do you mean to take the castle, pray? With snowballs? One of Lord Arnolf's grandsons gave answer. We'll cut down trees for rams to break the gates. And die. Another grandson made himself heard. We'll make ladders, scale the walls. And die. Up spoke Arthur Karstark, Lord Arnolf's younger son. We'll raise siege towers. And die, and die, and die. Sir Justin rolled his eyes. Gods be good, are all you Karstarks mad? Gods, said Richard Horp. You forget yourself, Justin. We have but one god here. Speak not of demons in this company. Only the Lord of Light can save us now. Wouldn't you agree? He put his hand upon the hilt of his sword, as if for emphasis, but his eyes never left the face of Justin Massey. Beneath that gaze, Sir Justin wilted. The Lord of Light, aye. My faith runs as deep as your own, Richard, you know that. It is your courage I question, Justin, not your faith. 
You have preached defeat every step of the way since we rode forth from Deepwood Mott. It makes me wonder whose side you are on. A flush crept up Massey's neck. I will not stay here to be insulted. He wrenched his damp cloak down from the wall so hard that Asha heard it tear, then stalked past Horp and through the door. A blast of cold air blew through the hall, raising ashes from the fire trench and fanning its flames a little brighter. Broken quick as that, thought Asha. My champion is made of suet. Even so, Sir Justin was one of the few who might object should the Queen's men try to burn her. So she rose to her feet, donned her own cloak, and followed him out into the blizzard. She was lost before she had gone ten yards. Asha could see the beacon fire burning atop the watchtower, a faint orange glow floating in the air. Elsewise, the village was gone. She was alone in a white world of snow and silence, plowing through snow drifts as high as her thighs. Justin, she called. There was no answer. Somewhere to her left, she heard a horse wicker. The poor thing sounds frightened. Perhaps he knows that he's to be tomorrow's supper. Asha pulled her cloak about her tightly. She blundered back onto the village green unknowing. The pinewood stakes still stood, charred and scorched, but not burned through. The chains about the dead had cooled by now, she saw, but still held the corpses fast in their iron embrace. A raven was perched atop one, pulling at the tatters of burned flesh that clung to its blackened skull. The blowing snow had covered the ashes at the base of the pyre and crept up the dead man's leg as far as his ankle. The old gods mean to bury him, Asha thought. This was no work of theirs. Take a good long gander, cunt, the deep voice of Clayton Suggs said behind her. You'll look just as pretty once you're roasted. Tell me, can squids scream? God of my fathers, if you can hear me in your watery halls beneath the waves, grant me just one small throwing axe. The drowned god did not answer. He seldom did. That was the trouble with gods. Have you seen Sir Justin? That prancing fool? What do you want with him, cunt? If it's a fuck you need, I'm more a man than Massey. Cunt again? It was odd how men like Suggs used that word to demean women when it was the only part of a woman they valued. And Suggs was worse than Middle Little. When he says the word, he means it. Your king gelds men for rape, she reminded him. Sir Clayton chuckled. The king's half blind from staring into fires. But have no fear, cunt. I'll not rape you. I'd need to kill you after and I'd sooner see you burn. There's that horse again. Do you hear that? Hear what? A horse. No, horses. More than one. She turned her head, listening. The snow did queer things to sound. It was hard to know which direction it had come from. Is this some squid game? I don't hear... Suggs scowled. Bloody hell. Riders. He fumbled at his sword belt, his hands clumsy in their fur and leather gloves, and finally succeeded in ripping his long sword from its scabbard. By then the riders were upon them. They emerged from the storm like a troop of wraiths, big men on small horses, made even bigger by the bulky furs they wore. Swords rode on their hips, singing their soft steel song as they rattled in their scabbards. Asha saw a battle-axe strapped to one man's saddle, a war-hammer on another's back. Shields they bore as well, but so obscured by snow and ice that the arms upon them could not be red. For all her layers of wool and fur and boiled leather, Asha felt naked standing there. A horn, she thought. I need a horn to rouse the camp. Run, you stupid cunt! Sir Clayton shouted. Run, warn the king! Lord Bolton is upon us! A brute he might have been, but Suggs did not want for courage. Sword in hand, he strode through the snow, putting himself between the riders and the king's tower, its beacon glimmering behind him like the orange eye of some strange god. Who goes there? Halt! Halt! 
The lead rider reined up before him. Behind were others, perhaps as many as a score. Asha had no time to count them. Hundreds more might be out there in the storm, coming hard upon their heels. Roos Bolton's entire host might be descending on them, hidden by darkness and swirling snow. These, though, they are too many to be scouts and too few to make a vanguard, and two were all in black. Night's Watch, she realized suddenly. Who are you? she called. Friends, a half-familiar voice replied. We looked for you at Winterfell, but found only crowfoot umber beating drums and blowing horns. It took some time to find you. The rider vaulted from his saddle, pulled back his hood, and bowed. So thick was his beard, and so crusted with ice, that for a moment Asha did not know him. Then it came. Triss, she said. My lady. Christopher Botley took a knee. The maid is here as well. Roggen, Grimtongue, Fingers, Rook. Six of us, all those fit enough to ride. Crom died of his wounds. What is this? Sir Clayton Suggs demanded. You're one of hers? How did you get loose of Deepwood's dungeons? Triss rose and brushed the snow from his knees. Sibel Glover was offered a handsome ransom for our freedom and chose to accept it in the name of the king. What ransom? Who would pay good coin for sea scum? I did, sir. The speaker came forward on his garron. He was very tall, very thin, so long-legged that it was a wonder his feet did not drag along the ground. I had need of a strong escort to see me safely to the king, and Lady Sibel had need of fewer mouths to feed. A scarf concealed the tall man's features, but atop his head was perched the queerest hat Asha had seen since the last time she had sailed to Tyrosh, a brimless tower of some soft fabric, like three cylinders stacked one atop the other. I was given to understand that I might find King Stannis here. It is most urgent that I speak with him at once. And who in seven stinking hells are you? The tall man slid gracefully from his garron, removed his peculiar hat, and bowed. I have the honor to be Tycho Nestorus, a humble servant of the iron rank of Bravos. Of all the strange things that might have come riding out of the night, the last one Asha Greyjoy would ever have expected was a Bravosi banker. It was too absurd. She had to laugh. King Stannis has taken the watchtower for his seat. Sir Clayton will be pleased to show you to him, I'm sure. That would be most kind. Time is of the essence. The banker studied her with shrewd, dark eyes. You are the Lady Asha of House Greyjoy, unless I am mistaken. I am Asha of House Greyjoy, I. Opinions differ on whether I'm a lady. The Bravosi smiled. We've brought a gift for you. He beckoned to the men behind him. We had expected to find the king at Winterfell. This same blizzard has engulfed the castle, alas. Beneath its walls we found more somber with a troop of raw green boys waiting for the king's coming. He gave us this. A girl and an old man, thought Asha, as the two were dumped rudely in the snow before her. The girl was shivering violently, even in her furs. If she had not been so frightened, she might even have been pretty, though the tip of her nose was black with frostbite. The old man... No one would ever think him comely. She had seen scarecrows with more flesh. His face was a skull with skin, his hair bone white and filthy, and he stank. Just the sight of him filled Asha with revulsion. He raised his eyes. Sister, see, this time I knew you. Asha's heart skipped a beat. Theon? His lips skinned back in what might have been a grin. Half his teeth were gone, and half of those still left him were broken and splintered. Theon, he repeated. My name is Theon. You have to know your name. Victarion The sea was black and the moon was silver as the iron fleet swept down on the prey. 
They sighted her in the narrows between the Isle of Cedars and the rugged hills of the Astapori hinterlands, just as the black priest Mokoro had said they would. Giscari! Longwater Pike shouted down from the crow's nest. Victarion Greyjoy watched her sail grow larger from the forecastle. Soon he could make out her oars rising and falling, and the long white wake behind her shining in the moonlight like a scar across the sea. Not a true warship, Victarion realized. A trading galley, and a big one. She would make a fine prize. He signaled to his captains to give chase. They would board this ship and take her. The captain of the galley had realized his peril by then. He changed course for the west, making for the Isle of Cedars, perhaps hoping to shelter in some hidden cove or run his pursuers onto the jagged rocks along the island's northeast coast. His galley was heavy laden, though, and the ironborn had the wind. Grief and iron victory cut across the quarry's course, whilst swift sparrowhawk and agile finger dancer swept behind her. Even then the Giscari captain did not strike his banners. By the time Lamentation came alongside the prey, raking her larboard side and splintering her oars, both ships were so close to the haunted ruins of Gozai that they could hear the monkeys chattering as the first dawn light washed over the city's broken pyramids. Their prize was named Giscari Dawn, the galley's captain said when he was delivered to Victarion in chains. She was out of New Gis and returning there by way of Yunkai after trading at Mirin. The man spoke no decent tongue but only a guttural Giscari, full of growls and hisses, as ugly a language as Victarion Greyjoy had ever heard. Makoro translated the captain's words into the common tongue of Westeros. The war for Mirin was won, the captain claimed. The Dragon Queen was dead, and a Giscari by the name of Hisdak ruled the city now. Victarion had his tongue torn out for lying. Daenerys Targaryen was not dead, Makoro assured him. His red god Rahalor had shown him the queen's face in his sacred fires. The captain could not abide lies, so he had the Giscari captain bound hand and foot and thrown overboard, a sacrifice to the drowned god. Your red god will have his due, he promised Makoro, but the seas are ruled by the drowned god. There are no gods but Rohalor and the other, whose name may not be said. The sorcerer-priest was garbed in somber black, but for a hint of golden thread at collar, cuffs, and hem. There was no red cloth aboard the Iron Victory, but it was not meet that Makoro go about in the salt-stained rags he had been wearing when the vole fished him from the sea, so Victarion had commanded Tom Tidewood to sew new robes for him from whatever was at hand, and had even donated some of his own tunics to the purpose. Of black and gold those were, for the arms of House Greyjoy showed a golden kraken on a black field, and the banners and sails of their ships displayed the same. The crimson and scarlet robes of the red priests were alien to the ironborn, but Victarion had hoped his men might accept Mokoro more easily once clad in Greyjoy colors. He hoped in vain. Clad in black from head to heel, with a mask of red and orange flames tattooed across his face, the priest appeared more sinister than ever. The crew shunned him when he walked the deck, and men would spit if his shadow chanced to fall upon them. Even the vole, who had fished the red priest from the sea, had urged Victarion to give him to the drowned god. But Makoro knew these strange shores in ways the ironborn did not, and secrets of the dragon kind as well. The crow's eye keeps wizards, why shouldn't I? His black sorcerer was more puissant than all of Euron's three, even if you threw them in a pot and boiled them down to one. The damn fair might disapprove, but Aaron and his pieties were far away. So Victarion closed his burned hand into a mighty fist and said, His carried dawn is no fit name for a ship of the Iron Fleet. For you, wizard, I shall rename her Red God's Wrath. The wizard bowed his head, as the captain says, and the ships of the Iron Fleet numbered four and fifty once again. The next day a sudden squall descended on them. Mokoro had predicted that as well. When the rains moved on, three ships were found to have vanished. Victarion had no way to know whether they had foundered, run aground, or been blown off course. They know where we are going, 
he told his crew. If they are still afloat, we will meet again. The Iron Captain had no time to wait for laggards, not with his bride encircled by her enemies. The most beautiful woman in the world has urgent need of my axe. Besides, Makoro assured him that the three ships were not lost. Each night, the sorcerer-priest would kindle a fire on the forecastle of the Iron Victory and stalk around the flames, chanting prayers. The firelight made his black skin shine like polished onyx, and sometimes Victarion could swear that the flames tattooed on his face were dancing too, twisting and bending, melting into one another, their colors changing with every turn of the priest's head. The black priest is calling demons down on us, one oarsman was heard to say. When that was reported to Victarion, he had the man scourged until his back was blood from shoulders to buttocks. So when Makoro said, your lost lambs will return to the flock off the isle called Yaros, the captain said. Pray that they do, priest, or you may be the next to taste the whip. The sea was blue and green and the sun blazing down from an empty blue sky when the Iron Fleet took its second prize in the waters north and west of Astapor. This time it was a mirish cog named Dove on her way to Yunkai by way of New Gis with a cargo of carpets, sweet green wines, and mirish lace. Her captain owned a mirish eye that made far-off things look close, two glass lenses in a series of brass tubes, cunningly wrought so that each section slid into the next, until the eye was no longer than a dirk. Victarion claimed that treasure for himself. The cog he renamed Shrike. Her crew would be kept for ransom, the captain decreed. They were neither slaves nor slavers, but free mermen and seasoned sailors. Such men were worth good coin. Sailing out of Mir, the dove brought them no fresh news of Myrene or Daenerys, only stale reports of Dothraki horsemen along the Rhoyne, the Golden Company upon the march, and others things Victarion already knew. What do you see? the captain asked his black priest that night, as Mokoro stood before his nightfire. What awaits us on the morrow? More rain? It smelled like rain to him. Gray skies and strong winds, Mokoro said. No rain. Behind come the tigers. Ahead waits your dragon. Your dragon? Victarion liked the sound of that. Tell me something that I do not know, priest. The captain commands, and I obey, said Mokoro. The crew had taken to calling him the Black Flame, a name fastened on him by Stephar Stammerer, who could not say Makoro. By any name, the priest had powers. The coastline here runs west to east, he told Victarion. Where it turns north, you will come on two more hares, swift ones with many legs. And so it came to pass. This time the prey proved to be a pair of galleys, long and sleek and fast. Ralph the Limper was the first to sight them, but they soon outdistanced woe and forlorn hope, so Victarion sent Iron Wing, Sparrow Hawk, and Kraken's Kiss to run them down. He had no swifter ships than those three. The pursuit lasted the best part of the day, but in the end both galleys were boarded and taken, after brief but brutal fights. They had been running empty, Victarion learned, making for new gifts to load supplies and weapons for the Giscari legions encamped before Mirin, and to bring fresh legionaries to the war to replace all the men who died. Men slain in battle? asked Victarion. The crews of the galleys denied it. The deaths were from a bloody flux. The pale mare, they called it. And like the captain of the Giscari Dawn, the captains of the galleys repeated the lie that Daenerys Targaryen was dead. Give her a kiss for me in whatever hell you find her, Victarion said. He called for his axe and took their heads off there and then. Afterward, he put their crews to death as well, saving only the slaves chained to the oars. He broke their chains himself and told them they were now free men and would have the privilege of rowing for the Iron Fleet, an honor that every boy in the Iron Islands dreamed of growing up. The Dragon Queen frees slaves and so do I, he proclaimed. The galleys he renamed Ghost and Shade. For I mean them to return and haunt these Yunkish men, 
he told the dusky woman that night after he had taken his pleasure of her. They were close now, and growing closer every day. We will fall upon them like a thunderbolt, he said, as he squeezed the woman's breast. He wondered if this was how his brother Aaron felt when the drowned god spoke to him. He could almost hear the god's voice welling up from the depths of the sea. You shall serve me well, my captain, the waves seemed to say. It was for this I made you. But he would feed the red god too, Mokoro's fire god. The arm the priest had healed was hideous to look upon, pork crackling from elbow to fingertips. Sometimes when Victarion closed his hand the skin would split and smoke, yet the arm was stronger than it had ever been. Two gods are with me now, he told the dusky woman. No foe can stand before two gods. Then he rolled her on her back and took her once again. When the cliffs of Yaros appeared off their larboard bows, he found his three lost ships waiting for him, just as Mokoro had promised. Victarion gave the priest a golden torque as a reward. Now he had a choice to make. Should he risk the straits, or take the iron fleet around the island? The memory of Fair Isle still rankled in the iron captain's memory. Stannis Baratheon had descended on the iron fleet from both north and south whilst they were trapped in the channel between the island and the mainland, dealing Victarion his most crushing defeat. But sailing around Yaros would cost him precious days. With Yunkai so near, shipping in the straits was like to be heavy, but he did not expect to encounter Yunkish warships until they were closer to Meereen. What would the crow's eye do? He brooded on that for a time, then signaled to his captains. We sail the straits. Three more prizes were taken before Yaros dwindled off their sterns. A fat gallius fell to the vole and grief, and a trading galley to Manfred Merlin of Kite. Their holds were packed with trade goods, wines and silks and spices, rare woods and rarer scents, but the ships themselves were the true prize. Later that same day, a fishing catch was taken by Seven Skulls and Thrallsbane. She was a small, slow, dingy thing, hardly worth the effort of boarding. Victarion was displeased to hear that it had taken two of his own ships to bring the fishermen to heel. Yet it was from their lips that he heard of the Black Dragon's return. The Silver Queen is gone, the catch's master told him. She flew away upon her dragon beyond the Dothraki Sea. Where is this Dothraki Sea? he demanded. I will sail the Iron Fleet across it and find the Queen wherever she may be. The fisherman laughed aloud. That would be a sight worth seeing. The Dothraki Sea is made of grass, fool. He should not have said that. Victarion took him around the throat with his burned hand and lifted him bodily into the air. Slamming him back against the mast, he squeezed till the Yunkish man's face turned as black as the fingers digging into his flesh. The man kicked and writhed for a while, trying fruitlessly to pry loose the captain's grip. No one calls Victarion Greyjoy a fool and lives to boast of it. When he opened his hand, the man's limp body flopped to the deck. Longwater Pike and Tom Tidewood chucked it over the rail, another offering to the drowned god. Your drowned god is a demon, the black priest Vokoro said afterward. He is no more than a thrall of the other, the dark god whose name must not be spoken. Take care, priest, Victarion warned him. There are godly men aboard this ship who would tear out your tongue for speaking such blasphemies. Your red god will have his due, I swear it. My word is iron. Ask any of my men. The black priest bowed his head. There is no need. The Lord of Light has shown me your worth, Lord Captain. Every night in my fires I glimpse the glory that awaits you. Those words pleased Victarion Greyjoy mightily, as he told the dusky woman that night. My brother Balon was a great man, he said, but I shall do what he could not. The Iron Islands shall be free again, and the old way will return. Even Dagon could not do that. Almost a hundred years had passed since Dagon Greyjoy sat the sea-stone chair, but the Ironborn still told tales of his raids and battles. 
In Dagon's day, a weak king sat the Iron Throne, his roomy eyes fixed across the narrow sea where bastards and exiles plotted rebellion. So forth from Pike, Lord Dagon sailed to make the sunset sea his own. He bearded the lion in his den and tied the direwolf's tail in knots, but even Dagon could not defeat the dragons. But I shall make the dragon queen mine own. She will share my bed and bear me many mighty sons. That night the ships of the Iron Fleet numbered sixty. Strange sails grew more common north of Yaros. They were very near to Yunkai, and the coast between the Yellow City and Mirin would be teeming with merchantmen and supply ships coming and going. So Victarion took the Iron Fleet out into the deeper waters, beyond the sight of land. Even there they would encounter other vessels. Let none escape to give warning to our foes, the Iron Captain commanded. None did. The sea was green and the sky was gray the morning grief and warrior wench and Victarion's own iron victory captured the slaver galley from Yunkai in the waters due north of the Yellow City. In her holds were twenty perfumed boys and fourscore girls destined for the pleasure houses of Lys. Her crew never thought to find peril so close to their home waters, and the ironborn had little trouble taking her. She was named the Willing Maiden. Victarion put the slavers to the sword, then sent his men below to unchain the rowers. You row for me now. Row hard and you shall prosper. The girls he divided amongst his captains. The Lyseni would have made whores of you, he told them. But we have saved you. Now you need only serve one man instead of many. Those who please their captains may be taken as salt wives, an honorable station. The perfumed boys he wrapped in chains and threw into the sea. They were unnatural creatures, and the ship smelled better once cleansed of their presence. For himself, Victarion claimed the seven choicest girls. One had red-gold hair and freckles on her teats. One shaved herself all over. One was brown-haired and brown-eyed, shy as a mouse. One had the biggest breasts he had ever seen. The fifth was a little thing, with straight black hair and golden skin. Her eyes were the color of amber. The sixth was white as milk, with golden rings through her nipples and her nether lips, the seventh black as a squid's ink. The slavers of Yunkai had trained them in the way of the seven sighs, but that was not why Victarion wanted them. His dusky woman was enough to satisfy his appetites until he could reach Mirene and claim his queen. No man had need of candles when the sun awaited him. The galley he renamed the Slaver's Scream. With her, the ships of the Iron Fleet numbered one in sixty. Every ship we capture makes us stronger, Victarion told his ironborn. But from here it will grow harder. On the morrow or the day after we are like to meet with warships. We are entering the home waters of Mirin, where the fleets of our foes await us. We will meet with ships from all three slaver cities, ships from Tolos and Illyria and New Gis, even ships from Karth. He took care not to mention the green galleys of old Volantis that surely must be sailing up through the Gulf of Grief even as he spoke. These slavers are feeble things. You have seen how they run before us, heard how they squeal when we put them to the sword. Every man of you is worth twenty of them, for only we are made of iron. Remember this when first we next spy some slaver's sails. Give no quarter and expect none. What need have we of quarter? We are the ironborn, and two gods look over us. We will seize their ships, smash their hopes, and turn their bay to blood. A great cry went up at his words. The captain answered with a nod, grim-faced, then called for the seven girls he had claimed to be brought on deck, the loveliest of all those found aboard the willing maiden. He kissed them each upon the cheeks and told them of the honor that awaited them, though they did not understand his words. Then he had them put aboard the fishing catch that they had captured, cut her loose, and had her set afire. With this gift of innocence and beauty we honor both the gods, he proclaimed, as the warships of the Iron Fleet rode past the burning catch. Let these girls be reborn in light, undefiled by mortal lust, or let them descend to the drowned gods' watery halls, 
to feast and dance and laugh until the seas dry up. Near the end, before the smoking catch was swallowed by the sea, the cries of the seven sweetlings changed to joyous song. It seemed to Victorian Greyjoy. A great wind came up then, a wind that filled their sails and swept them north and east and north again, toward Myrene and its pyramids of many-colored bricks. On wings of song I fly to you, Daenerys, the Iron Captain thought. That night, for the first time, he brought forth the dragon horn that the crow's eye had found amongst the smoking wastes of Great Valyria. A twisted thing it was, six feet long from end to end, gleaming black and banded with red gold and dark Valyrian steel. Euron's hell horn. Victarion ran his hand along it. The horn was as warm and smooth as the dusky woman's thighs, and so shiny that he could see a twisted likeness of his own features in its depths. Strange sorcerous writings had been cut into the bands that girded it. Valyrian glyphs, Makoro called them. That much Victarion had known. What do they say? Much and more. The black priest pointed to one golden band. Here the horn is named. I am Dragonbinder, it says. Have you ever heard its sound? Once. One of his brother's mongrels had sounded the hell horn at the king's mood on Old Wyke. A monster of a man he had been, huge and shaven-headed, with rings of gold and jet and jade around arms thick with muscle, and a great hawk tattooed across his chest. The sound it made, it burned somehow, as if my bones were on fire, searing my flesh from within. Those writings glowed red hot, then white hot and painful to look upon. It seemed as if the sound would never end. It was like some long scream, a thousand screams all melted into one. And the man who blew the horn, what of him? He died. There were blisters on his lips after. His bird was bleeding, too. The captain thumped his chest. The hawk, just here. Every feather dripping blood. I heard the man was all burned up inside, but that might just have been some tale. A true tale. Makoro turned the hell horn, examining the queer letters that crawled across a second of the golden bands. Here, it says, no mortal man shall sound me and live. Bitterly, Victarion brooded on the treachery of brothers. Euron's gifts are always poisoned. The crows I swore this horn would bind dragons to my will. But how will that serve me if the price is death? Your brother did not sound the horn himself, nor must you. Makoro pointed to the band of steel. Here. Blood for fire, fire for blood. Who blows the hell horn matters not. The dragons will come to the horn's master. You must claim the horn. With blood. The Ugly Little Girl Eleven servants of the many-faced god gathered that night beneath the temple, more than she had ever seen together at one time. Only the lordling and the fat fellow arrived by the front door. The rest came by secret ways, through tunnels and hidden passages. They wore their robes of black and white, but as they took their seats, each man pulled his cowl down to show the face he had chosen to wear that day. Their tall chairs were carved of ebony and weirwood, like the doors of the temple above. The ebon chairs had weirwood faces on their backs, the weirwood chairs faces of carved ebony. One of the other acolytes stood across the room with a flagon of dark red wine. She had the water. Whenever one of the servants wished to drink, he would raise his eyes or crook a finger, and one or both of them would come and fill his cup. But mostly they stood, waiting on looks that never came. I am carved of stone, she reminded herself. I am a statue, like the sea lords that stand along the canal of the heroes. The water was heavy, but her arms were strong. The priests used the language of Bravos, though once for several minutes three spoke heatedly in High Valyrian. The girl understood the words mostly, but they spoke in soft voices, and she could not always hear. 
I know this man, she did hear a priest with the face of a plague victim say. I know this man, the fat fellow echoed as she was pouring for him. But the handsome man said, I will give this man the gift. I know him not. Later the squinter said the same thing of someone else. After three hours of wine and words, the priests took their leave, all but the kindly man, the waif, and the one whose face bore the marks of plague. His cheeks were covered with weeping sores, and his hair had fallen out. Blood dripped from one nostril and crusted at the corners of both eyes. Our brother would have words with you, child, the kindly man told her. Sit if you wish. She seated herself in a weirwood chair with a face of ebony. Bloody sores held no terror for her. She had been too long in the house of black and white to be afraid of a false face. Who are you? Plague Face asked when they were alone. No one. Not so. You are Arya of House Stark, who bites her lip and cannot tell a lie. I was. I'm not now. Why are you here, liar? To serve. To learn. To change my face. First change your heart. The gift of the many-faced god is not a child's plaything. You would kill for your own purposes, for your own pleasures. Do you deny it? She bit her lip. I... He slapped her. The blow left her cheek stinging, but she knew that she had earned it. Thank you. Enough slaps, and she might stop chewing on her lip. Arya did that, not the night wolf. I do deny it. You lie. I can see the truth in your eyes. You have the eyes of a wolf and a taste for blood. Sir Gregor, she could not help but think. Dunson, Raff the Sweetling. Sir Eileen, Sir Marin, Queen Cersei. If she spoke, she would need to lie, and he would know. She kept silent. You were a cat, they tell me. Prowling through the alleys, smelling of fish, selling cockles and mussels for coin. A small life, well suited for a small creature such as you. Ask, and it can be restored to you. Push your barrow, cry your cockles, be content. Your heart is too soft to be one of us. He means to send me away. I have no heart. I only have a hole. I've killed lots of people. I could kill you if I wanted. Would that taste sweet to you? She did not know the right answer. Maybe. Then you do not belong here. Death holds no sweetness in this house. We are not warriors, nor soldiers, nor swaggering bravos puffed up with pride. We do not kill to serve some lord, to fatten our purses, to stroke our vanity. We never give the gift to please ourselves, nor do we choose the ones we kill. We are but servants of the god of many faces. Valar Harris. All men must serve. You know the words, but you are too proud to serve. A servant must be humble and obedient. I obey. I can be humbler than anyone. That made him chuckle. You will be the very goddess of humility, I am sure. But can you pay the price? What price? The price is you. The price is all you have and all you ever hoped to have. We took your eyes and gave them back. Next we will take your ears and you will walk in silence. You will give us your legs and crawl. You will be no one's daughter, no one's wife, no one's mother. Your name will be a lie, and the very face you wear will not be your own. She almost bit her lip again, but this time she caught herself and stopped. My face is a dark pool, hiding everything, showing nothing. She thought of all the names that she had worn. Ari, Weasel, Squab, Cat of the Canals. She thought of that stupid girl from Winterfell called Arya Horseface. Names did not matter. I can pay the price. Give me a face. 
Bases must be earned. Tell me how. Give a certain man a certain gift. Can you do that? What man? No one that you know. I don't know a lot of people. He is one of them. A stranger. No one you love, no one you hate, no one you have ever known. Will you kill him? Yes. Then on the morrow you shall be cat of the canals again. Wear that face. Watch. Obey. And we will see if you are truly worthy to serve him of many faces. So the next day she returned to Brusco and his daughters in the house on the canal. Brusco's eyes widened when he saw her, and Bria gave a little gasp. Valar Margulis, Cat said by way of greeting. Valar Doheris, Brusco replied. After that it was as if she had never been away. She got her first look at the man she must kill later that morning as she wheeled her barrow through the cobbled streets that fronted on the purple harbor. He was an old man, well past fifty. He has lived too long, she tried to tell herself. Why should he have so many years when my father had so few? But Cat of the Canals had no father, so she kept that thought to herself. Cockles and mussels and clams, Cat cried as he went past. Oysters and prawns and fat green mussels. She even smiled at him. Sometimes a smile was all you needed to make them stop and buy. The old man did not smile back. He scowled at her and went on past, sloshing through a puddle. The splash wet her feet. He has no courtesy, she thought, watching him go. His face is hard and mean. The old man's nose was pinched and sharp, his lips thin, his eyes small and close-set. His hair had gone to gray, but the little pointed beard at the end of his chin was still black. Cat thought it must be dyed and wondered why he had not dyed his hair as well. One of his shoulders was higher than the other, giving him a crooked cast. He is an evil man, she announced that evening when she returned to the house of black and white. His lips are cruel, his eyes are mean, and he has a villain's beard. The kindly man chuckled. He is a man like any other, with a light in him and darkness. It is not for you to judge him. That gave her pause. Have the gods judged him? Some gods, mayhaps. What are gods for if not to sit in judgment over men? The many-faced god does not weigh men's souls, however. He gives his gift to the best of men as he gives it to the worst. Elsewise, the good would live forever. The old man's hands were the worst thing about him, Cat decided the next day, as she watched him from behind her barrow. His fingers were long and bony, always moving, scratching at his beard, tugging at an ear, drumming on a table, twitching, twitching, twitching. He has hands like two white spiders. The more she watched his hands, the more she came to hate them. He moves his hands too much, she told them at the temple. He must be full of fear. The gift will bring him peace. The gift brings all men peace. When I kill him, he will look in my eyes and thank me. If he does, you will have failed. It would be best if he takes no note of you at all. The old man was some sort of merchant, Cat concluded, after watching him for a few days. His trade had to do with the sea, though she never saw him set foot upon a ship. He spent his days sitting in a soup shop near the Purple Harbor, a cup of onion broth cooling at his elbow as he shuffled papers and sealing wax and spoke in sharp tones to a parade of captains, ship owners, and other merchants, none of whom seemed to like him very much. Yet they brought him money, leather purses plump with gold and silver and the square iron coins of Bravos. The old man would count it out carefully, sorting the coins and stacking them up neatly, like with like. He never looked at the coins. Instead, he bit them, always on the left side of his mouth, where he still had all his teeth. From time to time, he'd spin one on the table and listen to the sound it made when it came clattering to a stop. And when all the coins had been counted and tasted, the old man would scrawl upon a parchment 
stamp it with his seal, and give it to the captain, else he'd shake his head and shove the coins back across the table. Whenever he did that, the other man would get red-faced and angry, or pale and scared-looking. Cat did not understand. They pay him gold and silver, but he only gives them writing. Are they stupid? A few, mayhaps. Most are simply cautious. Some think to cousin him. He is not a man easily cousined, however. But what is he selling them? He is writing each a binder. If their ships are lost in a storm or taken by pirates, he promises to pay them for the value of the vessel and all its contents. Is it some kind of wager? Of a sort. A wager every captain hopes to lose. Yes, but if they win, they lose their ships, oft times their very lives. The seas are dangerous, and never more so than in autumn. No doubt many a captain sinking in a storm has taken some small solace in his binder back in Bravos, knowing that his widow and children will not want. A sad smile touched his lips. It is one thing to write such a binder, though, and another to make good on it. Cat understood. One of them must hate him. One of them came to the house of black and white and prayed for the god to take him. She wondered who it had been, but the kindly man would not tell her. It is not for you to pry into such matters, he said. Who are you? No one. No one asks no questions. He took her hands. If you cannot do this thing, you need only say so. There is no shame in that. Some are made to serve the many-faced God, and some are not. Say the word, and I shall lift this task from you. I will do it. I said I would. I will. How, though? That was harder. He had guards, two of them, a tall, thin man and a short, thick one. They went with him everywhere from when he left his house in the morning till he returned at night. They made certain no one got close to the old man without his leave. Once a drunk almost staggered into him as he was coming home from the soup shop, but the tall one stepped between them and gave the man a sharp shove that knocked him to the ground. At the soup shop, the short one always tasted the onion broth first. The old man waited until the broth had cooled before he took a sip, long enough to be sure his guardsmen had suffered no ill effects. He's afraid, she realized, or else he knows that someone wants to kill him. He does not know, said the kindly man, but he suspects. The guards go with him even when he slips out to make water, she said, but he doesn't go when they do. The tall one is the quicker. I'll wait till he is making water, walk into the soup shop and stab the old man through the eye. And the other guard? He's slow and stupid. I can kill him, too. Are you some butcher of the battlefield, hacking down every man who stands in your way? No. I would hope not. You are a servant of the many-faced God, and we who serve him of many faces give his gift only to those who have been marked and chosen. She understood. Kill him. Kill only him. It took her three more days of watching before she found the way, and another day of practicing with her finger knife. Red Rago had taught her how to use it, but she had not slit a purse since back before they took away her eyes. She wanted to make certain that she still knew how. Smooth and quick, that's the way. No fumbling, she told herself and she slipped the little blade out of her sleeve again and again and again. When she was satisfied that she still remembered how to do it, she sharpened the steel on a whetstone until its edge glimmered silver-blue in the candlelight. The other part was trickier, but the waif was there to help her. I will give the man the gift on the morrow, she announced as she was breaking her fast. Him of many faces will be pleased. The kindly man rose. Cat of the Canals is known to many. If she is seen to have done this deed, it might bring down trouble on Brusco and his daughters. It is time you had another face. The girl did not smile, but inside she was pleased. She had lost Cat once and mourned her. 
She did not want to lose her again. What will I look like? Ugly. Women will look away when they see you. Children will stare and point. Strong men will pity you, and some may shed a tear. No one who sees you will soon forget you. Come. The kindly man took the iron lantern off its hook and led her past the still black pool and the rows of dark and silent gods to the steps at the rear of the temple. The waif fell in behind them as they were making their descent. No one spoke. The soft scuff of slippered feet on the steps was the only sound. Eighteen steps brought them to the vaults, where five arched passageways spread out like the fingers of a man's hand. Down here the steps grew narrower and steeper, but the girl had run up and down them a thousand times, and they held no terrors for her. Twenty-two more steps, and they were at the subcellar. The tunnels here were cramped and crooked, black wormholes twisting through the heart of the great rock. One passage was closed off by a heavy iron door. The priest hung the lantern from a hook, slipped a hand inside his robe, and produced an ornate key. Goose prickles rose along her arms. The sanctum. They were going lower still, down to the third level, to the secret chambers where only the priests were permitted. The key clicked three times, very softly, as the kindly man turned it in a lock. The door swung open on oiled iron hinges, making not a sound. Beyond were still more steps, hewn out of solid rock. The priest took down the lantern once again and led the way. The girl followed the light, counting the steps as she went down. Four, five, six, seven. She found herself wishing that she had brought her stick. Ten, eleven, twelve. She knew how many steps there were between the temple and the cellar, between the cellar and the subcellar. She had even counted the steps on the cramped winding stair that spiraled up into the garret, and the rungs on the steep wooden ladder that ascended to the rooftop door and the windy perch outside. This stair was unknown to her, however, and that made it perilous. One and twenty, two and twenty, three and twenty. With every step the air seemed to grow a little colder. When her count reached thirty, she knew that they were under even the canals. Three and thirty, four and thirty. How deep were they going to go? She had reached fifty-four when the steps finally ended at another iron door. This one was unlocked. The kindly man pushed it open and stepped through. She followed, with the waif on her heels. Their footsteps echoed through the darkness. The kindly man lifted his lantern and flicked its shutters wide open. Light washed over the walls around them. A thousand faces were gazing down on her. They hung upon the walls, before her and behind her, high and low, everywhere she looked, everywhere she turned. She saw old faces and young faces, pale faces and dark faces, smooth faces and wrinkled faces, freckled faces and scarred faces, handsome faces and homely faces, men and women, boys and girls, even babes, smiling faces, frowning faces, faces full of greed and rage and lust, bald faces and faces bristling with hair. Masks, she told herself, it's only masks but even as she thought the thought, she knew it wasn't so. They were skins. Do they frighten you, child? asked the kindly man. It is not too late for you to leave us. Is this truly what you want? Arya bit her lip. She did not know what she wanted. If I leave, where will I go? She had washed and stripped a hundred corpses. Dead things did not frighten her. They carry them down here and slice their faces off, so what? She was the night wolf. No scraps of skin could frighten her. Leather hoods, that's all they are. They cannot hurt me. Do it, she blurted out. He led her across the chamber, past a row of tunnels leading off into side passages. The light of his lantern illuminated each in turn. One tunnel was walled with human bones, its roof supported by columns of skulls. Another opened on winding steps that descended farther still. 
How many cellars are there? she wondered. Do they just go down forever? Sit, the priest commanded. She sat. Now close your eyes, child. She closed her eyes. This will hurt, he warned her. But pain is the price of power. Do not move. Still as stone, she thought. She sat unmoving. The cut was quick, the blade sharp. By rights, the metal should have been cold against her flesh, but it felt warm instead. She could feel the blood washing down her face, a rippling red curtain falling across her brow and cheeks and chin, and she understood why the priest had made her close her eyes. When it reached her lips, the taste was salt and copper. She licked at it and shivered. Bring me the face, said the kindly man. The waif made no answer, but she could hear her slippers whispering over the stone floor. To the girl, he said, drink this, and pressed a cup into her hand. She drank it down at once. It was very tart, like biting into a lemon. A thousand years ago, she had known a girl who loved lemon cakes. No, that was not me. That was only Arya. Mummers change their faces with artifice, the kindly man was saying, and sorcerers use glamours, weaving light and shadow and desire to make illusions that trick the eye. These arts you shall learn, but what we do here goes deeper. Wise men can see through artifice, and glamours dissolve before sharp eyes. But the face you are about to don will be as true and solid as that face you were born with. Keep your eyes closed. She felt his fingers brushing back her hair. Stay still. This will feel queer. You may be dizzy, but you must not move. Then came a tug and a soft rustling as the new face was pulled down over the old. The leather scraped across her brow, dry and stiff, but as her blood soaked into it, it softened and turned supple. Her cheeks grew warm, flushed. She could feel her heart fluttering beneath her breast, and for one long moment she could not catch her breath. Hands closed around her throat, hard as stone, choking her. Her own hands shot up to claw at the arms of her attacker, but there was no one there. A terrible sense of fear filled her, and she heard a noise, a hideous crunching noise, accompanied by blinding pain. A face floated in front of her, fat, bearded, brutal, his mouth twisted with rage. She heard the priest say, Breathe, child. Breathe out the fear. Shake off the shadows. He is dead. She is dead. Her pain is gone. Breathe. The girl took a deep, shuddering breath and realized it was true. No one was choking her. No one was hitting her. Even so, her hand was shaking as she raised it to her face. Flakes of dried blood crumbled at the touch of her fingertips, black in the lantern light. She felt her cheeks, touched her eyes, traced the line of her jaw. My face is still the same. Is it? Are you certain? Was she certain? She had not felt any change, but maybe it was not something you could feel. She swept a hand down across her face from top to bottom, as she had once seen Jaquen Hagar do back at Harrenhal. When he did it, his whole face had rippled and changed. When she did it, nothing happened. It feels the same. To you, said the priest. It does not look the same. To other eyes, your nose and jaw are broken, said the waif. One side of your face is caved in where your cheekbones shattered, and half your teeth are missing. She probed around inside her mouth with her tongue, but found no holes or broken teeth. Sorcery, she thought. I have a new face, an ugly broken face. You may have bad dreams for a time, warned the kindly man. Her father beat her so often and so brutally that she was never truly free of pain or fear until she came to us. Did you kill him? She asked the gift for herself, not for her father. You should have killed him. He must have read her thoughts. 
death came for him in the end, as it comes for all men, as it must come for a certain man upon the morrow. He lifted up the lamp. We are done here. For now. As they made their way back to the steps, the empty eye holes of the skins upon the walls seemed to follow her. For a moment she could almost see their lips moving, whispering dark, sweet secrets to one another in words too faint to hear. Sleep did not come easily that night. Tangled in her blankets, she twisted this way and that in the cold, dark room, but whichever way she turned, she saw the faces. They have no eyes, but they can see me. She saw her father's face upon the wall. Beside him hung her lady mother, and below them her three brothers all in a row. No, that was some other girl. I am no one, and my only brothers wear robes of black and white. Yet there was the black singer, there the stable boy she'd killed with needle, there the pimply squire from the crossroads inn, and over there the guard whose throat she'd slashed to get them out of Harrenhal. The tickler hung on the wall as well, the black holes that were his eyes swimming with malice. The sight of him brought back the feel of the dagger in her hand as she had plunged it into his back again and again and again. When at last day came to Bravos, it came gray and dark and overcast. The girl had hoped for fog, but the gods ignored her prayers, as gods so often did. The air was clear and cold, and the wind had a nasty bite to it. A good day for a death, she thought. Unbidden, her prayer came to her lips. Sir Gregor, Dunson, Raff the Sweetling, Sir Eilin, Sir Marin, Queen Circe. She mouthed the names silently. In the house of black and white, you never knew who might be listening. The vaults were full of old clothing, garments claimed from those who came to the house of black and white to drink peace from the temple pool. Everything from beggar's rags to rich silks and velvets could be found there. An ugly girl should dress in ugly clothing, she decided, so she chose a stained brown cloak fraying at the hem, a musty green tunic smelling of fish, and a pair of heavy boots. Last of all, she palmed her finger knife. There was no haste, so she decided to take the long way round to the Purple Harbor. Across the bridge she went, to the Isle of the Gods. Cat of the Canals had sold cockles and mussels amongst the temples here whenever Brusco's daughter Talia had her moon blood flowing and took to her bed. She half expected to see Talia selling there today, perhaps outside the Warren where all the forgotten godlings had their forlorn little shrines, but that was silly. The day was too cold and Talia never liked to wake this early. The statue outside the shrine of the weeping Lady of Lys was crying silver tears as the ugly girl walked by. In the gardens of Gelané stood a gilded tree a hundred feet high with leaves of hammered silver. Torchlight glimmered behind windows of leaded glass in the Lord of Harmony's wooden hall, showing half a hundred kinds of butterflies in all their bright colors. One time, the girl remembered, the sailor's wife had walked her rounds with her and told her tales of the city's stranger gods. That is the house of the great shepherd. Three-headed trios has that tower with three turrets. The first head devours the dying, and the reborn emerge from the third. I don't know what the middle head's supposed to do. Those are the stones of the silent god, and they are the entrance to the pattern maker's maze. Only those who learn to walk it properly will ever find their way to wisdom, the priests of the pattern say. Beyond it, by the canal, that's the temple of Aquan the Red Bull. Every thirteenth day his priests slit the throat of a pure white calf and offer bowls of blood to beggars. Today was not the thirteenth day, it seemed. The Red Bull's steps were empty. The brother gods Simosh and Soloso dreamed in twin temples on opposite sides of the Black Canal, linked by a carved stone bridge. The girl crossed there and made her way down to the docks, then through the ragman's harbor and past the half-sunken spires and domes of the drowned town. A group of Lysine sailors were staggering from the happy port as she went by, but the girl did not see any of the whores. The ship was closed up and forlorn, its troop of mummers no doubt still abed. But farther on, 
On the wharf beside an Ibanese whaler, she spied Cat's old friend Taganaro tossing a ball back and forth with Casso, king of seals, whilst his latest cut purse worked the crowd of onlookers. When she stopped to watch and listen for a moment, Taganaro glanced at her without recognition, but Casso barked and clapped his flippers. He knows me, the girl thought, or else he smells the fish. She hurried on her way. By the time she reached the Purple Harbor, the old man was ensconced inside the soup shop at his usual table, counting a purse of coins as he haggled with a ship's captain. The tall, thin guard was hovering over him. The short, thick one was seated near the door, where he would have a good view of anyone who entered. That made no matter. She did not intend to enter. Instead, she perched atop a wooden piling twenty yards away as the blustery wind tugged at her cloak with ghostly fingers. Even on a cold, gray day like this, the harbor was a busy place. She saw sailors on the prowl for whores, and whores on the prowl for sailors. A pair of bravos passed in rumpled finery, leaning on each other as they staggered drunkenly past the docks, their blades rattling at their sides. A red priest swept past, his scarlet and crimson robes snapping in the wind. It was almost noon before she saw the man she wanted, a prosperous shipowner she had seen doing business with the old man three times before. Big and bald and burly, he wore a heavy cloak of plush brown velvet trimmed with fur and a brown leather belt ornamented with silver moons and stars. Some mishap had left one leg stiff. He walked slowly, leaning on a cane. He would do as well as any and better than most, the ugly girl decided. She hopped off the piling and fell in after him. A dozen strides put her right behind him, her finger knife poised. His purse was on his right side, at his belt, but his cloak was in her way. Her blade flashed out, smooth and quick, one deep slash through the velvet, and he never felt a thing. Red Rago would have smiled to see it. She slipped her hand through the gap, slit the purse open with the finger knife, filled her fist with gold. The big man turned. What? The movement tangled her arm in the folds of his cloak as she was pulling out her hand. Coins rained around their feet. Thief! The big man raised his stick to strike at her. She kicked his bad leg out from under him, danced away, and bolted as he fell, darting past a mother with a child. More coins fell from between her fingers to bounce along the ground. Shouts of, Thief! Thief! rang out behind her. A pot-bellied innkeep passing by made a clumsy grab for her arm, but she spun around him, flashed past a laughing whore, raced headlong for the nearest alley. Cat of the canals had known these alleys, and the ugly girl remembered. She darted left, vaulted a low wall, leapt across a small canal, and slipped through an unlocked door into some dusty storeroom. All sounds of pursuit had faded by then, but it was best to be sure. She hunkered down behind some crates and waited, arms wrapped around her knees. She waited for the best part of an hour, then decided it was safe to go, climbed straight up the side of the building, and made her way across the rooftops almost as far as the Canal of Heroes. By now the ship owner would have gathered up coins and cane and limped on to the soup shop. He might be drinking a bowl of hot broth and complaining to the old man about the ugly girl who had tried to rob his purse. The kindly man was waiting for her at the house of black and white, seated on the edge of the temple pool. The ugly girl sat next to him and put a coin on the lip of the pool between them. It was gold, with a dragon on one face and a king on the other. The golden dragon of Westeros, said the kindly man. And how did you come by this? We are no thieves. It wasn't stealing. I took one of his, but I left him one of ours. The kindly man understood. And with that coin and the others in his purse, he paid a certain man. Soon after, that man's heart gave out. Is that the way of it? Very sad. The priest picked up the coin and tossed it into the pool. You have much and more to learn, but it may be you are not hopeless. That night they gave her back the face of Arya Stark. 
They brought a robe for her as well, the soft, thick robe of an acolyte, black upon one side and white upon the other. Wear this when you are here, the priest said, but know that you shall have little need of it for the present. On the morrow you will go to Isambaro to begin your first apprenticeship. Take what clothes you will from the vaults below. The city watch is looking for a certain ugly girl, known to frequent the Purple Harbor, so best you have a new face as well. He cupped her chin, turned her head this way and that, nodded. A pretty one this time, I think. As pretty as your own. Who are you, child? No one, she replied. Circe On the last night of her imprisonment, the queen could not sleep. Each time she closed her eyes, her head filled with forebodings and fantasies of the morrow. I will have guards, she told herself. They will keep the crowds away. No one will be allowed to touch me. The high sparrow had promised her that much. Even so, she was afraid. On the day Marcella sailed for Dorne, the day of the bread riots, gold cloaks had been posted all along the route of the procession, but the mob had broken through their lines to tear the old fat high septon into pieces and rape Lawless Stokeworth half a hundred times. And if that pale, soft, stupid creature could incite the animals when fully clothed, how much more lust would a queen inspire? Circe paced her cell, restless as the caged lions that had lived in the bowels of Casterly Rock when she was a girl, a legacy of her grandfather's time. She and Jane used to dare each other to climb into their cage, and once she worked up enough courage to slip her hand between two bars and touch one of the great tawny beasts. She was always bolder than her brother. The lion had turned his head to stare at her with huge golden eyes. Then he licked her fingers. His tongue was as rough as a rasp, but even so she would not pull her hand back, not until Jane took her by the shoulders and yanked her away from the cage. Your turn, she told him afterward. Pull his mane, I dare you. He never did. I should have had the sword, not him. Barefoot and shivering, she paced, a thin blanket draped about her shoulders. She was anxious for the day to come. By evening it would all be done. A little walk and I'll be home. I'll be back with Tommen, in my own chambers inside Magor's Holdfast. Her uncle said it was the only way to save herself. Was it, though? She could not trust her uncle, no more than she trusted this high septon. I could still refuse. I could still insist upon my innocence and hazard all upon a trial. But she dare not let the faith sit in judgment on her, as that Margary Tyrell meant to do. That might serve the little rose well enough, but Circe had few friends amongst the septas and sparrows around this new high septon. Her only hope was trial by battle, and for that she must needs have a champion. If Jame had not lost his hand. That road led nowhere, though. Jame's sword hand was gone, and so was he, vanished with the woman Brienne somewhere in the Riverlands. The queen had to find another defender, or today's ordeal would be the least of her travails. Her enemies were accusing her of treason. She had to reach Tommen, no matter the costs. He loves me. He will not refuse his own mother. Joff was stubborn and unpredictable, but Tommen is a good little boy, a good little king. He will do as he is told. If she stayed here, she was doomed, and the only way she would return to the Red Keep was by walking. The High Sparrow had been adamant, and Sir Kevin refused to lift a finger against him. No harm will come to me today, Circe said when the day's first light brushed her window. Only my pride will suffer. The words rang hollow in her ears. Jane may yet come. She pictured him riding through the morning mists, his golden armor bright in the light of the rising sun. Jane, if you ever loved me. When her jailers came for her, Septa Anella, Septa Moel, and Septa Scholara led the procession. With them were four novices and two of the Silent Sisters. The sight of the Silent Sisters in their gray robes filled the queen with sudden terrors. Why are they here? Am I to die? 
the silent sisters attended to the dead. The High Septon promised that no harm would come to me. Nor will it. Septa Anella beckoned to the novices. They brought lye soap, a basin of warm water, a pair of shears, and a long straight razor. The sight of the steel sent a shiver through her. They mean to shave me. A little more humiliation, a raisin for my porridge. She would not give them the pleasure of hearing her beg. I am Circe of House Lannister, a lion of the rock, the rightful queen of these seven kingdoms, true-born daughter of Tywin Lannister, and hair grows back. Get on with it, she said. The elder of the two silent sisters took up the shears, a practiced barber, no doubt. Her order often cleaned the corpses of the nobles slain before returning them to their kin, and trimming beards and cutting hair was part of that. The woman bared the queen's head first. Circe sat as still as a stone statue as the shears clicked. Drifts of golden hair fell to the floor. She had not been allowed to tend it properly penned up in this cell, but even unwashed and tangled it shone where the sun touched it. My crown, the queen thought. They took the other crown away from me, and now they are stealing this one as well. When her locks and curls were piled up around her feet, one of the novices soaped her head, and the silent sister scraped away the stubble with a razor. Circe hoped that would be the end of it, but no. Remove your shift, your grace, Septa Anella commanded. Here, the queen asked. Why? You must be shorn. Shorn, she thought, like a sheep. She yanked the shift over her head and tossed it to the floor. Do what you will. Then it was the soap again, the warm water, and the razor. The hair beneath her arms went next, then her legs, and last of all the fine golden down that covered her mound. When the silent sister crept between her legs with the razor, Circe found herself remembering all the times that Jame had knelt where she was kneeling now, planting kisses on the inside of her thighs, making her wet. His kisses were always warm. The razor was ice cold. When the deed was done, she was as naked and vulnerable as a woman could be. Not even a hair to hide behind. A little laugh burst from her lips, bleak and bitter. Does your grace find this amusing? said Septa Scholera. No, Septa, said Circe. But one day I will have your tongue ripped out with hot pincers, and that will be hilarious. One of the novices had brought a robe for her, a soft white septa's robe, to cover her as she made her way down the tower steps and through the sept, so any worshippers they met along the way might be spared the sight of naked flesh. Seven save us all, what hypocrites they are. Will I be permitted a pair of sandals? she asked. The streets are filthy. Not so filthy as your sins, said Septa Moel. His High Holiness has commanded that you present yourself as the gods made you. Did you have sandals on your feet when you came forth from your lady mother's womb? No, Septa, the queen was forced to say. Then you have your answer. A bell began to toll. The queen's long imprisonment was at an end. Circe pulled the robe tighter, grateful for its warmth, and said, Let us go. Her son awaited her across the city. The sooner she set out, the sooner she would see him. The rough stone of the steps scraped her soles as Circe Lannister made her descent. She had come to Baylor's Sept a queen, riding in a litter. She was leaving, bald and barefoot. But I am leaving. That is all that matters. The tower bells were singing, summoning the city to bear witness to her shame. The great sept of Baylor was crowded with faithful come for the dawn service, the sound of their prayers echoing off the dome overhead, but when the queen's procession made its appearance, a sudden silence fell, and a thousand eyes turned to follow her as she made her way down the aisle, past the place where her lord father had lain in state after his murder. Circe swept by them, looking neither right nor left. Her bare feet slapped against the cold marble floor. She could feel the eyes. 
Behind their altars, the seven seemed to watch as well. In the Hall of Lamps, a dozen warriors' sons awaited her coming. Rainbow cloaks hung down their backs, and the crystals that crested their great helms glittered in the lamplight. Their armor was silver plate polished to a mirror sheen, but underneath, she knew, every man of them wore a hair shirt. Their kite shields all bore the same device, a crystal sword shining in the darkness, the ancient badge of those the small folk called swords. Their captain knelt before her. Perhaps your grace will recall me. I am Sir Theodan the True, and His High Holiness has given me command of your escort. My brothers and I will see you safely through the city. Cersei's gaze swept across the faces of the men behind him, and there he was, Lancel, her cousin, Sir Kevin's son, who had once professed to love her before he decided that he loved the gods more. My blood and my betrayer. She would not forget him. You may rise, Sir Theoden. I am ready. The knight stood, turned, raised a hand, Two of his men stepped to the towering doors and pushed them open, and Circe walked through them into the open air, blinking at the sunlight like a mole roused from its burrow. A gusty wind was blowing, and it set the bottom of her robe snapping and flapping at her legs. The morning air was thick with the old familiar stinks of King's Landing. She breathed in the scents of sour wine, bread baking, rotting fish and night soil, smoke and sweat and horse piss. No flower had ever smelled so sweet. Huddled in her robe, Circe paused atop the marble steps as the warrior's sons formed up around her. It came to her suddenly that she had stood in this very spot before, on the day Lord Eddard Stark had lost his head. That was not supposed to happen. Joff was supposed to spare his life and send him to the wall. Stark's eldest son would have followed him as Lord of Winterfell, but Sansa would have stayed at court, a hostage. Varys and Littlefinger had worked out the terms, and Ned Stark had swallowed his precious honor and confessed his treason to save his daughter's empty little head. I would have made Sansa a good marriage, a Lannister marriage. Not Joff, of course, but Lancel might have suited, or one of his younger brothers. Peter Baelish had offered to wed the girl himself, she recalled but of course that was impossible. He was much too low-born. If Joff had only done as he was told, Winterfell would never have gone to war, and father would have dealt with Robert's brothers. Instead, Joff had commanded that Stark's head be struck off, and Lord Slint and Sir Island Payne had hastened to obey. It was just there, the Queen recalled, gazing at the spot, Janos Slint had lifted Ned Stark's head by the hair as his life's blood flowed down the steps, and after that there was no turning back. The memories seemed so distant. Joffrey was dead, and all Stark's sons as well. Even her father had perished. And here she stood on the steps of the Great Sept again, only this time it was her the mob was staring at, not Eddard Stark. The wide marble plaza below was as crowded as it had been on the day that Stark had died. Everywhere she looked, the queen saw eyes. The mob seemed to be equal parts men and women. Some had children on their shoulders, beggars and thieves, taverners and tradesfolk, tanners and stable boys and mummers, the poorer sort of whore. All the scum had come out to see a queen brought low. And mingled in with them were the poor fellows, Filthy, unshaven creatures armed with spears and axes and clad in bits of dinted plate, rusted mail and cracked leather, under rough-spun surcoats bleached white and blazoned with the seven-pointed star of the faith. The High Sparrow's ragged army. Part of her still yearned for Jame to appear and rescue her from this humiliation, but her twin was nowhere to be seen, nor was her uncle present. That did not surprise her. Sir Kevin had made his views plain during his last visit. Her shame must not be allowed to tarnish the honor of Casterly Rock. No lions would walk with her today. This ordeal was hers and hers alone. Septa Anella stood to her right, Septa Moel to her left, Septa Scholara behind her. If the queen should bolt or balk, 
the three hags would drag her back inside, and this time they would see to it that she never left her cell. Circe raised her head. Beyond the plaza, beyond the sea of hungry eyes and gaping mouths and dirty faces, across the city, Aegon's high hill rose in the distance, the towers and battlements of the Red Keep blushing pink in the light of the rising sun. It is not so far. Once she reached its gates, the worst of her travails would be over. She would have her son again. She would have her champion. Her uncle had promised her. Tommen is waiting for me. My little king. I can do this. I must. Septa Anella stepped forward. A sinner comes before you, she declared. She is Cersei of House Lannister, Queen Dowager, mother to his grace King Tommen, widow of his grace King Robert, and she has committed grievous falsehoods and fornications. Septimoel moved up on the queen's right. This sinner has confessed her sins and begged for absolution and forgiveness. His High Holiness has commanded her to demonstrate her repentance by putting aside all pride and artifice and presenting herself as the gods made her before the good people of the city. Septa Scholar finished. So now this sinner comes before you with a humble heart, shorn of secrets and concealments, naked before the eyes of gods and men, to make her walk of atonement. Circe had been a year old when her grandfather died. The first thing her father had done on his ascension was to expel his own father's grasping low-born mistress from Casterly Rock. The silks and velvets Lord Titos had lavished on her, and the jewelry she had taken for herself had been stripped from her, and she had been sent forth naked to walk through the streets of Lannisport, so the West could see her for what she was. Though she had been too young to witness the spectacle herself, Cersei had heard the stories growing up from the mouths of washerwomen and guardsmen who had been there. They spoke of how the woman had wept and begged, of the desperate way she clung to her garments when she was commanded to disrobe, of her futile efforts to cover her breasts and her sex with her hands as she hobbled barefoot and naked through the streets to exile. Vain and proud she was before, she remembered one guard saying. So haughty you'd think she'd forgot she'd come from dirt. Once we got her clothes off her, though, she was just another whore. If Sir Kevin and the High Sparrow thought that it would be the same with her, they were very much mistaken. Lord Tywin's blood was in her. I am a lioness. I will not cringe for them. The queen shrugged off her robe. She bared herself in one smooth, unhurried motion, as if she were back in her own chambers disrobing for her bath with no one but her bedmaids looking on. When the cold wind touched her skin, she shivered violently. It took all her strength of will not to try and hide herself with her hands, as her grandfather's whore had done. Her fingers tightened into fists, her nails digging into her palms. They were looking at her, all the hungry eyes. But what were they seeing? I am beautiful she reminded herself. How many times had Jane told her that? Even Robert had given her that much, when he came to her bed in his cups to pay her drunken homage with his cock. They looked at Ned Stark the same way, though. She had to move. Naked, shorn, barefoot, Circe made a slow descent down the broad marble steps. Goose prickles rose on her arms and legs, she held her chin high, as a queen should, and her escort fanned out ahead of her. The poor fellows shoved men aside to open a way through the crowd, whilst the swords fell in on either side of her. Septa Anella, Septa Scholara, and Septa Moel followed. Behind them came the novice girls in white. Whore! someone cried out. A woman's voice. Women were always the cruelest where other women were concerned. Cersei ignored her. There will be more, and worse. These creatures have no sweeter joy in life than jeering at their betters. She could not silence them, so she must pretend she did not hear them. She would not see them either. She would keep her eyes on Aegon's high hill across the city, on the towers of the Red Keep shimmering in the light. That was where she would find her salvation, if her uncle had kept his part of their bargain. 
He wanted this, him and the high sparrow, and the little rose as well, I do not doubt. I have sinned and must atone, must parade my shame before the eyes of every beggar in the city. They think that this will break my pride, that it will make an end to me, but they are wrong. Septa Anella and Septa Moel kept pace with her, with Septa Scholara scurrying behind, ringing a bell. Shame, the old hag called. Shame upon the sinner! Shame! Shame! Somewhere off to the right, another voice sang counterpoint to hers, some baker's boy shouting, Meat pies! Threepence! Hot meat pies here! The marble underfoot was cold and slick, and Circe had to step carefully for fear of slipping. Their path took them past the statue of Baylor the Blessed, standing tall and serene upon his plinth, his face a study in benevolence. To look at him, you would never guess what a fool he'd been. The Targaryen dynasty had produced kings both bad and good, but none as beloved as Baylor, that pious, gentle, septon king who loved the small folk and the gods in equal parts, yet imprisoned his own sisters. It was a wonder that his statue did not crumble at the sight of her bare breasts. Tyrion used to say that King Baylor was terrified of his own cock. Once, she recalled, he had expelled all the whores from King's Landing. He prayed for them as they were driven from the city gates, the history said, but would not look at them. Harlot! a voice screamed. Another woman. Something flew out of the crowd, some rotted vegetable, brown and oozing, it sailed above her head to splash at the foot of one of the poor fellows. I am not afraid. I am a lioness. She walked on. Hot pies, the baker's boy was crying. Get your hot pies here. Septa Scholara rang her bell, singing, Shame, shame, shame upon the sinner, shame, shame. The poor fellows went before them, forcing men aside with their shields, walling off a narrow path. Circe followed where they led, her head held stiffly, her eyes on the far distance. Every step brought the red keep nearer, every step brought her closer to her son and her salvation. It seemed to take a hundred years to cross the plaza, but finally marble gave way to cobblestones beneath her feet, shops and stables and houses closed in all around them, and they began the descent of Visenya's hill. The going was slower here. The street was steep and narrow, the crowds jammed together tightly. The poor fellows shoved at those who blocked the way, trying to move them aside, but there was nowhere to go, and those in the back of the crowd were shoving back. Circe tried to keep her head up, only to step in something slick and wet that made her slip. She might have fallen, but Septa Anella caught her arm and kept her on her feet. Your grace should watch where she sets her feet. Circe wrenched herself free. Yes, Septa, she said in a meek voice, though she was angry enough to spit. The queen walked on, clad only in goose prickles and pride. She looked for the red keep, but it was hidden now, walled off from her gaze by the tall timbered buildings to either side. Shame, shame, sang Septa Scholara, her bell clanging. Circe tried to walk faster, but soon came up against the backs of the stars in front of her and had to slow her steps again. A man just ahead was selling skewers of roast meat from a cart, and the procession halted as the poor fellows moved him out of the way. The meat looked suspiciously like rat to Circe's eyes, but the smell of it filled the air, and half the men around them were gnawing away with sticks in hand by the time the street was clear enough for her to resume her trek. Want some, your grace? one man called out. He was a big, burly brute with pig eyes, a massive gut, and an unkempt black beard that reminded her of Robert. When she looked away in disgust, he flung the skewer at her. It struck her on the leg and tumbled to the street, and the half-cooked meat left a smear of grease and blood down her thigh. The shouting seemed louder here than on the plaza, perhaps because the mob was so much closer. Whore and sinner were most common, but brother fucker and cunt and traitor were flung at her as well, and now and again she heard someone shout out for Stannis or Margary. 
The cobbles underfoot were filthy, and there was so little space that the queen could not even walk around the puddles. No one has ever died of wet feet, she told herself. She wanted to believe the puddles were just rainwater, though horse piss was just as likely. More refuse showered down from windows and balconies, half-rotted fruit, pails of beer, eggs that exploded into sulfurous stink when they cracked open on the ground. Then someone flung a dead cat over the poor fellows and warriors' sons alike. The carcass hit the cobbles so hard that it burst open, spattering her lower legs with entrails and maggots. Circe walked on. I am blind and deaf, and they are worms, she told herself. Shame, shame, the septas sang. Chestnuts, hot roast chestnuts, a peddler cried. Queen cunt, a drunkard pronounced solemnly from a balcony above, lifting his cup to her in a mocking toast. All hail the royal teats. Words are wind, Circe thought. Words cannot harm me. Halfway down Visenya's hill, the queen fell for the first time when her foot slipped in something that might have been night soil. When Septa Anella pulled her up, her knee was scraped and bloody. A ragged laugh rippled through the crowd, and some man shouted out an offer to kiss it and make it better. Circe looked behind her. She could still see the great dome and seven crystal towers of the great Sept of Baylor atop the hill. Have I really come such a little way? Worse, a hundred times worse, she had lost sight of the Red Keep. Where? Where? Your Grace. The captain of her escort stepped up beside her. Circe had forgotten his name. You must continue. The crowd is growing unruly. Yes, she thought, unruly. I am not afraid. You should be. He yanked at her arm pulling her along beside him. She staggered down the hill, downward, ever downward, wincing with every step, letting him support her. It should be Jane beside me. He would draw his golden sword and slash a path right through the mob, carving the eyes out of the head of every man who dared to look at her. The paving stones were cracked and uneven, slippery underfoot, and rough against her soft feet. Her heel came down on something sharp, a stone or piece of broken crockery. Circe cried out in pain. I asked for sandals, she spat at Septa Anella. You could have given me sandals, you could have done that much. The knight wrenched at her arm again, as if she were some common serving wench. Has he forgotten who I am? She was the queen of Westeros, he had no right to lay rough hands on her. Near the bottom of the hill, the slope gentled and the street began to widen. Circe could see the red keep again, shining crimson in the morning sun atop Aegon's high hill. I must keep walking. She wrenched free of Ser Theodan's grasp. You do not need to drag me, Ser. She limped on, leaving a trail of bloody footprints on the stones behind her. She walked through mud and dung, bleeding, goose-fleshed, hobbling. All around her was a babble of sound. My wife has sweeter teats than those, a man shouted. A teamster cursed as the poor fellows ordered his wagon out of the way. Shame, shame, shame on the sinner, chanted the septas. Look at this one, a whore called from a brothel window, lifting her skirts to the men below. It's not had half as many cocks up it as hers. Bells were ringing, ringing, ringing. That can't be the queen, a boy said. She's saggy as my mum. This is my penance, Circe told herself. I have sinned most grievously. This is my atonement. It will be over soon. It will be behind me. Then I can forget. The queen began to see familiar faces. A bald man with bushy side whiskers frowned down from a window with her father's frown, and for an instant looked so much like Lord Tywin that she stumbled. A young girl sat beneath a fountain, drenched in spray, and stared at her with Malara Heatherspoon's accusing eyes. She saw Ned Stark, and beside him little Sansa with her auburn hair and a shaggy gray dog that might have been her wolf. Every child squirming through the crowd became her brother Tyrion, 
jeering at her as he had jeered when Joffrey died. And there was Joff as well, her son, her firstborn, her beautiful bright boy with his golden curls and his sweet smile. He had such lovely lips. He... That was when she fell the second time. She was shaking like a leaf when they pulled her to her feet. Please, she said. Mother, have mercy, I confessed. You did, said Septimoel. This is your atonement. It is not much farther, said Septa Anella. See? She pointed. Up the hill, that's all. Up the hill, that's all. It was true. They were at the foot of Aegon's high hill, the castle above them. Whore! someone screamed. Brother fucker! another voice added. Abomination! Want to suck on this, your grace? A man in a butcher's apron pulled his cock out of his breeches, grinning. It did not matter. She was almost home. Cersei began to climb. If anything, the jeers and shouts were cruder here. Her walk had not taken her through Flea Bottom, so its denizens had packed onto the lower slopes of Aegon's high hill to see the show. The faces leering out at her from behind the shields and spears of the poor fellows seemed twisted, monstrous, hideous. Pigs and naked children were everywhere underfoot, crippled beggars and cut purses swarmed like roaches through the press. She saw men whose teeth had been filed into points, hags with goiters as big as their heads, a whore with a huge striped snake draped about breasts and shoulders, a man whose cheeks and brow were covered with open sores that wept gray pus. They grinned and licked their lips and hooted at her as she went limping past, her breasts heaving with the effort of the climb. Some shouted obscene proposals, others insults. Words are wind, she thought. Words cannot hurt me. I am beautiful, the most beautiful woman in all Westeros. Jane says so. Jane would never lie to me. Even Robert. Robert never loved me, but he saw that I was beautiful. He wanted me. She did not feel beautiful, though. She felt old, used, filthy, ugly. There were stretch marks on her belly from the children she had borne, and her breasts were not as firm as they had been when she was younger. Without a gown to hold them up, they sagged against her chest. I should not have done this. I was their queen, but now they've seen, they've seen, they've seen. I should never have let them see. Gowned and crowned, she was a queen. Naked, bloody, limping, she was only a woman, not so very different from their wives, more like their mothers than their pretty little maiden daughters. What have I done? There was something in her eyes, stinging, blurring her sight. She could not cry, she would not cry, the worms must never see her weep. Circe rubbed her eyes with the heels of her hands. A gust of cold wind made her shiver violently. And suddenly the hag was there, standing in the crowd with her pendulous teats and her warty greenish skin, leering with the rest, with malice shining from her crusty yellow eyes. Queen you shall be, she hissed, until there comes another, younger and more beautiful, to cast you down and take all you hold most dear. And then there was no stopping the tears. They burned down the queen's cheeks like acid. Circe gave a sharp cry, covered her nipples with one arm, slid her other hand down to hide her slit, and began to run, shoving her way past the line of poor fellows, crouching as she scrambled crab-legged up the hill. Partway up she stumbled and fell, rose, then fell again ten yards farther on. The next thing she knew she was crawling, scrambling uphill on all fours like a dog as the good folks of King's Landing made way for her, laughing and jeering and applauding her. Then all at once the crowd parted and seemed to dissolve, and there were the castle gates before her, and a line of spearmen in gilded half-helms and crimson cloaks. Circe heard the gruff, familiar sound of her uncle growling orders, and glimpsed a flash of white to either side as Ser Boros Blount and Ser Marin Trant strode toward her in their pale plate and snowy cloaks. My son, she cried, where is my son? Where is Tommen? Not here, 
No son should have to bear witness to his mother's shame. Sir Kevin's voice was harsh. Cover her up. Then Jocelyn was bending over her, wrapping her in a soft, clean blanket of green wool to cover her nakedness. A shadow fell across them both, blotting out the sun. The queen felt cold steel slide beneath her, a pair of great armored arms lifting her off the ground, lifting her up into the air as easily as she had lifted Joffrey when he was still a babe. A giant, thought Cersei, dizzy, as he carried her with great strides toward the gatehouse. She had heard that giants could still be found in the godless wild beyond the wall. That is just a tale. Am I dreaming? No. Her savior was real. Eight feet tall or maybe taller, with legs as thick around as trees, he had a chest worthy of a plow horse and shoulders that would not disgrace an ox. His armor was plate steel, enameled white and bright as a maiden's hopes, and worn over gilded mail. A great helm hid his face. From its crest streamed seven silken plumes in the rainbow colors of the faith. A pair of golden seven-pointed stars clasped his billowing cloak at the shoulders. A white cloak. Sir Kevin had kept his part of the bargain. Tommen, her precious little boy, had named her champion to the king's guard. Cersei never saw where Kyburn came from, but suddenly he was there beside them, scrambling to keep up with her champion's long strides. Your Grace, he said, it is so good to have you back. May I have the honor of presenting our newest member of the King's Guard? This is Sir Robert Strong. Sir Robert, Cersei whispered as they entered the gates. If it please your grace, Sir Robert has taken a holy vow of silence, Kyburn said. He has sworn that he will not speak until all of his grace's enemies are dead and evil has been driven from the realm. Yes, thought Cersei Lannister. Oh, yes. Tyrion The pile of parchments was formidably high. Tyrion looked at it and sighed. I had understood you were a band of brothers. Is this the love a brother bears a brother? Where is the trust, the friendship, the fond regard, the deep affection that only men who have fought and bled together can ever know? All in time, said Brown Ben Plum. After you sign, said Inkpots, sharpening a quill. Gasporio the Cunning touched his sword hilt. If you would like to start the bleeding now, I will happily oblige you. How kind of you to offer, said Tyrion. I think not. Inkpots placed the parchments before Tyrion and handed him the quill. Here is your ink, from old Volantis this, to last as long as proper maester's black. All you need do is sign and pass the notes to me. I'll do the rest. Tyrion gave him a crooked grin. Might I read them first? If you like. They are all the same, by and large. Except for the ones at the bottom, but we'll get to those in due course. Oh, I am sure we will. For most men, there was no cost to joining a company, but he was not most men. He dipped the quill into the ink pot, leaned over the first parchment, paused, looked up. Would you prefer me to sign Yalo or Hugor Hill? Brown Ben crinkled up his eyes. Would you prefer to be returned to Yazan's heirs or just beheaded? The dwarf laughed and signed the parchment, Tyrion of House Lannister. As he passed it left to Inkpots, he riffled through the pile underneath. There are, what, fifty, sixty? I thought there were five hundred second sons. Five hundred thirteen at present, Inkpots said. When you sign our book, we will be five hundred fourteen. So only one in ten receives a note? That hardly seems fair. I thought you were all share and share alike in the free companies. He signed another sheet. Brown Ben chuckled. Oh, all share, but not alike. The second sons are not unlike a family, and every family has its drooling cousins. Tyrion signed another note. The parchment crinkled crisply as he slid it toward the paymaster. There are cells down in the bowels of Casterly Rock where my lord father kept the worst of ours. He dipped his quill in the inkpot. 
Tyrion of House Lannister, he scratched out, promising to pay the bearer of the note one hundred golden dragons. Every stroke of the quill leaves me a little poorer, or would, if I were not a beggar to begin with. One day he might rue these signatures, but not this day. He blew on the wet ink, slid the parchment to the paymaster, and signed the one beneath, and again, and again, and again. This wounds me deeply, I will have you know, he told them between signatures. In Westeros, the word of a Lannister is considered good as gold. Inkpots shrugged. This is not Westeros. On this side of the narrow sea, we put our promises on paper. As each sheet was passed to him, he scattered fine sand across the signature to drink up excess ink, shook it off, and set the note aside. Debts written on the wind tend to be... forgotten, shall we say? Not by us. Tyrion signed another sheet, and another. He had found a rhythm now. A Lannister always pays his debts. Plum chuckled. Aye, but a sellsword's word is worthless. Well, yours is, thought Tyrion, and thank the gods for that. True, but I will not be a sellsword until I've signed your book. Soon enough, said Brown Ben. After the notes. I am dancing as fast as I can. He wanted to laugh, but that would have ruined the game. Plum was enjoying this, and Tyrion had no intention of spoiling his fun. Let him go on thinking that he's bent me over and fucked me up the arse, and I'll go on buying steel swords with parchment dragons. If ever he went back to Westeros to claim his birthright, he would have all the gold of Casterly Rock to make good on his promises. If not, well, he'd be dead, and his new brothers could wipe their arses with these parchments. Perhaps some might turn up in King's Landing with their scraps in hand, hoping to convince his sweet sister to make good on them. And would that I could be a roach in the rushes to witness that. The writing on the parchments changed about halfway down the pile. The hundred dragon notes were all for sergeants. Below them, the amounts suddenly grew larger. Now Tyrion was promising to pay the bearer one thousand golden dragons. He shook his head, laughed, signed, and again, and again. So, he said as he was scrawling, what will be my duties with the company? You are too ugly to be Bacocco's butt boy, said Casporio. But you might do as Arrow, fodder. Better than you know, said Tyrion, refusing to rise to the bait. A small man with a big shield will drive the archers mad. A wiser man than you once told me that. You will work with ink pots, said Brown Ben Plum. You will work for ink pots, said ink pots keeping books, counting coin, writing contracts and letters. Gladly, said Tyrion. I love books. What else would you do? sneered Casporio. Look at you. You are not fit to fight. I once had charge of all the drains in Casterly Rock, Tyrion said mildly. Some of them had been stopped up for years, but I soon had them draining merrily away. He dipped the quill in the ink again. Another dozen notes and he would be done. Perhaps I could supervise your camp followers. We can't have the men stopped up now, can we? That jape did not please Brown Ben. Stay away from the whores, he warned. Most of them are poxy and they talk. You're not the first escaped slave to join the company, but that don't mean we need to shout your presence. I won't have you parading about where you might be seen. Stay inside as much as you can and shit into your bucket. Too many eyes at the latrines. And never go beyond our camp without my leave. We can dress you up in squire's steel, pretend you're Jorah's butt boy, but there's some will see right through that. Once Meereen is taken and we're away to Westeros, you can prance about all you like in gold and crimson. Till then, though, I shall live beneath a rock and never make a sound. You have my word on that. Tyrion of House Lannister, he signed once more, with a flourish. That was the last parchment. Three notes remained, different from the rest. Two were written on fine vellum and made out by name. For Casporio the Cunning, ten thousand dragons. The same for Inkpots, whose true name appeared to be Tybero Isterion. Tybero, said Tyrion. 
That sounds almost Lannister. Are you some long-lost cousin? Perhaps. I always pay my debts as well. It is expected of a paymaster. Sign. He signed. Brown Ben's note was the last. That one had been inscribed upon a sheepskin scroll. One hundred thousand golden dragons, fifty hides of fertile land, a castle and a lordship. Well and well, this plum does not come cheaply. Tyrion plucked at his scar and wondered if he ought to make a show of indignation. When you bugger a man, you expect a squeal or two. He could curse and swear and rant of robbery, refuse to sign for a time, then give in reluctantly, protesting all the while. But he was sick of mummery. So instead he grimaced, signed, and handed the scroll back to Brown Ben. Your cock is as big as in the stories, he said. Consider me well and truly fucked, Lord Plum. Brown Ben blew on his signature. My pleasure, imp. And now we make you one of us. Inkpots, fetch the book. The book was leather-bound with iron hinges and large enough to eat your supper off. Inside its heavy wooden boards were names and dates going back more than a century. The second sons are amongst the oldest of the free companies, Inkpots said as he was turning pages. This is the fourth book. The names of every man to serve with us are written here. When they joined, where they fought, how long they served, the manner of their deaths, all in the book. You will find famous names in here, some from your seven kingdoms. Agor Rivers served a year with us before he left to found the Golden Company. Bittersteel, you call him. The Bright Prince, Arion Targaryen, he was a second son. And Roderick Stark, the Wandering Wolf, him as well. No, not that ink. Here, use this. He unstoppered a new pot and set it down. Tyrion cocked his head. Red ink? A tradition of the company, Inkpots explained. There was a time when each new man wrote his name in his own blood, but as it happens, blood makes piss-poor ink. Lannisters love tradition. Lend me your knife. Inkpots raised an eyebrow, shrugged, slipped his dagger from its sheath, and handed it across, hilt first. It still hurts, Halfmaster, thank you very much, thought Tyrion, as he pricked the ball of his thumb. He squeezed a fat drop of blood into the inkpot, traded the dagger for a fresh quill, and scrawled, Tyrion of House Lannister, Lord of Casterly Rock, in a big bold hand, just below Jorah Mormont's far more modest signature. And it's done. The dwarf rocked back on the camp stool. Is that all that you require of me? Don't I need to swear an oath, kill a baby, suck the captain's cock? Suck whatever you like. Inkpots turned the book around and dusted the page with a bit of fine sand. For most of us, the signature suffices, but I would hate to disappoint a new brother-in-arms. Welcome to the Second Sons, Lord Tyrion. Lord Tyrion. The dwarf liked the sound of that. The Second Sons might not enjoy the shining reputation of the Golden Company, but they had won some famous victories over the centuries. Have other lords served with the Company? Landless lords, said Brown Ben. Like you, imp. Tyrion hopped down from the stool. My previous brother was entirely unsatisfactory. I hope for more from my new ones. Now, how do I go about securing arms and armor? Will you want a pig to ride as well? asked Casporio. Why, I did not know your wife was in the company, said Tyrion. That's kind of you to offer her, but I would prefer a horse. The bravo reddened, but Inkpots laughed aloud, and Brown Ben went so far as to chuckle. Inkpots, show him to the wagons. He can have his pick from the company steel. The girl, too. Put a helm on her, a bit of mail. Might be some will take her for a boy. Lord Tyrion with me. Inkpots held the tent flap to let him waddle through. I will have Snatch take you to the wagons. Get your woman and meet him by the cook tent. She is not my woman. Perhaps you should get her. All she does of late is sleep and glare at me. You need to beat her harder and fuck her more often, the paymaster offered helpfully. Bring her, leave her, do what you will. Snatch will not care. 
Come find me when you have your armor, and I will start you on the ledgers. As you wish. Tyrion found Penny asleep in a corner of their tent, curled up on a thin straw pallet beneath a heap of soiled bedclothes. When he touched her with the toe of his boot, she rolled over, blinked at him, and yawned. Hugor, what is it? Talking again, are we? It was better than her usual sullen silence. All over an abandoned dog and pig. I saved the two of us from slavery. You would think some gratitude might be in order. If you sleep any longer, you're like to miss the war. I'm sad. She yawned again. And tired. So tired. Tired or sick? Tyrion knelt beside her pallet. You look pale. He felt her brow. Is it hot in here, or does she have a touch of fever? He dared not ask that question aloud. Even hard men like the Second Sons were terrified of mounting the pale mare. If they thought Penny was sick, they would drive her off without a moment's hesitation. They might even return us to Yazan's heirs, notes or no notes. I have signed their book, the old way, in blood. I am now a second son. Penny sat up, rubbing the sleep from her eyes. What about me? Can I sign too? I think not. Some free companies have been known to take women, but... Well, they are not second daughters, after all. We, she said. If you're one of them, you should say we, not they. Has anyone seen Pretty Pig? Inkpots said he'd ask after her. Or Crunch, has there been word of Crunch? Only if you trust Casporio. Plum's not-so-cunning second-in-command claimed that three Yunkish slave-catchers were prowling through the camps, asking after a pair of escaped dwarfs. One of them was carrying a tall spear with a dog's head impaled upon its point, the way that Caspo told it. Such tidings were not like to get Penny out of bed, however. No word as yet, he lied. Come, we need to find some armor for you. She gave him a wary look. Armor? Why? Something my old master at arms told me. Never go to battle naked, lad, he said. I take him at his word. Besides, now that I'm a sellsword, I really ought to have a sword to sell. She still showed no signs of moving. Tyrion seized her by the wrist, pulled her to her feet, and threw a fistful of clothing into her face. Dress. Wear the cloak with the hood and keep your head down. We're supposed to be a pair of likely lads just in case the slave catchers are watching. Snatch was waiting by the cook tent, chewing sour leaf when the two dwarfs turned up, cloaked and hooded. I hear the two of you are going to fight for us, the sergeant said. That should have them pissing in Mirene. Either of you ever killed a man? I have, said Tyrion. I swat them down like flies. What with? An axe, a dagger, a choice remark, though I'm deadliest with my crossbow. Snatch scratched at his stubble with the point of his hook. Nasty thing, a crossbow. How many men you kill with that? Nine. His father counted for at least that many, surely. Lord of Casterly Rock, Warden of the West, Shield of Lannisport, Hand of the King, Husband, Brother, Father, Father, Father. Nine. Snatch snorted and spat out a mouthful of red slime, aiming for Tyrion's feet, perhaps, but it landed on his knee. Plainly, that was what he thought of nine. The sergeant's fingers were stained a mottled red from the juice of the sour leaf he chewed. He put two of them into his mouth and whistled. Kem! Get over here, you fucking pisspot! Kem came running. Take Lord and Lady Imp to the wagons. Have Hammer fix them up with some company steel. Hammer might be passed out drunk, Kem cautioned. Piss in his face, that'll wake him up. Snatch turned back to Tyrion and Penny. We never had no bloody dwarfs before, but boys we never lacked for. Sons of this whore or that one. Little fools run off from home to have adventures. Butt boys, squires, and the like. Some of their shit might be small enough to fit imps. It's the shit they were wearing when they died like as not, but I know that won't bother fuckers fierce as you two. Nine, was it? He shook his head and walked away. 
The second sons kept their company armor in six big wains drawn up near the center of their camp. Kem led the way, swinging his spear as if it were a staff. How does a King's Landing lad end up with a free company? Tyrion asked him. The lad gave him a wary squint. Who told you I was from King's Landing? No one. Every word out of your mouth reeks of flea bottom. Your wits gave you away. There's no one clever as a Kingslander, they say. That seemed to startle him. Who says that? Everyone. Me. Since when? Since I just made it up. For ages, he lied. My father was wont to say it. Did you know Lord Tywin, Kem? The hand. Once I saw him riding up the hill, his men had red cloaks and little lions on their helms. I liked those helms. His mouth tightened. I never liked the hand, though. He sacked the city, and then he smashed us on the Blackwater. You were there? With Stannis. Lord Tywin come up with Renly's ghost and took us in the flank. I dropped my spear and ran, but at the ships this bloody knight said, Where's your spear, boy? We got no room for cravens. And they buggered off and left me, and thousands more besides. Later I heard how your father was sending them as fought with Stannis to the wall, so I made my way across the narrow sea and joined up with the second sons. Do you miss King's Landing? Some. I miss this boy. He... He was a friend of mine. And my brother, Kennet. But he died on the bridge of ships. Too many good men died that day. Tyrion's scar was itching fiercely. He picked at it with a fingernail. I miss the food, too, Kem said wistfully. Your mother's cooking? Rats wouldn't eat my mother's cooking. There was this pot shop, though. No one ever made a bowl of brown like them. So thick you could stand your spoon up in the bowl, with chunks of this and that. You ever have yourself a bowl of brown, half-man? A time or two. Singer's stew, I call it. Why's that? It tastes so good it makes me want to sing. Kem liked that. Singer's stew. I'll ask for that next time I get back to Flea Bottom. What do you miss, half-man? Jame, thought Tyrion. Shay, Tysha. My wife. I miss my wife, the wife I hardly knew. Wine, whores, and wealth, he answered. Especially the wealth. Wealth will buy you wine and whores. It will also buy you swords and the chems to wield them. Is it true the chamber pots in Casterly Rock are made of solid gold? Chem asked him. You should not believe everything you hear, especially where House Lannister is concerned. They say all Lannisters are twisty snakes. Snakes? Tyrion laughed. That sound you hear is my lord father slithering in his grave. We are lions, or so we like to say, but it makes no matter, Kem. Step on a snake or a lion's tail, you'll end up just as dead. By then they had reached the armory, such as it was. The smith, this fabled hammer, proved to be a freakish-looking hulk with a left arm that appeared twice as thick as his right. He's drunk more than not, Kem said. Brown Ben lets it go, but one day we'll get us a real armorer. Hammer's apprentice was a wiry, red-haired youth called Nail. Of course, what else, mused Tyrion. Hammer was sleeping off a drunk when they reached the forge, just as Kem had prophesied, but Nail had no objection to the two dwarfs clambering through the wagons. Crap iron, most of it, he warned them, but you're welcome to anything you can use. Under roofs of bent wood and stiffened leather, the wagon beds were heaped high with old weaponry and armor. Tyrion took one look and sighed, remembering the gleaming racks of swords and spears and halberds in the armory of the Lannisters below Casterly Rock. This may take a while, he declared. There's sound steel here if you can find it, a deep voice growled. None of it is pretty, but it will stop a sword. A big knight stepped down from the back of a wagon, clad head to heel in company steel. His left greave did not match his right, his gorget was spotted with rust, his vambraces rich and ornate, 
inlaid with niello flowers. On his right hand was a gauntlet of lobstered steel, on his left a fingerless mitt of rusted mail. The nipples on his muscled breastplate had a pair of iron rings through them. His great helm sported a ram's horns, one of which was broken. When he took it off, he revealed the battered face of Jorah Mormont. He looks every inch a sellsword and not at all like the half-broken thing we took from Yezhan's cage, Tyrion reflected. His bruises had mostly faded by now, and the swelling in his face had largely subsided, so Mormont looked almost human once again, though only vaguely like himself. The demon's mask the slavers had burned into his right cheek to mark him for a dangerous and disobedient slave would never leave him. Ser Jorah had never been what one might call a comely man. The brand had transformed his face into something frightening. Tyrion grinned. As long as I look prettier than you, I will be happy. He turned to Penny. You take that wagon. I'll start with this one. It will go faster if we look together. She plucked up a rusted iron half-helm, giggled, and stuck it on her head. Do I look fearsome? You look like a mummer girl with a pot on her head. That's a half-helm. You want a great helm. He found one and swapped it for the half-helm. It's too big, Penny's voice echoed hollowly inside the steel. I can't see out. She took the helm off and flung it aside. What's wrong with the half-helm? It's open-faced. Tyrion pinched her nose. I am fond of looking at your nose. I would rather that you kept it. Her eyes got big. You like my nose? Oh, Seven, save me. Tyrion turned away and began rooting amongst some piles of old armor toward the back of the wagon. Are there any other parts of me you like? Penny asked. Perhaps she meant that to sound playful. It sounded sad instead. I am fond of all of your parts, Tyrion said, in hopes of ending any further discussion of the subject, and even fonder of mine own. Why should we need armor? We're only mummers. We just pretend to fight. You pretend very well, said Tyrion, examining a shirt of heavy iron mail so full of holes that it almost looked moth-eaten. What sort of moths eat chain mail? Pretending to be dead is one way to survive a battle. Good armor is another. Though there is precious little of that here, I fear. At the Green Fork he had fought in mismatched scraps of plate from Lord Lefford's wagons, with a spiked bucket helm that made it look as if someone had upended a slop's pail over his head. This company steel was worse. Not just old and ill-fitting, but dinted, cracked, and brittle. Is that dried blood or only rust? He sniffed at it, but still could not be sure. Here's a crossbow. Penny showed it to him. Tyrion glanced at it. I cannot use a stirrup winch. My legs are not long enough. A crank would serve me better. Though, if truth be told, he did not want a crossbow. They took too long to reload. Even if he lurked by the latrine ditch waiting for some enemy to take a squat, the chances of his losing more than one quarrel would not be good. Instead, he picked up a morning star, gave it a swing, put it down again. Too heavy. He passed over a war hammer, too long, a studded mace, also too heavy and half a dozen long swords before he found a dirk he liked, a nasty piece of steel with a triangular blade. This might serve, he said. The blade had a bit of rust on it, but that would only make it nastier. He found a wood and leather sheath that fit, and slipped the dirk inside. A little sword for a little man, joked Penny. It's a dirk and made for a big man. Tyrion showed her an old longsword. This is a sword. Try it. Penny took it, swung it, frowned. Too heavy. Steel weighs more than wood. Chop through a man's neck with that thing, though, and his head is not like to turn into a melon. He took the sword back from her and inspected it more closely. Cheap steel. And notched. Here, see? I take back what I said. You need a better blade to hack off heads. I don't want to hack off heads. Nor should you. Keep your cuts below the knee. 
calf, hamstring, ankle. Even giants fall if you slice their feet off. Once they're down, they're no bigger than you. Penny looked as though she was about to cry. Last night I dreamed my brother was alive again. We were jousting before some great lord, riding Crunch and Pretty Pig, and men were throwing roses at us. We were so happy. Tyrion slapped her. It was a soft blow all in all, a little flick of the wrist, with hardly any force behind it. It did not even leave a mark upon her cheek. But her eyes filled with tears all the same. If you want to dream, go back to sleep, he told her. When you wake up, we'll still be escaped slaves in the middle of a siege. Crunch is dead. The pig is well, most like. Now find some armor and put it on, and never mind where it pinches. The mummer show is over. Fight or hide or shit yourself as you like, but whatever you decide to do, you'll do it clad in steel. Penny touched the cheek he'd slapped. We should never have run. We're not cell swords. We're not any kind of swords. It wasn't so bad with Yezen. It wasn't. Nurse was cruel sometimes, but Yezen never was. We were his favorites. His... His... Slaves. The word you want is slaves. Slaves, she said, flushing. We were his special slaves, though. Just like sweets, his treasures. His pets, thought Tyrion. And he loved us so much that he sent us to the pit to be devoured by lions. She was not all wrong. Yezan's slaves ate better than many peasants back in the Seven Kingdoms, and were less like to starve to death come winter. Slaves were chattels, I. They could be bought and sold, whipped and branded, used for the carnal pleasure of their owners, bred to make more slaves. In that sense, they were no more than dogs or horses. But most lords treated their dogs and horses well enough. Proud men might shout that they would sooner die free than live as slaves, but pride was cheap. When the steel struck the flint, such men were rare as dragon's teeth, elsewise the world would not have been so full of slaves. There has never been a slave who did not choose to be a slave, the dwarf reflected. Their choice may be between bondage and death, but the choice is always there. Tyrion Lannister did not accept himself. His tongue had earned him some stripes on the back in the beginning, but soon enough he had learned the tricks of pleasing Nurse and the noble Yezan. Jorah Mormont had fought longer and harder, but he would have come to the same place in the end. And Penny, well... Penny had been searching for a new master since the day her brother Grote had lost his head. She wants someone to take care of her, someone to tell her what to do. It would have been too cruel to say so, however. Instead, Tyrion said, Yazan's special slaves did not escape the Pale Mare. They're dead, the lot of them. Sweets was the first to go. Their mammoth master had died on the day of their escape, Brown Ben Plum had told him. Neither he nor Casporio nor any of the other sellswords knew the fate of the denizens of Yezan's grotesquerie, but if pretty Penny needed lies to stop her mooning, lie to her he would. If you want to be a slave again, I will find you a kind master when this war is done and sell you for enough gold to get me home, Tyrion promised her. I'll find you some nice youngish men to give you another pretty golden collar with little bells on it that will tinkle everywhere you go. First, though, you will need to survive what's coming. No one buys dead mummers. Or dead dwarfs, said Jorah Mormont. We are all like to be feeding worms by the time this battle is done. The young Kai have lost this war, though it may take them some time to know it. Mirin has an army of unsullied infantry, the finest in the world. And Mirin has dragons. Three of them, once the queen returns. She will. She must. Our side consists of two score yunkish lordlings, each with his own half-trained monkey men. Slaves on stilts, slaves in chains. They may have troops of blind men and palsied children, too. I would not put it past them. Oh, I know, said Tyrion. The second sons are on the losing side. They need to turn their cloaks again and do it now. He grinned. Leave that to me. The Kingbreaker A pale shadow and a dark, the two conspirators came together in the quiet of the armory on the Great Pyramid's second level, 
amongst racks of spears, sheaves of quarrels, and walls hung with trophies from forgotten battles. Tonight, said Skahazmo Kandak. The brass face of a blood bat peered out from beneath the hood of his patchwork cloak. All my men will be in place. The word is Grolio. Grolio. That is fitting, I suppose. Yes. What was done to him? You were at court? One guardsman amongst forty, all waiting for the empty tabard on the throne to speak the command so we might cut down Bloodbeard and the rest. Do you think the young Kai would ever have dared present Daenerys with the head of her hostage? No, thought Selmy. Hisdar seemed distraught. Sham. His own kin of Lorak were returned unharmed. You saw? The young Kai played us a mummer's farce with noble Hisdar as chief mummer. The issue was never Yurkhaz Zoyunzak. The other slavers would gladly have trampled that old fool themselves. This was to give Hisdar a pretext to kill the dragons. Sir Barristan chewed on that. Would he dare? He dared to kill his queen, why not her pets? If we do not act, Hisdar will hesitate for a time to give proof of his reluctance and allow the wise masters the chance to rid him of the storm crow and the blood rider. Then he will act. They want the dragons dead before the Volantine fleet arrives. Aye, they would. It all fit. That did not mean Barristan Selmy liked it any better. That will not happen. His queen was the mother of dragons. He would not allow her children to come to harm. The hour of the wolf, the blackest part of night when all the world's asleep. He had first heard those words from Tywin Lannister outside the walls of Duskendale. He gave me a day to bring out Eris. Unless I returned with the king by dawn of the following day, he would take the town with steel and fire, he told me. It was the hour of the wolf when I went in, and the hour of the wolf when we emerged. Grey Worm and the Unsullied will close and bar the gates at first light. Better to attack at first light, Skahaz said. Burst from the gates and swarm across the siege lines. Smash the young Kai as they come stumbling from their beds. No. The two of them had argued this before. There is a peace, signed and sealed by Her Grace the Queen. We will not be the first to break it. Once we have taken Hisdar, we will form a council to rule in his place and demand that the young Kai return our hostages and withdraw their armies. Should they refuse, then and only then will we inform them that the peace is broken and go forth to give them battle. Your way is dishonorable. Your way is stupid, the shave pate said. The hour is ripe. Our freedmen are ready, hungry. That much was true, Selmy knew. Simon Stripeback of the Free Brothers and Molano Yas Dob of the Stalwart Shields were both eager for battle, intent on proving themselves and washing out all the wrongs they had suffered in a tide of yunkish blood. Only Marcelin of the Mother's Men shared Ser Barristan's doubts. We discussed this. You agreed it would be my way. I agreed, the shave pate grumbled. But that was before Grolio, the head. The slavers have no honor. We do, said Ser Barristan. The shave pate muttered something in Giscari, then said, As you wish. Though we will rue your old man's honor before this game is done, I think. What of Hisdar's guards? His grace keeps two men by him when he sleeps. One on the door of his bedchamber, a second within, in an adjoining alcove. Tonight it will be Kraz and Steelskin. Kraz, the shave pate grumbled. That I do not like. It need not come to blood, Sir Barristan told him. I mean to talk to Hisdar. If he understands we do not intend to kill him, he may command his guards to yield. And if not, his dar must not escape us. He will not escape. Selmy did not fear Kraz, much less Steelskin. They were only pit fighters. His dar's fearsome collection of former fighting slaves made indifferent guards at best. Speed and strength and ferocity they had, and some skill at arms as well, but blood games were poor training for protecting kings. In the pits, their foes were announced with horns and drums, and after the battle was done and won, the victors could have their wounds bound up and quaff some milk of the poppy for the pain, 
knowing that the threat was past and they were free to drink and feast and whore until the next fight. But the battle was never truly done for a knight of the king's guard. Threats came from everywhere and nowhere, at any time of day or night. No trumpets announced the foe. Vassals, servants, friends, brothers, sons, even wives, any of them might have knives concealed beneath their cloaks and murder hidden in their hearts. For every hour of fighting, a Kingsguard knight spent ten thousand hours watching, waiting, standing silent in the shadows. King Hisdar's pit fighters were already growing bored and restive with their new duties, and bored men were lax, slow to react. I shall deal with Kraz, said Sir Barristan. Just make certain I do not need to deal with any brazen beasts as well. Have no fear. We will have Margaz in chains before he can make mischief. I told you, the brazen beasts are mine. You say you have men amongst the Yunkish men? Sneaks and spies. Reznak has more. Reznak cannot be trusted. He smells too sweet and feels too foul. Someone needs to free our hostages. Unless we get our people back, the Yunkai will use them against us. Skahaz snorted through the nose holes of his mask. Easy to speak of rescue, harder to do. Let the slavers threaten. And if they do more than threaten? Would you miss them so much, old man? A eunuch, a savage, and a sellsword? Hero Jogo and Dario. Jogo is the queen's blood rider, blood of her blood. They came out of the Red Waste together. Hero is Grey Worm's second in command. And Dario... She loves Dario. He had seen it in her eyes when she looked at him, heard it in her voice when she spoke of him. Dario is vain and rash, but he is dear to her grace. He must be rescued before his storm crows decide to take matters into their own hands. It can be done. I once brought the Queen's father safely out of Duskendale, where he was being held captive by a rebel lord, but you could never hope to pass unnoticed amongst the young Kai. Every man of them knows your face by now. I could hide my face like you, thought Selmy, but he knew the shave pate was right. Duskendale had been a lifetime ago. He was too old for such heroics. Then we must needs find some other way. Some other rescuer. Someone known to the Yunkish men, whose presence in their camp might go unnoticed. Dario calls you Ser Grandfather, Skahaz reminded him. I will not say what he calls me. If you and I were the hostages, would he risk his skin for us? Not likely, he thought, but he said. He might. Dario might piss on us if we were burning. Elsewise, do not look to him for help. Let the Stormcrows choose another captain, one who knows his place. If the Queen does not return, the world will be one sellsword short. Who will grieve? And when she does return? She will weep and tear her hair and curse the young Kai. Not us. No blood on our hands. You can comfort her. Tell her some tale of the old days. She likes those. Poor Dario, her brave captain. She will never forget him, no. But better for all of us if he is dead, yes? Better for Daenerys, too. Better for Daenerys and for Westeros. Daenerys Targaryen loved her captain, but that was the girl in her, not the queen. Prince Rhaegar loved his lady Lyanna, and thousands died for it. Daemon Blackfire loved the first Daenerys, and rose in rebellion when denied her. Bittersteel and Bloodraven both loved Shiera Seastar, and the Seven Kingdoms bled. The Prince of Dragonflies loved Jenny of Oldstones so much he cast aside a crown, and Westeros paid the bride price in corpses. All three of the sons of the fifth Aegon had wed for love, in defiance of their father's wishes, and because that unlikely monarch had himself followed his heart when he chose his queen, he allowed his sons to have their way, making bitter enemies where he might have had fast friends. Treason and turmoil followed, as night follows day, ending at summer hall in sorcery, fire, and grief. Her love for Dario is poison, a slower poison than the locusts, but in the end as deadly. There is still Jogo, Sir Barristan said, him and Hero, both precious to her grace. We have hostages as well, Skahaz Shavepate reminded him. If the slavers kill one of ours, we kill one of theirs. 
For a moment, Sir Barristan did not know whom he meant. Then it came to him. The Queen's cupbearers? Hostages, insisted Skahasmo Kandak. Grasdar and Keza are the blood of the Green Grace. Mazara is of Merek, Kesmia is Pal, Azak Gazin, Bakaz is Lorak, Hisdar's own kin. All are sons and daughters of the pyramids. Jacques, Quasar, Ulez, Hazkar, Dazak, Yerizan, all children of great masters. Innocent girls and sweet-faced boys. Sir Barristan had come to know them all during the time they served the queen. Grajar with his dreams of glory, shy Mazara, lazy Miklaz, vain pretty Kesmia, Keza with her big soft eyes and angel's voice, Dazar the dancer, and the rest. Children. Children of the harpy. Only blood can pay for blood. So said the Yunkish man who brought us Grolio's head. He was not wrong. I will not permit it. What use are hostages if they may not be touched? Mayhaps we might offer three of the children for Dario, Hero, and Jogo, Sir Barristan allowed. Her grace is not here. It is for you and me to do what must be done. You know that I am right. Prince Rhaegar had two children, Sir Barristan told him. Rhaenys was a little girl, Aegon a babe in arms. When Tywin Lannister took King's Landing, his men killed both of them. He served the bloody bodies up in crimson cloaks, a gift for the new king. And what did Robert say when he saw them? Did he smile? Barristan Selmy had been badly wounded on the trident, so he had been spared the sight of Lord Tywin's gift, but oft he wondered. If I had seen him smile over the red ruins of Rhaegar's children, no army on this earth could have stopped me from killing him. I will not suffer the murder of children, except that or I'll have no part of this. Skahaz chuckled. You are a stubborn old man. Your sweet-faced boys will only grow up to be sons of the harpy. Kill them now or kill them then. You kill men for the wrongs they have done, not the wrongs that they may do some day. The shave-pate took an axe down off the wall, inspected it, and grunted. So be it. No harm to Hisdar or our hostages. Will that content you, Sir Grandfather? Nothing about this will content me. It will serve. The hour of the wolf. Remember. I am not like to forget, Sir. Though the bat's brass mouth did not move, Sir Barristan could sense the grin beneath the mask. Long has Kandak waited for this night. That is what I fear. If King Hisdar was innocent, what they did this day would be treason. But how could he be innocent? Selmy had heard him urging Daenerys to taste the poisoned locusts, shouting at his men to slay the dragon. If we do not act, Hisdar will kill the dragons and open the gates to the queen's enemies. We have no choice in this. Yet no matter how he turned and twisted this, the old knight could find no honor in it. The rest of that long day raced past as swiftly as a snail. Elsewhere, he knew, King Hisdar was consulting with Reznak Mo Reznak, Margaz Zolorak, Galaza Galer, and his other Mirinese advisers, deciding how best to respond to Yunkai's demands, but Barrist and Selmy was no longer a part of such councils. Nor did he have a king to guard. Instead, he made the rounds of the pyramid from top to bottom to ascertain that the sentries were all at their posts. That took most of the morning. He spent that afternoon with his orphans, even took up sword and shield himself to provide a sterner test for a few of the older lads. Some of them had been training for the fighting pits when Daenerys Targaryen took Meereen and freed them from their chains. Those had had a good acquaintance with sword and spear and battle-axe even before Ser Barristan got hold of them. A few might well be ready. The boy from the Basilisk Isles, for a start. Tumko Lo. Black as Maester's ink he was, but fast and strong, the best natural swordsman Selmy had seen since Jaime Lannister. Larak as well, the lash. Sir Barristan did not approve of his fighting style, but there was no doubting his skills. Larak had years of work ahead of him before he mastered proper knightly weapons, sword and lance and mace, but he was deadly with his whip and trident. 
The old knight had warned him that the whip would be useless against an armored foe, until he saw how Larrick used it, snapping it around the legs of his opponents to yank them off their feet. No knight as yet, but a fierce fighter. Larrick and Tumko were his best. After them, the Lazarine, the one the other boys called Red Lamb, though as yet that one was all ferocity and no technique. Perhaps the brothers, too, three lowborn Giscari and slave to pay their father's debts. That made six. Six out of twenty-seven. Selmy might have hoped for more, but six was a good beginning. The other boys were younger for the most part, and more familiar with looms and plows and chamber pots than swords and shields, but they worked hard and learned quickly. A few years as squires, and he might have six more knights to give his queen. As for those who would never be ready, well, not every boy was meant to be a knight. The realm needs candle-makers and innkeeps and armorers as well. That was as true in Myrene as it was in Westeros. As he watched them at their drills, Sir Barristan pondered raising Tumco and Larrack to knighthood then and there, and mayhaps the Red Lamb, too. It required a knight to make a knight, and if something should go awry tonight, Dawn might find him dead or in a dungeon. Who would dub his squires then? On the other hand, a young knight's repute derived at least in part from the honor of the man who conferred knighthood on him. It would do his lads no good at all if it was known that they were given their spurs by a traitor, and might well land them in the dungeon next to him. They deserve better, Sir Barristan decided. Better a long life as a squire than a short one as a soiled knight. As the afternoon melted into evening, he bid his charges to lay down their swords and shields and gather round. He spoke to them about what it meant to be a knight. It is chivalry that makes a true knight, not a sword, he said. Without honor, a knight is no more than a common killer. It is better to die with honor than to live without it. The boys looked at him strangely, he thought, but one day they would understand. Afterward, back at the apex of the pyramid, Sir Barristan found Missende amongst piles of scrolls and books, reading. Stay here tonight, child, he told her. Whatever happens, whatever you see or hear, do not leave the Queen's chambers. This one hears, the girl said. If she may ask, best not. Sir Barristan stepped out alone on to the terrace gardens. I am not made for this, he reflected as he looked out over the sprawling city. The pyramids were waking one by one, lanterns and torches flickering to life as shadows gathered in the streets below. Plots, ploys, whispers, lies, secrets within secrets, and somehow I have become part of them. Perhaps by now he should have grown used to such things. The Red Keep had its secrets too. Even Rhaegar. The Prince of Dragonstone had never trusted him as he had trusted Arthur Dane. Harrenhal was proof of that. The year of the false spring. The memory was still bitter. Old Lord Went had announced the tourney shortly after a visit from his brother, Sir Oswell Went, of the Kingsguard. With Varys whispering in his ear, King Eris became convinced that his son was conspiring to depose him, that Went's tourney was but a ploy to give Rhaegar a pretext for meeting with as many great lords as could be brought together. Eris had not set foot outside the Red Keep since Duskendale, yet suddenly he announced that he would accompany Prince Rhaegar to Harrenhal, and everything had gone awry from there. If I had been a better knight, if I had unhorsed the prince in that last tilt as I unhorsed so many others, it would have been for me to choose the queen of love and beauty. Rhaegar had chosen Lyanna Stark of Winterfell. Barristan Selmy would have made a different choice. Not the queen, who was not present, nor Elia of Dorne, though she was good and gentle. Had she been chosen, much war and woe might have been avoided. His choice would have been a young maiden not long at court, one of Elia's companions, though compared to Asherah Dane, the Dornish princess was a kitchen drab. Even after all these years, Sir Barristan could still recall Asherah's smile, the sound of her laughter. He had only to close his eyes to see her, with her long dark hair tumbling about her shoulders and those haunting purple eyes. Daenerys has the same eyes. 
Sometimes when the queen looked at him, he felt as if he were looking at Asherah's daughter. But Asherah's daughter had been stillborn, and his fair lady had thrown herself from a tower soon after, mad with grief for the child she had lost, and perhaps for the man who had dishonored her at Harrenhal as well. She died never knowing that Ser Barristan had loved her. How could she? He was a knight of the king's guard, sworn to celibacy. No good could have come from telling her his feelings. No good came from silence, either. If I had unhorsed Rhaegar and crowned Asher a queen of love and beauty, might she have looked to me instead of Stark? He would never know. But of all his failures, none haunted Barristan sell me so much as that. The sky was overcast, the air hot, muggy, oppressive, yet there was something in it that made his spine tingle. Rain, he thought. A storm is coming if not tonight, upon the morrow. Sir Barristan wondered if he would live to see it. If Hisdar has his own spider, I am as good as dead. Should it come to that, he meant to die as he had lived, with his longsword in his hand. When the last light had faded in the west, behind the sails of the prowling ships on Slaver's Bay, Sir Barristan went back inside, summoned a pair of serving men, and told them to heat some water for a bath, Sparring with his squires in the afternoon heat had left him feeling soiled and sweaty. The water, when it came, was only lukewarm, but Selmy lingered in the bath until it had grown cold and scrubbed his skin till it was raw. Clean as he had ever been, he rose, dried himself, and clad himself in whites. Stockings, small clothes, silken tunic, padded jerkin, all fresh washed and bleached, over that he donned the armor that the queen had given him as a token of her esteem. The mail was gilded, finely wrought, the links as supple as good leather, the plate enameled, hard as ice and bright as new-fallen snow. His dagger went on one hip, his long sword on the other, hung from a white leather belt with golden buckles. Last of all, he took down his long white cloak and fastened it about his shoulders. The helm he left upon its hook. The narrow eye slit limited his vision, and he needed to be able to see for what was to come. The halls of the pyramid were dark at night, and foes could come at you from either side. Besides, though the ornate dragon's wings that adorned the helm were splendid to look upon, they could too easily catch a sword or axe. He would leave them for his next tourney, if the seven should grant him one. Armed and armored, the old knight waited, sitting in the gloom of his small chamber adjoining the queen's apartments. The faces of all the kings that he had served and failed floated before him in the darkness, and the faces of the brothers who had served beside him in the king's guard as well. He wondered how many of them would have done what he was about to do. Some, surely, but not all. Some would not have hesitated to strike down the shave pate as a traitor. Outside the pyramid, it began to rain. Sir Barristan sat along in the dark, listening. It sounds like tears, he thought. It sounds like dead kings, weeping. Then it was time to go. The Great Pyramid of Myrene had been built as an echo to the Great Pyramid of Gis, whose colossal ruins Lomas Longstrider had once visited. Like its ancient predecessor, whose red marble halls were now the haunt of bats and spiders, the Myrinese pyramid boasted three and thirty levels, that number being somehow sacred to the gods of Gis. Sir Barristan began the long descent alone, his white cloak rippling behind him as he started down. He took the servants' steps, not the grand stairways of veined marble, but the narrower, steeper, straighter stairs hidden within the thick brick walls. Twelve levels down, he found the shave pate waiting, his coarse features still hidden by the mask he had worn that morning the blood bat. Six brazen beasts were with him. All were masked as insects, identical to one another. Locusts, Selmy realized. Grolio, he said. Grolio, one of the locusts replied. I have more locusts if you need them, said Skahaz. Six should serve. What of the men on the doors? Mine. You will have no trouble. Sir Barristan clasped the shave pate by the arm. Shed no blood unless you must. Come the morrow we will convene a council and tell the city what we've done and why. 
as you say. Good fortune to you, old man. They went their separate ways. The brazen beasts fell in behind Ser Barristan as he continued his descent. The king's apartments were buried in the very heart of the pyramid, on the 16th and 17th levels. When Selmy reached those floors, he found the doors to the interior of the pyramid chained shut, with a pair of brazen beasts posted as guards. Beneath the hoods of their patchwork cloaks, one was a rat, the other a bull. Grolio, Sir Barristan said. Grolio, the bull returned. Third hall to the right. The rat unlocked the chain. Sir Barristan and his escort stepped through into a narrow, torchlit servant's corridor of red and black brick. Their footsteps echoed on the floors as they strode past two halls and took the third one to the right. Outside the carved hardwood doors to the king's chambers stood Steelskin, a younger pit fighter, not yet regarded as of the first rank. His cheeks and brow were scarred with intricate tattoos in green and black, ancient Valyrian sorcerer's signs that supposedly made his flesh and skin as hard as steel. Similar markings covered his chest and arms, though whether they would actually stop a sword or axe remained to be seen. Even without them, Steelskin looked formidable, a lean and wiry youth who overtopped Ser Barristan by half a foot. Who goes there? he called out, swinging his long axe sideways to bar their way. When he saw Ser Barristan, with the brass locusts behind him, he lowered it again. Old Ser. If it please the king, I must needs have words with him. The hour is late. The hour is late, but the need is urgent. I can ask. Steelskin slammed the butt of his long axe against the door to the king's apartments. A slide hole opened. A child's eye appeared. A child's voice called through the door. Steelskin replied. Ser Barristan heard the sound of a heavy bar being drawn back. The door swung open. Only you, said Steelskin. The beasts wait here. As you wish. Ser Barristan nodded to the locusts. One returned his nod. Alone, Selmy slipped through the door. Dark and windowless, surrounded on all sides by brick walls eight feet thick, the chambers that the king had made his own were large and luxurious within. Great beams of black oak supported the high ceilings. The floors were covered with silk carpets out of Carth. On the walls were priceless tapestries, ancient and much faded, depicting the glory of the old empire of Gis. The largest of them showed the last survivors of a defeated Valyrian army passing beneath the yoke and being chained. The archway leading to the royal bedchamber was guarded by a pair of sandalwood lovers, shaped and smoothed and oiled. Ser Barristan found them distasteful, though no doubt they were meant to be arousing. The sooner we are gone from this place, the better. An iron brazier gave the only light. Beside it stood two of the queen's cupbearers, Drakaz and Keza. Miklas has gone to wake the king, said Keza. May we bring you wine, sir? No, I thank you. You may sit, said Drakaz, indicating a bench. I prefer to stand. He could hear voices drifting through the archway from the bedchamber. One of them was the king's. It was still a good few moments before King Hisdarzo Lorak, fourteenth of that noble name, emerged yawning, knotting the sash that closed his robe. The robe was green satin, richly worked with pearls and silver thread. Under it the king was quite naked. That was good. Naked men felt vulnerable and were less inclined to acts of suicidal heroism. The woman Ser Barristan glimpsed peering through the archway from behind a gauzy curtain was naked as well, her breasts and hips only partially concealed by the blowing silk. Sir Barristan, Hisdar yawned again. What hour is it? Is there news of my sweet queen? None, your grace. Hisdar sighed. Your magnificence, please, though at this hour your sleepiness would be more apt. The king crossed to the sideboard to pour himself a cup of wine, but only a trickle remained in the bottom of the flagon. A flicker of annoyance crossed his face. Miklas wine, at once. Yes, your worship. 
Take Drakaz with you. One flagon of arbor gold and one of that sweet red. None of our yellow piss, thank you. And the next time I find my flagon dry, I may have to take a switch to those pretty pink cheeks of yours. The boy went running off, and the king turned back to sell me. I dreamed you found Daenerys. Dreams can lie, your grace. Your radiance would serve. What brings you to me at this hour, sir? Some trouble in the city? The city is tranquil. Is it so? Hisdar looked confused. Why have you come? To ask a question. Magnificence, are you the harpy? Hisdar's wine cup slipped through his fingers, bounced off the carpet, rolled. You come to my bedchamber in the black of night and ask me that? Are you mad? It was only then that the king seemed to notice that Ser Barristan was wearing his plate and mail. What? Why? How dare you? Was the poison your work, magnificence? King Hisdar backed away a step. The locusts? That... that was the Dornishman, Quentin, the so-called prince. Ask Resnak if you doubt me. Have you proof of that, has Resnak? No, else I would have had them seized. Perhaps I should do so in any case. Margaz will wring a confession out of them, I do not doubt. They're all poisoners, these Dornish. Resnak says they worship snakes. They eat snakes, said Sir Barristan. It was your pit, your box, your seats. Sweet wine and soft cushions, figs and melons and honeyed locusts. You provided all. You urged her grace to try the locusts, but never tasted one yourself. I... Hot spices do not agree with me. She was my wife, my queen. Why would I want to poison her? Was, he says, he believes her dead. Only you can answer that, Magnificence. It might be that you wished to put another woman in her place. Sir Barristan nodded at the girl peering timidly from the bedchamber. That one, perhaps? The king looked around wildly. Her? She's nothing. A bed slave. He raised his hands. I misspoke. Not a slave. A free woman. Trained in pleasure. Even a king has needs. She... She is none of your concerns, sir. I would never harm Daenerys. Never. You urged the queen to try the locusts. I heard you. I thought she might enjoy them. His dar retreated another step. Hot and sweet at once. Hot and sweet and poisoned. With mine own ears I heard you commanding the men in the pit to kill Drogon, shouting at them. Hisdar licked his lips. The beast devoured Barsina's flesh. Dragons prey on men. It was killing, burning, burning men who meant harm to your queen. Harpy's sons, as like as not, your friends. Not my friends. You say that, yet when you told them to stop killing, they obeyed. Why would they do that if you were not one of them? Hisdar shook his head. This time he did not answer. Tell me true, Sir Barristan said. Did you ever love her, even a little? Or was it just the crown you lusted for? Lust? You dare speak to me of lust! The king's mouth twisted in anger. I lusted for the crown, I but not half so much as she lusted for her cell sword. Perhaps it was her precious captain who tried to poison her for putting him aside. And if I had eaten of his locusts too, well, so much the better. Dario is a killer, but not a poisoner. Sir Barristan moved closer to the king. Are you the harpy? This time he put his hand on the hilt of his long sword. Tell me true, and I promise you shall have a swift, clean death. You presume too much, sir, said Hisdar. I am done with these questions, and with you. You are dismissed from my service. Leave Meereen at once, and I will let you live. If you are not the harpy, give me his name. Sir Barristan pulled his sword from the scabbard. Its sharp edge caught the light from the brazier, became a line of orange fire. Hisdar broke. Kraz! 
he shrieked, stumbling backwards toward his bedchamber. Kraz! Kraz! Sir Barristan heard a door open, somewhere to his left. He turned in time to see Kraz emerge from behind a tapestry. He moved slowly, still groggy from sleep, but his weapon of choice was in his hand, a Dothraki arak, long and curved, a slasher's sword made to deliver deep slicing cuts from horseback, a murderous blade against half-naked foes in the pit or on the battlefield. But here at close quarters the arak's length would tell against it, and Barristan Selmy was clad in plate and mail. I am here for Hisdar, the knight said. Throw down your steel and stand aside, and no harm need come to you. Kraz laughed. Old man, I will eat your heart. The two men were of a height, but Kraz was two stone heavier and forty years younger, with pale skin, dead eyes, and a crest of bristly red-black hair that ran from his brow to the base of his neck. Then come, said Barristan the Bold. Kraz came. For the first time all day, Selmy felt certain. This is what I was made for, he thought. The dance, the sweet steel song, a sword in my hand and a foe before me. The pit fighter was fast, blazing fast, as quick as any man Sir Barristan had ever fought. In those big hands, the Arak became a whistling blur, a steel storm that seemed to come at the old knight from three directions at once. Most of the cuts were aimed at his head, Kraz was no fool. Without a helm, Selmy was most vulnerable above the neck. He blocked the blows calmly, his long sword meeting each slash and turning it aside. The blades rang and rang again. Sir Barristan retreated. On the edge of his vision, he saw the cupbearers watching with eyes as big and white as chicken eggs. Kraz cursed and turned a high cut into a low one, slipping past the old knight's blade for once, only to have his blow scrape uselessly off a white steel greave. Selmy's answering slash found the pit fighter's left shoulder, parting the fine linen to bite the flesh beneath. His yellow tunic began to turn pink, then red. Only cowards dress in iron, Kraz declared, circling. No one wore armor in the fighting pits. It was blood the crowds came for, death, dismemberment, and shrieks of agony the music of the Scarlet Sands. Sir Barristan turned with him. This coward is about to kill you, sir. The man was no knight, but his courage had earned him that much courtesy. Kraz did not know how to fight a man in armor. Sir Barristan could see it in his eyes, doubt, confusion, the beginnings of fear. The pit fighter came on again, screaming this time, as if sound could slay his foe where steel could not. The Arak slashed low, high, low again. Selmy blocked the cuts at his head and let his armor stop the rest, whilst his own blade opened the pit fighter's cheek from ear to mouth, then traced a raw red gash across his chest. Blood welled from Kraz's wounds. That only seemed to make him wilder. He seized the brazier with his off hand and flipped it, scattering embers and hot coals at Selmy's feet. Sarbaristan leapt over them. Kraz slashed at his arm and caught him, but the Arak could only chip the hard enamel before it met the steel below. In the pit that would have taken your arm off, old man. We are not in the pit. Take off that armor. It is not too late to throw down your steel. Yield. Die, spat Kraz, but as he lifted his Arak, its tip grazed one of the wall hangings and hung. That was all the chance Sir Barristan required. He slashed open the pit fighter's belly, parried the arak as it wrenched free, then finished Kraz with a quick thrust to the heart as the pit fighter's entrails came sliding out like a nest of greasy eels. Blood and viscera stained the king's silk carpets. Selmy took a step back. The long sword in his hand was red for half its length. Here and there the carpets had begun to smolder where some of the scattered coals had fallen. He could hear Porqueza sobbing. Don't be afraid, the old knight said. I mean you no harm, child. I want only the king. He wiped his sword clean on a curtain and stalked into the bedchamber, where he found Hisdar Zolorak, fourteenth of his noble name, hiding behind a tapestry and whimpering. Spare me, he begged. I do not want to die. Few do. 
yet all men die regardless. Sir Barristan sheathed his sword and pulled Hisdar to his feet. Come, I will escort you to a cell. By now the brazen beasts should have disarmed Steelskin. You will be kept a prisoner until the Queen returns. If nothing can be proved against you, you will not come to harm. You have my word as a knight. He took the king's arm and led him from the bedchamber, feeling strangely lightheaded, almost drunk. I was a king's guard. What am I now? Miklas and Drakaz had returned with Hisdar's wine. They stood in the open door, cradling the flagons against their chests and staring wide-eyed at the corpse of Kraz. Keza was still crying, but Jejin had appeared to comfort her. She hugged the younger girl, stroking her hair. Some of the other cupbearers stood behind them, watching. Your worship, Miklas said. The noble Reznak Mo Reznak says to tell you, come at once. The boy addressed the king as if Ser Barristan were not there, as if there were no dead man sprawled upon the carpet, his life's blood slowly staining the silk red. Skahaz was supposed to take Reznak into custody until we could be certain of his loyalty. Had something gone awry? Come where? Sir Barristan asked the boy. Where does the Seneschal want his grace to go? Outside. Miklas seemed to see him for the first time. Outside, sir. To the terrace. To see. To see what? D -d Dragons. The dragons have been loosed, sir. Seven save us all, the old knight thought. The Dragon Tamer The knight crept past on slow black feet. The hour of the bat gave way to the hour of the eel, the hour of the eel to the hour of ghosts. The prince lay abed, staring at his ceiling, dreaming without sleeping, remembering, imagining, twisting beneath his linen coverlet, his mind feverish with thoughts of fire and blood. Finally, despairing of rest, Quentin Martell made his way to his solar, where he poured himself a cup of wine and drank it in the dark. The taste was sweet solace on his tongue, so he lit a candle and poured himself another. Wine will help me sleep, he told himself, but he knew that was a lie. He stared at the candle for a long time, then put down his cup and held his palm above the flame. It took every bit of will he had to lower it until the fire touched his flesh, and when it did, he snatched his hand back with a cry of pain. Quentin, are you mad? No, just scared. I do not want to burn. Garrus? I heard you moving about. I could not sleep. Are burns a cure for that? Some warm milk and a lullaby might serve you well. Or better still, I could take you to the Temple of the Graces and find a girl for you. A whore, you mean? They call them Graces. They come in different colors. The red ones are the only ones who fuck. Garrus seated himself across the table. The Septas back home should take up the custom if you ask me. Have you noticed that old septas always look like prunes? That's what a life of chastity will do to you. Quentin glanced out at the terrace, where night's shadows lay thick amongst the trees. He could hear the soft sound of falling water. Is that rain? Your whores will be gone. Not all of them. There are little snuggeries in the pleasure gardens, and they wait there every night until a man chooses them. Those who are not chosen must remain until the sun comes up, feeling lonely and neglected. We could console them. They could console me, is what you mean. That, too. That is not the sort of consolation I require. I disagree. Daenerys Targaryen is not the only woman in the world. Do you want to die a man-made? Quentin did not want to die at all. I want to go back to Ironwood and kiss both of your sisters, marry Gwyneth Ironwood, watch her flower into beauty, have a child by her. I want to ride in tourneys, hawk and hunt, visit with my mother in Norbos, read some of those books my father sends me. 
I want Cletus and Will and Maester Kedry to be alive again. Do you think Danerus would be pleased to hear that I had bedded some whore? She might be. Men may be fond of maidens, but women like a man who knows what he's about in the bedchamber. It's another sort of swordplay. Takes training to be good at it. The jibe stung. Quentin had never felt so much a boy as when he'd stood before Daenerys Targaryen pleading for her hand. The thought of betting her terrified him almost as much as her dragons had. What if he could not please her? Daenerys has a paramour, he said defensively. My father did not send me here to amuse the queen in the bedchamber. You know why we have come. You cannot marry her. She has a husband. She does not love his Darzo Lorak. What has love to do with marriage? A prince should know better. Your father married for love, it's said. How much joy has he had of that? Little and less. Doran Martell and his Norvashi wife had spent half their marriage apart and the other half arguing. It was the only rash thing his father had ever done, to hear some tell it, the only time he had followed his heart instead of his head, and he had lived to rue it. Not all risks lead to ruin, he insisted. This is my duty, my destiny. You are supposed to be my friend, Garrus. Why must you mock my hopes? I have doubts enough without your throwing oil on the fire of my fear. This will be my grand adventure. Men die on grand adventures. He was not wrong. That was in the stories, too. The hero sets out with his friends and companions, faces dangers, comes home triumphant. Only some of his companions don't return at all. The hero never dies, though. I must be the hero. All I need is courage. Would you have Dorne remember me as a failure? Dorne is not like to remember any of us for long. Quentin sucked at the burned spot on his palm. Dorne remembers Aegon and his sisters. Dragons are not so easily forgotten. They will remember Daenerys as well. Not if she's died. She lives. She must. She is lost, but I can find her. And when I do, she will look at me the way she looks at her sellsword, once I have proven myself worthy of her. From Dragonback? I have been riding horses since I was six years old. And you've been thrown a time or three. That never stopped me from getting back into the saddle. You've never been thrown off a thousand feet above the ground, Garrus pointed out. And horses seldom turn their riders into charred bones and ashes. I know the dangers. I'll hear no more of this. You have my leave to go. Find a ship and run home, Garrus. The prince rose, blew the candle out, and crept back to his bed and its sweat-soaked linen sheets. I should have kissed one of the drinkwater twins, or maybe both of them. I should have kissed them whilst I could. I should have gone to Norvos to see my mother and the place that gave her birth, so she would know that I had not forgotten her. He could hear the rain falling outside, drumming against the bricks. By the time the hour of the wolf crept upon them, the rain was falling steadily, slashing down in a hard, cold torrent that would soon turn the brick streets of Meereen into rivers. The three Dornishmen broke their fast in the pre-dawn chill, a simple meal of fruit and bread and cheese, washed down with goat milk. When Garrus made to pour himself a cup of wine, Quentin stopped him. No wine. There will be time enough for drink afterward. One hopes, said Garrus. The big man looked out toward the terrace. I knew it would rain, he said in a gloomy tone. My bones were aching last night. They always ache before it rains. The dragons won't like this. Fire and water don't mix, and that's a fact. You get a good cook fire lit, blazing away nice, then it starts to piss down rain, and next thing your wood is sodden and your flames are dead. Garrus chuckled. Dragons are not made of wood, Arch. Some are. That old King Aegon, the randy one, he built wooden dragons to conquer us. That ended bad, though. So may this, the prince thought. 
The follies and failures of Aegon the Unworthy did not concern him, but he was full of doubts and misgivings. The labored banter of his friends was only making his headache. They do not understand. They may be Dornish, but I am Dorn. Years from now, when I am dead, this will be the song they sing of me. He rose abruptly. It's time. His friends got to their feet. Sir Archibald drained the last of his goat's milk and wiped the milk mustache from his upper lip with the back of a big hand. I'll get our mummer's garb. He returned with the bundle that they had collected from the tattered prince at their second meeting. Within were three long hooded cloaks made from myriad small squares of cloth sewn together, three cudgels, three short swords, three masks of polished brass, a bull, a lion, and an ape. Everything required to be a brazen beast. They may ask for a word, the tattered prince had warned them when he handed over the bundle. It's dog. You are certain of that? Garrus had asked him. Certain enough to wager a life upon it. The prince did not mistake his meaning. My life. That would be the one. How did you learn their word? We chanced upon some brazen beasts, and Maris asked them prettily. But a prince should know better than to pose such questions, Dornish. In Pentos we have a saying. Never ask the baker what went into the pie. Just eat. Just eat. There was wisdom in that, Quentin supposed. I'll be the bull, Arch announced. Quentin handed him the bull mask. The lion for me. Which makes a monkey out of me. Garrus pressed the ape mask to his face. How do they breathe in these things? Just put it on. The prince was in no mood for japes. The bundle contained a whip as well, a nasty piece of old leather with a handle of brass and bone, stout enough to peel the hide off an ox. What's that for? Arch asked. Daenerys used a whip to cow the black beast. Quentin coiled the whip and hung it from his belt. Arch, bring your hammer as well. We may have need of it. It was no easy thing to enter the Great Pyramid of Myrene by night. The doors were closed and barred each day at sunset and remained closed until first light. Guards were posted at every entrance, and more guards patrolled the lowest terrace where they could look down on the street. Formerly, those guards had been unsullied. Now they were brazen beasts. And that would make all the difference, Quentin hoped. The watch changed when the sun came up, but dawn was still half an hour off as the three Dornishmen made their way down the servants' steps. The walls around them were made of bricks of half a hundred colors, but the shadows turned them all to gray until touched by the light of the torch that Garrus carried. They encountered no one on the long descent. The only sound was the scuff of their boots on the worn bricks beneath their feet. The pyramid's main gates fronted on Mirene's central plaza, but the Dornishmen made their way to a side entrance opening on an alley. These were the gates that slaves had used in former days as they went about their master's business, where small folk and tradesmen came and went and made their deliveries. The doors were solid bronze, closed with a heavy iron bar. Before them stood two brazen beasts, armed with cudgels, spears, and short swords. Torchlight glimmered off the polished brass of their masks, a rat and a fox. Quentin gestured for the big man to stay back in the shadows. He and Garrus strode forward together. You come early, the fox said. Quentin shrugged. We can leave again if you like. You're welcome to stand our watch. He sounded not at all Giscari, he knew, but half the brazen beasts were freed slaves with all manner of native tongues, so his accent went unremarked. Bugger that, the rat remarked. Give us the day's word, said the fox. Dog, said the Dornishman. The two brazen beasts exchanged a look. For three long heartbeats, Quentin was afraid that something had gone amiss, that somehow pretty Maris and the tattered prince had gotten the word wrong. Then the fox grunted. Dog, then, he said. 
The door is yours. As they moved off, the prince began to breathe again. They did not have long. The real relief would doubtless turn up shortly. Arch, he called, and the big man appeared, the torchlight shining off his bull's mask. The bar, hurry. The iron bar was thick and heavy, but well-oiled. Sir Archibald had no trouble lifting it. As he was standing it on end, Quentin pulled the doors open and Garrus stepped through, waving the torch. Bring it in now. Be quick about it. The butcher's wagon was outside, waiting in the alley. The driver gave the mule a lick and rumbled through, iron-rimmed wheels clacking loudly over bricks. The quartered carcass of an ox filled the wagon bed, along with two dead sheep. Half a dozen men entered afoot. Five wore the cloaks and masks of brazen beasts, but pretty Maris had not troubled to disguise herself. Where is your lord? he asked Maris. I have no lord, she answered. If you mean your fellow prince, he is near with fifty men. Bring your dragon out, and he will see you safe away, as promised. Cago commands here. Sir Archibald was giving the butcher's wagon the sour eye. Will that cart be big enough to hold a dragon? he asked. Should. It's held two oxen. The corpse killer was garbed as a brazen beast, his seamed scarred face hidden behind a cobra mask but the familiar black arak slung at his hip gave him away. We were told these beasts are smaller than the queen's monster. The pit has slowed their growth. Quentin's readings had suggested that the same thing had occurred in the Seven Kingdoms. None of the dragons bred and raised in the dragon pit of King's Landing had ever approached the size of Vagar or Meraxes, much less that of the Black Dread, King Aegon's monster. Have you brought sufficient chains? How many dragons do you have? said Pretty Maris. We have chains enough for ten, concealed beneath the meat. Very good. Quentin felt lightheaded. None of this seemed quite real. One moment it felt like a game, the next like some nightmare, like a bad dream where he found himself opening a dark door, knowing that horror and death waited on the other side, yet somehow powerless to stop himself. His palms were slick with sweat. He wiped them on his legs and said, There will be more guards outside the pit. We know, said Garrus. We need to be ready for them. We are, said Arch. There was a cramp in Quentin's belly. He felt a sudden need to move his bowels, but knew he dare not beg off now. This way, then. He had seldom felt more like a boy. Yet they followed, Garrus and the big man, Maris and Cago and the other windblown. Two of the sellswords had produced crossbows from some hiding place within the wagon. Beyond the stables, the ground level of the Great Pyramid became a labyrinth, but Quentin Martell had been through here with the queen, and he remembered the way. Under three huge brick arches they went, then down a steep stone ramp into the depths, through the dungeons and torture chambers and past a pair of deep stone cisterns. Their footsteps echoed hollowly off the walls, the butcher's cart rumbling behind them. The big man snatched a torch down from a wall sconce to lead the way. At last, a pair of heavy iron doors rose before them, rust-eaten and forbidding, closed with a length of chain whose every link was as thick around as a man's arm. The size and thickness of those doors was enough to make Quentin Martell question the wisdom of this course. Even worse, both doors were plainly dinted by something inside trying to get out. The thick iron was cracked and splitting in three places, and the upper corner of the left-hand door looked partly melted. Four brazen beasts stood guarding the door. Three held long spears. The fourth, the sergeant, was armed with short sword and dagger. His mask was wrought in the shape of a basilisk's head. The other three were masked as insects. Locusts, Quentin realized. Dog, he said. The sergeant stiffened. That was all it took for Quentin Martell to realize that something had gone awry. Take them, he croaked, even as the basilisk's hand darted for his short sword. He was quick, that sergeant. The big man was quicker. 
He flung the torch at the nearest locust, reached back, and unslung his warhammer. The basilisk's blade had scarce slipped from its leather sheath when the hammer's spike slammed into his temple, crunching through the thin brass of his mask and the flesh and bone beneath. The sergeant staggered sideways half a step before his knees folded under him, and he sank down to the floor, his whole body shaking grotesquely. Quentin stared transfixed, his belly roiling. His own blade was still in its sheath. He had not so much as reached for it. His eyes were locked on the sergeant dying before him, jerking. The fallen torch was on the floor, guttering, making every shadow leap and twist in a monstrous mockery of the dead man's shaking. The prince never saw the locust's spear coming toward him until Garrus slammed into him, knocking him aside. The spear point grazed the cheek of the lion's head he wore. Even then the blow was so violent it almost tore the mask off. It would have gone right through my throat, the prince thought, dazed. Garrus cursed as the locusts closed around him. Quentin heard the sound of running feet. Then the cell swords came rushing from the shadows. One of the guards glanced at them just long enough for Garrus to get inside his spear. He drove the point of his sword under the brass mask and up through the wearer's throat, even as the second locust sprouted a crossbow bolt from his chest. The last locust dropped his spear. Yield, I yield. No, you die. Kago took the man's head off with one swipe of his arak, the Valyrian steel shearing through flesh and bone and gristle as if they were so much suet. Too much noise, he complained. Any man with ears will have heard. Dog, Quentin said. The day's word was supposed to be dog. Why wouldn't they let us pass? We were told, you were told your scheme was madness. Have you forgotten? Said Pretty Maris. Do what you came to do. The dragons, Prince Quentin thought. Yes, we came for the dragons. He felt as though he might be sick. What am I doing here? Father, why? Four men dead in as many heartbeats, and for what? Fire and blood, he whispered. Blood and fire. The blood was pooling at his feet, soaking into the brick floor. The fire was beyond those doors. The chains. We have no key. Arch said, I have the key. He swung his war hammer hard and fast. Sparks flew when the hammerhead struck the lock. And then again, again, again. On his fifth swing, the lock shattered, and the chains fell away in a rattling clatter so loud Quentin was certain half the pyramid must have heard them. Bring the cart. The dragons would be more docile once fed. Let them gorge themselves on charred mutton. Archibald Ironwood grasped the iron doors and pulled them apart. Their rusted hinges let out a pair of screams for all those who might have slept through the breaking of the lock. A wash of sudden heat assaulted them, heavy with the odors of ash, brimstone, and burnt meat. It was black beyond the doors, a sullen Stygian darkness that seemed alive and threatening, hungry. Quentin could sense that there was something in that darkness, coiled and waiting. Warrior, grant me courage, he prayed. He did not want to do this, but he saw no other way. Why else would Daenerys have shown me the dragons? She wants me to prove myself to her. Garrus handed him a torch. He stepped through the doors. The green one is Rhaegal, the white Viserion, he reminded himself. Use their names, command them, speak to them calmly but sternly. Master them, as Daenerys mastered Drogon in the pit. The girl had been alone, clad in wisps of silk, but fearless. I must not be afraid. She did it, so can I. The main thing was to show no fear. Animals can smell fear, and dragons. What did he know of dragons? What does any man know of dragons? They have been gone from the world for more than a century. The lip of the pit was just ahead. Quentin edged forward slowly, moving the torch from side to side. Walls and floor and ceiling drank the light. Scorched, he realized. Bricks burned black, crumbling into ash. The air grew warmer with every step he took. He began to sweat. 
two eyes rose up before him. Bronze they were, brighter than polished shields, glowing with their own heat, burning behind a veil of smoke rising from the dragon's nostrils. The light of Quentin's torch washed over scales of dark green, the green of moss in the deep woods at dusk, just before the last light fades. Then the dragon opened its mouth, and light and heat washed over them. Behind a fence of sharp black teeth, he glimpsed the furnace glow, the shimmer of a sleeping fire a hundred times brighter than his torch. The dragon's head was larger than a horse's, and the neck stretched on and on, uncoiling like some great green serpent as the head rose, until those two glowing bronze eyes were staring down at him. Green, the prince thought. His scales are green. Rhaegal, he said. His voice caught in his throat, and what came out was a broken croak. Frog, he thought. I am turning into frog again. The food, he croaked, remembering. Bring the food. The big man heard him. Arch wrestled one of the sheep off the wagon by two legs, then spun and flung it into the pit. Regal took it in the air. His head snapped round, and from between his jaws a lance of flame erupted, a swirling storm of orange and yellow fire shot through with veins of green. The sheep was burning before it began to fall. Before the smoking carcass could strike the bricks, the dragon's teeth closed round it. A nimbus of flames still flickered about the body. The air stank of burning wool and brimstone. Dragon stink. I thought there were two, the big man said. Viserion, yes, where is Viserion? The prince lowered his torch to throw some light into the gloom below. He could see the green dragon ripping at the smoking carcass of the sheep, his long tail lashing from side to side as he ate. A thick iron collar was visible about his neck, with three feet of broken chain dangling from it. Shattered links were strewn across the floor of the pit amongst the blackened bones, twists of metal, partly melted. Regal was chained to the wall and floor the last time I was here, the prince recalled, but Viserion hung from the ceiling. Quentin stepped back, lifted the torch, craned his head back. For a moment he saw only the blackened arches of the bricks above, scorched by dragon flame. A trickle of ash caught his eye, betraying movement, something pale, half-hidden, stirring. He's made himself a cave, the prince realized, a burrow in the brick. The foundations of the great pyramid of Mirin were massive and thick to support the weight of the huge structure overhead. Even the interior walls were three times thicker than any castle's curtain walls. But Viserion had dug himself a hole in them with flame and claw, a hole big enough to sleep in and we've just woken him. He could see what looked like some huge white serpent uncoiling inside the wall, up where it curved to become the ceiling. More ash went drifting downward, and a bit of crumbling brick fell away. The serpent resolved itself into a neck and tail, and then the dragon's long horned head appeared, his eyes glowing in the dark like golden coals. His wings rattled, stretching. All of Quentin's plans had fled his head. He could hear Kago Corpse Killer shouting to his swords. The chains, he is sending for the chains, the Dornish prince thought. The plan had been to feed the beasts and chain them in their torpor, just as the queen had done. One dragon, or preferably both. More meat, Quentin said. Once the beasts were fed, they will become sluggish. He had seen it work with snakes in Dorn but here, with these monsters. Bring, bring. Viserion launched himself from the ceiling, pale leather wings unfolding, spreading wide. The broken chain dangling from his neck swung wildly. His flame lit the pit, pale gold shot through with red and orange, and the stale air exploded in a cloud of hot ash and sulfur as the white wings beat and beat again. A hand seized Quentin by the shoulder, the torch spun from his grip to bounce across the floor, then tumbled into the pit, still burning. He found himself face to face with a brass ape. Garrus. Quent, this will not work. They are too wild. They... 
The dragon came down between the Dornishmen and the door with a roar that would have sent a hundred lions running. His head moved side to side as he inspected the intruders. Dornishmen, windblown, cago. Last and longest, the beast stared at pretty Maris, sniffing. The woman, Quentin realized. He knows that she is female. He is looking for Daenerys. He wants his mother and does not understand why she's not here. Quentin wrenched free of Garrus's grip. Viserion, he called. The white one is Viserion. For half a heartbeat, he was afraid he'd gotten it wrong. Viserion, he called again, fumbling for the whip hanging from his belt. She cowed the black one with a whip. I need to do the same. The dragon knew his name. His head turned, and his gaze lingered on the Dornish prince for three long heartbeats. Pale fires burned behind the shining black daggers of his teeth. His eyes were lakes of molten gold, and smoke rose from his nostrils. Down, Quentin said. Then he coughed, and coughed again. The air was thick with smoke, and the sulfur stench was choking. Viserion lost interest. The dragon turned back toward the windblown and lurched toward the door. Perhaps he could smell the blood of the dead guards or the meat in the butcher's wagon. Or perhaps he had only now seen that the way was open. Quentin heard the sellswords shouting. Cago was calling for the chains, and Pretty Maris was screaming at someone to step aside. The dragon moved awkwardly on the ground, like a man scrabbling on his knees and elbows, but quicker than the Dornish prince would have believed. When the windblown were too late to get out of his way, Viserion let loose with another roar. Quentin heard the rattle of chains, the deep thrum of a crossbow. No, he screamed. No, don't, don't! But it was too late. The fool was all that he had time to think as the quarrel caromed off Viserion's neck to vanish in the gloom. A line of fire gleamed in its wake, dragon's blood glowing gold and red. The crossbowman was fumbling for another quarrel as the dragon's teeth closed around his neck. The man wore the mask of a brazen beast, the fearsome likeness of a tiger. As he dropped his weapon to try and pry apart Viserion's jaws, flame gouted from the tiger's mouth. The man's eyes burst with soft popping sounds, and the brass around them began to run. The dragon tore off a hunk of flesh, most of the sellsword's neck, then gulped it down as the burning corpse collapsed to the floor. The other windblown were pulling back. This was more than even Pretty Maris had the stomach for. Viserion's horned head moved back and forth between them and his prey, but after a moment he forgot the cell swords and bent his neck to tear another mouthful from the dead man, a lower leg this time. Quentin let his whip uncoil. Viserion, he called, louder this time. He could do this, he would do this, his father had sent him to the far ends of the earth for this, he would not fail him. Viserion! He snapped the whip in the air with a crack that echoed off the blackened walls. The pale head rose. The great gold eyes narrowed. Wisps of smoke spiraled upward from the dragon's nostrils. Down, the prince commanded. You must not let him smell your fear. Down, down, down! He brought the whip around and laid a lash across the dragon's face. Viserion hissed. And then a hot wind buffeted him, and he heard the sound of leathern wings, and the air was full of ash and cinders, and a monstrous roar went echoing off the scorched and blackened bricks, and he could hear his friends shouting wildly. Garrus was calling out his name over and over, and the big man was bellowing. Behind you! Behind you! Behind you! Quentin turned and threw his left arm across his face to shield his eyes from the furnace wind. Rhaegal, he reminded himself. The green one is Rhaegal. When he raised his whip, he saw that the lash was burning, his hand as well. All of him, all of him was burning. Oh, he thought. Then he began to scream. John. Let them die, said Queen Selyse. It was the answer that John Snow had expected. 
this queen never fails to disappoint. Somehow that did not soften the blow. Your grace, he persisted stubbornly. They are starving at hard home by the thousands. Many are women and children, yes, very sad. The queen pulled her daughter closer to her and kissed her cheek. The cheek unmarred by grayscale, John did not fail to note. We are sorry for the little ones, of course, but we must be sensible. We have no food for them, and they are too young to help the king, my husband, in his wars. Better that they be reborn into the light. That was just a softer way of saying, let them die. The chamber was crowded. Princess Shireen stood beside her mother's seat, with Patchface cross-legged at her feet. Behind the queen loomed Sir Axel Florent. Melisandre of Ashai stood closer to the fire, the ruby at her throat pulsing with every breath she took. The red woman, too, had her attendants, the squire Devon Seaworth and two of the guardsmen the king had left her. Queen Selyse's protectors stood along the walls, shining knights all in a row, Sir Malagorn, Sir Benethon, Sir Narbert, Sir Patrick, Sir Dordan, Sir Bruss. With so many bloodthirsty wildlings infesting Castle Black, Selyse kept her sworn shields about her night and day. Tormund Giantsbane had roared to hear it. Afraid of being carried off, is she? I hope you never said how big me member is, Jon Snow. That'd frighten any woman. I always wanted me one with a mustache. Then he laughed and laughed. He would not be laughing now. John had wasted enough time here. I'm sorry to have troubled your grace. The Night's Watch will attend to this matter. The Queen's nostrils flared. You still mean to ride to Hardhome. I see it on your face. Let them die, I said. Yet you will persist in this mad folly. Do not deny it. I must do as I think best. With respect, Your Grace, the wall is mine, and so is this decision. It is, Selyse allowed. And you will answer for it when the king returns. And for other decisions you have made, I fear, but I see that you are deaf to sense. Do what you must. Up spoke Sir Malagorn. Lord Snow, who will lead this ranging? Are you offering yourself, sir? Do I look so foolish? Patchface jumped up. I will lead it. His bells rang merrily. We will march into the sea and out again. Under the waves we will ride seahorses, and mermaids will blow seashells to announce our coming. Oh, oh, oh. They all laughed. Even Queen Selyse allowed herself a thin smile. John was less amused. I will not ask my men to do what I would not do myself. I mean to lead the ranging. How bold of you, said the queen. We approve. Afterward, some bard will make a stirring song about you, no doubt, and we shall have a more prudent lord commander. She took a sip of wine. Let us speak of other matters. Axel, bring in the wildling king, if you would be so good. At once, Your Grace. Sir Axel went through a door and returned a moment later with Garrick Kingsblood. Garrick of House Redbeard, he announced, King of the Wildlings. Garrick Kingsblood was a tall man, long of leg and broad of shoulder. The Queen had dressed him in some of the King's old clothes, it appeared. Scrubbed and groomed, clad in green velvets and an ermine half-cape, with his long red hair freshly washed and his fiery beard shaped and trimmed, the wildling looked every inch a Southron lord. He could walk into the throne room at King's Landing and no one would blink an eye, John thought. Garrick is the true and rightful king of the wildlings, the queen said, descended in an unbroken male line from their great king Raymond Redbeard, whereas the usurper Mance Raider was born of some common woman and fathered by one of your black brothers. No, John might have said, Garrick is descended from a younger brother of Raymond Redbeard. To the free folk, that counted about as much as being descended from Raymond Redbeard's horse. They know nothing, Agreet, and worse, they will not learn. Garrick has graciously agreed to give the hand of his eldest daughter to my beloved Axel to be united by the Lord of Light in holy wedlock, Queen Selyse said. 
His other girls shall wed at the same time, the second daughter with Sir Bruss Buckler and the youngest with Sir Malagorn of Redpool. Sirs, John inclined his head to the knights in question. May you find happiness with your betrothed. Under the sea, men marry fishes, Patchface did a little dance step, jingling his bells. They do, they do, they do. Queen Solis sniffed again. Four marriages can be made as simply as three. It is past time that this woman Val was settled, Lord Snow. I have decided that she shall wed my good and leal knight, Sir Patrick of King's Mountain. Has Val been told, Your Grace? asked John. Amongst the free folk, when a man desires a woman, he steals her and thus proves his strength, his cunning, and his courage. The suitor risks a savage beating if he is caught by the woman's kin, and worse than that if she herself finds him unworthy. A savage custom, Axel Florence said. Sir Patrick only chuckled. No man has ever had cause to question my courage. No woman ever will. Queen Solis pursed her lips. Lord Snow, as Lady Val is a stranger to our ways, please send her to me that I might instruct her in the duties of a noble lady toward her lord husband. That will go splendidly, I know. John wondered if the queen would be so eager to see Val married to one of her own knights if she knew Val's feelings about Princess Shireen. As you wish, he said. Though, if I might speak freely, no, I think not. You may take your leave of us. John Snow bent his knee, bowed his head, withdrew. He took the steps, two at a time, nodding to the queen's guards as he descended. Her grace had posted men on every landing to keep her safe from murderous wildlings. Halfway down, a voice called out from above him. John Snow. John turned. Lady Melisandre. We must speak. Must we? I think not. My lady, I have duties. It is those duties I would speak of. She made her way down, the hem of her scarlet skirts swishing over the steps. It almost seemed as if she floated. Where is your dire wolf? Asleep in my chambers. Her grace does not allow ghost in her presence. She claims he scares the princess. And so long as Borak and his boar are about, I dare not let him loose. The skin changer was to accompany Sauron's shieldbreaker to Stone Door once the wains carrying the seal skinner's clan to Greenguard returned. Until such time, Borak had taken up residence in one of the ancient tombs beside the castle lichyard. The company of men long dead seemed to suit him better than that of the living, and his boar seemed happy rooting amongst the graves, well away from other animals. That thing is the size of a bull, with tusks as long as swords. Ghost would go after him if he were loose, and one or both of them would not survive the meeting. Borak is the least of your concerns. This ranging, a word from you might have swayed the queen. Selyse has the right of this, Lord Snow. Let them die. You cannot save them. Your ships are lost. Six remain, more than half the fleet. Your ships are lost, all of them. Not a man shall return. I have seen that in my fires. Your fires have been known to lie. I have made mistakes, I have admitted as much, but a grey girl on a dying horse, daggers in the dark, a promised prince born in smoke and salt. It seems to me that you make nothing but mistakes, my lady. Where is Stannis? What of Rattleshirt and his spearwives? Where is my sister? All your questions shall be answered. Look to the skies, Lord Snow, and when you have your answers, send to me. Winter is almost upon us now. I am your only hope. A fool's hope. John turned and left her. Leathers was prowling the yard outside. Torag has returned, he reported when John emerged. His father settled his people at Oakenshield and will be back this afternoon with eighty fighting men. What did the bearded queen have to say? Her grace can provide no help. Too busy plucking out her chin hairs, is she? Leathers spat. Makes no matter. 
Tormund's men and ours will be enough. Enough to get us there, perhaps. It was the journey back that concerned Jon Snow. Coming home, they would be slowed by thousands of free folk, many sick and starved. A river of humanity moving slower than a river of ice. That would leave them vulnerable. Dead things in the woods, dead things in the water. How many men are enough? he asked Leathers. A hundred? Two hundred? Five hundred? A thousand? Should I take more men or fewer? A smaller ranging would reach Hardhome sooner, but what good were swords without food? Mother Mole and her people were already at the point of eating their own dead. To feed them, he would need to bring carts and wagons and draft animals to haul them, horses, oxen, dogs. Instead of flying through the wood, they would be condemned to crawl. There is still much to decide. Spread the word. I want all the leading men in the shield hall when the evening watch begins. Tormund should be back by then. Where can I find Toreg? With the little monster like as not, he's taken a liking to one of them milkmaids, I hear. He has taken a liking to Val. Her sister was a queen, why not her? Tormund had once thought to make himself the king beyond the wall, before Mance had bested him. Toreg the Tall might well be dreaming the same dream. Better him than Garrick Kingsblood. Let them be, said John. I can speak with Toreg later. He glanced up past the king's tower. The wall was a dull white, the sky above it whiter. A snow sky. Just pray we do not get another storm. Outside the armory, Mully and the flea stood shivering at guard. Shouldn't you be inside out of this wind? John asked. That'd be sweet, my lord, said Folk the flea. But your wolf's in no mood for company today. Molly agreed. He tried to take a bite of me, he did. Ghost? John was shocked. Unless your lordship has some other white wolf, I... I never seen him like this, my lord. All wild-like, I mean. He was not wrong, as John discovered for himself when he slipped inside the doors. The big white dire wolf would not lie still. He paced from one end of the armory to the other, past the cold forge and back again. Easy, ghost, John called. Down. Sit, ghost. Down. Yet when he made to touch him, the wolf bristled and bared his teeth. It's that bloody boar. Even in here, ghost can smell his stink. Mormont's ravens seemed agitated, too. Snow, the bird kept screaming. Snow, snow, snow. John shooed him off, had Satin start a fire, then sent him out after Bowen Marsh and Othel Yarwick. Bring a flagon of mulled wine as well. Three cups, my lord? Six. Mully and the flea look in need of something warm. So will you. When Satin left, John seated himself and had another look at the maps of the lands north of the wall. The fastest way to Hardhome was along the coast, from Eastwatch. The woods were thinner near the sea, the terrain mostly flatlands, rolling hills, and salt marshes. And when the autumn storms came howling, the coast got sleet and hail and freezing rain rather than snow. The giants are at Eastwatch, and Leathers says that some will help. From Castle Black, the way was more difficult, right through the heart of the haunted forest. If the snow is this deep at the wall, how much worse up there? Marsh entered snuffling, Yarwick Dower. Another storm, the first builder announced. How are we to work in this? I need more builders. Use the free folk, John said. Yarwick shook his head. More trouble than they're worth, that lot. Sloppy, careless, lazy. Some good workers here and there, I'll not deny it, but hardly a mason amongst them, and nary a smith. Strong backs might be, but they won't do as they are told. And us with all these ruins to turn back into forts. Can't be done, my lord. I tell you true, it can't be done. It will be done, said John, or they will live in ruins. A lord needed men about him he could rely upon for honest counsel. Marsh and Yarwick were no lickspittles, and that was to the good, but they were seldom any help, either. 
More and more, he found he knew what they would say before he asked them. Especially when it concerned the free folk, where their disapproval went bone deep. When John settled Stone Door on Soren Shieldbreaker, Yarwick complained that it was too isolated. How could they know what mischief Soren might get up to off in those hills? When he conferred Oakenshield on Tormund Giantsbane and Queensgate on Morna White Mask, Marsh pointed out that Castle Black would now have foes on either side who could easily cut them off from the rest of the wall. As for Borok, Othel Yarwick claimed the woods north of Stone Door were full of wild boars. Who was to say the skin changer would not make his own pig army? Hoarfrost Hill and Rhymegate still lacked garrisons, so John had asked their views on which of the remaining wildling chiefs and warlords might be best suited to hold them. We have Brog, Gavin the Traitor, the Great Walrus. Howd Wanderer walks alone, Tormund says, but there's still Harl the Huntsman, Harl the Handsome, Blind Doss. Egon Oldfather commands a following, but most are his own sons and grandsons. He has eighteen wives, half of them stolen on raids. Which of these? None, Bowen Marsh had said. I know all these men by their deeds. We should be fitting them for nooses, not giving them our castles. Aye, Othel Yarwick had agreed. Bad and worse and worst makes a beggar's choice. My lord had as well present us with a pack of wolves and ask which we'd like to tear our throats out. It was the same again with Hardhome. Satin poured whilst John told them of his audience with the queen. Marsh listened attentively, ignoring the mulled wine, whilst Yarwick drank one cup and then another. But no sooner had John finished than the Lord Steward said, her grace is wise. Let them die. John sat back. Is that the only counsel you can offer, my lord? Tormund is bringing eighty men. How many should we send? Shall we call upon the giants, the spearwives at Long Barrow? If we have women with us, it may put Mother Mole's people at ease. Send women, then. Send giants. Send suckling babes. Is that what my lord wishes to hear? Owen Marsh rubbed at the scar he had won at the Bridge of Skulls. Send them all. The more we lose, the fewer mouths we'll have to feed. Yarwick was no more helpful. If the wildlings at Hardhome need saving, let the wildlings here go save them. Tormund knows the way to Hardhome. To hear him talk, he can save them all himself with his huge member. This was pointless, John thought. Pointless, fruitless, hopeless. Thank you for your counsel, my lords. Satin helped them back into their cloaks. As they walked through the armory, Ghost sniffed at them, his tail upraised and bristling. My brothers. The Night's Watch needed leaders with the wisdom of Maester Aemon, the learning of Samuel Tarley, the courage of Corin Halfhand, the stubborn strength of the old bear, the compassion of Donal Noy. What it had instead was them. The snow was falling heavily outside. Winds from the south, Yarwick observed. It's blowing the snow right up against the wall, see? He was right. The switchback stair was buried almost to the first landing, John saw, and the wooden doors of the ice cells and storerooms had vanished behind a wall of white. How many men do we have in ice cells? he asked Bowen Marsh. Four living men, two dead ones the corpses. John had almost forgotten them. He had hoped to learn something from the bodies they'd brought back from the Weirwood Grove, but the dead men had stubbornly remained dead. We need to dig those cells out. Ten stewards and ten spades should do it, said Marsh. Use one one too. As you command. Ten stewards and one giant made short work of the drifts, but even when the doors were clear again, John was not satisfied. Those cells will be buried again by morning. We'd best move the prisoners before they smother. Karstark too, my lord? asked Fulk the Flea. Can't we just leave that one shivering till spring? Would that we could. Cregan Karstark had taken to howling in the night of late and throwing frozen feces at whoever came to feed him that had not made him beloved of his guards. Take him to the Lord Commander's Tower. The Undervault should hold him. Though partly collapsed, 
The old bear's former seat would be warmer than the ice cells. Its subcellars were largely intact. Cregan kicked at the guards when they came through the door, twisted and shoved when they grabbed him, even tried to bite them. But the cold had weakened him, and John's men were bigger, younger, and stronger. They hauled him out, still struggling, and dragged him through thigh-high snow to his new home. What would the Lord Commander like us to do with his corpses? asked Marsh when the living men had been moved. Leave them. If the storm entombed them, well and good. He would need to burn them eventually, no doubt, but for the nonce they were bound with iron chains inside their cells. That, and being dead, should suffice to hold them harmless. Tormund Giantsbane timed his arrival perfectly, thundering up with his warriors when all the shoveling was done. Only fifty seemed to have turned up, not the eighty Toreg promised leathers, but Tormund was not called Tall Talker for naught. The wildling arrived red-faced, shouting for a horn of ale and something hot to eat. He had ice in his beard and more crusting his mustache. Someone had already told the Thunderfist about Garrick Kingsblood and his new style. King of the wildlings, Tormund roared. Ha! King of my hairy butt crack, more like. He has a regal look to him, John said. He has a little red cock to go with all that red hair, that's what he has. Raymond Redbeard and his sons died at Long Lake thanks to your bloody Starks and the drunken giant, not the little brother. Ever wonder why they called him the Red Raven? Tormund's mouth split in a gap-toothed grin. First to fly the battle he was. T'was a song about it after. The singer had to find a rhyme for Craven, so... He wiped his nose. If your queen's knights want those girls of his, they're welcome to them. Girls, squawked Mormont's raven. Girls, girls. That set Tormund to laughing all over again. Now there's a bird with sense. How much do you want for him, Snow? I gave you a son. The least you could do is give me the bloody bird. I would, said John. But like as not, you'd eat him. Tormund roared at that as well. Eat, the raven said darkly, flapping its black wings. Corn, corn, corn. We need to talk about the ranging, said John. I want us to be of one mind at the shield hall. We must... He broke off when Mully poked his nose inside the door, grim-faced, to announce that Clytus had brought a letter. Tell him to leave it with you. I will read it later. As you say, my lord, only... Clytus don't look his proper self. He's more white than pink, if you get my meaning. And he's shaking. Dark wings, dark words, muttered Tormund. Isn't that what you kneelers say? We say, bleed a cold, but feast a fever, too, John told him. We say, never drink with Dornish men when the moon is full. We say a lot of things. Molly added his two groats. My old grandmother used to say, summer friends will melt away like summer snows, but winter friends are friends forever. I think that's sufficient wisdom for the moment, said John Snow. Show Clytus in if you would be so good. Molly had not been wrong. The old steward was trembling, his face as pale as the snows outside. I am being foolish, Lord Commander, but this letter frightens me. See here? Bastard was the only word written outside the scroll. No Lord Snow or John Snow or Lord Commander, simply Bastard. And the letter was sealed with a smear of hard pink wax. You were right to come at once, John said. You were right to be afraid. He cracked the seal, flattened the parchment, and read. Your false king is dead, Bastard. He and all his host were smashed in seven days of battle. I have his magic sword. Tell his red whore. Your false king's friends are dead. Their heads upon the walls of Winterfell. Come see them, bastard. Your false king lied, and so did you. You told the world you burned the king beyond the wall. Instead, you sent him to Winterfell to steal my bride from me. I will have my bride back. 
If you want Mance Raider back, come and get him. I have him in a cage for all the North to see, proof of your lies. The cage is cold, but I have made him a warm cloak from the skins of the six whores who came with him to Winterfell. I want my bride back. I want the false king's queen. I want his daughter and his red witch. I want his wildling princess. I want his little prince, the wildling babe. And I want my reek. Send them to me, bastard, and I will not trouble you or your black crows. Keep them from me, and I will cut out your bastard's heart and eat it. It was signed, Ramsay Bolton, true-born lord of Winterfell. Snow, said Tormund Giantsbane. You look like your father's bloody head just rolled out of that paper. Jon Snow did not answer at once. Mully helped Clytus back to his chambers. The night is dark and the paths will be slippery with snow. Satin, go with them. He handed Tormund Giantsbane the letter. Here, see for yourself. The wildling gave the letter a dubious look and handed it right back. Feels nasty. But Tormund Thunderfist had better things to do than learn to make papers talk at him. They never have any good to say, now do they? Not often, Jon Snow admitted. Dark wings, dark words. Perhaps there was more truth to those wise old sayings than he'd known. It was sent by Ramsay Snow. I'll read you what he wrote. When he was done, Tormund whistled. Ha! That's buggered, and no mistake. What was that about Mance? Has him in a cage, does he? How, when hundreds saw your red witch burn the man? That was Rattleshirt, John almost said. That was sorcery, a glamour, she called it. Melisandre, look to the skies, she said. He set the letter down. A raven in a storm. She saw this coming. When you have your answers, send to me. Might be all a skin of lies. Tormund scratched under his beard. If I had me a nice goose quill and a pot of maester's ink, I could write down that me member was long and thick as me arm wouldn't make it so. He has Lightbringer. He talks of heads upon the walls of Winterfell. He knows about the spearwives and their number. He knows about Mance Raider. No, there is truth in there. I won't say you're wrong. What do you mean to do, Crow? John flexed the fingers of his sword hand. The Night's Watch takes no part. He closed his fist and opened it again. What you propose is nothing less than treason. He thought of Rob, with snowflakes melting in his hair. Kill the boy and let the man be born. He thought of Bran, clambering up a tower wall, agile as a monkey. Of Rickon's breathless laughter. Of Sansa, brushing out Lady's coat and singing to herself. You know nothing, Jon Snow. He thought of Arya, her hair as tangled as a bird's nest. I made him a warm cloak from the skins of the six whores who came with him to Winterfell. I want my bride back. I want my bride back. I want my bride back. I think we had best change the plan, Jon Snow said. They talked for the best part of two hours. Horse and Rory had replaced Falk and Mully at the armory door with the change of watch. With me, John told them, when the time came. Ghost would have followed as well, but as the wolf came padding after them, John grabbed him by the scruff of his neck and wrestled him back inside. Borok might be amongst those gathering at the shield hall. The last thing he needed just now was his wolf savaging the skin changer's boar. The shield hall was one of the older parts of Castle Black, a long, drafty feast hall of dark stone, its oaken rafters black with the smoke of centuries. Back when the Night's Watch had been much larger, its walls had been hung with rows of brightly colored wooden shields. Then as now, when a knight took the black, tradition decreed that he set aside his former arms and take up the plain black shield of the Brotherhood. The shields thus discarded would hang in the shield hall. 
Hundreds of knights meant hundreds of shields. Hawks and eagles, dragons and griffins, suns and stags, wolves and wyverns, manticores, bulls, trees and flowers, harps, spears, crabs and krakens, red lions and golden lions and checky lions, owls, lambs, maids and mermen, stallions, stars, buckets and buckles, flayed men and hanged men and burning men, axes, long swords, turtles, unicorns, bears, quills, spiders and snakes and scorpions, and a hundred other heraldic charges had adorned the shield hall walls, blazoned in more colors than any rainbow ever dreamed of. But when a knight died, his shield was taken down, that it might go with him to his pyre or his tomb, and over the years and centuries fewer and fewer knights had taken the black. A day came when it no longer made sense for the knights of Castle Black to dine apart. The shield hall was abandoned. In the last hundred years it had been used only infrequently. As a dining hall it left much to be desired. It was dark, dirty, drafty, and hard to heat in winter, its cellars infested with rats, its massive wooden rafters worm-eaten and festooned with cobwebs. But it was large and long enough to seat two hundred, and half again that many if they crowded close. When John and Tormund entered, a sound went through the hall, like wasps stirring in a nest. The wildlings outnumbered the crows by five to one, judging by how little black he saw. Fewer than a dozen shields remained, sad gray things with faded paint and long cracks in the wood. But fresh torches burned in the iron sconces along the walls, and John had ordered benches and tables brought in. Men with comfortable seats were more inclined to listen, Maester Eamon had once told him. Standing men were more inclined to shout. At the top of the hall a sagging platform stood. John mounted it, with Tormund Giant's Bane at his side, and raised his hands for quiet. The wasps only buzzed the louder. Then Tormund put his warhorn to his lips and blew a blast. The sound filled the hall, echoing off the rafters overhead. Silence fell. I summoned you to make plans for the relief of Hardhome, Jon Snow began. Thousands of the free folk are gathered there, trapped and starving, and we have had reports of dead things in the wood. To his left he saw Marsh and Yarwick. Othel was surrounded by his builders, whilst Bowen had Wick Whittlestick, Left Hand Lou, and Alf of Runnymud beside him. To his right, Soren Shieldbreaker sat with his arms crossed against his chest. Farther back, John saw Gavin the traitor and Harl the Handsome whispering together. Egon Oldfather sat amongst his wives, Howd Wanderer alone. Borak leaned against a wall in a dark corner. Mercifully, his boar was nowhere in evidence. The ships I sent to take off Mother Mole and her people have been racked by storms. We must send what help we can by land or let them die. Two of Queen Selyse's knights had come as well, John saw. Sir Norbert and Sir Benethon stood near the door at the foot of the hall, but the rest of the Queen's men were conspicuous in their absence. I had hoped to lead the ranging myself and bring back as many of the free folk as could survive the journey. A flash of red in the back of the hall caught John's eye. Lady Melisandre had arrived. But now I find I cannot go to Hardhome. The ranging will be led by Tormund Giantsbane, known to you all. I have promised him as many men as he requires. And where will you be, Crow? Borak thundered. Hiding here in Castle Black with your white dog? No, I ride south. Then John read them the letter Ramsay Snow had written. The shield hall went mad. Every man began to shout at once. They leapt to their feet, shaking fists. So much for the calming power of comfortable benches. Swords were brandished, axes smashed against shields. Jon Snow looked to Tormund. The giant's bane sounded his horn once more, twice as long and twice as loud as the first time. The Night's Watch takes no part in the Wars of the Seven Kingdoms, John reminded them when some semblance of quiet had returned. It is not for us to oppose the Bastard of Bolton, to avenge Stannis Baratheon, to defend his widow and his daughter. 
This creature who makes cloaks from the skins of women has sworn to cut my heart out, and I mean to make him answer for those words. But I will not ask my brothers to forswear their vows. The night's watch will make for hard home. I ride to Winterfell alone, unless... John paused. Is there any man here who will come stand with me? The roar was all he could have hoped for, the tumult so loud that the two old shields tumbled from the walls. Soren Shieldbreaker was on his feet, the Wanderer as well, Toreg the Tall, Brog, Harl the Huntsman and Harl the Handsome both, Egon Oldfather, Blind Doss, even the Great Walrus. I have my swords, thought Jon Snow, and we are coming for you, bastard. Yarwick and Marsh were slipping out, he saw, and all their men behind them. It made no matter. He did not need them now. He did not want them. No man can ever say I made my brothers break their vows. If this is oath-breaking, the crime is mine and mine alone. Then Tormund was pounding him on the back, all gap-toothed grin from ear to ear. Well spoken, Crow. Now bring out the mead. Make them yours and get them drunk, that's how it's done. We'll make a wildling of you yet, boy. Ha! I will send for ale, John said, distracted. Melisandre was gone, he realized, and so were the Queen's knights. I should have gone to Selyse first. She has the right to know her lord is dead. You must excuse me. I'll leave you to get them drunk. Ha! A task I'm well suited for, Crow. On your way. Horse and Rory fell in beside John as he left the shield hall. I should talk with Melisandre after I see the queen, he thought. If she could see a raven in a storm, she can find Ramsay Snow for me. Then he heard the shouting, and a roar so loud it seemed to shake the wall. That come from Hardin's tower, my lord, Horse reported. He might have said more, but the scream cut him off. Val was John's first thought but that was no woman's scream. That is a man in mortal agony. He broke into a run. Horse and Rory raced after him. Is it White's? asked Rory. John wondered. Could his corpses have escaped their chains? The screaming had stopped by the time they came to Hardin's tower, but one wig one dar one was still roaring. The giant was dangling a bloody corpse by one leg, the same way Arya used to dangle her doll when she was small, swinging it like a morning star when menaced by vegetables. Arya never tore her dolls to pieces, though. The dead man's sword arm was yards away, the snow beneath it turning red. Let him go, John shouted. One one, let him go! One one did not hear or did not understand. The giant was bleeding himself, with sword cuts on his belly and his arm, he swung the dead knight against the gray stone of the tower again and again and again until the man's head was red and pulpy as a summer melon. The knight's cloak flapped in the cold air. Of white wool it had been, bordered in cloth of silver and patterned with blue stars. Blood and bone were flying everywhere. Men poured from the surrounding keeps and towers. Northmen, free folk, queensmen. Form a line, Jon Snow commanded them. Keep them back, everyone, but especially the Queen's men. The dead man was Sir Patrick of King's Mountain. His head was largely gone, but his heraldry was as distinctive as his face. John did not want to risk Sir Malagorn or Sir Bruss or any of the Queen's other knights trying to avenge him. One wig, one dar one howled again and gave Sir Patrick's other arm a twist and pull. It tore loose from his shoulder with a spray of bright red blood like a child pulling petals off a daisy, thought John. Leathers, talk to him, calm him. The old tongue, he understands the old tongue. Keep back, the rest of you. Put away your steel, we're scaring him. Couldn't they see the giant had been cut? John had to put an end to this, or more men would die. They had no idea of one one's strength. A horn, I need a horn. He saw the glint of steel, turned toward it. No blades, he screamed. Wick, put that knife away, he meant to say. When Wick Whittlestick slashed at his throat, the word turned into a grunt. John twisted from the knife, 
just enough so it barely grazed his skin. He cut me. When he put his hand to the side of his neck, blood welled between his fingers. Why? For the watch. Wick slashed at him again. This time John caught his wrist and bent his arm back until he dropped the dagger. The gangling steward backed away, his hands up raised as if to say, Not me, it was not me. Men were screaming. John reached for Longclaw, but his fingers had grown stiff and clumsy. Somehow he could not seem to get the sword free of its scabbard. Then Bowen Marsh stood there before him, tears running down his cheeks. For the watch. He punched John in the belly. When he pulled his hand away, the dagger stayed where he had buried it. John fell to his knees. He found the dagger's hilt and wrenched it free. In the cold night air, the wound was smoking. Ghost, he whispered. Pain washed over him. Stick them with the pointy end. When the third dagger took him between the shoulder blades, he gave a grunt and fell face first into the snow. He never felt the fourth knife, only the cold. The Queen's Hand The Dornish Prince was three days dying. He took his last shuddering breath in the bleak black dawn, as cold rain hissed from a dark sky to turn the brick streets of the old city into rivers. The rain had drowned the worst of the fires, but wisps of smoke still rose from the smoldering ruin that had been the Pyramid of Hazkar, and the great black pyramid of Yerizan where Regal had made his lair hulked in the gloom like a fat woman bedecked with glowing orange jewels. Perhaps the gods are not deaf after all, Sir Barristan Selmy reflected as he watched those distant embers. If not for the rain, the fires might have consumed all of Mirin by now. He saw no sign of dragons, but he had not expected to. The dragons did not like the rain. A thin red slash marked the eastern horizon where the sun might soon appear. It reminded Selmy of the first blood welling from a wound. Often, even with a deep cut, the blood came before the pain. He stood beside the parapets of the highest step of the Great Pyramid, searching the sky as he did every morning, knowing that the dawn must come and hoping that his queen would come with it. She will not have abandoned us. She would never leave her people he was telling himself, when he heard the prince's death rattle coming from the queen's apartments. Sir Barristan went inside. Rainwater ran down the back of his white cloak, and his boots left wet tracks on the floors and carpets. At his command, Quentin Martell had been laid out in the queen's own bed. He had been a knight and a prince of Dorne besides. It seemed only kind to let him die in the bed he had crossed half a world to reach. The bedding was ruined, sheets, covers, pillows, mattress, all reeked of blood and smoke, but Sir Barristan thought Daenerys would forgive him. Missandei sat at the bedside. She had been with the prince night and day, tending to such needs as he could express, giving him water and milk of the poppy when he was strong enough to drink, listening to the few tortured words he gasped out from time to time, reading to him when he fell quiet, sleeping in her chair beside him. Sir Barristan had asked some of the queen's cupbearers to help, but the sight of the burned man was too much for even the boldest of them. And the blue graces had never come, though he'd sent for them four times. Perhaps the last of them had been carried off by the pale mare by now. The tiny Nathi scribe looked up at his approach. Honored sir, the prince is beyond pain now. His Dornish gods have taken him home. See, he smiles. How can you tell he has no lips? It would have been kinder if the dragons had devoured him. That at least would have been quick. This. Fire is a hideous way to die. Small wonder half the hells are made of flame. Cover him. Miss Enday pulled the coverlet over the prince's face. What will be done with him, sir? He is so very far from home. I'll see that he's returned to Dorne. But how? As ashes? That would require more fire, 
and Sir Barristan could not stomach that. We'll need to strip the flesh from his bones. Beetles not boiling. The Silent Sisters would have seen to it at home, but this was Slaver's Bay. The nearest Silent Sister was ten thousand leagues away. You should go sleep now, child, in your own bed. If this one may be so bold, sir, you should do the same. You do not sleep the whole night through. Not for many years, child, not since the Trident. Grand Maester Picel had once told him that old men do not need as much sleep as the young, but it was more than that. He had reached that age when he was loath to close his eyes, for fear that he might never open them again. Other men might wish to die in bed asleep, but that was no death for a knight of the King's Guard. The nights are too long, he told Miss and Day, and there is much and more to do always, here as in the Seven Kingdoms. But you have done enough for now, child. Go and rest. And if the gods are good, you will not dream of dragons. After the girl was gone, the old knight peeled back the coverlet for one last look at Quentin Martell's face, or what remained of it. So much of the prince's flesh had sloughed away that he could see the skull beneath. His eyes were pools of pus. He should have stayed in Dorne. He should have stayed a frog. Not all men are meant to dance with dragons. As he covered the boy once more, he found himself wondering whether there would be anyone to cover his queen, or whether her own corpse would lie unmourned amongst the tall grasses of the Dothraki Sea, staring blindly at the sky until her flesh fell from her bones. No, he said aloud. Daenerys is not dead. She was riding that dragon. I saw it with mine own two eyes. He had said the same a hundred times before, but every day that passed made it harder to believe. Her hair was afire, I saw that too. She was burning, and if I did not see her fall, hundreds swear they did. Day had crept upon the city. Though the rain still fell, a vague light suffused the eastern sky, and with the sun arrived the shave pate. Skahaz was clad in his familiar garb of pleated black skirt, greaves, and muscled breastplate. The brazen mask beneath his arm was new, a wolf's head with lolling tongue. So, he said by way of greeting, the fool is dead, is he? Prince Quentin died just before first light. Selmy was not surprised that Skahaz knew. Word traveled quickly within the pyramid. Is the council assembled? They await the hand's pleasure below. I am no hand, a part of him wanted to cry out. I am only a simple knight, the queen's protector. I never wanted this. But with the queen gone and the king in chains, someone had to rule, and Sir Barristan did not trust the shave pate. Has there been any word from the green grace? She has not yet returned to the city. Skahaz had opposed sending the priestess, nor had Galaza Galer herself embraced the task. She would go, she allowed, for the sake of peace, but his Darzo Lorak was better suited to treat with the wise masters. But Sir Barristan did not yield easily, and finally the Green Grace had bowed her head and sworn to do her best. How stands the city? Selmy asked the shave pate now. All the gates are closed and barred as you commanded. We are hunting down any cell swords or yunkai left inside the city and expelling or arresting those we catch. Most seem to have gone to ground. Inside the pyramids, beyond a doubt. The unsullied man the walls and towers, ready for any assault. There are two hundred highborn gathered in the square, standing in the rain in their tokars and howling for audience. They want Hisdar free and me dead and they want you to slay these dragons. Someone told them knights were good at that. Men are still pulling corpses from the Pyramid of Hazgar. The great masters of Yarizan and Ulez have abandoned their own pyramids to the dragons. Sir Barristan had known all that. And the butcher's tally? He asked, dreading the answer. Nine and twenty. Nine and twenty? That was far worse than he could ever have imagined. The sons of the Harpy had resumed their shadow war two days ago. Three murders the first night, nine the second. 
but to go from nine to nine and twenty in a single night. The count will pass thirty before midday. Why do you look so gray, old man? What did you expect? The harpy wants his dar free, so he has sent his sons back into the streets with knives in hand. The dead are all freedmen in shave pates as before. One was mine, a brazen beast. The sign of the harpy was left beside the bodies, chalked on the pavement or scratched into a wall. There were messages as well. Dragons must die, they wrote, and Hargaz the hero. Death to Daenerys was seen as well, before the rain washed out the words. The blood tax. Twenty-nine hundred pieces of gold from each pyramid, I, Skahaz grumbled. It will be collected. But the loss of a few coins will never stay the harpy's hand. Only blood can do that. So you say. The hostages again. He would kill them every one if I allowed it. I heard you the first hundred times. No. Queen's hand. Skahaz grumbled with disgust. An old woman's hand, I am thinking, wrinkled and feeble. I pray Daenerys returns to us soon. He pulled his brazen wolf's mask down over his face. Your council will be growing restless. They are the queen's council, not mine. Selmy exchanged his damp cloak for a dry one and buckled on his sword belt, then accompanied the shave pate down the steps. The pillared hall was empty of petitioners this morning. Though he had assumed the title of hand, Ser Barristan would not presume to hold court in the Queen's absence, nor would he permit Skahasmo Kandak to do such. Hisdar's grotesque dragon thrones had been removed at Ser Barristan's command, but he had not brought back the simple pillowed bench the Queen had favored. Instead, a large round table had been set up in the center of the hall, with tall chairs all around it where men might sit and talk as peers. They rose when Ser Barristan came down the marble steps, Skahaz shave paid at his side. Marcelin of the Mother's Men was present, with Simon Stripeback, commander of the Free Brothers. The stalwart shields had chosen a new commander, a black-skinned summer islander called Tal Torak, their old captain, Molono Yasdab, having been carried off by the Pale Mare. Grey Worm was there for the Unsullied, attended by three eunuch sergeants in spiked bronze caps. The Storm Crows were represented by two seasoned sellswords, an archer named Jokin, and the scarred and sour axeman known simply as the Widower. The two of them had assumed joint command of the company in the absence of Dario Naharis. Most of the Queen's Kalasar had gone with Ago and Rakaro to search for her on the Dothraki Sea, but the squinty, bow-legged Jakaran Ramo was there to speak for the riders who remained. And across the table from Ser Barristan sat four of King Hisdar's erstwhile guardsmen, the pit fighters Gogor the Giant, Bellaquo Bonebreaker, Cameron of the Count, and the Spotted Cat. Selmy had insisted on their presence, over the objections of Skahaz's shavepate. They had helped Daenerys Targaryen take this city once, and that should not be forgotten. Blood-soaked brutes and killers they might be, but in their own way they had been loyal. To King Hisdar, yes, but to the Queen as well. Last to come, Strong Belwas lumbered into the hall. The eunuch had looked death in the face, so near he might have kissed her on the lips. It had marked him. He looked to have lost two stone of weight, and the dark brown skin that had once stretched tight across a massive chest and belly, crossed by a hundred faded scars, now hung on him in loose folds, sagging and wobbling, like a robe cut three sizes too large. His step had slowed as well, and seemed a bit uncertain. Even so, the sight of him gladdened the old knight's heart. He had once crossed the world with Strong Belwas, and he knew he could rely on him, should all this come to swords. Belwas, we are pleased that you could join us. Whitebeard, Belwas smiled. Where is liver and onions? Strong Belwas is not so strong as before. He must eat, get big again. They made Strong Belwas sick. Someone must die. Someone will. Many someones like as not. Sit, my friend. When Belwas sat and crossed his arms, Ser Barristan went on. 
Quentin Martel died this morning just before the dawn. The widower laughed. The dragon rider. Fool, I call him, said Simon Stripeback. No, just a boy. Sir Barristan had not forgotten the follies of his own youth. Speak no ill of the dead. The prince paid a ghastly price for what he did. And the other Dornish? asked Tal Tarak. Prisoners for the nonce. Neither of the Dornish men had offered any resistance. Archibald Ironwood had been cradling his prince's scorched and smoking body when the brazen beasts had found him, as his burned hands could testify. He had used them to beat out the flames that had engulfed Quentin Martell. Garrus Drinkwater was standing over them with sword in hand, but he had dropped the blade the moment the locusts had appeared. They share a cell. Let them share a gibbet, said Simon Stripeback. They unleashed two dragons on the city. Open the pits and give them swords, urged the spotted cat. I will kill them both as all Mirene shouts out my name. The fighting pits will remain closed, said Selmy. Blood and noise would only serve to call the dragons. All three, perhaps, suggested Marcelin. The black beast came once, why not again, this time with our queen? Or without her? Should Drogon return to Mirin without Daenerys mounted on his back, the city would erupt in blood and flame, of that Ser Barristan had no doubt. The very men sitting at this table would soon be at dagger points with one another. A young girl she might be, but Daenerys Targaryen was the only thing that held them all together. Her grace will return when she returns, said Ser Barristan. We have herded a thousand sheep into the Dasnak's pit, filled the pit of grass with bullocks, and the golden pit with beasts that his dar Zolorak had gathered for his games. Thus far, both dragons seemed to have a taste for mutton, returning to Dasnax whenever they grew hungry. If either one was hunting man, inside or outside the city, Ser Barristan had yet to hear of it. The only Mirenese the dragons had slain since Hargaz the hero had been the slavers foolish enough to object when Rhaegal attempted to make his lair atop the Pyramid of Haskar. We have more pressing matters to discuss. I have sent the Green Grace to the Yunkish men to make arrangements for the release of our hostages. I expect her back by midday with their answer. With words, said the widower, the storm crows know the Yunkai. Their tongues are worms that wriggle this way or that. The Green Grace will come back with worm words, not the captain. If it pleases the Queen's hand to recall, the wise masters hold our hero too, said Grey Worm. Also the horse Lord Jogo, the Queen's own blood rider. Blood of her blood, agreed the Dothraki Ramo. He must be freed. The honor of the Kalasar demands it. He shall be freed, said Ser Barristan. But first we must needs wait and see if the Green Grace can accomplish. Skahaz's shavepate slammed his fist upon the table. The Green Grace will accomplish nothing. She may be conspiring with the young Kai even as we sit here. Arrangements, did you say? Make arrangements? What sort of arrangements? Ransom, said Ser Barristan. Each man's weight in gold. The wise masters do not need our gold, sir, said Marcelin. They are richer than your Westerosi lords, every one. Their sellswords will want the gold, though. What are the hostages to them? If the Yunkish men refuse, it will drive a blade between them and their hirelings. Or so I hope. It had been Missenday who suggested the ploy to him. He would never have thought of such a thing himself. In King's Landing, bribes had been Littlefinger's domain, whilst Lord Varys had the task of fostering division amongst the crown's enemies. His own duties had been more straightforward. Eleven years of age, yet Missinday is as clever as half the men at this table and wiser than all of them. I have instructed the Green Grace to present the offer only when all of the Yunkish commanders have assembled to hear it. They will refuse even so, insisted Simon Stripeback. They will say they want the dragons dead, the king restored. I pray that you are wrong, and fear that you are right. Your gods are far away, sir, grandfather, said the widower. I do not think they hear your prayers. And when the young Kai send back the old woman to spit in your eye, what then? 
Fire and blood, said Barristan Selmy, softly, softly. For a long moment, no one spoke. Then Strong Belwas slapped his belly and said, Better than liver and onions. And Skahaz Shafepate stared through the eyes of his wolf's head mask and said, You would break King Hisdar's peace, old man? I would shatter it. Once, long ago, a prince had named him Barristan the Bold. A part of that boy was in him still. We have built a beacon atop the pyramid where once the harpy stood. Dry wood soaked with oil, covered to keep the rain off. Should the hour come, and I pray that it does not, we will light that beacon. The flames will be your signal to pour out of our gates and attack. Every man of you will have a part to play, so every man must be in readiness at all times, day or night. We will destroy our foes or be destroyed ourselves. He raised a hand to signal to his waiting squires. I have had some maps prepared to show the dispositions of our foes, their camps and siege lines and trebuchets. If we can break the slavers, their cell swords will abandon them. I know you will have concerns and questions. Voice them here. By the time we leave this table, all of us must be of a single mind with a single purpose. Best send down for some food and drink, then, suggested Simon Stripeback. This will take a while. It took the rest of the morning and most of the afternoon. The captains and commanders argued over the maps like fishwives over a bucket of crabs, weak points and strong points, how to best employ their small company of archers, whether the elephants should be used to break the Yunkish lines or held in reserve, who should have the honor of leading the first advance, whether their horse cavalry was best deployed on the flanks or in the vanguard. Sir Barristan let each man speak his mind. Taltorak thought that they should march on Yunkai once they had broken through the lines. The Yellow City would be almost undefended, so the Yunkai would have no choice but to lift the siege and follow. The Spotted Cat proposed to challenge the enemy to send forth a champion to face him in single combat. Strong Belwas liked that notion, but insisted he should fight, not the cat. Cameron of the Count put forth a scheme to seize the ships tied up along the river front and use the Skahazadan to bring three hundred pit fighters around the Yunkish rear. Every man there agreed that the Unsullied were their best troops, but none agreed on how they should be deployed. The widower wanted to use the eunuchs as an iron fist to smash through the heart of the Yunkish defenses. Marcelin felt they would be better placed at either end of the main battle line, where they could beat back any attempt by the foe to turn their flanks. Simon Stripeback wanted them split into three and divided amongst the three companies of freedmen. His free brothers were brave and eager for the fight, he claimed, but without the unsullied to stiffen them, he feared his unblooded troops might not have the discipline to face battle-seasoned sellswords by themselves. Grey Worm said only that the Unsullied would obey whatever might be asked of them. And when all that had been discussed, debated, and decided, Simon Stripeback raised one final point. As a slave in Yunkai, I helped my master bargain with the free companies and saw to the payment of their wages. I know sellswords, and I know that the young Kai cannot pay them near enough to face Dragonflame. So I ask you, if the peace should fail and this battle should be joined, will the dragons come? Will they join the fight? They will come, Sir Barristan might have said. The noise will bring them, the shouts and screams, the scent of blood. That will draw them to the battlefield, just as the roar from Daznak's pit drew Drogon to the Scarlet Sands. But when they come, Will they know one side from the other? Somehow he did not think so. So he said only, The dragons will do what the dragons will do. If they do come, it may be that just the shadow of their wings will be enough to dishearten the slavers and send them fleeing. Then he thanked them and dismissed them all. Grey Worm lingered after the others had left. These ones will be ready when the beacon fire is lit. But the hand must surely know that when we attack, the young Kai will kill the hostages. I will do all I can to prevent that, my friend. I have a notion. But pray excuse me. It is past time the Dornishmen heard that their prince is dead. Grey Worm inclined his head. 
this one obeys. Sir Barristan took two of his new-made knights with him down into the dungeons. Grief and guilt had been known to drive good men into madness, and Archibald Ironwood and Garris Drinkwater had both played roles in their friend's demise. But when they reached the cell, he told Tum and the Red Lamb to wait outside whilst he went in to tell the Dornish that the prince's agony was over. Sir Archibald, the big bald one, had nothing to say. He sat on the edge of his pallet, staring down at his bandaged hands in their linen wrappings. Sir Garrus punched a wall. I told him it was folly. I begged him to go home. Your bitch of a queen had no use for him. Any man could see that. He crossed the world to offer her his love and fealty, and she laughed in his face. She never laughed, said Selmy. If you knew her, you would know that. She spurned him. He offered her his heart, and she threw it back at him and went off to fuck her sellsword. You had best guard that tongue, sir. Sir Barristan did not like this Garrus drinkwater, nor would he allow him to vilify Daenerys. Prince Quentin's death was his own doing, and yours. Ours? How are we at fault, sir? Quentin was our friend, yes. A bit of a fool, you might say, but all dreamers are fools. But first and last, he was our prince. We owed him our obedience. Barristan Selmy could not dispute the truth of that. He had spent the best part of his own life obeying the commands of drunkards and madmen. He came too late. He offered her his heart, Sir Garris said again. She needed swords, not hearts. He would have given her the spears of Dorn as well. Would that he had. No one had wanted Daenerys to look with favor on the Dornish prince more than Barristan Selmy. He came too late, though, and this folly, buying swords, loosing two dragons on the city, that was madness and worse than madness. That was treason. What he did, he did for love of Queen Daenerys, Garrus Drinkwater insisted, to prove himself worthy of her hand. The old knight had heard enough. What Prince Quentin did, he did for Dorne. Do you take me for some doting grandfather? I have spent my life around kings and queens and princes. Sunspear means to take up arms against the Iron Throne. No, do not trouble to deny it. Dorian Martell is not a man to call his spears without hope of victory. Duty brought Prince Quentin here. Duty, honor, thirst for glory. Never love. Quentin was here for dragons, not dangerous. You did not know him, sir. He, he's dead, Drink. Ironwood rose to his feet. Words won't fetch him back. Cletus and Will are dead, too, so shut your bloody mouth before I stick my fist in it. The big knight turned to Selmy. What do you mean to do with us? Skahaz Shavepate wants you hanged. You slew four of his men, four of the Queen's men. Two were freedmen who had followed her grace since Astapor. Ironwood did not seem surprised. The beast men, I... I only killed the one, the basilisk head. The sellswords did the others. Don't matter, though, I know that. We were protecting Quentin, said Drinkwater. We be quiet, Drink. He knows. To Sir Barristan, the big knight said, No need to come and talk if you meant to hang us. So it's not that, is it? No. This one may not be as slow-witted as he seems. I have more use for you alive than dead. Serve me, and afterward I will arrange a ship to take you back to Dorn and give you Prince Quentin's bones to return to his lord father. Sir Archibald grimaced. Why is it always ships? Someone needs to take Quent home, though. What do you ask of us, sir? Your swords. You have thousands of swords. The Queen's freedmen are as yet unblooded. The sellswords I do not trust. Unsullied are brave soldiers, but not warriors, not knights. He paused. What happened when you tried to take the dragons? Tell me. The Dornishmen exchanged a look. Then Drinkwater said, Quentin told the tattered prince he could control them. It was in his blood, he said. He had Targaryen blood. 
Blood of the dragon. Yes. The cell swords were supposed to help us get the dragons chained up so we could get them to the docks. Rags arranged for a ship, said Ironwood. A big one in case we got both dragons. And Quent was going to ride one. He looked at his bandaged hands. The moment we got in, though, you could see none of it was going to work. The dragons were too wild. The chains. There were bits of broken chain everywhere. Big chains. Links the size of your head mixed in with all these cracked and splintered bones. And Quent, seven save him. He looked like he was going to shit his small clothes. Cago and Maris weren't blind. They saw it, too. Then one of the crossbowmen let fly. Maybe they meant to kill the dragons all along and were only using us to get to them. You never know with tatters. Anyway, you hack it off and weren't clever. The quarrel just made the dragons angry, and they hadn't been in such a good mood to start with. Then... Then things got bad. And the wind blown blew away, said Ser Garrus. Quent was screaming, covered in flames, and they were gone. Cago, pretty Maris, all but the dead one. Ah, what did you expect, Drink? A cat will kill a mouse, a pig will wallow in shit, and a sellsword will run off when he's needed most. Can't be blamed, just the nature of the beast. He's not wrong, Seb Ariston said. What did Prince Quentin promise the tattered prince in return for all this help? He got no answer. Sir Garrus looked at Sir Archibald. Sir Archibald looked at his hands, the floor, the door. Pentos, said Sir Barristan. He promised him Pentos. Say it. No words of yours can help or harm Prince Quentin now. Aye, said Sir Archibald unhappily. It was Pentos. They made marks on a paper, the two of them. There is a chance here. We still have wind blown in the dungeons, those feigned deserters. I remember, said Ironwood. Hungerford, straw, that lot. Some of them weren't so bad for sellswords. Others, well, might be they could stand a bit of dying. What of them? I mean to send them back to the tattered prince, and you with them. You will be two amongst thousands. Your presence in the Yunkish camps should pass unnoticed. I want you to deliver a message to the tattered prince. Tell him that I sent you, that I speak with the queen's voice. Tell him that we'll pay his price if he delivers us our hostages, unharmed and whole. Sir Archibald grimaced. Rags and tatters is more like to give the two of us to pretty Maris. He won't do it. Why not? The task is simple enough. Compared to stealing dragons. I once brought the queen's father out of Duskendale. That was Westeros, said Garrus Drinkwater. This is Meereen. Arch cannot even hold a sword with those hands. He ought not need to. You will have the cell swords with you, unless I mistake my man. Garrus Drinkwater pushed back his mop of sun-streaked hair. Might we have some time to discuss this amongst ourselves? No, said Selmy. I'll do it, offered Sir Archibald. Just so long as there's no bloody boats involved, Drink will do it too. He grinned. He don't know it yet, but he will. And that was done. The simple part, at least, thought Barristan Selmy, as he made the long climb back to the summit of the pyramid. The hard part he'd left in Dornish hands. His grandfather would have been aghast. The Dornish men were knights, at least in name, though only Ironwood impressed him as having the true steel. Drinkwater had a pretty face, a glib tongue, and a fine head of hair. By the time the old knight returned to the queen's rooms atop the pyramid, Prince Quentin's corpse had been removed. Six of the young cupbearers were playing some child's game as he entered, sitting in a circle on the floor as they took turns spinning a dagger. When it wobbled to a stop, they cut a lock of hair off whichever of them the blade was pointing at. Sir Barristan had played a similar game with his cousins when he was just a boy at Harvest Hall though in Westeros, as he recalled, kissing had been involved as well. Bacaz, he called. A cup of wine, if you would be so good. Grajar, Azak, the door is yours. 
I am expecting the green grace. Show her in at once when she arrives. Elsewise, I do not wish to be disturbed. Azak scrambled to his feet. As you command, Lord Hand. Sir Barristan went out onto the terrace. The rain had stopped, though a wall of slate-gray clouds hid the setting sun as it made its descent into Slaver's Bay. A few wisps of smoke still rose from the blackened stones of Hasdar, twisted like ribbons by the wind. Far off to the east, beyond the city walls, he saw pale wings moving above a distant line of hills. Isarion. Hunting, mayhaps, or flying just to fly. He wondered where Rhaegal was. Thus far, the green dragon had shown himself to be more dangerous than the white. When Bakaz brought his wine, the old knight took one long swallow and sent the boy for water. A few cups of wine might be just the thing to help him sleep, but he would need his wits about him when Galaza Galaire returned from treating with the foe. So he drank his wine well watered, as the world grew dark around him. He was very tired, and full of doubts. The Dornishman, Hisdar, Reznak, the attack. Was he doing the right things? Was he doing what Daenerys would have wanted? I was not made for this. Other Kingsguard had served as hand before him, not many, but a few. He had read of them in the White Book. Now he found himself wondering whether they had felt as lost and confused as he did. Lord Hand, Grajar stood in the door, a taper in his hand. The Green Grace has come, you ask to be told. Show her in, and light some candles. Galaza Galaire was attended by four pink graces. An aura of wisdom and dignity seemed to surround her that Sir Barristan could not help but admire. This is a strong woman, and she has been a faithful friend to Daenerys. Lord Hand, she said her face hidden behind shimmering green veils. May I sit? These bones are old and weary. Grajar, a chair for the green grace. The pink graces arrayed themselves behind her, with eyes lowered and hands clasped before them. May I offer you refreshment? asked Sir Barristan. That would be most welcome, Sir Barristan. My throat is dry from talking. A juice, perhaps? As you wish. He beckoned to Kesmia and had her fetch the priestess a goblet of lemon juice, sweetened with honey. To drink it, the priestess had to remove her veil, and Selmy was reminded of just how old she was. Twenty years my elder, or more. If the queen were here, I know she would join me in thanking you for all that you have done for us. Her magnificence has always been most gracious. Galaza Galaire finished her drink and fastened up her veil again. Have there been any further tidings of our sweet queen? None as yet. I shall pray for her. And what of King Hisdar, if I may be so bold? Might I be permitted to see his radiance? Soon, I hope. He is unharmed, I promise you. I am pleased to hear that. The wise masters of Yunkai asked after him. You will not be surprised to hear that they wish the noble Hisdar to be restored at once to his rightful place. He shall be, if it can be proved that he did not try to kill our queen. Until such time, Meereen will be ruled by a council of the loyal and just. There is a place for you on that council. I know that you have much to teach us all your benevolence. We need your wisdom. I fear you flatter me with empty courtesies, Lord Hand, the Green Grace said. If you truly think me wise, heed me now. Release the noble Hisdar and restore him to his throne. Only the queen can do that. Beneath her veils, the green grace sighed. The peace that we worked so hard to forge flutters like a leaf in an autumn wind. These are dire days. Death stalks our streets, riding the pale mare from thrice-cursed Astapor. Dragons haunt the skies, feasting on the flesh of children. Hundreds are taking ship, sailing for Yunkai, for Tolos, for Karth, for any refuge that will have them. The Pyramid of Haskar has collapsed into a smoking ruin, and many of that ancient line lie dead beneath its blackened stones. 
The pyramids of Ulez and Yerizan have become the lairs of monsters, their masters homeless beggars. My people have lost all hope and turned against the gods themselves, giving over their nights to drunkenness and fornication. And murder. The sons of the harpy slew thirty in the night. I grieve to hear this. All the more reason to free the noble Hisdar Zolorak, who stopped such killings once. And how did he accomplish that unless he is himself the harpy? Her grace gave her hand to Hisdar Zolorak, made him her king and consort, restored the mortal art as he beseeched her. In return, he gave her poisoned locusts. In return, he gave her peace. Do not cast it away, sir, I beg you. Peace is the pearl beyond price. Hisdar is of Lorak. Never would he soil his hands with poison. He is innocent. How can you be certain? Unless you know the poisoner. The gods of Gis have told me. My gods are the seven, and the seven have been silent on this matter. Your wisdom, did you present my offer? To all the lords and captains of Yunkai, as you commanded me. Yet I fear you will not like their answer. They refused. They did. No amount of gold will buy your people back, I was told. Only the blood of dragons may set them free again. It was the answer Sir Barristan had expected, if not the one that he had hoped for. His mouth tightened. I know these were not the words you wished to hear, said Galaza Galer. Yet for myself I understand. These dragons are fell beasts. Young Kai fears them, and with good cause you cannot deny. Our histories speak of the dragon lords of Dread Valeria and the devastation that they wrought upon the peoples of Old Gis. Even your own young queen, fair Daenerys, who called herself the mother of dragons, we saw her burning that day in the pit. Even she was not safe from the dragon's wrath. Her grace is not... She is dead. May the gods grant her sweet sleep. Tears glistened behind her veils. Let her dragons die as well. Selmy was groping for an answer when he heard the sound of heavy footsteps. The door burst inward, and Skahasmo Kandak stormed in with four brazen beasts behind him. When Grajar tried to block his path, he slammed the boy aside. Sir Barristan was on his feet at once. What is it? The trebuchets, the shape pate growled. All six. Galaza Galer rose. Thus does young Kai make reply to your offers, sir. I warned you that you would not like their answer. They chose war, then. So be it. Sir Barristan felt oddly relieved. War, he understood. If they think they will break Mirene by throwing stones, not stones. The old woman's voice was full of grief, of fear. Corpses. Daenerys. The hill was a stony island in a sea of green. It took Danny half the morning to climb down. By the time she reached the bottom, she was winded. Her muscles ached and she felt as if she had the beginnings of a fever. The rocks had scraped her hands raw. They are better than they were, though, she decided as she picked at a broken blister. Her skin was pink and tender, and a pale milky fluid was leaking from her cracked palms, but her burns were healing. The hill loomed larger down here. Danny had taken to calling it Dragonstone, after the ancient citadel where she'd been born. She had no memories of that dragon stone, but she would not soon forget this one. Scrub grass and thorny bushes covered its lower slopes. Higher up, a jagged tangle of bare rock thrust steep and sudden into the sky. There, amidst broken boulders, razor-sharp ridges, and needle spires, Drogon made his lair inside a shallow cave. He had dwelt there for some time, Danny had realized when she first saw the hill. The air smelled of ash, every rock and tree in sight was scorched and blackened, the ground strewn with burned and broken bones, yet it had been home to him. Danny knew the lure of home. 
Two days ago, climbing on a spire of rock, she had spied water to the south, a slender thread that glittered briefly as the sun was going down. A stream, Danny decided. Small, but it would lead her to a larger stream, and that stream would flow into some little river, and all the rivers in this part of the world were vassals of the Skahazadan. Once she found the Skahazadan, she needed only follow it downstream to Slaver's Bay. She would sooner have returned to Mirin on dragon's wings, to be sure. But that was a desire Drogon did not seem to share. The dragon lords of Old Valyria had controlled their mounts with binding spells and sorcerous horns. Daenerys made do with a word and a whip. Mounted on the dragon's back, she oft felt as if she were learning to ride all over again. When she whipped her silver mare on her right flank, the mare went left, for a horse's first instinct is to flee from danger. When she laid the whip across Drogon's right side, he veered right, for a dragon's first instinct is always to attack. Sometimes it did not seem to matter where she struck him, though. Sometimes he went where he would and took her with him. Neither whip nor words could turn Drogon if he did not wish to be turned. The whip annoyed him more than it hurt him, she had come to see. His scales had grown harder than horn. And no matter how far the dragon flew each day, come nightfall some instinct drew him home to Dragonstone. His home, not mine. Her home was back in Meereen, with her husband and her lover. That was where she belonged, surely. Keep walking. If I look back, I am lost. Memories walked with her. Clouds seen from above. Horses small as ants thundering through the grass. A silver moon, almost close enough to touch. Rivers running bright and blue below, glimmering in the sun. Will I ever see such sights again? On Drogon's back she felt whole. Up in the sky the woes of this world could not touch her. How could she abandon that? It was time, though. A girl might spend her life at play, but she was a woman grown, a queen, a wife, a mother to thousands. Her children had need of her. Drogon had bent before the whip, and so must she. She had to don her crown again and return to her ebon bench and the arms of her noble husband. His dar of the tepid kisses. The sun was hot this morning, the sky blue and cloudless. That was good. Danny's clothes were hardly more than rags and offered little in the way of warmth. One of her sandals had slipped off during her wild flight from Mirene, and she had left the other up by Drogon's cave, preferring to go barefoot rather than half-shod. Her tokar and veils she had abandoned in the pit, and her linen under-tunic had never been made to withstand the hot days and cold nights of the Dothraki Sea. Sweat and grass and dirt had stained it, and Danny had torn a strip off the hem to make a bandage for her shin. I must look a ragged thing, and starved, she thought. But if the days stay warm, I will not freeze. Hers had been a lonely sojourn, and for most of it she had been hurt and hungry. Yet, despite it all, she had been strangely happy here. A few aches, an empty belly, chills by night. What does it matter when you can fly? I would do it all again. Jiki and Eri would be waiting atop her pyramid back in Mirene, she told herself. Her sweet scribe Miss Ende as well, and all her little pages. They would bring her food, and she could bathe in the pool beneath the persimmon tree. It would be good to feel clean again. Danny did not need a glass to know that she was filthy. She was hungry, too. One morning she had found some wild onions growing halfway down the south slope, and later that same day a leafy reddish vegetable that might have been some queer sort of cabbage. Whatever it was, it had not made her sick. Aside from that, and one fish that she had caught in the spring-fed pool outside of Drogon's cave, she had survived as best she could on the dragon's leavings, on burned bones and chunks of smoking meat, half charred and half raw. She needed more, she knew. One day she kicked at a cracked sheep's skull with the side of a bare foot, and sent it bouncing over the edge of the hill. And as she watched it tumble down the steep slope toward the sea of grass, she realized she must follow. Danny set off through the tall grass at a brisk pace. 
The earth felt warm between her toes. The grass was as tall as she was. It never seemed so high when I was mounted on my silver, riding beside my sun and stars at the head of his calisar. As she walked, she tapped her thigh with the pitmaster's whip. That, and the rags on her back, were all she had taken from Mirene. Though she walked through a green kingdom, it was not the deep, rich green of summer. Even here autumn made its presence felt, and winter would not be far behind. The grass was paler than she remembered, a wan and sickly green on the verge of going yellow. After that would come brown. The grass was dying. Daenerys Targaryen was no stranger to the Dothraki Sea, the great ocean of grass that stretched from the forest of Kohor to the mother of mountains and the womb of the world. She had seen it first when she was still a girl, newly wed to Caldrogo, and on her way to Vase Dothrak to be presented to the crones of the Dosh Kaleen. The sight of all that grass stretching out before her had taken her breath away. The sky was blue, the grass was green, and I was full of hope. Ser Jorah had been with her then, her gruff old bear. She'd had Eerie and Jiki and Dorea to care for her, her sun and stars to hold her in the night, his child growing inside her. Rago. I was going to name him Rago, and the Dosh Kaleen said he would be the stallion who mounts the world. Not since those half-remembered days in Bravos when she lived in the house with the Red Door had she been as happy. But in the Red Waste, all her joy had turned to ashes. Her sun and stars had fallen from his horse, the Magi Miri Mazdur had murdered Rago in her womb, and Danny had smothered the empty shell of Caldrogo with her own two hands. Afterward, Drogo's great Kalasar had shattered. Copono named himself Calpono and took many riders with him, and many slaves as well. Kojako named himself Kaljako and rode off with even more. Mago, his blood rider, raped and murdered Arroe, a girl Daenerys had once saved from him. Only the birth of her dragons amidst the fire and smoke of Caldrogo's funeral pyre had spared Danny herself from being dragged back to Vase Dothrak to live out the remainder of her days amongst the crones of the Dosh Kaleen. The fire burned away my hair, but elsewise it did not touch me. It had been the same in Dasnak's pit. That much she could recall, though much of what followed was a haze. So many people, screaming and shoving. She remembered rearing horses, a food cart spilling melons as it overturned. From below, a spear came flying, followed by a flight of crossbow bolts. One passed so close that Danny felt it brush her cheek. Others skittered off Drogon's scales, lodged between them, or tore through the membrane of his wings. She remembered the dragon twisting beneath her, shuddering at the impacts, as she tried desperately to cling to his scaled back. The wounds were smoking. Danny saw one of the bolts burst into sudden flame. Another fell away, shaken loose by the beating of his wings. Below, she saw men whirling, wreathed in flame, hands up in the air as if caught in the throes of some mad dance. A woman in a green tokar reached for a weeping child, pulling him down into her arms to shield him from the flames. Danny saw the color vividly, but not the woman's face. People were stepping on her as they lay tangled on the bricks. Some were on fire. Then all of that had faded, the sounds dwindling, the people shrinking, the spears and arrows falling back beneath them as Drogon clawed his way into the sky. Up and up and up he'd borne her, high above the pyramids and pits, his wings outstretched to catch the warm air rising from the city's sun-baked bricks. If I fall and die, it will still have been worth it, she had thought. North they flew, beyond the river, Drogon gliding on torn and tattered wings through clouds that whipped by like the banners of some ghostly army. Danny glimpsed the shores of Slaver's Bay and the old Valyrian road that ran beside it through sand and desolation until it vanished in the west. The road home. Then there was nothing beneath them but grass rippling in the wind. Was that first flight a thousand years ago? Sometimes it seemed as if it must be. The sun grew hotter as it rose, and before long her head was pounding. Danny's hair was growing out again, but slowly. 
I need a hat, she said aloud. Up on Dragonstone she had tried to make one for herself, weaving stalks of grass together as she had seen Dothraki women do during her time with Drogo, but either she was using the wrong sort of grass or she simply lacked the necessary skill. Her hats all fell to pieces in her hands. Try again, she told herself. You will do better the next time. You are the blood of the dragon, you can make a hat. She tried and tried, but her last attempt had been no more successful than her first. It was afternoon by the time Danny found the stream she had glimpsed atop the hill. It was a rill, a rivulet, a trickle, no wider than her arm, and her arm had grown thinner every day she spent on Dragonstone. Danny scooped up a handful of water and splashed it on her face. When she cupped her hands, her knuckles squished in the mud at the bottom of the stream. She might have wished for colder, clearer water, but no, if she were going to pin her hopes on wishes, she would wish for rescue. She still clung to the hope that someone would come after her. Sarbariston might come seeking her. He was the first of her queen's guard, sworn to defend her life with his own. And her blood riders were no strangers to the Dothraki Sea, and their lives were bound to her own. Her husband, the noble Hisdar Zolorak, might dispatch searchers. And Dario. Danny pictured him riding toward her through the tall grass, smiling, his golden tooth gleaming with the last light of the setting sun. Only Dario had been given to the young Kai, a hostage to ensure no harm came to the Yunkish captains. Dario and Hero, Jogo and Grolio, and three of Hisdar's kin. By now, surely, all of her hostages would have been released. But... She wondered if her captain's blades still hung upon the wall beside her bed, waiting for Dario to return and claim them. I will leave my girls with you, he had said. Keep them safe for me, beloved. And she wondered how much the young Kai knew about what her captain meant to her. She had asked Zerbariston that question the afternoon the hostages went forth. They will have heard the talk, he had replied. Naharis may even have boasted of your graces, of your great regard for him. If you will forgive my saying so, modesty is not one of the captain's virtues. He takes great pride in his, his swordsmanship. He boasts of betting me, you mean? But Dario would not have been so foolish as to make such a boast amongst her enemies. It makes no matter. By now the young Kai will be marching home. That was why she had done all that she had done. For peace. She turned back the way she'd come, to where Dragonstone rose above the grasslands like a clenched fist. It looks so close. I've been walking for hours, yet it still looks as if I could reach out and touch it. It was not too late to go back. There were fish in the spring-fed pool by Drogon's cave. She had caught one her first day there, she might catch more. And there would be scraps, charred bones with bits of flesh still on them, the remnants of Drogon's kills. No, Danny told herself. If I look back, I am lost. She might live for years amongst the sun-baked rocks of Dragonstone, riding Drogon by day and gnawing at his leavings every evenfall as the great grass sea turned from gold to orange, but that was not the life she had been born to. So once again she turned her back upon the distant hill and closed her ears to the song of flight and freedom that the wind sang as it played amongst the hill's stony ridges. The stream was trickling south by southeast, as near as she could tell. She followed it. Take me to the river, that is all I ask of you. Take me to the river, and I will do the rest. The hours passed slowly. The stream bent this way and that, and Danny followed, beating time upon her leg with the whip, trying not to think about how far she had to go, or the pounding in her head, or her empty belly. Take one step. Take the next. Another step. Another. What else could she do? It was quiet on her sea. When the wind blew, the grass would sigh as the stalks brushed against each other, whispering in a tongue that only gods could understand. Now and again the little stream would gurgle where it flowed around a stone, mud squished between her toes, 
Insects buzzed around her, lazy dragonflies and glistening green wasps and stinging midges almost too small to see. She swatted at them absently when they landed on her arms. Once she came upon a rat drinking from the stream, but it fled when she appeared, scurrying between the stalks to vanish in the high grass. Sometimes she heard birds singing. The sound made her belly rumble, but she had no nets to snare them with, and so far she had not come on any nests. Once I dreamed of flying, she thought, and now I've flown and dream of stealing eggs. That made her laugh. Men are mad and gods are madder, she told the grass, and the grass murmured its agreement. Thrice that day she caught sight of Drogon. Once he was so far off that he might have been an eagle, slipping in and out of distant clouds, but Danny knew the look of him by now, even when he was no more than a speck. The second time he passed before the sun, his black wings spread, and the world darkened. The last time he flew right above her, so close she could hear the sound of his wings. For half a heartbeat Danny thought that he was hunting her, but he flew on without taking any notice of her, and vanished somewhere in the east. Just as well, she thought. Evening took her almost unawares. As the sun was gilding the distant spires of Dragonstone, Danny stumbled onto a low stone wall, overgrown and broken. Perhaps it had been part of a temple, or the hall of the village lord. More ruins lay beyond it, an old well, and some circles in the grass that marked the sites where hovels had once stood. They had been built of mud and straw, she judged, but long years of wind and rain had worn them away to nothing. Danny found eight before the sun went down, but there might have been more farther out, hidden in the grass. The stone wall had endured better than the rest. Though it was nowhere more than three feet high, the angle where it met another lower wall still offered some shelter from the elements, and night was coming on fast. Danny wedged herself into that corner, making a nest of sorts by tearing up handfuls of the grass that grew around the ruins. She was very tired and fresh blisters had appeared on both her feet, including a match set upon her pinky toes. It must be from the way I walk, she thought, giggling. As the world darkened, Danny settled in and closed her eyes, but sleep refused to come. The night was cold, the ground hard, her belly empty. She found herself thinking of Mirene, of Dario, her love, and Hisdar, her husband, Aviri and Jiki and Sweet Missandei, Ser Baristan and Reznak and Skahaz Shavepate. Do they fear me dead? I flew off on a dragon's back. Will they think he ate me? She wondered if Hisdar was still king. His crown had come from her. Could he hold it in her absence? He wanted Drogon dead. I heard him. Kill it, he screamed. Kill the beast. And the look upon his face was lustful and strong Belwas had been on his knees, heaving and shuddering. Poison, it had to be poison. The honeyed locusts. Hisdar urged them on me, but Belwas ate them all. She had made Hisdar her king, taken him into her bed, opened the fighting pits for him. He had no reason to want her dead. Yet who else could it have been? Reznak, her perfumed seneschal? The young Kai? The sons of the harpy? Off in the distance, a wolf howled. The sound made her feel sad and lonely, but no less hungry. As the moon rose above the grasslands, Danny slipped at last into a restless sleep. She dreamed. All her cares fell away from her, and all her pains as well, and she seemed to float upward into the sky. She was flying once again, spinning, laughing, dancing, as the stars wheeled around her and whispered secrets in her ear. To go north, you must journey south. To reach the west, you must go east. To go forward, you must go back. To touch the light, you must pass beneath the shadow. Quaith, Danny called. Where are you, Quaith? Then she saw. Her mask is made of starlight. Remember who you are, Daenerys the stars whispered in a woman's voice. The dragons know. Do you?
The next morning she woke stiff and sore and aching, with ants crawling on her arms and legs and face. When she realized what they were, she kicked aside the stalks of dry brown grass that had served as her bed and blanket and struggled to her feet. She had bites all over her, little red bumps, itchy and inflamed. Where did all the ants come from? Danny brushed them from her arms and legs and belly. She ran a hand across her stubbly scalp where her hair had burned away and felt more ants on her head and one crawling down the back of her neck. She knocked them off and crushed them under her bare feet. There were so many. It turned out that their anthill was on the other side of her wall. She wondered how the ants had managed to climb over it and find her. To them, these tumble-down stones must loom as huge as the wall of Westeros. The biggest wall in all the world, her brother Viserys used to say, as proud as if he'd built it himself. Viserys told her tales of nights so poor that they had to sleep beneath the ancient hedges that grew along the byways of the Seven Kingdoms. Danny would have given much and more for a nice thick hedge, preferably one without an anthill. The sun was only just coming up. A few bright stars lingered in the cobalt sky. Perhaps one of them is Caldrogo, sitting on his fiery stallion in the nightlands and smiling down on me. Dragonstone was still visible above the grasslands. It looks so close. I must be leagues away by now, but it looks as if I could be back in an hour. She wanted to lie back down, close her eyes, and give herself up to sleep. No, I must keep going. The stream, just follow the stream. Danny took a moment to make certain of her directions. It would not do to walk the wrong way and lose her stream. My friend, she said aloud. If I stay close to my friend, I won't get lost. She would have slept beside the water if she dared, but there were animals who came down to the stream to drink at night. She had seen their tracks. Danny would make a poor meal for a wolf or lion, but even a poor meal was better than none. Once she was certain which way was south, she counted off her paces. The stream appeared at eight. Danny cupped her hands to drink. The water made her belly cramp, but cramps were easier to bear than thirst. She had no other drink but the morning dew that glistened on the tall grass, and no food at all unless she cared to eat the grass. I could try eating ants. The little yellow ones were too small to provide much in the way of nourishment, but there were red ants in the grass, and those were bigger. I am lost at sea, she said, as she limped along beside her meandering rivulet. So perhaps I'll find some crabs, or a nice fat fish. Her whip slapped softly against her thigh. Whap, whap, whap. One step at a time and the stream would see her home. Just past midday, she came upon a bush growing by the stream, its twisted limbs covered with hard green berries. Danny squinted at them suspiciously, then plucked one from a branch and nibbled at it. Its flesh was tart and chewy, with a bitter aftertaste that seemed familiar to her. In the Kalasar, they used berries like these to flavor roasts, she decided. Saying it aloud made her more certain of it. Her belly rumbled, and Danny found herself picking berries with both hands and tossing them into her mouth. An hour later, her stomach began to cramp so badly that she could not go on. She spent the rest of that day retching up green slime. If I stay here, I will die. I may be dying now. Would the horse god of the Dothraki part the grass and claim her for his starry Kalasar, so she might ride the nightlands with Caldrogo? In Westeros, the dead of House Targaryen were given to the flames, but who would light her pyre here? My flesh will feed the wolves and carrion crows, she thought sadly, and worms will burrow through my womb. Her eyes went back to Dragonstone. It looked smaller. She could see smoke rising from its wind-carved summit miles away. Drogon has returned from hunting. Sunset found her squatting in the grass, groaning. Every stool was looser than the one before and smelled fouler. 
By the time the moon came up, she was shitting brown water. The more she drank, the more she shat, but the more she shat, the thirstier she grew, and her thirst sent her crawling to the stream to suck up more water. When she closed her eyes at last, Danny did not know whether she would be strong enough to open them again. She dreamt of her dead brother. Viscerous looked just as he had the last time she'd seen him. His mouth was twisted in anguish, his hair was burnt, and his face was black and smoking where the molten gold had run down across his brow and cheeks and into his eyes. You are dead, Danny said. Murdered. Though his lips never moved, somehow she could hear his voice whispering in her ear. You never mourned me, sister. It is hard to die unmourned. I loved you once. Once, he said, so bitterly it made her shudder. You were supposed to be my wife, to bear me children with silver hair and purple eyes, to keep the blood of the dragon pure. I took care of you. I taught you who you were. I fed you. I sold our mother's crown to keep you fed. You hurt me. You frightened me. Only when you woke the dragon. I loved you. You sold me. You betrayed me. No. You were the betrayer. You turned against me, against your own blood. They cheated me. Your horsey husband and his stinking savages. They were cheats and liars. They promised me a golden crown and gave me this. He touched the molten gold that was creeping down his face, and smoke rose from his finger. You could have had your crown, Danny told him. My sun and stars would have won it for you if only you had waited. I waited long enough. I waited my whole life. I was their king, their rightful king. They laughed at me. You should have stayed in Pentos with Magister Illyrio. Caldrogo had to present me to the Dosh Kalin, but you did not have to ride with us. That was your choice, your mistake. Do you want to wake the dragon, you stupid little whore? Drogo's Kalasar was mine. I bought them from him, a hundred thousand screamers. I paid for them with your maidenhead. You never understood. Dothraki do not buy and sell. They give gifts and receive them. If you had waited... I did wait. For my crown, for my throne, for you. All those years, and all I ever got was a pot of molten gold. Why did they give the dragon's eggs to you? They should have been mine. If I'd had a dragon, I would have taught the world the meaning of our words. Viserys began to laugh until his jaw fell away from his face, smoking, and blood and molten gold ran from his mouth. When she woke, gasping, her thighs were slick with blood. For a moment she did not realize what it was. The world had just begun to lighten, and the tall grass rustled softly in the wind. No, please, let me sleep some more. I'm so tired. She tried to burrow back beneath the pile of grass she had torn up when she went to sleep. Some of the stalks felt wet. Had it rained again? She sat up, afraid that she had soiled herself as she slept. When she brought her fingers to her face, she could smell the blood on them. Am I dying? Then she saw the pale crescent moon floating high above the grass, and it came to her that this was no more than her moon blood. If she had not been so sick and scared, that might have come as a relief. Instead, she began to shiver violently. She rubbed her fingers through the dirt and grabbed a handful of grass to wipe between her legs. The dragon does not weep. She was bleeding, but it was only woman's blood. The moon is still a crescent, though. How can that be? She tried to remember the last time she had bled. The last full moon? The one before? The one before that? No, it cannot have been so long as that. I am the blood of the dragon, she told the grass aloud. Once, the grass whispered back, until you change your dragons in the dark. Drogon killed a little girl. Her name was... Her name... 
Danny could not recall the child's name. That made her so sad that she would have cried if all her tears had not been burned away. I will never have a little girl. I was the mother of dragons. Aye, the grass said. But you turned against your children. Her belly was empty, her feet sore and blistered, and it seemed to her that the cramping had grown worse. Her guts were full of writhing snakes biting at her bowels. She scooped up a handful of mud and water in trembling hands. By midday the water would be tepid, but in the chill of dawn it was almost cool and helped her keep her eyes open. As she splashed her face, she saw fresh blood on her thighs. The ragged hem of her under tunic was stained with it. The sight of so much red frightened her. Moon blood, it's only my moon blood. But she did not remember ever having such a heavy flow. Could it be the water? If it was the water, she was doomed. She had to drink or die of thirst. Walk, Danny commanded herself. Follow the stream and it will take you to the Skahazadan. That's where Dario will find you. But it took all her strength just to get back to her feet, and when she did, all she could do was stand there, fevered and bleeding. She raised her eyes to the empty blue sky, squinting at the sun. Half the morning gone already, she realized, dismayed. She made herself take a step, and then another, and then she was walking once again, following the little stream. The day grew warmer, and the sun beat down upon her head and the burnt remnants of her hair. Water splashed against the soles of her feet. She was walking in the stream. How long had she been doing that? The soft brown mud felt good between her toes and helped to soothe her blisters. In the stream or out of it, I must keep walking. Water flows downhill. The stream will take me to the river, and the river will take me home. Except it wouldn't. Not truly. Mirene was not her home, and never would be. It was a city of strange men with strange gods and stranger hair, of slavers wrapped in fringed tokars, where grace was earned through whoring, butchery was art, and dog was a delicacy. Mirene would always be the harpy's city, and Daenerys could not be a harpy. Never said the grass, in the gruff tones of Jorah Mormont. You were warned, your grace. Let this city be, I said. Your war is in Westeros, I told you. The voice was no more than a whisper, yet somehow Danny felt that he was walking just behind her. My bear, she thought. My old sweet bear, who loved me and betrayed me. She had missed him so. She wanted to see his ugly face, to wrap her arms around him and press herself against his chest, but she knew that if she turned around, Ser Jorah would be gone. I am dreaming, she said. A waking dream, a walking dream. I am alone and lost. Lost because you lingered, in a place that you were never meant to be, murmured Ser Jorah as softly as the wind alone, because you sent me from your side. You betrayed me. You informed on me, for gold. For home. Home was all I ever wanted. And me. You wanted me. Danny had seen it in his eyes. I did, the grass whispered sadly. You kissed me. I never said you could, but you did. You sold me to my enemies, but you meant it when you kissed me. I gave you good counsel. Save your spears and swords for the seven kingdoms, I told you. Leave Mirene to the Mirenes and go west, I said. You would not listen. I had to take Mirene or see my children starve along the march. Danny could still see the trail of corpses she had left behind her crossing the Red Waste. It was not a sight she wished to see again. I had to take Mirene to feed my people. You took Mirene, he told her, yet still you lingered. To be a queen. You are a queen, her bear said, in Westeros. It is such a long way, she complained. 
I was tired, Jora. I was weary of war. I wanted to rest, to laugh, to plant trees and see them grow. I am only a young girl. No, you are the blood of the dragon. The whispering was growing fainter, as if Ser Jora were falling farther behind. Dragons plant no trees. Remember that. Remember who you are, what you were made to be. Remember your words. Fire and blood, Daenerys told the swaying grass. A stone turned under her foot. She stumbled to one knee and cried out in pain, hoping against hope that her bear would gather her up and help her to her feet. When she turned her head to look for him, all she saw was trickling brown water and the grass still moving slightly. The wind, she told herself. The wind shakes the stalks and makes them sway. Only no wind was blowing. The sun was overhead, the world still and hot. Midges swarmed in the air, and a dragonfly floated over the stream, darting here and there. And the grass was moving when it had no cause to move. She fumbled in the water, found a stone the size of her fist, pulled it from the mud. It was a poor weapon, but better than an empty hand. From the corner of her eye, Danny saw the grass move again, off to her right. The grass swayed and bowed low, as if before a king, but no king appeared to her. The world was green and empty. The world was green and silent. The world was yellow, dying. I should get up, she told herself. I have to walk. I have to follow the stream. Through the grass came a soft silvery tinkling. Bells, Danny thought, smiling, remembering Caldrogo, her son in stars, and the bells he braided into his hair. When the sun rises in the west and sets in the east, when the seas go dry and mountains blow in the wind like leaves, when my womb quickens again and I bear a living child, Caldrogo will return to me. But none of those things had happened. Bells, Danny thought again. Her blood riders had found her. Ago, she whispered. Jogo, Rokaro. Might Dario have come with them? The green sea opened. A rider appeared. His braid was black and shiny, his skin as dark as burnished copper, his eyes the shape of bitter almonds. Bells sang in his hair. He wore a medallion belt and painted vest, with an arak on one hip and a whip on the other. A hunting bow and a quiver of arrows were slung from his saddle. One rider, and alone. A scout. He was one who rode before the Kalasar to find the game and the good green grass, and sniff out foes wherever they might hide. If he found her there, he would kill her, rape her, or enslave her. At best, he would send her back to the crones of the Dashkalin, where good Khaleesi were supposed to go when their cows had died. He did not see her, though. The grass concealed her, and he was looking elsewhere. Danny followed his eyes, and there the shadow flew with wings spread wide. The dragon was a mile off, and yet the scout stood frozen until his stallion began to wicker in fear. Then he woke as if from a dream, wheeled his mount about, and raced off through the tall grass at a gallop. Danny watched him go. When the sound of his hoofs had faded away to silence, she began to shout. She called until her voice was hoarse, and Drogon came, snorting plumes of smoke. The grass bowed down before him. Danny leapt onto his back. She stank of blood and sweat and fear, but none of that mattered. To go forward I must go back, she said. Her bare legs tightened around the dragon's neck. She kicked him, and Drogon threw himself into the sky. Her whip was gone, so she used her hands and feet and turned him north by east, the way the scout had gone. Drogon went willingly enough. Perhaps he smelled the rider's fear. In a dozen heartbeats they were past the Dothraki, as he galloped far below. To the right and left, Danny glimpsed places where the grass was burned and ashen. Drogon has come this way before, she realized. Like a chain of gray islands, the marks of his hunting dotted the green grass sea. 
a vast herd of horses appeared below them. There were riders too, a score or more, but they turned and fled at the first sight of the dragon. The horses broke and ran when the shadow fell upon them, racing through the grass until their sides were white with foam, tearing the ground with their hooves, but as swift as they were, they could not fly. Soon one horse began to lag behind the others. The dragon descended on him, roaring, and all at once the poor beast was aflame, yet somehow he kept on running, screaming with every step, until Drogon landed on him and broke his back. Danny clutched the dragon's neck with all her strength to keep from sliding off. The carcass was too heavy for him to bear back to his lair, so Drogon consumed his kill there, tearing at the charred flesh as the grasses burned around them, the air thick with drifting smoke and the smell of burnt horsehair. Danny, starved, slid off his back and ate with him, ripping chunks of smoking meat from the dead horse with bare, burned hands. In Myrene I was a queen in silk, nibbling on stuffed dates and honeyed lamb, she remembered. What would my noble husband think if he could see me now? His dar would be horrified, no doubt. But Dario... Dario would laugh, carve off a hunk of horse meat with his arak, and squat down to eat beside her. As the western sky turned the color of a blood bruise, she heard the sound of approaching horses. Danny rose, wiped her hands on her ragged undertunic, and went to stand beside her dragon. That was how Kaljako found her, when half a hundred mounted warriors emerged from the drifting smoke. Epilogue I am no traitor, the Knight of Griffin's Roost declared. I am King Tommen's man and yours. A steady drip, drip, drip punctuated his words as Snowmelt ran off his cloak to puddle on the floor. The snow had been falling on King's Landing most of the night. Outside the drifts were ankle deep. Sir Kevin Lannister pulled his cloak about himself more closely. So you say, sir. Words are wind. Then let me prove the truth of them with my sword. The light of the torches made a fiery blaze of Ronnet Connington's long red hair and beard. Send me against my uncle, and I will bring you back his head, and the head of this false dragon, too. Lannister spearmen in crimson cloaks and lion-crested half-helms stood along the west wall of the throne room. Tyrell guards in green cloaks faced them from the opposite wall. The chill in the throne room was palpable. Though neither Queen Cersei nor Queen Margaery was amongst them, their presence could be felt poisoning the air, like ghosts at a feast. Behind the table where the five members of the king's small council were seated, the iron throne crouched like some great black beast, its barbs and claws and blades half shrouded in shadow. Kevin Lannister could feel it at his back, an itch between the shoulder blades. It was easy to imagine old King Eris perched up there, bleeding from some fresh cut, glowering down. But today the throne was empty. He had seen no reason for Tommen to join them, kinder to let the boy remain with his mother. The Seven only knew how long mother and son might have together before Cersei's trial, and possibly her execution. Mace Tyrell was speaking. We shall deal with your uncle and his feigned boy in due time. The new king's hand was seated on an oaken throne carved in the shape of a hand, an absurd vanity his lordship had produced the day Sir Kevin agreed to grant him the office he coveted. You will bide here until we are ready to march, then you shall have the chance to prove your loyalty. Sir Kevin took no issue with that. Escort Sir Ronit back to his chambers, he said, and see that he remains there, went unspoken. However loud his protestations, the knight of Griffin's Roost remained suspect. Supposedly the sellswords who had landed in the south were being led by one of his own blood. As the echoes of Connington's footsteps faded away, Grand Maester Picel gave a ponderous shake of his head. His uncle once stood just where the boy was standing now and told King Eris how he would deliver him the head of Robert Baratheon. That is how it is when a man grows as old as Picel. Everything you see or hear reminds you of something you saw or heard when you were young. How many men-at-arms accompanied Sir Ronit to the city? Sir Kevin asked. Twenty, 
said Lord Randall Tarley, and most of them Gregor Clegane's old lot. Your nephew Jane gave them to Connington. To rid himself of them, I'd wager. They had not been in Maidenpool a day before one killed a man and another was accused of rape. I had to hang the one and geld the other. If it were up to me, I would send them all to the Night's Watch and Connington with them. The wall is where such scum belong. A dog takes after its master, declared Mace Tyrell. Black cloaks would suit them, I agree. I will not suffer such men in the City Watch. A hundred of his own High Garden men had been added to the gold cloaks, yet plainly his lordship meant to resist any balancing infusion of Westermen. The more I give him, the more he wants. Kevin Lannister was beginning to understand why Cersei had grown so resentful of the Tyrells. But this was not the moment to provoke an open quarrel. Randall Tarley and Mace Tyrell had both brought armies to King's Landing, whilst the best part of the strength of House Lannister remained in the Riverlands, fast melting away. The Mountain's men were always fighters, he said in a conciliatory tone, and we may have need of every sword against these sellswords. If this truly is the Golden Company, as Kyburn's whisperers insist, call them what you will, said Randall Tarley. They are still no more than adventurers. Perhaps, Sir Kevin said. But the longer we ignore these adventurers, the stronger they grow. We have had a map prepared, a map of the incursions. Grand Maester? The map was beautiful, painted by a master's hand on a sheet of the finest vellum, so large it covered the table. Here, Pycel pointed with a spotted hand. Where the sleeve of his robe rode up, a flap of pale flesh could be seen dangling beneath his forearm. Here and here, all along the coast and on the islands. Tarth, the Stepstones, even Estermont. And now we have reports that Connington is moving on Storm's End. If it is John Connington, said Randall Tarley. Storm's End. Lord Mace Tyrell grunted the words. He cannot take Storm's End, not if he were Aegon the Conqueror. And if he does, what of it? Stannis holds it now. Let the castle pass from one pretender to another. Why should that trouble us? I shall recapture it after my daughter's innocence is proved. How can you recapture it when you have never captured it to begin with? I understand, my lord, but Tyrell did not let him finish. These charges against my daughter are filthy lies. I ask again, why must we play out this mummer's farce? Have King Tommen declare my daughter innocent, sir, and put an end to the foolishness here and now. Do that, and the whispers will follow Margery the rest of her life. No man doubts your daughter's innocence, my lord, Sir Kevin lied, but his High Holiness insists upon a trial. Lord Randall snorted. What have we become when kings and high lords must dance to the twittering of sparrows? We have foes on every hand, Lord Tarley, Sir Kevin reminded him. Stannis in the north, iron men in the west, sellswords in the south. Defy the High Septon, and we will have blood running in the gutters of King's Landing as well. If we are seen to be going against the gods, it will only drive the pious into the arms of one or the other of these would-be usurpers. Mace Tyrell remained unmoved. Once Paxter Redwine sweeps the Iron Men from the seas, my sons will retake the shields. The snows will do for Stannis, or Bolton will. As for Connington, if it is him, Lord Randall said, as for Connington, Tyrell repeated, what victories has he ever won that we should fear him? He could have ended Robert's rebellion at Stony Sept. He failed, just as the Golden Company has always failed. Some may rush to join them, I. The realm is well rid of such fools. Sir Kevin wished that he could share his certainty. He had known John Connington, slightly, a proud youth, the most headstrong of the gaggle of young lordlings who had gathered around Prince Rhaegar Targaryen, competing for his royal favor. Arrogant, but able and energetic. That, and his skill at arms, was why Mad King Eris had named him Hand. Old Lord Merryweather's inaction had allowed the rebellion to take root and spread, and Eris wanted someone young and vigorous to match Robert's own youth and vigor. Too soon. Lord Tywin Lannister had declared when word of the king's choice had reached Casterly Rock. Connington is too young, too bold, too eager for glory. The Battle of the Bells had proved the truth of that. 
Sir Kevin had expected that afterward Ares would have no choice but to summon Tywin once more. But the Mad King had turned to the Lord's Chelstead and Rossard instead, and paid for it with life and crown. That was all so long ago, though. If this is indeed John Connington, he will be a different man. Older, harder, more seasoned, more dangerous. Connington may have more than the Golden Company. It is said he has a Targaryen pretender. A feigned boy is what he has, said Randall Tarley. That may be, or not. Kevin Lannister had been here, in this very hall, when Tywin had laid the bodies of Prince Rhaegar's children at the foot of the Iron Throne, wrapped up in crimson cloaks. The girl had been recognizably the Princess Rhaenys, but the boy, a faceless horror of bone and brain and gore, a few hanks of fair hair, none of us looked long. Tywin said that it was Prince Aegon, and we took him at his word. We have these tales coming from the east as well. A second Targaryen, and one whose blood no man can question. Daenerys Stormborn. As mad as her father, declared Lord Mace Tyrell. That would be the same father that Highgarden and House Tyrell supported to the bitter end and well beyond. Mad she may be, Sir Kevin said. But with so much smoke drifting west, surely there must be some fire burning in the east. Grand Maester Pycelle bobbed his head. Dragons. These same stories have reached Old Town. Too many to discount. A silver-haired queen with three dragons. At the far end of the world, said Mace Tyrell. Queen of Slaver's Bay, aye, she is welcome to it. On that we can agree, Sir Kevin said. But the girl is of the blood of Aegon the Conqueror, and I do not think she will be content to remain in Meereen forever. If she should reach these shores and join her strength to Lord Connington and this prince of his, feigned or no, we must destroy Connington and his pretender now, before Daenerys Stormborn can come west. Mace Tyrell crossed his arms. I mean to do just that, sir. After the trials. Sell swords fight for coin, declared Grand Maester Pycelle. With enough gold, we might persuade the Golden Company to hand over Lord Connington and the Pretender. Aye, if we had gold, Sir Harris Swift said. Alas, my lords, our vaults contain only rats and roaches. I have written again to the Mirish bankers. If they will agree to make good the Crown's debt to the Bravo Sea and extend us a new loan, mayhaps we will not have to raise the taxes. Elsewise, the Magisters of Pentos have been known to lend money as well, said Sir Kevin. Try them. The Pentoshi were even less like to be of help than the Mirish money changers, but the effort must be made. Unless a new source of coin could be found, or the Iron Bank persuaded to relent, he would have no choice but to pay the crown's debts with Lannister gold. He dare not resort to new taxes, not with the Seven Kingdoms crawling with rebellion. Half the lords in the realm could not tell taxation from tyranny, and would bolt to the nearest usurper in a heartbeat if it would save them a clipped copper. If that fails, you may well need to go to Bravos to treat with the Iron Bank yourself. Sir Harris quailed. Must I? You are the master of coin, Lord Randall said sharply. I am. The puff of white hair at the end of Swift's chin quivered in outrage. Must I remind my lord this trouble is not of my doing? and not all of us have had the opportunity to refill our coffers with the plunder of Maidenpool and Dragonstone. I resent your implication, Swift, Mace Tyrell said, bristling. No wealth was found on Dragonstone, I promise you. My son's men have searched every inch of that damp and dreary island and turned up not so much as a single gemstone or speck of gold, nor any sign of this fabled horde of dragon eggs. Kevin Lannister had seen Dragonstone with his own eyes. He doubted very much that Loras Tyrell had searched every inch of that ancient stronghold. The Valyrians had raised it, after all, and all their works stank of sorcery. And Ser Loras was young, prone to all the rash judgments of youth, and had been grievously wounded storming the castle besides. But it would not do to remind Tyrell that his favorite son was fallible. If there was wealth on Dragonstone, Stannis would have found it, he declared. Let us move along, my lords. We have two queens to try for high treason, you may recall. My niece has elected trial by battle, she informs me. 
Sir Robert Strong will champion her. The silent giant, Lord Randall grimaced. Tell me, sir, where did this man come from? demanded Mace Tyrell. Why have we never heard his name before? He does not speak. He will not show his face. He is never seen without his armor. Do we know for a certainty that he is even a knight? We do not even know if he's alive. Marin Trant claimed that Strong took neither food nor drink, and Boros Blount went so far as to say he had never seen the man use the privy. Why should he? Dead men do not shit. Kevin Lannister had a strong suspicion of just who this Sir Robert really was beneath that gleaming white armor, a suspicion that Mace Tyrell and Randall Tarley no doubt shared. Whatever the face hidden behind Strong's helm, it must remain hidden for now. The silent giant was his niece's only hope. And pray that he is as formidable as he appears. But Mace Tyrell could not seem to see beyond the threat to his own daughter. His grace named Sir Robert to the King's Guard, Sir Kevin reminded him, and Kyburn vouches for the man as well. Be that as it may, we need Sir Robert to prevail, my lords. If my niece is proved guilty of these treasons, the legitimacy of her children will be called into question. If Tommen ceases to be a king, Margary will cease to be a queen. He let Tyrell chew on that a moment. Whatever Cersei may have done, she is still a daughter of the Rock, of mine own blood. I will not let her die a traitor's death, but I have made sure to draw her fangs. All her guards have been dismissed and replaced with my own men. In place of her former ladies-in-waiting, she will henceforth be attended by a septa and three novices selected by the High Septon. She is to have no further voice in the governance of the realm, nor in Tommen's education. I mean to return her to Casterly Rock after the trial and see that she remains there. Let that suffice. The rest he left unsaid. Cersei was soiled goods now, her power at an end. Every baker's boy and beggar in the city had seen her in her shame, and every tart and tanner from Flea Bottom to Pisswater Bend had gazed upon her nakedness, their eager eyes crawling over her breasts and belly and woman's parts. No queen could expect to rule again after that. In gold and silk and emeralds, Cersei had been a queen, the next thing to a goddess. Naked, she was only human, an aging woman with stretch marks on her belly and teats that had begun to sag, as the shrews in the crowds had been glad to point out to their husbands and lovers. Better to live shamed than die proud, Sir Kevin told himself. My niece will make no further mischief, he promised Mace Tyrell. You have my word on that, my lord. Tyrell gave a grudging nod. As you say, my Margary prefers to be tried by the faith so the whole realm can bear witness to her innocence. If your daughter is as innocent as you'd have us believe, why must you have your army present when she faces her accusers? Sir Kevin might have asked. Soon, I hope, he said instead, before turning to Grand Maester Pycelle. Is there aught else? The Grand Maester consulted his papers. We should address the Rosby inheritance. Six claims have been put forth. We can settle Rosby at some later date. What else? Preparations should be made for Princess Myrcella. This is what comes of dealing with the Dornish, Mace Tyrell said. Surely a better match can be found for the girl? Such as your own son Willis, perhaps? Her disfigured by one Dornishman, him crippled by another? No doubt, Sir Kevin said. But we have enemies enough without offending Dorne. If Doran Martell were to join his strength to Connington's in support of this feigned dragon, things could go very ill for all of us. Mayhaps we can persuade our Dornish friends to deal with Lord Connington, Sir Harris Swift said with an irritating titter. That would save a deal of blood and trouble. It would, Sir Kevin said wearily. Time to put an end to this. Thank you, my lords. Let us convene again five days hence, after Cersei's trial. As you say, may the warrior lend strength to Sir Robert's arms. The words were grudging. The dip of the chin Mace Tyrell gave the Lord Regent the most cursory of bows. But it was something, and for that much Sir Kevin Lannister was grateful. Randall Tarley left the hall with his liege lord, their green-cloaked spearmen right behind them. Tarley is the real danger, 
Sir Kevin reflected as he watched their departure. A narrow man, but iron-willed and shrewd, and as good a soldier as the Reach could boast. But how do I win him to our side? Lord Tyrell loves me not, Grand Maester Pycell said in gloomy tones when the hand had departed. This matter of the moon tea. I would never have spoken of such, but the Queen Dowager commanded me. If it pleased the Lord Regent, I would sleep more soundly if you could lend me some of your guards. Lord Tyrell might take that amiss. Sir Harris Swift tugged at his chin-beard. I am in need of guards myself. These are perilous times. I thought Kevin Lannister, and Pycell is not the only council member our hand would like to replace. Mace Tyrell had his own candidate for Lord Treasurer, his uncle, Lord Seneschal of Highgarden, whom men called Garth the Gross. The last thing I need is another Tyrell on the small council. He was already outnumbered. Sir Harris was his wife's father, and Pycelle could be counted upon as well. But Tarly was sworn to Highgarden, as was Paxter Redwine, Lord Admiral and Master of Ships, presently sailing his fleet around Dorne to deal with Euron Greyjoy's Iron Men. Once Redwine returned to King's Landing, the council would stand at three and three, Lannister and Tyrell. The seventh voice would be the Dornish woman now escorting Myrcella home. The Lady Nim. But no lady, if even half of what Kyburn reports is true. A bastard daughter of the Red Viper, near as notorious as her father and intent on claiming the council seat that Prince Oberyn himself had occupied so briefly. Sir Kevin had not yet seen fit to inform Mace Tyrell of her coming. The hand, he knew, would not be pleased. The man we need is Littlefinger. Peter Baelish had a gift for conjuring dragons from the air. Hire the mountains, men, Sir Kevin suggested. Red Ronnet will have no further use for them. He did not think that Mace Tyrell would be so clumsy as to try to murder either Pycell or Swift, but if guards made them feel safer, let them have guards. The three men walked together from the throne room. Outside, the snow was swirling round the outer ward, a caged beast howling to be free. Have you ever felt such cold? asked Sir Harris. The time to speak of the cold, said Grand Maester Pycelle, is not when we are standing out in it. He made his slow way across the outer ward, back to his chambers. The others lingered for a moment on the throne room steps. I put no faith in these Mirish bankers, Sir Kevin told his good father. You had best prepare to go to Bravos. Sir Harris did not look happy at the prospect. If I must. But I say again, this trouble is not of my doing. No, it was Cersei who decided that the Iron Bank would wait for their due. Should I send her to Bravos? Sir Harris blinked. Her Grace, that... that... Sir Kevin rescued him. That was a jape. A bad one. Go and find a warm fire. I mean to do the same. He yanked his gloves on and set off across the yard, leaning hard into the wind as his cloak snapped and swirled behind him. The dry moat surrounding Magor's holdfast was three feet deep in snow, the iron spikes that lined it glistening with frost. The only way in or out of Magor's was across the drawbridge that spanned that moat. A knight of the Kingsguard was always posted at its far end. Tonight the duty had fallen to Sir Marin Trant. With Balon Swan hunting the rogue knight Darkstar down in Dorne, Loras Tyrell gravely wounded on Dragonstone, and Jame vanished in the Riverlands, only four of the White Swords remained in King's Landing, and Sir Kevin had thrown Osmond Kettleblack and his brother Osfrid into the dungeon within hours of Cersei's confessing that she had taken both men as lovers. That left only Trant, the feeble Boros Blount, and Kyburn's mute monster Robert Strong to protect the young king and royal family. I will need to find some new swords for the king's guard. Tommen should have seven good knights about him. In the past, the king's guard had served for life, but that had not stopped Joffrey from dismissing Sir Barrist and Selmy to make a place for his dog, Sandor Clegane. Kevin could make use of that precedent. I could put Lancel in a white cloak, he reflected. There is more honor in that than he will ever find in the warrior's sons. 
Kevin Lannister hung his snow-sodden cloak inside his solar, pulled off his boots, and commanded his serving man to fetch some fresh wood for his fire. A cup of mulled wine would go down well, he said as he settled by the hearth. See to it. The fire soon thawed him, and the wine warmed his insides nicely. It also made him sleepy, so he dare not drink another cup. His day was far from done. He had reports to read, letters to write, and supper with Cersei and the king. His niece had been subdued and submissive since her walk of atonement, thank the gods. The novices who attended her reported that she spent a third of her waking hours with her son, another third in prayer, and the rest in her tub. She was bathing four or five times a day, scrubbing herself with horsehair brushes and strong lye soap, as if she meant to scrape her skin off. She will never wash the stain away, no matter how hard she scrubs. Sir Kevin remembered the girl she once had been, so full of life and mischief. And when she'd flowered, ah, had there ever been a maid so sweet to look upon? If Eris had agreed to marry her to Rhaegar, how many deaths might have been avoided? Cersei could have given the prince the sons he wanted, lions with purple eyes and silver manes, and with such a wife, Rhaegar might never have looked twice at Lyanna Stark. The northern girl had a wild beauty, as he recalled, though however bright a torch might burn, it could never match the rising sun. But it did no good to brood on lost battles and roads not taken. That was a vice of old, dun men. Rhaegar had wed Elia of Dorne, Lyanna Stark had died, Robert Baratheon had taken Cersei to bride, and here they were. And tonight his own road would take him to his niece's chambers and face to face with Cersei. I have no reason to feel guilty, Sir Kevin told himself. Tywin would understand that, surely. It was his daughter who brought shame down on our name, not I. What I did, I did for the good of House Lannister. It was not as if his brother had never done the same. In their father's final years, after their mother's passing, their sire had taken the comely daughter of a candlemaker as mistress. It was not unknown for a widowed lord to keep a common girl as bedwarmer. But Lord Titus soon began seating the woman beside him in the hall, showering her with gifts and honors, even asking her views on matters of state. Within a year she was dismissing servants, ordering about his household knights, even speaking for his lordship when he was indisposed. She grew so influential that it was said about Lannisport that any man who wished for his petition to be heard should kneel before her and speak loudly to her lap, for Titus Lannister's ear was between his lady's legs. She had even taken to wearing their mother's jewels. Until the day their lord father's heart had burst in his chest as he was ascending a steep flight of steps to her bed, that is. All the self-seekers who had named themselves her friends and cultivated her favor had abandoned her quickly enough when Tywin had her stripped naked and paraded through Lannisport to the docks like a common whore. Though no man laid a hand on her, that walk spelled the end of her power. Surely Tywin would never have dreamed that same fate awaited his own golden daughter. It had to be, Sir Kevin muttered over the last of his wine. His high holiness had to be appeased. Tommen needed the faith behind him in the battles to come. And Cersei, the golden child, had grown into a vain, foolish, greedy woman. Left to rule, she would have ruined Tommen as she had Joffrey. Outside, the wind was rising, clawing at the shutters of his chamber. Sir Kevin pushed himself to his feet. Time to face the lioness in her den. We have pulled her claws. Jame, though. But no, he would not brood on that. He donned an old, well-worn doublet, in case his niece had a mind to throw another cup of wine in his face, but he left his sword belt hanging on the back of his chair. Only the knights of the King's Guard were permitted swords in Tommen's presence. Sir Boris Blount was in attendance on the boy king and his mother when Sir Kevin entered the royal chambers. Blount wore enameled scale, white cloak, and half-helm. He did not look well. Of late, Boros had grown notably heavier about the face and belly, and his color was not good. And he was leaning against the wall behind him, as if standing had become too great an effort for him. The meal was served by three novices, 
well-scrubbed girls of good birth between the ages of twelve and sixteen. In their soft white woolens, each seemed more innocent and unworldly than the last, yet the High Septon had insisted that no girl spend more than seven days in the Queen's service, lest Cersei corrupt her. They tended the Queen's wardrobe, drew her bath, poured her wine, changed her bedclothes of a morning. One shared the Queen's bed every night, to ascertain she had no other company. The other two slept in an adjoining chamber with the septa who looked over them. A tall stork of a girl with a pockmarked face escorted him into the royal presence. Cersei rose when he entered and kissed him lightly on the cheek. Dear uncle, it is so good of you to sup with us. The queen was dressed as modestly as any matron, in a dark brown gown that buttoned up to her throat, and a hooded green mantle that covered her shaved head. Before her walk she would have flaunted her baldness beneath a golden crown. Come, sit, she said. Will you have wine? A cup. He sat, still wary. A freckled novice filled their cups with hot spiced wine. Tommen tells me that Lord Tyrell intends to rebuild the Tower of the Hand, Cersei said. Sir Kevin nodded. The new tower will be twice as tall as the one you burned, he says. Cersei gave a throaty laugh. Long lances, tall towers. Is Lord Tyrell hinting at something? That made him smile. It is good that she still remembers how to laugh. When he asked if she had all that she required, the queen said, I am well served. The girls are sweet, and the good septas make certain that I say my prayers. But once my innocence is proved, it would please me if Tana Merriweather might attend me once again. She could bring her son to court. Tommen needs other boys about him, friends of noble birth. It was a modest request. Sir Kevin saw no reason why it should not be granted. He could foster the Merriweather boy himself, whilst Lady Tana accompanied Cersei back to Casterly Rock. I will send for her after the trial, he promised. Supper began with beef and barley soup, followed by a brace of quail and a roast pike near three feet long, with turnips, mushrooms, and plenty of hot bread and butter. Sir Boros tasted every dish that was set before the king. A humiliating duty for a knight of the king's guard, but perhaps all Blount was capable of these days, and wise after the way Tommen's brother had died. The king seemed happier than Kevin Lannister had seen him in a long time. From soup to sweet, Tommen burbled about the exploits of his kittens, whilst feeding them morsels of pike off his own royal plate. The bad cat was outside my window last night, he informed Kevin at one point. But Sir Pounce hissed at him and he ran off across the roofs. The bad cat? Sir Kevin said, amused. He is a sweet boy. An old black tomcat with a torn ear, Cersei told him. A filthy thing, and foul-tempered. He clawed Joff's hand once. She made a face. The cats keep the rats down, I know. But that one. He's been known to attack ravens in the rookery. I will ask the ratters to set a trap for him. Sir Kevin could not remember ever seeing his niece so quiet, so subdued, so demure. All for the good, he supposed. But it made him sad as well. Her fire is quenched, she who used to burn so bright. You have not asked about your brother, he said, as they were waiting for the cream cakes. Cream cakes were the king's favorite. Cersei lifted her chin, her green eyes shining in the candlelight. Jame, have you had word? None. Cersei, you may need to prepare yourself for. If he were dead, I would know it. We came into this world together, uncle. He would not go without me. She took a drink of wine. Tyrion can leave whenever he wishes. You have had no word of him either, I suppose. No one has tried to sell us a dwarf's head of late, no. She nodded. Uncle, may I ask you a question? Whatever you wish. Your wife. Do you mean to bring her to court? No. Dorna was a gentle soul, never comfortable but at home with friends and kin around her. 
She had done well by their children, dreamed of having grandchildren, prayed seven times a day, loved needlework and flowers. In King's Landing she would be as happy as one of Tommen's kittens in a pit of vipers. My lady wife mislikes travel. Lannisport is her place. It is a wise woman who knows her place. He did not like the sound of that. Say what you mean. I thought I did. Cersei held out her cup. The freckled girl filled it once again. The cream cakes appeared then, and the conversation took a lighter turn. Only after Tommen and his kittens were escorted off to the royal bedchamber by Ser Boros did their talk turn to the queen's trial. Osney's brothers will not stand by idly and watch him die, Cersei warned him. I did not expect that they would. I've had the both of them arrested. That seemed to take her aback. For what crime? Fornication with a queen. His High Holiness says that you confessed to bedding both of them. Had you forgotten? Her face reddened. No. What will you do with them? The wall, if they admit their guilt. If they deny it, they can face Sir Robert. Such men should never have been raised so high. Cersei lowered her head. I... I misjudged them. You misjudged a good many men, it seems. He might have said more, but the dark-haired novice with the round cheeks returned to say, My lord, my lady, I am sorry to intrude, but there is a boy below. Grand Maester Pycelle begs the favor of the Lord Regent's presence at once. Dark wings, dark words, Sir Kevin thought. Could Storm's End have fallen? Or might this be word from Bolton in the north? It might be news of Jame the queen said. There was only one way to know. Sir Kevin rose. Pray excuse me. Before he took his leave, he dropped to one knee and kissed his niece upon the hand. If her silent giant failed her, it might be the last kiss she would ever know. The messenger was a boy of eight or nine, so bundled up in fur he seemed a bear cub. Trant had kept him waiting out on the drawbridge rather than admit him into Magor's. Go find a fire, lad, Sir Kevin told him, pressing a penny into his hand. I know the way to the rookery well enough. The snow had finally stopped falling. Behind a veil of ragged clouds, a full moon floated fat and white as a snowball. The stars shone cold and distant. As Sir Kevin made his way across the inner ward, the castle seemed an alien place, where every keep and tower had grown icy teeth and all familiar paths had vanished beneath a white blanket. Once an icicle long as a spear fell to shatter by his feet. Autumn in King's Landing, he brooded. What must it be like up on the wall? The door was opened by a serving girl, a skinny thing in a fur-lined robe much too big for her. Sir Kevin stamped the snow off his boots, removed his cloak, tossed it to her. The Grand Maester is expecting me, he announced. The girl nodded, solemn and silent, and pointed to the steps. Pycelle's chambers were beneath the rookery, a spacious suite of rooms cluttered with racks of herbs and salves and potions and shelves jammed full of books and scrolls. Sir Kevin had always found them uncomfortably hot. Not tonight. Once past the chamber door, the chill was palpable. Black ash and dying embers were all that remained of the hearth fire. A few flickering candles cast pools of dim light here and there. The rest was shrouded in shadow, except beneath the open window, where a spray of ice crystals glittered in the moonlight, swirling in the wind. On the window seat a raven loitered, pale, huge, its feathers ruffled. It was the largest raven that Kevin Lannister had ever seen. Larger than any hunting hawk at Casterly Rock, larger than the largest owl. Blowing snow danced around it, and the moon painted it silver. Not silver. White. The bird is white. The white ravens of the citadel did not carry messages, as their dark cousins did. When they went forth from Old Town, it was for one purpose only, to herald a change of seasons. Winter, said Sir Kevin. The word made a white mist in the air. 
he turned away from the window. Then something slammed him in the chest between the ribs, hard as a giant's fist. It drove the breath from him and sent him lurching backwards. The white raven took to the air, its pale wings slapping him about the head. Sir Kevin half sat and half fell onto the window seat. What? Who? A quarrel was sunk almost to the fletching in his chest. No, no, that was how my brother died. Blood was seeping out around the shaft. By cell, he muttered, confused. Help me, I... Then he saw. Grand Maester Picel was seated at his table, his head pillowed on the great leather-bound tome before him. Sleeping, Kevin thought, until he blinked and saw the deep red gash in the old man's spotted skull and the blood pooled beneath his head, staining the pages of his book. All around his candle were bits of bone and brain, islands in a lake of melted wax. He wanted guards, Sir Kevin thought. I should have sent him guards. Could Cersei have been right all along? Was this his nephew's work? Tyrion? he called. Where? Far away, a half-familiar voice replied. He stood in a pool of shadow by a bookcase, plump, pale-faced, round-shouldered, clutching a crossbow in soft powdered hands. Silk slippers swaddled his feet. Varys? The eunuch set the crossbow down. Sir Kevin, forgive me if you can. I bear you no ill will. This was not done from malice. It was for the realm, for the children. I have children. I have a wife. Oh, Dorna. Pain washed over him. He closed his eyes, opened them again. There are, there are hundreds of Lannister guardsmen in this castle. But none in this room, thankfully. This pains me, my lord. You do not deserve to die alone on such a cold, dark night. There are many like you, good men in service to bad causes. But you were threatening to undo all the Queen's good work, to reconcile High Garden and Casterly Rock, bind the faith to your little king, unite the seven kingdoms under Tommen's rule. So? A gust of wind blew up. Sir Kevin shivered violently. Are you cold, my lord? asked Varys. Do forgive me. The Grand Maester befouled himself in dying, and the stink was so abominable that I thought I might choke. Sir Kevin tried to rise, but the strength had left him. He could not feel his legs. I thought the crossbow fitting. You shared so much with Lord Tywin, why not that? Your niece will think the Tyrells had you murdered, mayhaps with the connivance of the imp. The Tyrells will suspect her. Someone somewhere will find a way to blame the Dornishmen. Doubt, division, and mistrust will eat the very ground beneath your boy king, while Stagon raises his banner above Storm's End and the lords of the realm gather round him. Aegon. For a moment he did not understand. Then he remembered. A babe swaddled in a crimson cloak, the cloth stained with his blood and brains. Dead. He's dead. No. The eunuch's voice seemed deeper. He is here. Aegon has been shaped for rule since before he could walk. He has been trained in arms, as befits a knight to be, but that was not the end of his education. He reads and writes, he speaks several tongues, he has studied history and law and poetry. A septa has instructed him in the mysteries of the faith since he was old enough to understand them. He has lived with fisherfolk, worked with his hands, swum in rivers and mended nets, and learned to wash his own clothes at need. He can fish and cook and bind up a wound. He knows what it is like to be hungry, to be hunted, to be afraid. Tommen has been taught that kingship is his right. Aegon knows that kingship is his duty, that a king must put his people first and live and rule for them. Kevin Lannister tried to cry out, to his guards, his wife, his brother, but the words would not come. Blood dribbled from his mouth. He shuddered violently. I am sorry. Varys wrung his hands. You are suffering, I know, yet here I stand going on like some silly old woman. Time to make an end to it. 
The eunuch pursed his lips and gave a little whistle. Sir Kevin was cold as ice, and every labored breath sent a fresh stab of pain through him. He glimpsed movement, heard the soft scuffling sound of slippered feet on stone. A child emerged from a pool of darkness, a pale boy in a ragged robe, no more than nine or ten. Another rose up behind the Grand Maester's chair. The girl who had opened the door for him was there as well. They were all around him, half a dozen of them, white-faced children with dark eyes, boys and girls together. And in their hands, the daggers. Westeros The Boy King Tommen Baratheon, the first of his name, King of the Andals, the Roinar, and the First Men, Lord of the Seven Kingdoms, a boy of eight years. His wife, Queen Margery of House Tyrell, thrice wed, twice widowed, accused of high treason, held captive in the great sept of Baelor. Her lady companions and cousins, Mega, Alla, and Eleanor Tyrell, accused of fornications. Eleanor's betrothed, Alan Ambrose, squire. His mother, Cersei of House Lannister, Queen Dowager, Lady of Casterly Rock, accused of high treason, captive in the great sept of Baelor. His siblings. His elder brother, King Joffrey I Baratheon, poisoned during his wedding feast. His elder sister, Princess Myrcella Baratheon, a girl of nine, a ward of Prince Doran Martell at Sunspear, betrothed to his son Tristain. His kittens, Ser Pounce, Lady Whiskers, Boots. His uncles, Ser James Lannister, called the Kingslayer, twin to Queen Cersei, Lord Commander of the Kingsguard. Tyrion Lannister, called the Imp, a dwarf, accused and condemned for regicide and kinslaying. His other kin, his grandfather, Tywin Lannister, Lord of Casterly Rock, Warden of the West, Hand of the King, murdered in the privy by his son Tyrion. His great uncle, Sir Kevin Lannister, Lord Regent and Protector of the Realm, married Dornis Swift. Their children, Sir Lancel Lannister, a knight of the Holy Order of the Warrior's Sons, Willem, twin to Martin, murdered at River Run, Martin, twin to Willem, a squire, Janae, a girl of three. His great aunt, Genna Lannister, married Sir Emmon Frey. Their children, Sir Cleos Frey, killed by outlaws, his son, Sir Tywin Frey, called Ty, his son, Willem Frey, a squire, Sir Lionel Frey, Lady Genna's second son, Tyon Frey, a squire, murdered at River Run, Walder Frey, called Red Walder, a page at Casterly Rock. His great-uncle, Sir Tygett Lannister, married Darlessa Marbrand. Their children, Tyrek Lannister, a squire, vanished during the food riots in King's Landing. Lady Ermisand Hayford, Tyrek's child wife. His great-uncle, Garion Lannister, lost at sea. Joy Hill, his bastard daughter. King Tommen's Small Council Sir Kevin Lannister, Lord Regent Lord Mace Tyrell, Hand of the King Grand Maester Pycelle, Counselor and Healer Sir James Lannister, Lord Commander of the Kingsguard Lord Paxter Redwine, Grand Admiral and Master of Ships Kyburn, a disgraced maester and reputed necromancer, Master of Whisperers Queen Cersei's former small council, Lord Giles Rosby, Lord Treasurer and Master of Coin, dead of a cough, Lord Orton Merriweather, Justiciar and Master of Laws, fled to Long Table upon Queen Cersei's arrest, Orain Waters, the bastard of Driftmark, Grand Admiral and Master of Ships, fled to sea with the royal fleet upon Queen Cersei's arrest. King Tommen's Kingsguard, Sir Jane Lannister, Lord Commander, Sir Marin Trant, Sir Boros Blount, removed and thence restored, Sir Balan Swan, in Dorne with Princess Myrcella, Sir Osmond Kettleblack, Sir Loras Tyrell, 
The Night of Flowers, Sir Eris Oakheart, Dead in Dorn. Tommen's Court at King's Landing, Moon Boy, The Royal Jester and Fool, Pate, A Lad of Eight, King Tommen's Whipping Boy, Ormond of Old Town, the Royal Harper and Bard, Sir Osfred Kettleblack, brother to Sir Osmond and Sir Osney, a captain in the city watch, Noho Dimitis, envoy from the Iron Bank of Bravos, Sir Gregor Clegane, called the Mountain that Rides, dead of a poisoned wound, Renifer Longwaters, chief underjailer of the Red Keep's dungeons, Queen Margaery's alleged lovers. Watt, a singer styling himself the Blue Bard, a captive driven mad by torment. Hamish the Harper, an aged singer, died a captive. Sir Mark Mullendor, who lost a monkey and half an arm in the Battle of the Blackwater. Sir Talad, called the Tall. Sir Lambert Turnberry, Sir Bayard Norcross, Sir Hugh Clifton. Jalabark So, Prince of the Red Flower Vale an exile from the Summer Isles. Sir Horace Redwine, found innocent and freed. Sir Haber Redwine, found innocent and freed. Queen Cersei's chief accuser. Sir Osney Kettleblack, brother to Sir Osmond and Sir Osfred, held captive by the Faith. The People of the Faith. The High Septon, father of the faithful, voice of the seven on earth, an old man and frail. Septa Anella, Septa Moel, Septa Scolora, the Queen's Jailers. Septon Torbert, Septon Reynard, Septon Lucian, Septon Olidor, of the Most Devout. Septa Aglantine, Septa Hellicent, serving the Seven at the Great Sept of Baylor. Sir Theodan Wells, called Theodan the True, pious commander of the Warrior's Sons. The Sparrows, the humblest of men, fierce in their piety. People of King's Landing Chatea, proprietor of an expensive brothel. Alayaya, her daughter. Dancy, Marais, two of Chatea's girls. Tobo Mott, a master armorer. Lords of the Crownlands, sworn to the Iron Throne. Renfred Ricker, Lord of Duskendale. Sir Rufus Leek, a one-legged knight in his service. Castellan of the Dun Fort at Duskendale. Tanda Stokeworth, Lady of Stokeworth, died of a broken hip. Her eldest daughter, Felice, died screaming in the black cells. Sir Balman Birch, Lady Felice's husband, killed in a joust. Her younger daughter, Lawless, weak of wit, Lady of Stokeworth. Her newborn son, Tyrion Tanner, of the Hundred Fathers. Her husband, Sir Bronn of the Blackwater, Sellsword turned knight. Maester Franken, in service at Stokeworth. King Tommen's banner shows the crowned stag of Baratheon, black on gold, and the lion of Lannister, gold on crimson, combatant. The King at the Wall Stannis Baratheon, the first of his name, second son of Lord Stefan Baratheon and Lady Cassana of House Estermont, Lord of Dragonstone, styling himself King of Westeros. With King Stannis at Castle Black. Lady Melisandre of Ashai, called the Red Woman, a priestess of Rahalor, the Lord of Light. His knights and sworn swords. Sir Richard Horp, his second in command. Sir Godfrey Faring, called Giant Slayer. Sir Justin Massey. Lord Robin Peasbury. Lord Harwood Fell. Sir Clayton Suggs, Sir Corliss Penny, Queen's men and fervent followers of the Lord of Light. Sir William Foxglove, Sir Humphrey Clifton, Sir Ormond Wilde, Sir Harris Cobb, Knights. His squires, Devon Seaworth and Brian Faring. His captive, Mance Raider, King Beyond the Wall. Raider's infant son, the Wildling Prince. The boy's wet nurse, Gilly, a Wildling girl. Gilly's infant son, the Abomination, fathered by her father, Craster. At East Watch by the Sea, Queen Celise of House Florent, his wife, Princess Shireen, their daughter, a girl of eleven, 
Patchface, Shireen's tattooed fool. Her uncle, Sir Axel Florent, foremost of the Queen's men, styling himself the Queen's hand. Her knights and sworn swords, Sir Norbert Grandison, Sir Benethon Scales, Sir Patrick of King's Mountain, Sir Dordan the Dower, Sir Malagorn of Redpool, Sir Lambert Whitewater, Sir Perkin Follard, Sir Bruss Buckler. Sir Davos Seaworth, Lord of the Rainwood, Admiral of the Narrow Sea, and Hand of the King, called the Onion Knight. Saladar San of Lys, a pirate and cell sail, master of the Valyrian and a fleet of galleys. Tycho Nestoris, emissary from the Iron Bank of Bravos. Stannis has taken for his banner the fiery heart of the Lord of Light, a red heart surrounded by orange flames upon a yellow field. Within the heart is the crowned stag of House Baratheon in black. King of the Isles and the North The Great Joys of Pike claim descent from the Grey King of the Age of Heroes. Legend says the Grey King ruled the sea itself and took a mermaid to wife. Aegon the Dragon ended the line of the last king of the Iron Islands, but allowed the Ironborn to revive their ancient custom and choose who should have primacy among them. They chose Lord Vicken Greyjoy of Pike. The Greyjoy sigil is a golden kraken upon a black field. Their words are, We do not sow. Euron Greyjoy, the third of his name since the Grey King, King of the Iron Islands and the North, King of Salt and Rock, Son of the Sea Wind, and Lord Reaper of Pike, Captain of the Silence, called Crow's Eye. His elder brother, Balon, King of the Iron Islands and the North, the ninth of his name since the Grey King, killed in a fall. Lady Alanis, of House Harlaw, Balon's widow. Their children, Roderick, slain during Balon's first rebellion. Marin, slain during Balon's first rebellion. Asha, captain of the Black Wind and conqueror of Deepwood Mott, married Eric Ironmaker. Theon, called by Northmen Theon Turncloak, a captive at the Dreadfort. His younger brother, Victarion, Lord Captain of the Iron Fleet, Master of the Iron Victory. His youngest brother, Aaron, called Damfair, a priest of the Drowned God. His captains and sworn swords. Torwald Browntooth, Pinchface John Meyer, Roderick Freeborn, the Red Oarsman, Left Hand Lucas Cod, Quellen Humble, Harren Half Hor, Kemet Pike the Bastard, Carl the Thrall, Stonehand, Ralph the Shepherd, Ralph of Lordsport. His crewmen, Cregorn, who blew the Hellhorn and died. His Lord's Bannermen, Eric Ironmaker, called Eric Anvilbreaker and Eric the Just, Lord Steward of the Iron Islands, Castellan of Pike, an old man once renowned, married Asha Greyjoy. Lords of Pike, Garmund Botley, Lord of Lordsport, Walden Winch, Lord of Iron Holt. Lords of Old Wick. Dunstan Drum, the Drum, Lord of Old Wick. Norn Goodbrother of Shatterstone, the Stone House. Lords of Great Wick. Gorald Goodbrother, Lord of the Hammerhorn. Tristan Farwind, Lord of Sealskin Point, the Spar. Meldred Merlin, Lord of Pembleton. Lords of Orkmont. Alan Orkwood, called Orkwood of Orkmont, Lord Balan Tawny, Lords of Saltcliffe, Lord Donner Saltcliffe, Lord Sunderley, Lords of Harlaw, Roderick Harlaw, called the Reader, Lord of Harlaw, Lord of Ten Towers, Harlaw of Harlaw, Sigfred Harlaw, called Sigfred Silverhair, his great uncle, Master of Harlaw Hall, Hotho Harlaw, called Hotho Humpback, of the Tower of Glimmering, a cousin. Bormund Harlaw, called Bormund the Blue, master of Harridan Hill, a cousin. Lords of the Lesser Isles and Rocks. Gilbert Farwind, Lord of the Lonely Light. The Ironborn Conquerors, on the Shield Islands. Andric the Unsmiling, Lord of South Shield. Newt the Barber, Lord of Oaken Shield. Marin Volmark, Lord of Green Shield. Sir Harris Harlaw, Lord of Greyshield, 
The Knight of Grey Gardens. Atmot Kalin, Ralph Kenning, Castellan and Commander. Adrek Humble, Short Half an Arm. Dagon Cod, Who Yields to No Man. At Torhen Square, Dagmar, called Cleftjaw, Captain of Foam Drinker. At Deepwood Mott, Asha Greyjoy, the Kraken's daughter, Captain of the Black Wind. Her lover, Carl the Maid, a swordsman. Her former lover, Christopher Botley, heir to Lordsport, dispossessed of his lands. Her crewmen, Rogan Rustbeard, Grimtongue, Rolf the Dwarf, Lauren Longaxe, Rook, Fingers, Six-Toed Harl, Drupai Dale, Earl Harlaw, Crom, Hagen the Horn, and his beautiful red-haired daughter. Her cousin, Quentin Greyjoy. Her cousin, Dagon Greyjoy, called Dagon the Drunkard. Other Houses Great and Small House Arryn The Arryns are descended from the kings of mountain and vale. Their sigil is a white moon and falcon upon a sky-blue field. House Arryn has taken no part in the War of the Five Kings. Robert Arryn, Lord of the Airy, Defender of the Vale, a sickly boy of eight years, called Sweet Robin. His mother, Lady Lysa of House Tully, widow of Lord John Arryn, pushed from the moon door to her death. His guardian, Peter Baelish, called Littlefinger, Lord of Harrenhal, Lord Paramount of the Trident, and Lord Protector of the Vale. Elaine Stone, Lord Peter's natural daughter, a maid of three and ten, actually Sansa Stark. Sir Lothor Brune, a sellsword in Lord Peter's service, captain of the guards at the Airy. Oswell, a grizzled man-at-arms in Lord Peter's service, sometimes called Kettle Black. Sir Shadrick of the Shady Glen, called the Mad Mouse, a hedge knight in Lord Peter's service. Sir Byron the Beautiful, Sir Morgarth the Merry, hedge knights in Lord Peter's service. His household and retainers. Maester Coleman, counselor, healer, and tutor. Mord, a brutal jailer with teeth of gold. Gretchel, Maddie, and Mila, serving women. His bannermen, the lords of Mountain and Vale. Yon Royce, called Bronze Yon, Lord of Runestone, his son, Ser Andar, heir to Runestone. Lord Nestor Royce, High Steward of the Vale and Castellan of the Gates of the Moon. His son and heir, Ser Albar. His daughter, Miranda, called Randa, a widow but scarce used. Maya Stone, bastard daughter of King Robert. Lionel Corbray, Lord of Hearts Home. Ser Lynn Corbray, his brother, who wields the famed blade Lady Forlorn. Sir Lucas Corbray, his younger brother. Tristan Sunderland, Lord of the Three Sisters. Godric Borrell, Lord of Sweet Sister. Roland Longthorpe, Lord of Long Sister. Alessandro Torrent, Lord of Little Sister. Anya Wainwood, Lady of Iron Oaks Castle. Sir Morton, her eldest son and heir. Sir Donal, the Knight of the Bloody Gate. Wallace, her youngest son. Harold Harding, her ward, a squire oft called Harry the Heir. Sir Simon Templeton, the Knight of Nine Stars. John Linderley, Lord of the Snakewood. Edmund Waxley, the Knight of Wickenden. Gerald Grafton, the Lord of Gulltown. Eon Hunter, Lord of Longbow Hall, recently deceased. Sir Gilwood, Lord Eon's eldest son and heir, now called Young Lord Hunter. Sir Eustace, Lord Eon's second son. Sir Harlan, Lord Eon's youngest son. Young Lord Hunter's household. Maester Williman, counselor, healer, tutor. Horton Redfort, Lord of Redfort, thrice wed. Sir Jasper, Sir Creighton, Sir John, his sons. Sir Michael, his youngest son, a new-made knight, married Isilla Royce of Runestone. Benadar Belmore. Lord of Strong Song, Clan Chiefs from the Mountains of the Moon, Shaga, son of Dolph, of the Stone Crows, presently leading a band in the Kingswood, Timot, son of Timot, of the Burned Men, Chella, daughter of Chake, of the Black Ears, Kron, son of Kalor, of the Moon Brothers, 
The Aaron words are as high as honor. House Baratheon The youngest of the great houses, House Baratheon was born during the Wars of Conquest when Oris Baratheon, rumored to be a bastard brother of Aegon the Conqueror, defeated and slew Argilac the Arrogant, the last Storm King. Aegon rewarded him with Argilac's castle, lands, and daughter. Oris took the girl to bride and adopted the banner, honors, and words of her line. In the 283rd year after Aegon's conquest, Robert of House Baratheon, Lord of Storm's End, overthrew the Mad King, Aenys II Targaryen, to win the Iron Throne. His claim to the crown derived from his grandmother, a daughter of King Aegon V Targaryen, though Robert preferred to say his warhammer was his claim. Robert Baratheon, the first of his name, King of the Andals, the Roinar, and the First Men, Lord of the Seven Kingdoms and Protector of the Realm, killed by a boar. His wife, Queen Cersei of House Lannister. Their children. King Joffrey Baratheon, the first of his name, murdered at his wedding feast. Princess Myrcella, a ward in Sunspear, betrothed to Prince Tristane Martell. King Tommen Baratheon, the first of his name. His brothers. Stannis Baratheon, rebel lord of Dragonstone and pretender to the Iron Throne. His daughter Shireen, a girl of eleven. Renly Baratheon, rebel lord of Storm's End and pretender to the Iron Throne, murdered at Storm's End in the midst of his army. His bastard children. Maya Stone, a maid of nineteen, in the service of Lord Nestor Royce of the Gates of the Moon. Gendry, an outlaw in the Riverlands, ignorant of his heritage. Edric Storm, his acknowledged bastard son by Lady Delina of House Florent, hiding in Lys. Sir Andrew Estermont, his cousin and guardian. His guards and protectors. Sir Gerald Gower, Lewis, called the Fishwife. Sir Tristan of Tally Hill, Omer Blackberry. Barra, his bastard daughter by a whore of King's Landing, killed by the command of his widow. His other kin, his great uncle, Sir Eldon Estermont, Lord of Greenstone, his cousin, Sir Eamon Estermont, Eldon's son, his cousin, Sir Alan Estermont, Eamon's son, his cousin, Sir Lomas Estermont, Eldon's son, his cousin, Sir Andrew Estermont, Lomas's son. Bannermen sworn to Storm's End, the Storm Lords. Davos Seaworth, Lord of the Rainwood, Admiral of the Narrow Sea, and Hand of the King. His wife, Maria, a carpenter's daughter. Their sons, Dale, Allard, Mathos, Marrick, killed in the Battle of the Blackwater. Their son, Devon, squire to King Stannis. Their sons, Stannis and Stefan. Sir Gilbert Faring, Castellan of Storm's End. His son, Brian, squire to King Stannis. His cousin, Sir Godry Faring, called Giant Slayer. Elwood Meadows, Lord of Grassfield Keep, Seneschal at Storm's End. Selwyn Tarth, called the Even Star, Lord of Tarth. His daughter, Brienne, the Maid of Tarth, also called Brienne the Beauty. Her squire, Podrick Payne, a boy of ten. Sir Ronnet Connington, called Red Ronnet, the Knight of Griffin's Roost. His younger siblings, Raymond and Alan, his bastard son, Ronald Storm. His cousin, John Connington, once Lord of Storm's End and Hand of the King, exiled by Aerys II Targaryen, believed dead of drink. Lester Morrigan, Lord of Crow's Nest. His brother and heir, Sir Richard Morrigan. His brother, Sir Guyard Morrigan, called Guyard the Green, slain in the Battle of the Blackwater. Arsten Selmy, Lord of Harvest Hall his great-uncle, Sir Barristan Selmy, Caspar Wilde, Lord of the Rainhouse, his uncle, Sir Ormond Wilde, an aged knight, Harwood Fell, Lord of Fellwood, Hugh Grandison, called Greybeard, Lord of Grandview, Sebastian Errol, Lord of Haystack Hall, Clifford Swan, Lord of Stonehelm, Barrack Dondarrion, Lord of Blackwater, called the Lightning Lord, an outlaw in the Riverlands, oft slain and now thought dead. Bryce Caron, Lord of Nightsong, 
slain by Sir Philip Foote on the Blackwater. His slayer, Sir Philip Foote, a one-eyed knight, lord of Nightsong. His base-born half-brother, Sir Roland Storm, called the Bastard of Nightsong, pretender lord of Nightsong. Robin Peasbury, lord of Pottingfield. Mary Mertens, lady of Mistwood. Ralph Buckler, lord of Bronzegate. His cousin, Sir Bruss Buckler. The Baratheon sigil is a crowned stag, black, on a golden field. Their words are, Ours is the Fury. House Frey The Freys are bannermen to House Tully, but have not always been diligent in their duty. At the outset of the War of the Five Kings, Rob Stark won Lord Walder's allegiance by pledging to marry one of his daughters or granddaughters. When he wed Lady Jane Westerling instead, the Freys conspired with Roose Bolton and murdered the young wolf and his followers at what became known as the Red Wedding. Walder Frey, Lord of the Crossing By his first wife, Lady Para of House Royce, Sir Steverin Frey died after the Battle of Oxcross, Sir Emmon Frey, his second son, Sir Aeneas Frey, leading the Frey forces in the north, Aeneas's son Aegon Bloodborne, an outlaw, Aeneas's son Rhaegar, an envoy to White Harbor. Perian, his eldest daughter, married Sir Leslin Hay. By his second wife, Lady Sirena of House Swan. Sir Jared Frey, an envoy to White Harbor. Septon Lucian, his fifth son. By his third wife, Lady Amore of House Craighall. Sir Hostine Frey, a knight of great repute. Lyenth, his second daughter married Lord Lucius Viprin. Simon Frey, his seventh son, a counter of coins, an envoy to White Harbor. Sir Danwell Frey, his eighth son. Merritt Frey, his ninth son, hanged at Oldstones. Merritt's daughter, Walda, called Fat Walda, married Roos Bolton, Lord of the Dreadfort. Merritt's son, Walder, called Little Walder, eight, a squire in service to Ramsay Bolton. Sir Jeremy Frey, his tenth son, drowned. Sir Raymond Frey, his eleventh son. By his fourth wife, Lady Alyssa of House Blackwood. Lothar Frey, his twelfth son, called Lame Lothar. Sir Jamos Frey, his thirteenth son. Jamos's son, Walder, called Big Walder, eight, a squire in service to Ramsay Bolton. Sir Waylon Frey, his fourteenth son. Moria, his third daughter married Sir Flement Brax. Tita, his fourth daughter, called Tita the Maid. By his fifth wife, Lady Saria of House Went, no progeny. By his sixth wife, Lady Bethany of House Rosby. Sir Perwin Frey, his Walder's fifteenth son. Sir Benfrey Frey, his Walder's sixteenth son, died of a wound received at the Red Wedding. Maester Williman, his seventeenth son, in service at Longbow Hall. Olivar Frey, his eighteenth son, once a squire to Rob Stark. Roslyn, his fifth daughter, married Lord Edmure Tully at the Red Wedding, pregnant with his child. By his seventh wife, Lady Anara of House Faring. Arwen, his sixth daughter, a maid of fourteen. Wendell, his nineteenth son, a page at Seaguard. Colmar, his twentieth son, Eleven and promised to the faith. Walter, called Tyr, his twenty first son, ten. Elmar, his twenty second and last born son, a boy of nine, briefly betrothed to Arya Stark. Shiray, his seventh daughter and youngest child, a girl of seven. His eighth wife, Lady Joyeuse of House Aranford, presently with child. Lord Walder's natural children by sundry mothers. Walder Rivers, called Bastard Walder, Maester Melwis, in service at Rosby, Jane Rivers, Martin Rivers, Riger Rivers, Ronal Rivers, Malara Rivers, others. House Lannister The Lannisters of Casterly Rock remain the principal support of King Tommen's claim to the Iron Throne. They boast of descent from Lan the Clever, the legendary trickster of the Age of Heroes. 
the gold of Casterly Rock and the Golden Tooth has made them the wealthiest of the great houses. The Lannister sigil is a golden lion upon a crimson field. Their words are, Hear me roar. Tywin Lannister, Lord of Casterly Rock, Shield of Lannisport, Warden of the West, and Hand of the King, murdered by his dwarf son in his privy. Lord Tywin's Children Cersei, twin to Jaime, widow of King Robert I Baratheon, a prisoner at the Great Sept of Baelor. Ser Jaime, twin to Cersei, called the Kingslayer, Lord Commander of the Kingsguard. His squires, Josmond Peckledon, Garrett Page, Lou Piper. Ser Eilin Payne, a tongueless knight, lately the King's Justice and Headsman. Ser Ronnet Connington, called Red Ronnet, the Knight of Griffin's Roost, sent to Maidenpool with a prisoner. Ser Adam Marbrand, Sir Flemont Brax, Sir Alan Stackspear, Sir Stephen Swift, Sir Humphrey Swift, Sir Lyle Craighall, called Strongbore, Sir John Betley, called Beardless John, Knights serving with Sir James Host at River Run. Tyrion, called the Imp, Dwarf and Kinslayer, a fugitive in exile across the Narrow Sea. The Household at Casterly Rock Maester Craylin healer, tutor, and counselor, Vilar, captain of guards, Sir Benedict Broom, master at arms, White Smile Watt, a singer. Lord Tywin's siblings and their offspring, Sir Kevin Lannister, married Dorna of House Swift, Lady Genna, married Sir Emmon Frey, now Lord of Riverrun, Genna's eldest son, Sir Cleos Frey, married Jane of House Derry, killed by outlaws, Cleos's eldest son, Sir Tywin Frey, called Ty, now heir to River Run. Cleos's second son, Willem Frey, a squire. Gena's younger sons, Sir Lionel Frey, Tyon Frey, Walder Frey, called Red Walder. Sir Tyget Lannister, died of a pox. Tyrek, Tyget's son, missing and feared dead. Lady Ermisand Hayford, Tyrek's child wife. Garion Lannister, lost at sea. Joy Hill, Garion's bastard daughter, eleven. Lord Tywin's other close kin. Sir Stafford Lannister, a cousin and brother to Lord Tywin's wife, slain in battle at Oxcross. Serena and Miriel, Stafford's daughters. Sir Davin Lannister, Stafford's son. Sir Damien Lannister, a cousin, married Lady Shiera Craighall their son, Sir Lucian, their daughter, Lana, married Lord Antario Jast, Lady Margot, a cousin, married Lord Titus Peak. Bannermen and Sworn Swords, Lords of the West, Damon Marbrand, Lord of Ashmark, Roland Craighall, Lord of Craighall, Sebastian Farman, Lord of Fair Isle, Titus Brax, Lord of Hornvale, Quentin Bainfort, Lord of Bainfort, Sir Harris Swift, good father to Sir Kevin Lannister, Reginard Estrin, Lord of Windhall, Gawain Westerling, Lord of the Crag, Lord Selman Stackspear, Terence Kenning, Lord of Case, Lord Antario Jast, Lord Robin Morland, Lady Alisanne Lefford, Louis Lydon, Lord of the Deep Den, Lord Philip Plum, Lord Garrison Prester, Sir Laurent Lorch, a landed knight, Sir Garth Greenfield, a landed knight, Sir Lyman Vickery, a landed knight, Sir Reynard Rudiger, a landed knight, Sir Manfred Yu, a landed knight, Sir Tybalt Heatherspoon, a landed knight. House Martell Dorne was the last of the Seven Kingdoms to swear fealty to the Iron Throne. Blood, custom, geography, and history all helped to set the Dornish men apart from the other kingdoms. At the outbreak of the War of the Five Kings, Dorne took no part, but when Marcella Baratheon was betrothed to Prince Tristane, Sunspear declared its support for King Joffrey. The Martell banner is a red sun pierced by a golden spear. Their words are unbowed, unbent, unbroken. Doran Nymeros Martell, Lord of Sunspear, Prince of Dorne. His wife, Malario, 
of the free city of Norvos. Their children, Princess Ariane, heir to Sunspear, Prince Quentin, a new-made knight, fostered at Ironwood, Prince Tristane, betrothed to Marcella Baratheon, Ser Gascoigne of the Greenblood, his sworn shield. His siblings. Princess Elia, raped and murdered during the sack of King's Landing. Her daughter, Rhaenys Targaryen, murdered during the sack of King's Landing. Her son, Aegon Targaryen, a babe at the breast, murdered during the sack of King's Landing. Prince Oberyn, called the Red Viper, slain by Ser Gregor Clegane during a trial by combat. His paramour, Elaria Sand, natural daughter of Lord Harmon Uller. His bastard daughters, the Sand Snakes. Obara, his daughter by an old town whore. Nymeria, called Lady Nim, his daughter by a noblewoman of Old Volantis. Tyene, his daughter by a Septa. Sorella, his daughter by a traitor captain from the Summer Isles. Elia, his daughter by Ilaria Sand. Obella, his daughter by Ilaria Sand. Doria, his daughter by Elaria Sand. Loriza, his daughter by Elaria Sand. Prince Doran's court. At the Water Gardens. Ario Hota, of Norvos, captain of guards. Maester Caliot, counselor, healer, and tutor. At Sunspear. Maester Miles, counselor, healer, and tutor. Ricasso, Seneschal, old and blind. Ser Manfrey Martel, Castellan at Sunspear. Lady Elise Ladybright, Lord Treasurer. His ward, Princess Marcella Baratheon, betrothed to Prince Tristane. Her sworn shield, Ser Aris Oakhart, slain by Ario Hota. Her bedmaid and companion, Rosamund Lannister, a distant cousin. His bannermen, the Lords of Dorne. Anders Ironwood, Lord of Ironwood, Warden of the Stone Way, the Blood Royal. Innis, his eldest daughter, married Ryan Illyrian. Sercletus, his son and heir. Gwyneth, his youngest daughter, a girl of twelve. Harmon Uller, Lord of Hellholt. Dilan Illyrian, Lady of God's Grace. Ryan Illyrian, her son and heir. Dagos Manwoody, Lord of Kingsgrave. Lara Blackmont, Lady of Blackmont. Mimela Toland, Lady of Ghost Hill. Quentin Corgyle, Lord of Sandstone. Ser Dzeel Dalt, the Knight of Lemonwood. Franklin Fowler, Lord of Skyreach, called the Old Hawk, the Warden of the Prince's Pass. Ser Simon Santagar, the Knight of Spotswood. Edric Dane, Lord of Starfall, a squire. Trevor Jordane, Lord of the Tor. Tremond Gargalen, Lord of Salt Shore. Daron Vaith, Lord of the Red Dunes. House Stark The Starks trace their descent from Brandon the Builder and the Kings of Winter. For thousands of years they ruled from Winterfell as kings in the north, until Torhen Stark, the king who knelt, chose to swear fealty to Aegon the Dragon rather than give battle. When Lord Eddard Stark of Winterfell was executed by King Joffrey, the Northmen forswore their loyalty to the Iron Throne and proclaimed Lord Eddard's son Rob as king in the north. During the War of the Five Kings, he won every battle, but was betrayed and murdered by the Freys and Boltons at the Twins during his uncle's wedding. Rob Stark, King in the North, King of the Trident, Lord of Winterfell, called the Young Wolf, murdered at the Red Wedding. Grey Wind, his direwolf, killed at the Red Wedding. His trueborn siblings. Sansa, his sister, married Tyrion of House Lannister. Lady, her direwolf, killed at Castle Darry. Arya, a girl of eleven, missing and thought dead. Nymeria, her direwolf, prowling the riverlands. Brandon, called Bran, a crippled boy of nine, heir to Winterfell, believed dead. Summer, his direwolf. Rickon, a boy of four, believed dead. Shaggy Dog, his direwolf, black and savage. Osha, a wildling woman once captive at Winterfell. His bastard half-brother, Jon Snow of the Night's Watch. Ghost, Jon's direwolf, white and silent. His other kin. 
His uncle, Benjen Stark, first ranger of the Night's Watch, lost beyond the wall, presumed dead. His aunt, Lissa Aaron, Lady of the Airy. Her son, Robert Aaron, Lord of the Airy and Defender of the Vale, a sickly boy. His uncle, Edmure Tully, Lord of Riverrun, taken captive at the Red Wedding. Lady Rosalind, of House Frey, Edmure's bride, great with child. His great uncle, Sir Brynden Tully, called the Blackfish, lately Castellan of Riverrun, now a hunted man. Bannermen of Winterfell, the Lords of the North. John Umber, called the Great John, Lord of the Last Hearth, a captive at the Twins. John, called the Small John, the Great John's eldest son and heir, slain at the Red Wedding. Morse, called Crow Food, uncle to the Great John, Castellan at the Last Hearth. Hawther, called Horsebane, uncle to the Great John, likewise Castellan at the Last Hearth. Clay Serwin, Lord of Serwin, killed at Winterfell. John L., his sister, a maid of two and thirty. Roose Bolton, Lord of the Dreadfort. Domeric, his heir, died of a bad belly. Walton, called Steelshanks, his captain. Ramsay Bolton, his natural son, called the Bastard of Bolton, Lord of the Hornwood. Walder Frey and Walder Frey, called Big Walder and Little Walder, Ramsay's squires. Ben Bones, kennelmaster at the Dreadfort. Reek, a man-at-arms infamous for his stench, slain while posing as Ramsay. The Bastard's Boys, Ramsay's men-at-arms. Yellow Dick, Damon Dance for Me, Luton, Sour Allen, Skinner, Grunt. Rickard Carstark, Lord of Carhold, beheaded by the young wolf for murdering prisoners. Eddard, his son, slain in the Whispering Wood. Torhen, his son, slain in the Whispering Wood. Harion, his son, a captive at Maidenpool. Alice, his daughter, a maid of fifteen. His uncle Arnulf, Castellan of Carhold. Cregan, Arnulf's elder son. Arthur, Arnulf's younger son. Wyman Manderley, Lord of White Harbor, vastly fat. Sir Wylas Manderley, his eldest son and heir, very fat, a captive at Harrenhal. Wylas's wife, Leona of House Woolfield. Winifred, their eldest daughter. Willa, their younger daughter. Sir Wendell Manderley, his second son, slain at the Red Wedding. Sir Marlon Manderley, his cousin, commander of the garrison at White Harbor. Maester Theomore, counselor, tutor, healer. Wex, a boy of twelve, once squire to Theon Greyjoy, mute. Sir Bartimus, an old knight, one-legged, one-eyed, and oft drunk, Castellan of the Wolf's Den. Garth, a jailer and headsman, his axe, Lady Lou. Therry, a young turnkey. Mage Mormont, Lady of Bear Island, the She-Bear. Daisy, her eldest daughter, slain at the Red Wedding. Alisane, her daughter, the young She-Bear. Lyra, Jorel, Lyanna, her younger daughters. Gior Mormont, her brother, Lord Commander of the Night's Watch, slain by own men. Ser Jorah Mormont, his son, an exile. Howland Reed, Lord of Greywater Watch, a uh, Cranogman. His wife, Gianna, of the Cranogmen. Their children, Mira, a young huntress. Jojen, a boy blessed with green sight. Galbart Glover, master of Deepwood Mott, unwed. Robert Glover, his brother and heir. Robert's wife, Cybele of House Locke. Benjicott Branch, noseless Ned Woods, men of the Wolfswood sworn to Deepwood Mott. Sir Helmand Tallhart, master of Torhen Square, slain at Duskendale. Benfred, his son and heir, slain by Iron Men on the Stony Shore. Adara, his daughter, captive at Torhen Square. Leobald, his brother, killed at Winterfell. Leobald's wife, Verena of House Hornwood, captive at Torhen Square. Their sons, Brandon and Baron, likewise captives at Torhen Square. Roderick Ricewell, Lord of the Rills. Barbara Dustin, his daughter, Lady of Barrowton, widow of Lord William Dustin. Harwood Stout, her liege man, 
a petty lord at Barrowton. Bethany Bolton, his daughter, second wife of Lord Roose Bolton, died of a fever. Roger Ricewell, Rickard Ricewell, Roose Ricewell, his quarrelsome cousins and bannermen. Lyessa Flint, Lady of Widow's Watch. Andrew Locke, Lord of Oldcastle, an old man. The Chiefs of the Mountain Clans. Hugo Wool, called Big Bucket, or the Wool. Brandon Norrie, called the Norrie. Brandon Norrie, the Younger, his son. Torin Little, called the Little. Duncan Little, his eldest son, called Big Little, a man of the Night's Watch. Morgan Little, his second son, called Middle Little. Rickard Little, his third son, called Little Little. Torgan Flint, of the first Flints, called the Flint or Old Flint. Black Donald Flint, his son and heir. Artos Flint, his second son, half-brother to Black Donald. The stark arms show a grey direwolf racing across an ice-white field. The stark words are, Winter is coming. House Tully Lord Edmund Tully of River Run was one of the first of the river lords to swear fealty to Aegon the Conqueror. King Aegon rewarded him by raising House Tully to dominion over all the lands of the Trident. The Tully sigil is a leaping trout, silver, on a field of rippling blue and red. The Tully words are family, duty, honor. Edmure Tully, Lord of River Run, taken captive at his wedding and held prisoner by the Freys. His bride, Lady Rosalind of House Frey, now with child. His sister, Lady Caitlin Stark, widow of Lord Eddard Stark of Winterfell, slain at the Red Wedding. His sister, Lady Lyssa Arryn, widow of Lord John Arryn of the Vale, pushed to her death from the Airy. His uncle, Sir Brendan Tully, called the Blackfish, lately Castellan of River Run, now an outlaw. His household at River Run, Maester Vyman, counselor, healer, and tutor. Sir Desmond Grell, master at arms. Sir Robin Riger, captain of the guard. Long Lou, Elwood, Delp, guardsman. Utherides Wayne, steward of River Run. His bannermen, the lords of the Trident. Titus Blackwood, lord of Raven Tree Hall. Brynden, his eldest son and heir. Lucas, his second son, slain at the Red Wedding. Hoster, his third son, a bookish boy. Edmund and Alan, his younger sons. Bethany, his daughter, a girl of eight. Robert, his youngest son, died of loose bowels. Jonas Bracken, Lord of the Stone Hedge. Barbara, Jane, Caitlin, Bess, Alisan, his five daughters. Hildy, a camp follower. Jason Malister, Lord of Seaguard, a prisoner in his own castle. Patrick, his son, imprisoned with his father. Sir Dennis Malister, Lord Jason's uncle, a man of the Night's Watch. Clement Piper, Lord of Pink Maiden Castle. His son and heir, Sir Mark Piper, taken captive at the Red Wedding. Carol Vance, Lord of Wayfarer's Rest. Norbert Vance, the blind Lord of Atranta. Theomar Smallwood, Lord of Acorn Hall. William Mouton, Lord of Maidenpool. Eleanor, his daughter and heir, thirteen, married Dickon Tarley of Horn Hill. Shella Went, dispossessed Lady of Harrenhal. Sir Halman Page, Lord Lyman Goodbrook. House Tyrell the Tyrells rose to power as stewards to the kings of the Reach, though they claimed descent from Garth Greenhand, Gardner King of the First Men. When the last king of House Gardner was slain on the Field of Fire, his steward, Harlan Tyrell, surrendered Highgarden to Aegon the Conqueror. Aegon granted him the castle and dominion over the Reach. Mace Tyrell declared his support for Renly Baratheon at the onset of the War of the Five Kings, and gave him the hand of his daughter Margaery. Upon Renly's death, Highgarden made alliance with House Lannister, and Margaery was betrothed to King Joffrey. Mace Tyrell, Lord of Highgarden, Warden of the South, Defender of the Marches, and High Marshal of the Reach. His wife, Lady Illyrie, of House Hightower of Oldtown. 
their children, Willis, their eldest son, heir to Highgarden, Sir Garlin, called the Gallant, their second son, newly raised to Lord of Brightwater, Garlin's wife, Lady Leonette of House Fossaway, Sir Loris, the Knight of Flowers, their youngest son, a sworn brother of the Kingsguard, wounded on Dragonstone, Margery, their daughter, twice wed and twice widowed, Margery's companions and ladies-in-waiting, her cousins, Mega, Alla, and Eleanor Tyrell, Eleanor's betrothed, Alan Ambrose, squire, Lady Alison Bulwer, Lady Alice Graceford, Lady Taina Merriweather, Meredith Crane, called Mary, Septa Nisterica, her companions. His widowed mother, Lady Olena of House Redwine, called the Queen of Thorns. His sisters, Lady Mina, married Paxter Redwine, Lord of the Arbor. Her son, Sir Horace Redwine, called Horror. Her son, Sir Haber Redwine, called Slobber. Her daughter, Desmera Redwine, 16. Lady Janna, wed to Sir John Fossaway. His uncles. His uncle, Garth Tyrell, called the Gross, Lord Seneschal of Highgarden. Garth's bastard sons, Garce and Garrett Flowers. His uncle, Sir Morin Tyrell, Lord Commander of the City Watch of Old Town. His uncle, Maester Gorman, serving at the Citadel. Mace's household at Highgarden. Maester Lomis, Counselor, Healer, and Tutor. Igon Verwell, Captain of the Guard. Sir Vortimer Crane, Master at Arms. Butterbumps, Fool and Jester, Hugely Fat. His bannermen, the Lords of the Reach. Randall Tarley, Lord of Horn Hill, commanding King Tommen's army on the Trident. Paxter Redwine, Lord of the Arbor. Sir Horace and Sir Haber, his twin sons. Lord Paxter's healer, Maester Balabar. Arwen Oakhart, Lady of Old Oak. Mathis Rowan, Lord of Golden Grove. Leighton Hightower, Voice of Old Town, Lord of the Port. Humphrey Hewitt, Lord of Oakenshield. Thalia Flowers, his bastard daughter. Osbert Sari, Lord of Southshield. Guthor Grimm, Lord of Greyshield. Morabald Chester, Lord of Greenshield. Orton Merriweather, Lord of Longtable. Lady Taina, his wife, a woman of Mir. Russell, her son, a boy of six. Lord Arthur Ambrose. Lornet Caswell, Lord of Bitterbridge. His Knights and Sworn Swords. Sir John Fossaway, of the Green Apple Fossaways. Sir Tanton Fossaway, of the Red Apple Fossaways. The Tyrell sigil is a golden rose on a grass-green field. Their words are growing strong. The Sworn Brothers of the Night's Watch. John Snow, the Bastard of Winterfell, 998th Lord Commander of the Night's Watch. Ghost, his white direwolf. His steward, Edison Tollett, called Dolorous Ed. At Castle Black, Maester Aemon Targaryen, healer and counselor, a blind man, 102 years old. Aemon's steward, Clytus. Aemon's steward, Samuel Tarley, fat and bookish. Bowen Marsh, Lord Steward. Three-finger Hob, steward and chief cook. Donal Noy, one-armed armorer and smith, slain at the gate by Mag the Mighty. Owen, called the Oaf, Tim Tangletongue, Mully, Coogan, Donal Hill, called Sweet Donal, Left Hand Lou, Jaron, Ty, Danil, Wick Whittlestick, stewards. Othel Yarwick, first builder. Spare Boot, Halder, Albet, Kegs, Alf of Runnymud, builders. Septon Celador, a drunken devout. Blackjack Bulwer, first ranger. Dywen, Kedge Witteye, Bedwick, called Giant, Mathar, Garth Greyfeather, Ulmer of the Kingswood, Elron, Garrett Greenspear, Fulk the Flea, Pipar, called Pip, Gren, called Orox, Bernar, called Black Bernar, Tim Stone, Rory, Bearded Ben, Tom Barleycorn, Goaty Big Little, Luke of Longtown, 
Harry Howe, Rangers. Leathers, a wildling turned crow. Sir Alistair Thorne, former master at arms. Lord Janos Slint, former commander of the City Watch of King's Landing, briefly Lord of Harrenhal. Iron Emmet, formerly of East Watch, master at arms. Harith, called Horse, the twins Aaron and Emric, Satin, Hop Robin, recruits in training. At the Shadow Tower, Sir Dennis Malister, commander. His steward and squire, Wallace Massey. Maester Mullen, healer and counselor. Corin Halfhand, Squire Dalbridge, Egan, Rangers, slain beyond the wall. Stone Snake, a ranger, lost a foot in Skirling Pass. At East Watch by the Sea, Cotter Pike, a bastard of the Iron Islands, commander. Maester Harmune, healer and counselor. Old Tattersalt, captain of the Blackbird. Sir Glendon Hewitt, master at arms. Sir Maynard Holt, captain of the Talon. Russ Barleycorn, Captain of the Storm Crow. The Wildlings, or the Free Folk. Mance Raider, King Beyond the Wall, a captive at Castle Black. His wife, Dalla, died in childbirth. Their newborn son, born in battle, as yet unnamed. Val, Dalla's younger sister, the Wildling Princess, a captive at Castle Black. Jarl, Val's lover, killed in a fall. His captains, chiefs, and raiders. The Lord of Bones, mocked as Rattleshirt, a raider and leader of a warband, captive at Castle Black. Igreet, a young spearwife, Jon Snow's lover, killed during the attack on Castle Black. Rick, called Longspear, a member of his band. Ragwile, Lenil, members of his band. Tormund, Mead King of Ruddy Hall, called Giant's Bane, Tall Talker, Hornblower, and Breaker of Ice, also Thunderfist, Husband to Bears, Speaker to Gods, and Father of Hosts. Tormund's sons, Toreg the Tall, Torweird the Tame, Dormund, and Drin, his daughter Munda, the Weeper, called the Weeping Man, a notorious raider and leader of a warband, Harma, called Dog's Head, slain beneath the wall, Halleck, her brother. Stare, Magnar of Then, slain attacking Castle Black. Sigorn, Stare's son, new Magnar of Then. Varamir, called Six Skins, a skin changer and warg, called Lump as a boy. One Eye, Sly, Stalker, his wolves. His brother, Bump, killed by a dog. His foster father, Hagen, a warg and hunter. Thistle, a spear wife, hard and homely. Briar, Grisella, skin changers, long dead. Borak, called the boar, a skin changer, much feared. Garrick Kingsblood, of the blood of Raymond Redbeard, his three daughters. Soren Shieldbreaker, a famed warrior. Morna White Mask, the warrior witch, a raider. Egon Oldfather, a clan chief with eighteen wives. The Great Walrus, leader on the frozen shore. Mother Mole, a woods witch, given to prophecy. Brog, Gavin the Traitor, Harl the Huntsman, Harl the Handsome, Howd Wanderer, Blind Doss, Kyleg of the Wooden Ear, Devon Sealskinner, chiefs and leaders amongst the free folk. Orel, called Orel the Eagle, a skin changer slain by Jon Snow in the Skirling Pass. Magmar Tundoweg, called Mag the Mighty, a giant, slain by Donal Noy at the gate of Castle Black. One Weg One Dar One, called One One, a giant. Rowan, Holly, Squirrel, Willow Witch Eye, Frenya, Myrtle, Spearwives, Captive at the Wall. Beyond the Wall In the Haunted Forest Brandon Stark, called Bran, Prince of Winterfell and heir to the North, a crippled boy of nine. His companions and protectors. Mira Reed, a maid of sixteen, daughter of Lord Howland Reed of Greywater Watch. Jojen Reed, her brother, thirteen, cursed with green sight. Hodor, a simple lad, seven feet tall. 
his guide cold hands, clad in black, once perhaps a man of the night's watch, now a mystery. At Craster's Keep, the betrayers, once men of the night's watch, Dirk, who murdered Craster, Olo Lophand, who slew the old bear, G.R. Mormont, Garth of Greenaway, Monty, Grubbs, Allen of Rosby, former rangers, Clubfoot Carl, Orphan Oss, Muttering Bill, former stewards. In the caverns beneath a hollow hill, the three-eyed crow, also called the last green seer, sorcerer and dreamwalker, once a man of the night's watch named Brynden, now more tree than man. The children of the forest, those who sing the song of earth, last of their dying race. Leaf, ash, scales, black knife, snowy locks, coals. Essos, beyond the narrow sea. In Bravos. Farago Antarion, sea lord of Bravos, sickly and failing. Caro Volantin, first sword of Bravos, his protector. Belagir Authoris, called the Black Pearl, a courtesan descended from the pirate queen of the same name. The Veiled Lady, the Merling Queen, the Moon Shadow, the Daughter of the Dusk, the Nightingale, the Poetess, famous courtesans. The Kindly Man and the Waif, servants of the many-faced god at the House of Black and White. Umma, the Temple Cook. The Handsome Man, the Fat Fellow, the Lordling, the Stern Face, the Squinter, and the Starved Man, secret servants of him of many faces. Arya of House Stark, a novice in service at the House of Black and White, also known as Ari, Nan, Weasel, Squab, Salty, and Cat of the Canals. Brusco, a fishmonger. His daughters, Talia and Brea. Marilyn, called Mary, proprietor of the Happy Port, a brothel near the Ragman's Harbor. The sailor's wife, a whore at the Happy Port. Lana, her daughter, a young whore. Red Rago, Gyloro Dothair, Gylino Dothair, a scribbler called Quill, Cosimo the Conjurer, patrons of the Happy Port. Taganaro, a dockside cut purse and thief. Casso, king of the seals, his trained seal. Savrone, a dockside whore of a murderous bent. The drunken daughter, a whore of uncertain temper. In Old Volantis, the reigning triarchs, Maliquo Magir, triarch of Volantis, a tiger. Donifos Panimion, Triarch of Volantis, an elephant. Niesos Vassar, Triarch of Volantis, an elephant. People of Volantis. Benero, High Priest of Rahulor, the Lord of Light. His right hand, Mokoro, a priest of Rahulor. The widow of the waterfront, a wealthy freed woman of the city, also called Vogaro's whore. Her fierce protectors, the widow's sons. Penny, a dwarf girl and mummer. Her pig, pretty pig. Her dog, crunch. Groat, brother to Penny, a dwarf mummer, murdered and beheaded. Alios Kadar, a candidate for Triarch. Parquello Veleros, a candidate for Triarch. Bellico Stegon, a candidate for Triarch. Grazdan Mo Eraz, an envoy from Young Kai. On Slaver's Bay. In Yunkai, the Yellow City, Yorkaz Zoyunzak, supreme commander of the armies and allies of Yunkai, a slaver and aged noble of impeccable birth. Yezanzo Kagaz, mocked as the Yellow Whale, monstrously obese, sickly, hugely rich. Nurse, his slave overseer. Sweets, a hermaphrodite slave, his treasure. Scar, a sergeant and slaveholder. Morgo, a slave soldier. Morgaz Zogerzin, a nobleman oft in his cups, mocked as the drunken conqueror. Gorjak Zo Eraz, a nobleman and slaver, mocked as pudding face. Fejar Zo Fez, a nobleman and slaver, known as the rabbit. Gazdor Zo Alak, a nobleman and slaver, mocked as Lord Wobblecheeks. 
Pejar Zomirak, a nobleman of small stature, mocked as the little pigeon. Chesdar Zorazin, Maison Zorazin, Grazdan Zorazin, noblemen and brothers, mocked as the clanker lords. The charioteer, the beastmaster, the perfumed hero, noblemen and slavers. In Astapor, the Red City, Cleon the Great, called the Butcher King, Cleon II, his successor, king for eight days, King Cutthroat, a barber, slit the throat of Cleon II to steal his crown, Queen Whore, concubine to King Cleon II, claimed the throne after his murder. The Queen Across the Water Daenerys Targaryen, the first of her name, Queen of Myrene, Queen of the Andals and the Rhoynar and the First Men, Lord of the Seven Kingdoms, Protector of the Realm, Khaleesi of the Great Grass Sea, called Daenerys Stormborn, the Unburnt, Mother of Dragons. Her dragons, Drogon, Viserion, Rhaegal. Her brother, Rhaegar, Prince of Dragonstone, slain by Robert Baratheon on the Trident. Rhaegar's daughter, Rhaenys, murdered during the sack of King's Landing. Rhaegar's son, Aegon, a babe in arms, murdered during the sack of King's Landing. Her brother, Viserys, the third of his name, called the Beggar King, crowned with molten gold. Her lord husband, Drogo, Akal of the Dothraki, died of a wound gone bad. Her stillborn son by Drogo, Rago, slain in the womb by the Megi Miri Mazdur. Her protectors, Sabaristan Selmy, called Baristan the Bold, Lord Commander of the Queen's Guard. His lads, squires training for knighthood. Tumco Lo, of the Basilisk Isles. Larak, called the Lash, of Myrene. The Red Lamb, a Lazarine freedman. The Boys, three Giscari brothers. Strong Belwas, eunuch and former fighting slave. Her Dothraki blood riders. Jogo, the Whip, blood of her blood. Ago, the Bow, blood of her blood. Rakaro, the Arak, blood of her blood. Her captains and commanders. Dario Naharis, a flamboyant Tyrashi sellsword, captain of the Storm Crows, a free company. Ben Plum, called Brown Ben, a mongrel sellsword, captain of the Second Sons, a free company. Grey Worm, a eunuch, commander of the Unsullied, a company of eunuch infantry. Hero, an unsullied captain, second in command. Stalwart shield, an unsullied spearman. Milano Yas Dob, commander of the stalwart shields, a company of freedmen. Simon Strikeback, commander of free brothers, a company of freedmen. Marcelin, commander of the mother's men, a company of freedmen, a eunuch, brother to Missendei. Grolio of Pentos, formerly captain of the great cog Sejulion, now an admiral without a fleet. Ramo, a jacaran of the Dothraki. Her Myrinese court. Reznak Mo Reznak, her seneschal, bald and unctuous. Skahasmo Kandak, called the shave pate, shaven headed commander of the brazen beasts, her city watch. Her handmaids and servants. Eri and Jiki, young women of the Dothraki. Missende, a Nathi scribe and translator. Grazdar, Keza, Mazara, Kesmia, Azak, Bakaz, Miklaz, Dazar, Drakaz, Jezain, children of the pyramids of Mirenes, her cupbearers and pages. People of Mirene, high born and common. Galaza Galer, the Green Grace, high priestess at the Temple of the Graces. Grazdamzo Galer, her cousin, a nobleman. Hisdar Zolorak, a wealthy Miranese nobleman of ancient lineage. Margaz Zolorak, his cousin. Rylona Ri, freedwoman and harpist. Hazea, a farmer's daughter, four years of age. Gogor the Giant, Kraz, Beliquo Bonebreaker, Cameron of the Count, Fearless Ithok, the Spotted Cat, Barcina Blackhair, Steelskin, Pit Fighters and Freed Slaves. Her uncertain allies, false friends, and known enemies. Ser Jorah Mormont, formerly Lord of Bear Island. Miri Mazdur, God's wife and Megi, 
a servant of the great shepherd of Lazar. Xaroxoan Daxos, a merchant prince of Karth. Quaith, a masked shadowbinder from Ashai. Illyrio Mopatis, a magister of the free city of Pentos, who brokered her marriage to Caldrogo. Cleon the Great, butcher king of Astapor. The Queen's Suitors. On Slaver's Bay, Dario Naharis, late of Tyrosh, a cell sword and captain of the Storm Crows. Hisdar Zolorak, a wealthy Myrinese nobleman. Skahaz Mokandak, called the Shave Pate, a lesser nobleman of Myrene. Cleon the Great, butcher king of Astapor. In Volantis, Prince Quentin Martel, eldest son of Doran Martel, Lord of Sunspear and Prince of Dorn. His sworn shields and companions. Sir Cletus Ironwood, heir to Ironwood, slain by corsairs. Sir Archibald Ironwood, cousin to Cletus, called the Big Man. Sir Garris Drinkwater. Sir Willem Wells, slain by corsairs. Maester Kedry, slain by corsairs. On the Rhoyne. Young Griff, a blue haired lad of eighteen years. His foster father, Griff, a sellsword late of the Golden Company. His companion, teachers, and protectors. Sir Raleigh Duckfield, called Duck, a knight. Septa Lamore, a woman of the faith. Halden, called the half maester, his tutor. Yandri, master and captain of the shy maid. Isilla, his wife. At sea. Victarion Greyjoy, lord captain of the Iron Fleet, called the Iron Captain. His bedwarmer, a dusky woman without a tongue, a gift from Euron Crow's Eye. His healer, Maester Kerwin, late of Greenshield, a gift from Euron Crow's Eye. His crew on the Iron Victory. Wolf One Ear, Ragnar Pike, Longwater Pike, Tom Tidewood, Burton Humble, Quellen Humble, Stefar Stammerer. His captains, Roderick Spar, called the Vole, Captain of Grief, Red Ralph Stonehouse, Captain of Red Jester, Manfred Merlin, Captain of Kite, Ralph the Limper, Captain of Lord Quellen, Tom Cod, called Bloodless Tom, Captain of the Lamentation, Dagon Shepherd, called the Black Shepherd, Captain of the Dagger. The Targaryens are the blood of the dragon, descended from the High Lords of the ancient freehold of Valyria, their heritage marked by lilac, indigo, and violet eyes, and hair of silver gold. To preserve their blood and keep it pure, House Targaryen has oft wed brother to sister, cousin to cousin, uncle to niece. The founder of the dynasty, Aegon the Conqueror, took both his sisters to wife and fathered sons on each. The Targaryen banner is a three-headed dragon, red on black, the three heads representing Aegon and his sisters. The Targaryen words are fire and blood. The Cell Swords Men and Women of the Free Companies The Golden Company, 10,000 strong, of uncertain loyalty. Homeless Harry Strickland, Captain General. Watkin, his squire and cupbearer. Sir Miles Toyne, called Blackheart, four years dead, the previous Captain General. Black Balak, a white-haired summer islander, commander of the company archers. Lisono Mar, a sellsword late of the free city of Lys, company spymaster. Goris Edorian, a sellsword late of the free city of Volantis, company paymaster. Sir Franklin Flowers, the bastard of Cider Hall, a sellsword from the Reach. Sir Mark Mandrake, an exile escaped from slavery, scarred by pox. Sir Laswell Peak, an exile lord. His brothers, Tormen and Pikewood. Sir Tristan Rivers, Bastard, Outlaw, Exile. Caspar Hill, Humphrey Stone, Mallow Jane, Dick Cole, Will Cole, Lorimus Mudd, John Lothston, Lyman Pease, Sir Brendel Byrne, Duncan Strong, Dennis Strong, Chains, Young John Mudd, Sergeants of the Company. Sir Agor Rivers, called Bittersteel, a bastard son of King Aegon IV Targaryen, founder of the company. Malus I Blackfire, called Malus the Monstrous, captain general of the company, pretender to the Iron Throne of Westeros, member of the Band of Nine, 
slain during the War of the Nine Penny Kings. The Windblown, two thousand horse and foot, sworn to Yunkai. The Tattered Prince, a former nobleman of the free city of Pentos, captain and founder. Kago, called Corpse Killer, his right hand. Denzo Dehan, the warrior bard, his left hand. Hugh Hungerford, sergeant, former company paymaster, fined three fingers for stealing. Sir Orson Stone, Sir Lucifer Long, Will of the Woods, Dick Straw, Ginger Jack, Westerosi Sellswords. Pretty Maris, the company torturer. Books, a volunteer swordsman and notorious reader. Beans, a crossbowman, late of Mare. Old Bill Bone, a weathered summer islander. Mario Miracus, a sellsword late of Pentos. The Company of the Cat, 3,000 strong, sworn to Yunkai. Bloodbeard, captain and commander. The Long Lances, 800 horse riders, sworn to Yunkai. Gilo Regan, captain and commander. The Second Sons, 500 horse riders, sworn to Queen Daenerys. Brown Ben Plum, captain and commander. Casporio, called Casporio the Cunning, a bravo, second in command. Tybero Isterian, called Inkpots, company paymaster. Hammer, a drunken blacksmith and armorer. His apprentice, called Nail. Snatch, a sergeant, one-handed. Kem, a young sellsword from Flea Bottom. Bokoko, an axeman of formidable repute. Ulan, a sergeant of the company. The Stormcrows, five hundred horse riders, sworn to Queen Daenerys. Dario Naharis, captain and commander. The Widower, his second in command. Jokin, commander of the company archers. End of A Dance with Dragons